Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. <clears throat> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, and I call uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. Number 17, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Benefit to Australia Bill 2020 and number 21, Parliamentary Privileges Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. Thank you, Minister. I call the clerk. Oh, beg your pardon. So the question is the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 17, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Benefit to Australia Bill 2020, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Hanson. So the question is that the motion. Uh, are you speaking to the bill, Senator Hanson, or you want the motion put? You're speaking. Yes, please continue. Thank you. I rise to speak to my offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, Benefit to Australia Bill 2022. I want the Australian people to understand the importance of this legislation and why it is so necessary. First, some background. The country of Norway has a population of fewer than six million people. It sits next to the resource-rich North Sea. The country's leaders decided long ago to make sure Norway's people who own these resources benefited from the extraction and sale. As a result, Norway now has the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, with a value approaching two trillion Australian dollars. That's more than $350,000 for every person in Norway. Now compare that to Australia. We have resources of minerals and energy that makes Norway seem insignificant. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty, rich and rare. Our very own natural national anthem says it as plain as day. We have enough iron ore to supply the world's needs for centuries. We have some of the world's largest reserves of aluminium, uranium, <clears throat> gold, copper, coal. The list goes on and on. Just as it is with the people of Norway, these resources are the sovereign property of the Australian people. Yeah. And just like the people of Norway, the people of Australia should be rolling in the riches derived from the extraction and sale of these resources. However, we are not. Our federal, state, territory and local government debt is about 85 per cent of our GDP. Private debt is about 135 per cent of GDP. Families across Australia are struggling with the rising cost of living. We have a housing crisis which is forcing many families to sleep in cars or on the streets. 
We have some of the highest energy bills in the world and crippling shortages of energy in a country with abundant reserves of energy that most others can only dream of. We have a public health system which cannot cope with demand. We have increasing poverty and increasing welfare costs. Something is very, very wrong here in Australia. It is very clear that successive Australian governments have not made the right decisions about leveraging our resources for the, for the benefit of the Australian people. Australians receive the lowest share of benefits from their mineral and energy wealth of any country in the world. The question is why? Why have successive coalition Labor governments allowed our resources to be effectively pillaged by mainly foreign-owned multinational companies for virtually no return to the Australian people? Natural gas is the perfect example of this debacle. Our gas reserves in the northwest shelf area are huge, and there are plentiful reserves everywhere. <clears throat> there are quite literally trillions of cubic feet owned by the Australian people. As was noted in the committee inquiry into this legislation, we became the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world in 2019. <clears throat> Exports from the northwest shelf are at more than $80 billion in value, but Australia receives only two or $300 million in revenue from it through the petroleum resource and rent tax, the PWRT. By comparison, the country of Qatar generates $26 billion in annual revenue from fewer LNG exports. I've asked the current Prime Minister, the opposition leader and senior ministers of the former coalition if they understand what's going on with the riches owned by Australians in the North West Shelf. None of them knew anything about it and said so. Our LNG exports continue to climb in volume, enriching foreign-owned multinationals and our manufacturing competitors. So much gas is being exported that Australia is actually suffering a shortfall of domestic supplies, and there is no pipeline delivering northwest shelf gas to Australia where it is in very high demand. This has created a situation which, on the face of it, is completely ludicrous. Australia is the only large gas producer in the world where domestic prices are higher than international prices. Another important reason for our domestic shortfall is that successive Labor and coalition governments have let these mostly foreign-owned multinationals bank our gas reserves. According to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, they are sitting on proven and prob probable reserves that could provide Australians with reliable energy for decades to come. These reserves are being locked away under retention leases for, more, for 30 years or more, where, when they are, local operators ready and willing to develop them, local customers ready and willing to buy, and many thousands of Australian households and businesses struggling with some of the highest energy bills in the world. Successive Labor and coalition governments have been weak. They have been frightened by the threats these companies make and have worked actively to help these companies rip off the Australian people. They have happily received many millions of dollars in donations from these companies as a reward for ripping off the Australian people. They let foreign-owned multinationals buy Australian housing stock. They have let foreign owners buy about 20 per cent of Australia's water entitlements. None of this is in our best interests. Let me be absolutely clear. You have no business being a member of this parliament unless you are always acting to the benefit of the Australian people and everyone here. Here's your chance to show the Australian people you are truly acting to their benefit by supporting the Offshore Petroleum gas, Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2022. This is not a tax bill. This amendment is aimed at increasing the domestic supply of natural gas at a fair price. If the government and opposition fail to support an amendment requiring ministers and other decision makers to act to the benefit of Australians, they need to explain why before casting their vote. This is not to the benefit of the Australian people who own these resources. This is to the detriment 
of the Australian people and the major parties which form government in Australia are enabling it. This amendment to the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 is profound but simple. It should not, be it should not even be necessary, but the Great Australian Gas ripoff enabled by successive Labor and Coalition governments make it necessary. One Nation's amendment broadens the objects clause in Section 3 of the Act. It states, the object of the Act is to ensure that the exploitation of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. What more do you want to know? That is just plain common sense. The Australian community might wonder why it's necessary for the Act to state the obvious, but recent history demonstrates decision makers need this obligation placed on them by this amendment. All of these mainly foreign-owned companies exploiting our resources are laughing at Australia all the way to the bank. And why not? To them, Australia is little more than a cheap dirt mine. From 2014 to 2019, ExxonMobil, Australia's revenue, was about $56 billion and it paid no tax. In the same period, revenue for Chevron Australian Holdings was $28 billion and it paid no tax. Revenue for Woodside was $43 billion and it paid only $1.2 billion in tax. Santos made $23 billion and paid only $3 million in tax. Enough is enough. These resources belong to the Australian people. It should be the Australian people who are benefiting from the exploitation of these resources. Once they're gone, they're gone for good and the Australian people will never get a fair return for their resources. This amendment is an important step in correcting this ludicrous state of affairs, and it represents an opportunity to get things right with the new energy source everyone is talking about, hydrogen. Naturally occurring hydrogen deposits all over the place in Australia and often associated with the deposits of oil and gas. It's the cheapest form of hydrogen because it doesn't require energy-intensive processes to produce it. The former government's national hydrogen strategy says Australia is well-placed to make hydrogen its next big export. It says large-scale market activation will include enabling competitive domestic markets with explicit public benefits. Our amendment bill is aimed at ensuring this really happens with hydrogen and that this resource is not squandered for little public benefit, as is happening with natural gas. The major parties have screwed us on our gas and oil. Here's hoping they don't screw us on hydrogen too. Anything less than full support for this amendment by members of this parliament would be a clear message to the Australian people that you are not acting to their benefit. It would be a clear message that you don't care the Australian people are being ripped off. It would be a clear message that you don't that you've been cowered into submission by mostly foreign-owned multinationals, it will be a clear message to the Australian people that you don't belong in this parliament. With the time remaining to me, I've worked on this for about the last five years when it was brought to my attention about the resource that we have in Australia and we're not getting the benefit to it. I note that when I raised this in March of 2021, um, Senator Ayres got up and basically said offshore petroleum developments are already subject to a range of vastly more specific regulations to test if they're for the benefit of Australian community. Really? And he says adding redundant for benefit of the Australian community clause doesn't mean that oil and gas developments and environment are environmentally sustainable. It doesn't mandate that Australian oil and gas investments should employ Australian workers and offer them decent wages and conditions. It's got nothing to do with offering them decent wages and conditions. This is about the Australian people reaping the benefits from our resources. As I said to you, Norway has utilised their resources to the best of the ability of, the, of their people, six million people, and yet they've been able to make nearly two trillion dollars money from that. Here in Australia, we're struggling with providing the services, whether it's healthcare, housing, um, water, to our people in Australia. We have families living in their cars. We have an ever-increasing welfare debt. We have an ever-increasing debt to the Australian to the rest of the world that we can't seem to be able to pay. When, the, when 
Prime Minister Albanese, being paying Prime Minister of this country, he said he will see that multinationals pay their fair share of tax. What's happened with it? Haven't heard a word about it. Nothing. Here you have the best resource that we have, and we can make a lot of money out of it. If Qatar is exporting less um, LNG than what we are and can make $26 billion, over $26 billion for their country, what the hell is happening here? The problem is that I've found over the years, and who I've spoken to with regards to this, is the resource ministers didn't have a clue about it, didn't have, understand what they were talking about, weren't interested. Retention leases are only supposed to be for five years. We keep renewing it because the lobbyists come in, take them to dinner, say, oh no, mate, that's fine, we'll sign off on this, we'll give you another five years, where some of the retention leases are more than 30 years old. It's got to be use it or lose it. We also yeah. need to build a pipeline from the west coast of, of Australia to the east coast to give the supply of gas that we need. You can build if you have the will. But what I find that in this place, most of the people here have never run a business, they've never employed staff, they've actually come from universities, work in, in political offices, then see their way up to become members of parliament. You have no business acumen, you don't know the effects of it, you actually listen to the bureaucrats who've got nothing to lose. No one's held accountable in this place, not even the bureaucrats. They tell you what to do because you lack the confidence of the knowledge or the business acumen to know what to do and how to make the decisions in this place. The people out there are relying on us to make for, the ben for their benefit. And I will not give up on this. And it absolutely disgusts me to think that the Labor are not going to be talking to this bill today. They're not going to say a word on it. Why? Why are you, why are you shut down? Why aren't you speaking to this? Why aren't you going to explain to the Australian people what is into the benefit of Australian people? Well, if Senator Ayres has anything to go by, the fact is so sexist of governments, the benefit of Australia. Why have we lost the Commonwealth Bank? Why have we lost the airports? Why have we lost this water security? Why have we lost our, our electricity components? Why have we sold it to multinationals? The Australian people are getting to a stage they own nothing. They've got no control of their country or their destiny. And the politicians in this place, to my opinion, are basically useless because I don't think you even know what the hell you're doing here. Collect your pay, just show up, and you, have, you don't understand the workings of this country, how to benefit the people of Australia. And I recommend this bill to the Senate. Senator MacDonald. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020. And I would note first and foremost that while the aim of this bill is a worthy one, it is unfortunately flawed in a way that would result in unintended consequences that may in fact have the opposite effect of its original intention. I, uh, I agree with the uh, comments made in closing by Senator Hanson, particularly around the way business operates and the importance uh, of legislation, uh, importance of our roles in determining legislation in this place. Uh, but I do need to talk about the specifics uh, of this legislation amendment. The le legal system relies on explicit wording of legislation and clear definitions by making the term for the benefit of the Australian community open to interpretation by the courts, we would allow radical environmental groups to tie up any projects in legal fights. And it is not out of the realm of possibility that activist groups would use this amended objective to make the argument that an activity such as drilling an offshore well to recover oil or gas would contribute to climate change or have an environmental impact, therefore arguing that it does not benefit the Australian community. This legislation amendment will expose the gas industry and potentially the entire resources sector to green lawfare and drive industry investment away from Australia. This will, of course, be disastrous for our economy, uh, but for Australian workers and Australian businesses who are benefiting from the investments Thank into these developments the Act, so and would right. severely constrict well, we would be providing them with another opportunity, Senator Hanson, would severely constrict the regional Australia's ability to support businesses and families. I also want to touch on uh, Senator Hanson's comments with regard to uh, the PRT uh, returns uh, and company tax returns. 
Uh, I think what is not well understood uh, is that when these investments are made um, into these projects, it is billions of dollars, billions of dollars in not just capital investment but also uh, precursory uh, environmental uh, and other um, reviews, and that costs a, a huge amount of money, which is able to be offset on part of the um, on part of the tax calculations. And remembering that those dollars are spent in Australia with Australian companies employing Australian workers. While this bill talks about community benefit, it is clear that mining in this country does already benefit the community in ways that may not appear on annual profit and loss statements. And if we want to look at industry figures, the resources sector as a whole supports over 1.1 million direct and indirect jobs within Australia, contributing over $32.6 billion in direct salaries in 2021. The government has even acknowledged that the resources sector is to thank for a $50 billion budget boost this year and a brighter than expected fiscal outlook for Australia. The Australian oil and gas industry directly and indirectly supports over 80,000 jobs, contributed over $5.35 billion in tax in 2019-20 and recorded a $15.9 billion surplus in the trade of oil and gas. Now, over the past decade, the oil and gas industry paid more than $64.4 billion to the government, with contributions spanning decades totalling $161 billion since the mid-80s. This contribution is not limited to taxes. Now, over the last decade, the oil and gas industry has invested around $473 billion in the Australian economy. This includes about $170 billion spent directly since 2007 on five offshore LNG projects, which includes Pluto, Gorgon, Wheatstone, Ithacus and Prelude. And as of the last year, there are $120 billion worth of projects in the pipeline. That means more jobs in construction, supply chains and new operations. But we do potentially risk these investments uh, with the introduction of the government's 43 per cent um, emissions reduction legislation. Uh, the Queensland government's increase in coal royalties and potentially this amendment, all of which goes to undermine confidence in investment in this country. Opponents of gas, coal and mining in general are quick to point out tax and royalty payments are less than they believe they ought to be. But the full value of our resources sector is found to be away from the balance sheets, the prospectuses and annual reports. It is in the high-paying jobs, both in the regions and in the metropolitan company head offices. It's in the sponsorship of sporting teams, events and community groups. Superannuation funds and shareholders rely on a profitable resources sector to supplement their incomes and pay for their retirement. This money flows through local businesses, creating employment, which is also taxed, generating more revenue for the government. Just as mining's ripple effect on the economy is far-reaching, so too any impost on the mining and resources sector will be felt far away from the pits, the pipelines and corporate boardrooms. Already in Queensland, we are seeing big miners pull out of projects due to the state governments imposing the world's highest coal royalties. This reduced investment in regional Australia is disastrous for engineering firms, food suppliers, workwear stores and everyone employed directly and indirectly by the mining and resources sector. Many of these businesses are run by families. They're not driving limousines or flying in private jets. They're cementing a future for their kids, providing apprenticeships and sponsoring local netball and football teams. Rugby clubs such as the Capella Cattle Dogs and Emerald Rams in central Queensland would struggle to survive without sponsorships by local businesses engaged by the resources sector. Far more community support from resources companies operating in Queensland we can point to a million dollars to build a new centre for the AEIOU Foundation in Townsville, which spe specialises in teaching children with autism. Six million dollars for the Banana Shire Library, Museum and Community Hub. Eight million dollars for 16 affordable housing units in Isaac Shire. 4.5 million for a pool in Mount Morgan. 7.8 million for a pool in Charters Towers. 834,000 for a sports facility upgrade at Cloncurry. The list goes on and on, and this is a snapshot of just one of the hundreds uh, of resources companies operating in Australia that give back to local organisations and enriching small businesses. 
and I can guarantee you that this Labor government would not be directing any additional royalties back to those regional communities. Taking just one example from a submission to the committee examining this bill, Chevron stated that over the past decade during the construction of Gorgon and Wheat Zone, uh, jobs and industry opportunities surge, with over $60 billion spent on local content. Post-construction, the plants have an operating budget over $1 billion a year, delivering high-paying jobs and local contracts with local content of over 80 per cent. These projects supply domestic gas to Western Australian customers, supporting local jobs throughout the state and cleaner generation of electricity. And over the past decade, Chevron has paid $5.8 billion in taxes and royalties. By the mid-20s, we expect to be paying around $2 billion a year in taxes and royalties. And this is just one company. Is this not already a benefit for Australian communities? Across the industry, this has meant more export earnings, investments, taxes and royalties, something that benefits all Australians, as it provides the funds governments use to invest in infrastructure, education and social services. And as the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association said in their submission to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee's inquiry into this bill, APIA supports and agrees that the development of natural resources should be for the benefit of the Australian community. The effect of this amendment, however, will do the opposite and stymie investment. Claims that companies are hoarding resources has been proved incorrect and changing the objects clauses of the Act under which hundreds of billions of dollars of investment have been made drastically increases Australian sovereign risk for no material gain. The resources sector currently operates for the benefit of the Australian community, and the addition of this unnecessary amendment has the potential to simply shut down projects and drive investment offshore. The Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse, Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 provides for the safe and responsible operation of offshore oil and gas activities. It ensures that risks to safety and the environment are reduced as to how low as to to as low as reasonably practicable. It also ensures that industry meets the requirements of good oil field practice and ensures that the recovery of oil and gas is at its optimum level. One Nation's proposed amendment alters the objectives of the existing Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 by adding the following clause, to ensure that the exploitation of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. Now, while this change may seem innocent enough, it, in effect it injects a major ambiguity and uncertainty into the Act. Poorly drafted amendments, as proposed today, can be hijacked and have serious unintended consequences that would undermine future resources investment. We are constantly told these days that words have consequences, and it is definitely true in the case of this bill. The Coalition has previously spoken in opposition to the bill due to the broad nature of the amendment and unnecessary wording, which has the potential to open offshore petroleum exploration and development to legal challenges. The Greens supported the same bill last time with amendments that defined community benefit as relating to the effects of climate change and oil and gas's contribution to temperature rises. And in applying this de definition to that community benefit term, the Greens proved the bill's wording can be utilised against the sector to push extreme anti-development agendas. So I've already touched on the legal system relying on explicit wording of legislation and clear definitions, but this term, for the benefit of the Australian community, open to interpretation by the courts, we would allow radical environmental groups to tie up any projects in uh, legal fights. It is clear from even the most cursory look at resources contribution uh, to our society that any moving at the re regulatory levers must be meticulously considered and only done as a last resort, especially if there are moves to de decrease the profitability of these companies via increased royalties and taxes. We have already seen in Queensland the Labor government's royalty increase send shockwaves not just through the coal sector, but through all mining activities. And while Queensland Labor claims they are doing this to benefit the community, 
the early signs are that it will result in long-term harm for regional communities. Federally, we have seen the introduction of new requirements in the investment objectives of a number of government agencies like Infrastructure Australia and NAIF, hamstringing investment in industries like the gas industry and sending signals to investors that the government does not support the industry. Australia must understand that this is a highly competitive space, that we must continue to present ourselves as a viable, responsible and appealing investment opportunity to ensure that we continue to benefit from this sector. Uh, over 70 per cent of our nation's income is drawn from mining and resource activities, uh, and not to mention the highly paid salaries, the regional investment that allows towns uh, like Dalby, like Chinchilla, like Cloncurry uh, to be thriving with the activity of mining uh, in this country. Poorly drafted amendments can be hijacked and that have serious unintended consequences would further undermine future resources investments. There is no benefit to an industry that no longer exists. And the coalition will not be supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I call Senator Wish Wilson. Are you seeking the call? Yes, I was. I thought Senator Pocock was was next chair. Um, I, on the I believe there was a rearrangement, but if that's not the case, then Senator Pocock, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in support of this bill. This bill is striking in its simplicity. It seeks to ensure that any exploitation of fossil fuels is for the benefit of the Australian community. Our laws do little to guarantee that Australians get a fair share from the sale of our fossil fuel. Worse still, our laws are ineffective in protecting our climate and environment against the impacts of their extraction. The flaws in our laws start with offshore leases being granted to companies under excessively generous terms. This amendment could tighten this loophole. But there also needs to be real reform to our tax system. The companies that extract our fossil fuels are overwhelmingly foreign-owned. Just look at the gas industry, where 96 per cent of the companies profiting from gas exports are based offshore. The income tax royalties and petroleum resource rent tax that these companies pay is woefully inadequate. At times there are misconceptions about the contribution of the fossil fuel industry to Australian prosperity. In fact, the total tax paid by fossil fuel companies represents less than 1 per cent of government revenue, and yet profits are at record levels. In the first half of this year, Woodside Energy and Santos made a profit of more than $4 billion between them an increase of between 300 and 400 per cent. The profit these two companies made in just six months is equivalent to the cost of sending all Australian children to preschool between the ages of three and five for 10 years, or of electrifying a third of all Australian households. How, I ask members of the government and of the opposition, is that in the best interests of the Australian community? What we need now is a windfall profits tax. A convincing case for this change is being made across the community, including by former Labor politicians like former Senator Bob Carr, former senior public servants like Dr Ken Henry, Secretary of the Department of Treasury under former Prime Minister John Howard, business leaders like Mike Cannon-Brooks, the largest shareholder in AGL, Australia's biggest polluter. Prominent economists such as Professor Ross Garneau and former Chief Economist of the World Bank, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who called the measures a no-brainer. Unions, including the ACTU, union leaders like Dan Walton, Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, and public think tanks like the Grattan Institute. Perhaps the strongest call for this change has come from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who recently said, and I quote, the fossil fuel industry is feasting on hundreds of billions of dollars in sub subsidies and windfall profits, profits while household profits shrink and our planet burns. Any argument that it is too hard or that business will flee is a straw man. 
Just look at the United Kingdom, where the Conservative government has responded to high fossil fuel prices by swiftly enacting a windfall profits tax. That change is expected to raise the equivalent of approximately $13 billion this financial year. Recent research suggests that in Australia, two in three people support a windfall profits tax. It's no wonder, given the soaring costs of energy bills that households are facing. My colleagues in Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party and I may not agree on many things in this parliament, but in this case I admire their foresight on the issue of domestic gas prices. Introduced nearly two years ago, the explanatory me me memorandum to this bill highlights the problem of our domestic gas market. It highlights the problem of it being exposed to international prices. We're not in involved in the, the war in Russia. We don't import gas from Russia, yet we're paying export prices for our gas. This was long before the invasion of Ukraine that One Nation proposed this amendment. <coughs> Since the, this bill was first introduced, the price of gas has increased threefold as we continue to export 80 per cent of the gas we produce. The effect has been a huge increase in the cost of living for Australians across the country. A well-designed windfall profits tax would push domestic gas prices down and reduce cost of living pressures for Australians. If the measure was applied to the domestic sales of gas and set by a gas reference price from the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, it would act to efficiently reduce the cost of gas in Australia. In addition to a reduction in the domestic gas price, the revenue generated by a windfall profits tax could be used to fund development in rural and regional communities. The majority of fossil fuel extraction is from beneath land and sea near to these communities and it is right that the benefits are for them too. I would like to see the additional revenue used to set regional and rural communities up to benefit from a renewable energy future. This could look something like the Nationals Royalties for the Regions program in Western Australia and could be administered by an energy transition authority. The Nationals rightly point to the need to invest in, re in regional Australia and Labor has an agenda to transition our economy. A windfall profits tax for the regions can help do just that. I call on the government to start work on the design of a policy that will give Australians a fair share of the enormous profits being extracted from our land and seas. I also call on the government to ensure that fossil fuel projects do not go ahead where they are not in the interests of the Australian community. On this point, the IEA and the IPCC and climate scientists all agree. It is in the best interest of the Australian community and the global community for there to be no additional fossil fuel projects, especially when projects are opposed by First Nations people. First Nations people in their country and sea country are disproportionately and unjustly impacted by fossil fuel projects. Many have been fighting against the odds to protect their country from fossil fuel developments. I want to congratulate the landmark win by Mr. Dennis Tipa Kalipa of the Manupi clan of the Tiwi Islands in the federal court last week. Tiwi Islanders argued before the federal court that Santos did not appropriately consult the Manupi clan about the impacts of the offshore Barossa gas project. In a legal first, witnesses gave powerful evidence on country in the Tiwi Islands about the physical and spiritual impact that drilling could have on them, their culture and the sacred animals that call this sea country home. The case demonstrates the requirement for deep consultation with traditional owners before approval for drilling in sea country. It is vital that the voices of First Nations people be heard when gas projects such as Santos Barossa project threaten their country. It's an historic decision, a true David and Goliath battle, and I applaud the Tiwi people for having the courage to take on one of the world's biggest, one of the biggest resource companies in Australia. But this community courage and recent victory comes against a backdrop of structural failure. Last week, the, U the UN Human Rights Committee found that the Australian government has failed to adequately protect Torres Strait Islanders 
and violated their right to enjoy their culture and lives by failing to act on the climate crisis. We have to do better. I support increased emphasis on the need for decisions around oil and gas to benefit the Australian community. This bill is essentially trying to deal with the state capture we see in Australia. Both major parties not having the political courage to actually ensure that resources contribute to the wealth of everyday Australians. We see over the last few decades policies that benefit multinational companies that come to Australia, extract our resources and ship their profits overseas. Senator Hansen rightly pointed to Norway and their approach to actually ensuring that their resources contribute to their national wealth. It's a st stark, stark contrast to what we see in Australian politics. My sense talking to everyday Australians is that they want politicians to actually ensure that if we are selling resources from our country that we're reaping the rewards and not multinational corporations that, as we know, pay little tax and really, really push the line about jobs and, and how much they are investing in communities, which is total pocket change. Order, Senators. Continue your remarks. Which is total pocket change when you look at the amount of revenue that they're, that they're generating. We know that many of the jobs figures are also overblown. Another jurisdiction to point at, as Senator Hansen did, was Qatar, who produced less LNG than us, but pull in some $26 billion a year in royalties. There's been a clear message from Australian, the Australian people that they want more transparency, that they want the, the lives of everyday Australians put forward. And I really commend this, um, this bill and this amendment to actually ensure that fossil fuel exploration and profits is in the interest and, and in the benefit of everyday Australians. On the broader point about new fossil fuel projects, it's clear that the best interest of all Australians is for them not to go ahead. So we, we face this point in, uh, in time where we need to ensure that from existing fossil fuel projects, we are storing that wealth and actually using it to transition our economy. But when it comes to new fossil fuel projects, that we have the political courage to do the right thing, to do the thing that scientists are telling us we have to do, that we, we know we have to do to actually protect all the people and places we love. Thank you, Senator Pocock. And I call Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, you yourself, Acting Deputy President, remember the fights we had in this Senate chamber uh, five years ago and through numerous committees to get companies like Chevron to actually pay some tax in Australia. Um, and it really hit home to me today listening to the Liberal Party get up here and talk about what a great taxpayer Chevron is and how, ma how, how many billions of dollars they're uh, putting into our tax system. When the Australian government, the Australian tax office, had to take Chevron to the High Court in 2017 to get them to pay any tax, they were Australia's biggest tax avoider. Chevron, $340 million they ended up having to pay thanks to the Australian Tax Office and senators in this chamber pressuring some political action, Senator Scar, to you, Chair, pressuring senators on your side of the chamber to actually do something to make big oil and gas corporations pay their fair share of tax. We had a Senate inquiry into the petroleum resource rent tax that the Greens initiated in 2017, chaired by the very capable Senator Sam Dastyari, may I say. 
And right then, the government had what was called the Callaghan Review, which they'd been sitting on for two years, because the petroleum resource rent tax, called the PRRT, was the petroleum resource rort tax. These companies had clocked up nearly $340 billion in tax credits. In other words, they were going to pay no tax for the life cycle of their large gas projects in this country. A tax system invented in the 1980s, totally out of touch with the reality of the 2000s. And it was this chamber, Senator Scar, to you, Chair, and senators that actually worked hard to get changes to the PRRT. But let me say how disappointing those changes were. 25 per cent uplift on expiration rates at the time of our inquiry, oil and gas companies could uplift their expiration expenditures by 15 per cent per annum, and all their offshore operating activities cost by 5 per cent per annum. The Australian public would even pay for the cleanups of oil and gas spills, because that was also deductible under the petroleum resource rort tax. And the government, thanks to the pressure from this chamber, at least uh, reduced that uplift on exploration expenditure to 5 per cent. But still, we have hundreds of billions of dollars in tax credits and tax that could be paying for schools and hospitals and important things in this country that is not paid. It is still wrought. And, um, my, uh, my colleague, very shortly, Senator Cox, will talk about the Greens have a very simple solution to this, and I know crossbenchers in this place. Uh, One Nation, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, previously Senator Patrick, have all tried to bring in proper uh, reform to the petroleum resource rort tax. We need at least a royalty rate of 10 per cent, a base royalty rate that deductions don't work against, so that we actually get a return for the Australian people. Yes, some of these companies pay tax, and yes, they employ Australians, but remember, what other industry apart from mining gets their resource for free, gets the inputs into their production for free. These companies are taking our gas and taking our oil and our condensate and other products, and they are paying nothing for it. Yes, they are extracting it and they are employing people, but they are paying nothing for it to the Australian people who own these resources. And it's so typical to hear the LNP come in this place and say, well, Leave it to the free market. They're employing people. Let them get away with these super profits. Let them get away with paying no tax. They're still doing transfer pricing. They are still, they are still doing transfer pricing. There's still dodgy related uh, third party financing going on. There's a whole range of things that these companies are still doing. But I'm proud to be part of a party that over the last decade has led to at least some reform in this sector, and we need to see more of it. But here is where the Greens fundamentally disagree with One Nation. We believe that the exploitation, to focus on that word, the exploitation of our oil and gas reserves offshore that would best suit the Australian people would be no new oil and gas projects. There is enough hydrocarbons and enough oil and gas already in reserves, that if we exploit those, we will exceed our Paris target. We will exceed two degrees of warming. And even the Conservative International Energy Agency said, if we are to get warming to one and a half degrees, to protect the future generations on this planet, some of them who are watching this Senate debate today from the chamber, if we are to limit warming to one and a half degrees, we have to stop exploring and exploiting new fossil fuel projects, not just in Australia but internationally. We need to, as quickly as possible, move to 100 per cent renewable energy footing. Now, of course, we're going to still use petroleum products for the decades to come. There has to be a transition, but we need to move as quickly as possible. The last thing we should be doing is encouraging or putting in place incentives in legislation uh, financial or otherwise, that encourage more greedy oil and gas companies exploiting our ocean for the exact same product that, when we burn it, is boiling our ocean.
killing our coral reefs, the ecosystems off my state in Tasmania, like our giant kelp forest, decimating our fisheries and biodiversity uh, in the womb of this planet, which is our ocean. It is insanity in this day and age to be doing exactly that. So what we actually need to do is have legislation in this place that stops all new oil and gas exploration. And the Greens have a bill before this august chamber to do exactly that, to amend the Offshore Petroleum uh, Oil and Gas Storage Act to ban all new fossil fuel exploration. But I totally accept uh, the spirit with which One Nation have brought this forward today, which is to actually get a benefit for the Australian people from the big, greedy oil and gas companies that currently pay very little tax, thanks to an overly generous, extremely generous and totally out of date uh, tax system that relates to the royalties on uh, oil and gas extraction from this country. I remember we actually called a number of witnesses before the Senate, uh, including the architects of the PRRT. And we, we put the simple question to them as senators. We said, why shouldn't this system be totally reformed? This system was set up for oil production in Bass Strait. Set up for oil production in Bass Strait in the late 80s and 1990s. Now what we have is vertical integration and massive multi-billion, in fact trillion dollar projects that extract gas. This was not set up for the gas market or the condensate market. And I remember speaking to Dr Craig Emerson, who was one of the architects of this, uh, this PRRT, and he said, well, Senator, if you change the system now, uh, it will lead uh, to sovereign risk. We won't see any more investment in new oil and gas projects. Now, yes, putting, putting in fact aside that I didn't have a problem with that, um, I don't accept that uh, changing a tax system purely for the benefits of corporation is in the public interest or not changing a tax system purely for the benefits of oil and gas uh, corporations is in the public interest. We have a duty to make sure that any mining company pays its fair share of tax in this country. Tax is not a dirty word. We need uh, royalties. We need resource rents. It is for you, Senator Scar. Uh, and we, it is for you Senator and the Liberal Scar. Party. I totally understand that. But for most Australians, they want to see corporations pay their fair share of tax because they know what it's like when they get a, a letter from the Australian Tax Office or a call from their accountant and they're told that they didn't fill their tax return in properly or well, they owe tax to the Australian Tax Office. Individuals in this country know what that's like. Why should corporations, because they have access to power and influence, get away without paying their fair share of tax? And once again, I am very proud to be part of a political party that has spent so much time and effort in this chamber over many, many years trying to get a fairer tax system for all Australians. Because if we had a fair tax system for all Australians, we wouldn't actually have a revenue crisis. We wouldn't have a revenue crisis. We would have the money we need to have a social security net, to invest in our people, in better health for Australians, in better education, all the kind of things, Senator Scar, I'm sure you would agree with to you, Chair, uh, you would agree with would be an investment in the Australian public uh, and in our future. But more importantly, we would have the money we need to actually pay to avert the biodiversity crisis we have in this country. We'd have money to fully fund our recovery plans for the 150 species and habitats that the previous government tried to have removed from the Environment Protection and Biodiversity and Conservation Act recovery plans because they were never resourced. We would have money in this country to assist farmers, to assist communities, to restore degraded habitat in both our oceans and on our land. We would actually have the revenue we need to pay for schools and hospitals and all those critical things. And that comes down to one thing. Do we have the courage as politicians, do we have the spine in this place to take on big corporations? Uh, Senator Pocock's talked about state capture in this place, and it is a very apt description for the polity that I have seen in the decade that I have been a senator in this place. And state capture is a simple concept. It means that big political parties are captured by vested interests through 
donations through other influence, and they deliver policies that those vested interests want. Well, I don't think the Australian public voted for that. I think they voted for change at the last election. A third of all Australians now haven't voted for major political parties. They voted for the Greens and for other parties. They want to see change. They want to see us break this state capture that, let me tell you, has absolutely paralysed climate action in this parliament, in this building, in the last 15, 20 years. I'm glad that we are finally moving on with some climate action in this parliament. And I know the Australian people support that. But if we really want to get to one and a half degrees warming, and I wanted to remind senators, if you believe in climate change and the science of climate change, and you look at the changes that we are seeing in Australia and around the planet, that is happening at one degree of warming above pre-industrial levels. Record floods, record heat waves, record fires, loss of habitat. That is happening at one degree of warming. The Paris Agreement wants to limit warming to one and a half degrees. That is a 50 per cent increase on what we've already got. That's not reducing the warming in the system by 50 per cent and taking us back to half a degree of warming or reducing the warming by 100 per cent, taking us back to 350 parts per million. That is already saying we wave the white flag and accept this planet is going to warm by another 50 per cent on what we've already seen. That's supposed to be a good thing. Yet the current government's plan is to have us on two degrees of warming. That's a 100 per cent increase on what we've already seen in our lifetimes. And under the previous government, we were on a business as usual scenario of three to four degrees of warming, which means that large parts of this planet won't be inhabitable. And I don't need to tell senators what the costs of that will be, uh, not just to the environment and to ecosystems and habitat, but to us as a species and to everything we love and everything we stand for. And the only thing that's going to fix that is systemic change, and systemic change means political change. It means coming in here with courage, standing up for policies and changes that will actually deliver at least limiting warming on this planet to one and a half degrees. So if we are serious about that, the most important thing we can do is stop all new oil and gas exploration offshore and onshore in this country. And you can be sure that's what the Greens stand for. That's what we will come into this place for and fight for every day. As we have fought through the swamp and desert years of the LNP over the last decade in this building, the swamp and desert years, we have been here fighting like hell, Senator Scar, every day for climate action, and that's what we do as a political party, and that's what we will continue to do. Every day we come in here, we are going to fight for our communities, we're going to fight for our ecosystems and for marine life and for the animals on this planet and all the things that First Nations communities, all the things that we put value on and we know the other Australians or many other Australians also put value on. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, and I call Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, this is the second time I've been given an opportunity to speak to this bill. I also spoke to this bill in the last parliament, and I acknowledge that the, uh, there are many laudable objectives that sit behind this uh, private senator's bill, and there has been a strong tradition in our system of uh, parliamentary democracy where the parliament determines that it is necessary to impose various laws to regulate the conduct of corporations, uh, be they taxation laws or be they conduct rules or be they consumer protection rules, so on and so forth. Um, we're now living through a period where we have uh, the greatest concentration of corporate power in the hands of the fewest possible hands. And I'm talking here most directly about the concentration of power inside the big technology companies. But it has been the same for uh, resources organisations and banking organisations. They have had, over the years, uh, a very strong concentration of power. And so um, when you look at the best way to manage that, 
I think it's very important to apply principles. I personally am a subscriber to the Menzian form of liberalism, uh, which dictates that you should have uh, the minimal uh, possible or the minimal amount of government regulation in order to promote private investment, uh, private capital coming into the market. Now, um, a couple of the key facts when you look at the resources sector or any major part of the Australian economy uh, always start with the fact that we don't have enough money to run this country. Uh, we never have, and that is why we have relied so heavily upon foreign capital uh, for these past 250 years. And as far as I can see, there are no pools of domestic capital which are going to come to the rescue and fund these major resources projects. Uh, certainly the major uh, pools of capital which may have been possible to use for this purpose uh, can't be used because the superannuation funds have a sole purpose test. They are only allowed to invest for the purposes of their members' retirement savings. And whatever we may think about that scheme, uh, that is, a, I think, a sound principle which should not be pierced at any, any time in the future. But uh, it is therefore the foreign investors that will be required to fund these projects. And I know that there are great debates about the use of fossil fuels. Uh, I think there is no doubt that there will be the need to use gas in the future for many decades. And whether you look at the view of the scientists, the chief scientists, former chief scientists, Alan Finkel, or whether you look at the major investors like Larry Fink at BlackRock, um, everyone is of the view that in the short to medium term there is going to be a need for gas. So the idea that we're not going to have any more gas uh, means that we're not going to have any more uh, electricity or any more lights on in Australia, which is very worrying, very, very concerning. So we are where we are. We, we need to get the gas out of the ground. Uh, there, will, there will be a need to fund that activity. And uh, as far as I can see, uh, there is no domestic pool of capital which is going to allow that to happen. And that's, that's where the foreign capital comes in. And we need to send the right signals to the market that we're not going to engage in undue sovereign risk. And certainly we have seen this movie before. Uh, we have seen Mr Connor and uh, his attempts to try and uh, engage in some sort of quasi-nationalisation of resources assets in the 1970s, which led to, I think it was 15 per cent inflation and a uh, major uh, economic catastrophe, which had to be uh, resolved with various measures. Um, so we have seen this movie before. I don't think we want to go back to that uh, particular uh, period. Uh, so we need to send the right signals that we as a country want to have that foreign investment. We want to have that foreign investment on the right basis. Uh, we will certainly be imposing conditions upon activity, corporate activity in Australia. And I think there is a, a case to be made uh, for some of these organisations to pay, pay more tax. Um, certainly my former profession of accounting has uh, done some good things for humanity, I'm sure, but it's also done <laughs> some uh, rather evil things. And I think that the transfer pricing, and the, which has led to the base erosion and profit shifting where effectively companies have been able to establish a, a mining uh, organisation in Singapore uh, is frankly outrageous. I mean, uh, I don't know that there's that many mines in Singapore. Uh, or many resources projects in Singapore, but certainly uh, they are managing to pay a very low rate of corporate tax in Singapore on the back of their significant projects undertaken in Australia. Now, I, I, I'm for lower taxes, and I think it's great that Singapore has been able to cut taxes. And I wish that we could have a similar trajectory here in Australia. I note that the UK is uh, now looking to reverse its uh, misguided policy of raising corporate taxes. And uh, we look forward to the UK heading back into a corporate tax uh, rate with, I think it's going to be 19. Uh, and, and so we should be seeking to compete with Singapore uh, as well as addressing the major issue of base erosion and profit shifting, which is uh, the mechanism by which the resources companies have been able to fleece Australian taxpayers of uh, taxation revenue. So I think that there are, there are um, certainly areas here that have been raised by the crossbench that are worthy of further consideration, certainly in terms of the, the tax uh, burden which is placed on some of these foreign multinationals. 
And um, as I say, I think we need to do it in a way which is not going to spook foreign investors, uh, but certainly I think we can do it in a way which is uh, at least going to return a better, a better return to the Australian taxpayers. So I, I, I would say to you that um, there are some laudable objectives here, and I think it's good that we have an opportunity to raise uh, the, some issues that are not the issues of the government of the day, and that's what we're here to do as a Senate. And uh, as I said, I was pleased to make a second contribution on this bill after making a contribution on it in the last parliament. And I would summarise my comments here by really reminding the Senate that it is very important that we are cognisant of the fact that we don't have enough domestic capital to fund these major projects. Now, for people that believe that these projects do need to be financed, uh, that finance needs to come from somewhere. Now, there is now there is no domestic there is no domestic pool of capital which is going to be able to meet this investment need. So therefore we need to send the right signals to the capital markets, the global capital markets, that we are a stable democracy uh, that has reasonable corporate laws, reasonable corporate laws that are clearly understood, uh, that don't have terms in those corporate laws which are not easily uh, understood or they are, they are too broad. In the case of this bill, I think there's no doubt that the benefit to the Australian community test would be a very, very broad test. It would be hard, to, hard for a court of law to define exactly what, what that, that is. And as, as a legislator, I don't think it's our role to um, hand pass our role uh, to the courts down the road and let them uh, effectively become the quasi-legislature. Uh, that is our role. And if people want to put a more specific concept on the table, then that's, they should do that. Uh, so that's, that, that's the first point. We don't want to spook foreign investors. We need to have clear corporate laws. And the, and the second point I want to make, or I want to summarise, is that in terms of taxation, and this is not a tax bill, I should, should note, I think there is a very strong case for some of these foreign multinationals to pay more tax. Uh, I, regr I regret very much that my uh, former colleagues in the accounting profession have uh, done so much uh, uh, damage to our taxation revenue collection system by devising these schemes. Uh, I do think that it's going to be difficult for us to resolve the base erosion and profit shifting issues without some sort of coordinate, coordinated effort with other like-minded countries, and I'm sure that um, we can do that in the years ahead. So, uh, I, I, as I say, I think there's some laudable objectives here, but I think we need to do a bit more work on it. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make my contribution to the, this bill on behalf of the Greens. And the bill is a very simple one. It exerts a, a new object into the Act, which will ensure that the exploration, oh, sorry, exploitation of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. And um, One Nation claims that this bill will fix the offshore uh, gas issue and that the government and the Australian community uh, don't profit enough from these projects. And Whilst the Greens agree that the fossil fuel companies don't pay their fair share of tax, we know that the problem goes uh, further than this. We also know that this bill is being worded too broadly to actually give it its desired effect. So the Greens believe that if we truly want to benefit the Australian community, these gas and oil reserves are best left in the ground. There's no other option to do that. We should be leaving it there because we now need to transition to renewable energy sources. This applies to offshore projects, which this bill relates to, but also onshore as well, as Senator Wish Wilson has already outlined. We are in a climate crisis, and the science could not be any clearer. No new fossil fuel projects should be approved, opened or expanded. Mm -hmm. Not one, but also definitely not 114 that are currently in the pipeline. And it's really not that hard to understand, but it appears that the major parties are still struggling, in particular when the global markets are indicating differently. And they're telling us that the customer wants cleaner, greener energy sources. Now, from the perspective of trade, and as the Australian uh, Green spokespersons for trade, um, we know that 65 per cent of this gas actually goes offshore. It goes through the trade uh, that we export to other nations around the world. And we need to make sure that we actually create that certainty for investors 
and the public with that environmental and social governance legislation and regulation that is required. It is already in the EU, it is already in the US and it is already in the UK. So we need that here. And we must do that to make sure that the customer there at the other end of the pipeline is happy with that greener, greener cleaner resource that we trade with them. And we, I think we need to think about the benefits not just in terms of money, but what does that drilling of dirty gas bring to our future generations? What message does that continuation of those fossil fuel projects send to them? Well, we know what that is because the, the case of those brave kids who tried to prove to the federal government, who claim that they didn't have a duty of care to protect future generations from the impacts of climate change. And Senator Wish Wilson's already outlined this. But this is about the assessment of those fossil fuel projects who were initially successful. These kids were initially successful, but had their hope ripped away from them when the then Environment Minister, Susan Lay from the opposition, spent taxpayer money appealing this case. I mean, what benefit does exploitation of gas and, uh, and, and oil accelerating the climate crisis bring to them. It's the legacy that we are passing on. And what we know is that the benefits to the rest of the global community, and even though in this place they will argue that scope three emissions don't matter, and in particular to small island nations who are already feeling the effects of climate change, and although we've, uh, you know, we think we've done the least to contribute to that, but in the Torres Strait Islands, in that landmark case from last week from the UN Human Rights Commission, they will argue, and they've won, that actually Article 27, the right to culture, Article 17, the right to free and arbitrary interference with privacy, family and home, were proven because we are not caring about the impact of these offshore gas projects on other nations. What are the benefits to our oceans that are becoming more acidic? The unique wildlife, the reefs are dying, the cultural heritage of our First Nations people. I'm glad Senator Pocock mentioned the Manupi clan of the Tiwi Islands, which I had the privilege to sit with and listen to their evidence on country. We need to think about whose land, sea and sky country this is and what the impact is on those people. And we cannot continue to ignore the voice of First Nations people at every step right through to rehabilitation. We also cannot ignore First Nations businesses that need to be involved in this. We can't ignore First Nations Indigenous knowledges and science, and they must be incorporated in all of this. This bill specifically deals with offshore projects, which are all happening on unceded sea country that traditional owners have not provided their free prior and informed consent to. And on top of that, we need to legislate the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People which authorise us to be able to provide that free prior informed consent. But for over 200 years, our voices have been ignored. Our culture is continually being destroyed in this country. And if the government really wants to give First Nations people a voice, this bill does not require a referendum. And it will have immediate impact on acknowledging our sovereignty. And the, with gas being the largest polluter in Australia, it's as dirty as coal. And it's overwhelming that, like coal, the majority of the gas is extracted in Australia and, as I said, exported. It is not for domestic use. That is a myth, and one of the biggest myths that is being bandied around in this place and throughout the media and to, to the Australian public. It is the case because huge amounts of energy, the dirty energy, is needed to extract and, progress and process that gas into liquid so that it can be exported. They're burning that. The meat Global Methane Pledge says that. So we have to listen to the science. PRRT is a huge issue. We need to crack down on tax avoidance in Australia. And big companies need to pay their fair share, as Senator Wish Wilson has already outlined. And I'm glad to hear that Senator Bragg and others in this place have been part of the previous Senate inquiries into PRRT. And this is about making sure they pay their fair share of rent in this country. As Senator Wish Wilson said, there is no business in Australia or globally that gets their resources for free and sells them on for profit. And this is what's happening in this country with these gas companies. We have to make sure also that these companies are not a revolving door for ministers. They grant leases and exemptions and funding for these companies to continue 
the climate wrecking projects that they once rolled out into their cushy jobs with the same companies. We know that those major parties have the stronghold, and I'm so glad to see this uh, united on the crossbench. Um, but it's really no surprise that they're against any attempt to ensure that paying uh, co corporates in this uh, country pay their fair share of tax. These companies are eroding their democracy. Senator uh, Pocock also talked about state, state capture and the importance of our democracy, destroying our planet, wrecking our cultural heritage of First Nations people around the country. And unfortunately, the governments in this place have been letting them do that. They are letting them continue to do that because they're too scared to stand up to them and do what the public actually wants them to do, to enact change and say no to new, new fossil fuel projects. This is happening from the Barossa to the Beedaloo to Narrabri and to Scarborough in my home state. We need change and we need it now. What we have to do is make sure that in that PRRT changes that they are the Australian Tax Office has already named those gas companies, Chevron one of them, being systemic non-payers of tax, despite Australia's gas exporters earning more than $50 billion in exports. The Tax Office says that they don't expect any significant revenue to be paid under the existing tax system until the mid-2030s. That is unreal. Last year, uh, sorry, in 2017, Shell admitted that they would never pay PRRT tax, and especially on their 25 per cent share of the Gorgon project. The last election was very clear in their message. The Australian public wants meaningful change on climate action, and that's what we, we want to emphasise in this, is meaningful. I'd like to take, to, to, to take this chance to remind the government um, that, yet again, we are not seeking to just reduce climate emissions by 43 per cent. We now need to be ambitious to do that to 75 per cent. And we cannot keep opening new fossil fuel projects. We cannot claim to care for the environment by supporting climate and environmental wrecking projects like Beedaloo and Barossa. Mm -hmm. And you cannot claim to care for First Nations people and their voice while you're ignoring their opposition of drilling in their sea country, fracking on their country and removing their sacred rock art. You cannot do that. So whilst the Greens support this bill in principle, we do not support One Nation's move to prevent members from contributing in the second reading debate. And my, um, mine is uh, cut short because, I mean, this is the place of debate and we shouldn't be trying to gag that. Um, why well, I'm proposing that the second reading... Sorry? No, excuse me, Senator Cox. Just continue your, contri continue your contribution Senator through Scott, the. Hang please on, continue your contribution? contribution through the chair. Thank you, Senator Cox. Yep. Yeah. Senators. Thank you. Um, the Greens are proposed. Can I seek leave to make further my further comments? Yes. You still Thank have you. time for contribution. Yes. The Greens are proposing a second reading amendment, which has been circulated. And for this basis, we need to um, remove that uh, the motion adds. But the Senate is of the opinion that offshore oil and gas industry is a major contributor to climate change and is to the benefit of the Australian community that no new fossil, pro uh, fossil fuel projects are opened. And B calls on the government to introduce a 10 per cent Commonwealth royalty for gas extraction credible against PRRT and end all public sub subsidies of coal, oil and gas and implement a long-term strategy to ensure industry covers the full cost of on offshore decommissioning informed by overseas models that are underpinned by transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. So you'll be seeking leave to move your second reading amendment as circulated on page 1661. Thank you very much. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move that the question be now put. Uh, Senator Roberts, we will attend to the second reading amendment that's been moved by Senator Cox in the first instance. So the question before the chair is that the second reading amendment as circulated by Senator Cox be agreed to. All of those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Cox and circulated on sheet 1661 be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Scar, teller for the noes.
gentlemen. There being 12 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we'll now move to the following question that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The eyes will move to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts for the eyes and I appoint Senator Scar for the nose.
There being six ayes and 42 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Senators. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day, Number 21, Parliamentary Privileges Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill, 2022, Second Reading Debate. Thank you, Senators. Before I call Senator Lambie, would uh, Senators please resume their seats or move out of the chamber in an orderly fashion? Thank you very much. Senator Lambie. Lot on this, mate. Thank, you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Royal Commission in Defence and Veterans Suicide was forced to extend its inquiry by 12 months in April, partly because it's had trouble getting important information out of the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defence. Commissioner Nick Caldas was asked about it in an ABC interview with Patricia Cavellis last month, and it's worth documenting his response. Patricia referenced the DVA in defence delays and asked, has information been more forthcoming over the past few months since the inquiry was extended? Commissioner, Commissioner Caldas replied, and I quote, not as yet, we're still waiting for some things to be resolved. Patricia Cavellis said then, and I quote, I consider that, please correct me if I'm wrong, quite alarming, you're a Royal Commission. Does it concern you that you're a Royal Commission with Royal Commission powers and that you've found it so difficult? The Commissioner told, told it to her straight, and I quote, yes, it does. This bill addresses one of the biggest barriers stopping the Royal Commission from doing its job, parliamentary privilege. I don't move it lightly. Parliamentary privilege has protected the same witnesses and whistleblowers who felt, fought so hard to get this Royal Commission established in the first place. It protects people who, can, who have come to me and told me the most horrific things going on in defence. It gave me the power to fight for them. But the Parliamentary Privileges Act isn't working well when it comes to the Royal Commissions. It gets, it gets in the way when, it, when those Royal Commissions need to examine the actions of government. Instead of protecting people with no power, it's shielding people in power from scrutiny. That's why the Veterans Suicide Royal Commissions hit roadblocks. The Royal Commission wants to ask the hard questions. They want to bring defence officials and officials from the Department of Veterans Affairs on the stand and drill down on them, and so they should. That is why we are having a Royal Commission to find answers. It's what we set them up to do, but they don't do it. Don't take it from me, take it from the Royal Commission itself. The interim report says that privilege, and I quote, implodes transparency surrounding government decisions and acts as a shield for the executive from accountability for their commitments and actions taken to implement matters subject to privilege, end quote. That's because parliamentary privilege prevents courts and tribunals including royal commissions, from drawing infer 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 inferences or conclusions from a re from report or inquiry that is subject to its protection. That's why the Royal Commission says it can't inquire into the work and outcomes of prior Senate inquiries and auditor general reports of all things, even though its terms of references require it to do so. The Royal Commission can't tender documents subject to privilege and draw conclusions from them. This is ridiculous. It can't ask, witness, it can't ask witnesses who worked on audits of defence and DVO programs to give evidence about their investigation. Not if it wants to use that evidence to make any meaningful findings anyway. And if it wants to use evidence that's subject to privilege in its findings, the only way to do that is to redraw that evidence from witnesses. It has to redo the work that is already done, and it has to rerun the inquiry. Absolutely pointless. And why would we put people through this again and again? It has to tiptoe around everything we've done in Parliament up to this point. All that work that's come before, 
all the work we did in the Senate, the Royal Commission can't use it to come to any conclusion about what the government's been up to all these years. It's such a terrible waste. Take what happened with the 2021 Auditor General report into the successes and failures of culture reform strategies in defence. The report matters to the Royal Commission. It made a number of recommendations on how to improve health, wellbeing and safety of Australian Defence Force members. Defence's response to the audit is relevant to the terms of reference for the Royal Commission's inquiry. It's publicly available on the ANAO's website and has probably been downloaded thousands and thousands of times. But the Royal Commission, of all things, hasn't been able to use the report in any meaningful way. Council assisting the Royal Commission found that parliamentary privilege prevents them from asking defence representatives questions about the report because they can't make any kind of finding or conclusion from evidence that's subject to privilege. They wanted to show parts of the report on screens at one of the Royal Commission's public hearing, hearings. They wanted to tender it, to refer to it in questioning. But parliamentary privilege prevented it from doing so. The risk of being accused of making findings from protected information was too great. They had to make clear that the Royal Commissioners should not make any conclusions or findings based on the Auditor General's work. All that work, and it's absolutely useless to them. The Council assisting the Royal Commission make it through by looking for official documents that were published outside Parliament and that reference the findings and outcomes of inquiry reports. How ridiculous! What a waste of time when the reports are sitting there, ready to go in their hot little hands. In one case, they were lucky enough to find an official document outlining the recommendations and government responses to the 2017 Senate inquiry report, the constant battle, suicide by veterans. They used this document instead of the report itself because they had to to get people in the witness box and look at what the Australian government did in response to the inquiry's recommendations. It worked then, but it's not sustainable, not by a long shot. I mean, we've had 17 reviews in 17 years in the Department of Veterans Affairs itself. I don't know how many times Defence has been through the audit, the audit office on different things associated with their personnel. This is absolutely ridiculous. All this work that's been done up here, they are prevented from using it. It is as simple as that. Instead, they've got to go through paper by paper to see what's in that. And that is a, not a good way of doing, doing an investigation and is not sustainable, not by a long shot. We can't have a situation where it comes down to pure luck whether the Royal Commission can get to the, get the, to the evidence it needs to meet its terms of reference. This Royal Commission has been hard won by thousands of veterans and their families. They knew it was our only shot to call out the terrible failures of government that led to hundreds of veterans taking their lives. There's nothing higher than a Royal Commission. We have nowhere else to go. This is the pinnacle for us. But even here, in an inquiry with the strongest investigative powers that you can imagine, we see how far executive government will go to avoid transparency and avoid accountability. It just goes to show how hard it is to get to the bottom of the terrible problems with defence and veterans affairs. That's why we're moving to enact recommendation of seven of the Royal Commission's interim report. The provisions of this bill follow the Royal Commission's recommendation precisely to exempt Royal Commissions from section 16 3C of the Parliamentary Privileges Act, where their terms of reference require examination of government, exactly what the Royal Commission asked for. I know it's a serious thing to open up an exemption to privilege, but seriously, there is no other way around this. Trust me, we're pulling our hair out in my office. And if Royal Commissions say they have a problem, then they have a problem. We need to fix it so they can get on with their job. I thought that's what we're here to do. Not stand here as obstructionists so they can't get their job done. 
and we certainly can't ignore what they are telling us. We've got to find a way to make sure Commissioner Cowardice and the other commissioners can turn over every stone, every rock, and get to the bottom of what's going so terribly wrong in Defence and Department of Veterans Affairs and why we are having so many suicides in our military. It's not a hard, it's not a hard ask. So Senator Tyrrell and I will talk to anyone and everyone about how to fix the problems the Royal Commission has found. That's why I hope to send this bill to an inquiry. It will be a quick inquiry because it will need the best legal minds out there to be there so we can thrash out the issues that the Royal Commission has raised. But we've got to act now and we've got to act fast. Time is not on a veteran's side, I can assure you, when it comes to the Royal Commission. The sooner the Royal Commission can get its job done, the sooner we can get it wrapped up and then sooner, hopefully, we will have less people trying to take their lives out there who have served their country. That is the whole purpose of having the Royal Commission. So the Royal Commission has been too hard won for us to stuff, up, stuff it up now. And all those people who rocked up on cold mornings to protest, the mums who came to parliament to tell the PM about their sons they had lost, the brave soldiers and the veterans who have stood up and given evidence, even though it hurts, even though it takes them back to a dark place, everyone we've lost, our veterans and our defence personnel are relying on making this Royal Commission a success and to find the answers that we need. This has to be our last inquiry into veterans' suicide. It has to be, because, like I said, 17 inquiries in 17 years, we can't go through any more. We can't keep reliving our stories and watching the failure of future governments not fix these issues. So I call on Labor today, today to take this seriously. Come to the table and help us figure this out. You helped us win this fight, and veterans don't, haven't forgotten that. But now you're in government and you're responsible for making sure this inquiry, the last inquiry we'll hopefully ever have, you're responsible for making it work. You are now in government. Yes, and that means hard decisions, and yes, that will mean upsetting some of the uh, apple cart here. So I'm asking you to be brave, because sometimes we have to be that way in life to get things done. So it's up to Labor now to make this happen, but like I said, it is extremely time sensitive. There is nothing else I have up my sleeve or anybody else can tell me that is higher than a Royal Commission to slow down these veteran suicides. I'm very clear that I can never stop, or that we can never stop, veteran suicide. But sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, if we do this properly, we can sure as hell reduce them. And we have one chance at this. This is our last one. So I'm asking you, give the Royal Commission everything it needs, because I need somebody else to come up with the answers, because I've run out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Cash. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to speak today to the Parliamentary Privileges Amendment Royal Commission Bill 2022. And this is a bill that before us today raises issues fundamental to our parliamentary democracy. Um, in the first instance, though, can I recognise the passion shown by Senator Lambie and her commitment to veterans throughout Australia? Uh, the amendment arises from the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide Interim Report. You will recall that the Royal Commission was set up by the former coalition government in 2021, and its clear intent was to reduce deaths by suicide within our veterans community. I think that uh, without a doubt we'd all agree the death of any ADF member or a veteran is tragic, and it is deeply felt by the entire community. In the 2021-22 budget, the former coalition government provided $174 million to fund the Royal Commission and examine the systemic issues surrounding the death by suicide of veterans. There is no doubt that the Royal Commission provided very clear acknowledgement of the issues involved. And I think it was an extremely important process for the families of our defence veterans and indeed a part of the healing process for some families. That process to share their stories and experiences while extremely distressing, will be of enormous value to all future members of our Defence Forces 
and I pay tribute to those who were involved in this way. We know this is a highly sensitive and complex issue and that there are deep, deep emotional scars that relate to these issues. The Interim Royal Commission report was tough reading, but the coalition was prepared for this. Our commitment to serving Australian Defence Force members and veterans is sacrosanct and required no stone left unturned to address defence and veteran suicide. Our support for Australian veterans and their families was in recognition of the service and sacrifice that they have made to keep our nation safe and secure. In terms of the bill before us, the bill before us deals with the issue of parliamentary privilege arising from one of the recommendations in the Royal Commission interim report. As we know in this place, parliamentary privilege refers to special legal rights and immunities which apply to each House of Parliament, its committees and members, and it is a fundamental part and process of what we do here. We are given a special legal status because it is recognised that there are tasks performed here that require additional powers and protections. Special rights and immunities are necessary because of the functions in this place. For example, we need to be able to debate matters of importance freely, to discuss grievances and to conduct investigations effectively without interference. Section 49 of the Commonwealth Constitution provides that until declared by the parliament, the powers, privileges and immunities of the Senate and the House of Representatives and the members and committees of each House shall be those of the British House of Commons at the time of federation, being 1901. It was not until 1987 and following a thorough review of the whole subject by a joint select committee that the Commonwealth Parliament passed comprehensive legislation in this area. The Parliamentary Privileges Act described the proceedings in Parliament to which privilege will apply as all words spoken and acts done in the course of or for the purposes of or incidental to the transacting of the business of a House or of a committee. It includes but is not limited to a the giving of evidence before a House or committee and evidence so given, b the presentation or submission of a document to a House or committee, c the preparation of a document for purposes of or incidental to the transacting of any business, and d the formulation, making or publication of a document, including a report, by or pursuant to an order of a House or a committee, and the documents so formulated, made or published. The Act prevents this Royal Commission from receiving or tendering evidence of the nature that I have just described for the purpose of a questioning or relying on the truth, motive, intention or good faith of anything forming part of those proceedings in Parliament, b questioning or establishing the credibility, motive, intention or good faith of any person, c drawing or inviting the drawing of interferences or conclusions wholly or partly from anything forming part of those proceedings in Parliament, or d going beyond providing an occurrence of events in Parliament, including what was said in the course of parliamentary proceedings. The privilege of freedom of speech is often described as the most important of all privileges. Its origins date from the British Bill of Rights of 1689, and Article 9 of the Bill of Rights provides that the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of the Parliament. As this was one of the privileges of the House of Commons in 1901, it was inherited by the House and the Senate under the terms of the Commonwealth Constitution. Section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act preserves the application of the traditional expression of this privilege, but spells out in some detail just what may be covered by the term 
proceedings in Parliament. The practical effect of this is that those taking part in proceedings in Parliament enjoy absolute privilege. It is well known that members may not be sued if they make defamatory statements when taking part in debates in a House. But the privilege is wider than that and, for instance, protects members from being prosecuted if in a debate they make a statement that would otherwise be a criminal offence. The privilege of freedom of speech has been described as a privilege of necessity. It enables members and senators to raise matters they would not otherwise be able to bring forward, at least not without fear of the legal consequences. The privilege is thus a very, very great one. And it is recognised that it carries with it a corresponding obligation that it should always be used responsibly. The privilege of freedom of speech is not limited to members and senators in the parliament. It also applies to others taking part in proceedings in parliament. The most obvious examples of others who may enjoy absolute privilege are witnesses who give evidence to committees. Parliamentary privilege provides parliamentarians in both houses of parliament with freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in parliament. It does so by preventing courts and tribunals from interfering in these matters. As such, it upholds the separation of powers doctrine within the Australian Constitution. Parliamentary privilege extends to royal commissions because they are included in the definition of tribunals. The proposed amendment to the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987 would mean royal commissions and other tribunals could have evidence tendered or received, ask questions or statement submissions or comments made concerning proceedings in parliament for the purpose of drawing or inviting the drawing of inferences or conclusions wholly or partly from anything forming part of those proceedings in the parliament. Royal commissions already have extraordinary powers which go far beyond the powers of a criminal court. The ancient rights of parliamentary privilege must be preserved so proceedings of the parliament can be carried out without hesitation. Members of parliament, witnesses before committees and the reports of committees are subject to parliamentary privilege to ensure the parliament can access all information required for its deliberation and processes. This protection is important to prevent those participating in parliamentary processes and can ensure that they can engage without hesitation and it ensures the primacy of the parliament in our democracy. And Acting Deputy President, on that basis, the coalition will not be supporting the bill. Senator McCarthy. I'm pleased to speak to this private senator's bill on behalf of the Labor government. And I too would like to acknowledge Senator Lambie's deep commitment to the scourge of suicide in the ADF and the veterans community and your advocacy for and support of that community. The death by suicide of any Australian is a tragedy, and it is a sorry fact that the rate of suicide among veterans of the Australian Defence Force is significantly higher than across the broader Australian community. This country has lost more serving and former ADF personnel to suicide than it has in operations over 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq. ADF members, veterans and their families are right to demand that this crisis be addressed. And that is why, when in opposition, Labor joined with families who had lost loved ones to this crisis to call for the establishment of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. And the former government 
resisted taking that step for quite some time. But Labor thought the need for this commission was obvious and absolutely compelling, and we strongly supported its establishment and we continue to support its work. Labor welcomed the Royal Commission's interim report, and we released that report on the 11th of August 2022, immediately after we received it from the Commission. We wanted the Commission's recommendations to be able to be considered publicly at the earliest opportunity. The government has been closely considering the recommendations made by the Royal Commission in its interim report. And we will this very afternoon release its formal response to each and every one of those recommendations to the parliament and to the public and indicate how the government proposes to address those recommendations. The Defence and Veterans Community, the Royal Commission, the parliament and the Australian public are entitled to see the government respond to the full swathe of recommendations made by the Royal Commission. At this moment, I will not preempt that formal response by the government. However, I would like to make some brief observations about the bill that Senator Lambie has brought before the Senate. This bill deals with one particular recommendation in the Royal Commission's interim report. Recommendation 7 of the interim report recommends that where the terms of reference require an examination of government, Royal Commissions should be made exempt from section 16.3c of the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987, Commonwealth. Parliamentary privilege is a fundamental feature of our democratic system and of our parliamentary tradition. Section 16 of the modern Parliamentary Privileges Act descends from Article 9 of the UK Bill of Rights 1689 which declares that proceedings in parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. This principle is important not because it's very old, but because it is essential even today. None of us in this place could do our work, represent our communities, serve the country as parliamentarians without the proper and appropriate protection that is provided by parliamentary privilege. As Senator Lambie noted in her second reading speech on this bill on 7 September 2022, it is parliamentary privilege that protects whistleblowers who wish to raise matters, including those the subject of this Royal Commission. It is parliamentary privilege that ultimately protects us as parliamentarians when we seek to advocate on behalf of the vulnerable, to take on powerful vested interests and to shine a light in some very dark places. Now, Senator Lambie also says that parliamentary privilege should not stand in the way of the proper role of a royal commission, and, and I agree. I want to note in respect of that that the particular protection given to proceedings in parliament, the subject of section 16.3c of the Parliamentary Privileges Act and of this bill, is quite confined, and that provision reads, three, in proceedings in any court or tribunal, it is not lawful for evidence to be tendered or received, questions asked or statements, submissions or comments made concerning proceedings in parliament by way of or for the purpose of, c, drawing or inviting the drawing of inferences or conclusions wholly or partly from anything forming part of those proceedings in parliament. Mr Deputy President, the Australian Law Reform Commission has considered the effect this provision may have on a Royal Commission. And the Law Reform Commission noted in a 2009 report that the privilege of freedom of speech may prevent Royal Commissions or the rec recommended official inquiries from investigating allegations of misconduct made in parliament. In practice, however, a number of inquiries have investigated such claims or conducted investigations touching on the proceedings of parliament. Although courts have differed on this issue, it appears that royal commissions or official inquiries will infringe parliamentary privilege 
if they inquire into the motives, intentions or truthfulness of a speaker in parliament or allow witnesses to be cross-examined in relation to words spoken or documents tabled in parliament. Mr Deputy President, in considering this present bill, it is important to note, again, as Senator Lambie has already done in her second reading speech, that privilege does not prevent a Royal Commission for using the proceedings of Parliament for other purposes. That might be, for example, as background material or to establish matters of fact. And importantly, again, as Senator Lambie noted, it does not prevent a Royal Commission from obtaining its own evidence on matters put before Parliament, for instance, by seeking evidence from witnesses who have previously given evidence to parliamentary inquiries. Royal Commissions are very serious affairs, and this Royal Commission in particular is conducting an inquiry into an issue of the utmost seriousness for our country. And we must make sure that both Royal Commissions and the Parliament are able to do their work. As I've said, this government will be formally responding to the recommendations made by the Royal Commission in its interim report this afternoon. We will work with Senator Lambie and indeed all senators in addressing those recommendations and doing what we must to tackle the crisis of suicide in the defence and veterans community. Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, yes, Senator Shoebridge. Um, I, I rise to speak to uh, Senator Lambie's Parliamentary Privileges Amendment Royal Commission's Response Bill 2022. Yeah, I have, and I, sorry, Senator, I, uh, there was a, a leave was sought to continue oh, I see. the remarks, so therefore it, it comes a technical adjournment. That's why, I, with respect, I looked at, I looked at you. Ah. Probably my apologies well, for not explaining. It's, it's, it's my paused. apologies for not being wise. I, I, would, I, I would just seek to make a brief contribution on the bill. He's just ask, for, ask me for leave? I'd seek leave. If that's is leave right. granted? Leave is granted. Senator Shoebridge, you, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, um, I, I rise to speak briefly to the Parliamentary Privileges Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, and I do thank Senator Lambie for bringing it to the Senate in such a timely fashion. Um, we have, I think, all seen in this chamber, but I think perhaps more in our work with constituents, particularly veterans, the impact of veteran suicides on the Defence Force, but on other veterans, on their families and on the broader defence community. Um, it has been genuinely shocking to me to see the lack of care, the systemic failures in dealing with veterans in the short time that I've had the portfolio of dealing with veterans on behalf of the Greens. Um, I've said before and I say it again, I don't hold the current government responsible for the mess that the system's in, but I do hold the government responsible for navigating the way through and fixing the system and doing it with the degree of urgency that the interim report has shown is needed. One of the key problems, though, that we saw from the interim report has been the way in which the Royal Commission, under very effective leadership, um, has not had the ability to look in detail and then draw inferences and conclusions from a series of parliamentary committee reports, auditor general reports, government reports and government responses. Um, and, and, it's, and it's in response to those very real practical concerns um, that we saw recommendation seven of the interim report uh, issued and, and issued to the parliament. And that, that recommendation reads, recommendation seven, to provide exemption from parliamentary privilege where their terms of reference require an examination of government, royal commissions should be made exempt from section 16.3c of the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987. Now, Deputy President, the royal commission made this recommendation because parliamentary privilege in the broader sense had been prohibiting the royal commission from drawing the conclusions or inferences from previous reports created by parliamentary committees, tabled, with this, uh, tabled in parliament or um, as part of the broader parliamentary business. And I, I quote from the, from the report. Um, the, the Royal Commission said, 
A number of other reports prepared by the Auditor General, as well as the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, are directly relevant to, report, to, our work, to our work. These reports are subject to privilege, meaning we cannot draw inferences or conclusions from them. The Royal Commission went on to say how this directly impeded its work. And they said this. This leaves us unable to inquire into the work and outcomes of prior critical reports. It, it hampers our ability to learn from that which came before. This risks an unnecessary duplication of effort. It impedes transparency surrounding government decisions and acts as a shield for the executive from accountability for their commitments and actions taken to implement matters subject to privilege. Now, Deputy President, I stop there to remind the Senate that the Royal Commission is inquiring into defence and veteran suicide. And as has been commented on in this debate and outside, our defence forces have lost more personnel through suicide um, than we've lost in all of the armed conflicts they've been involved in from Iraq to Afghanistan onwards. That, that is a chilling reminder of, why the, of the importance of this work. And to see that the Royal Commission has been hampered in that work gives, I think, places an obligation on us to see what we can do to remedy that. Now, this bill seeks to amend it but does it in a very broad way. Um, um, adopting the recommendations, the wording of the recommendations, and I acknowledge Senator Lambie has done that, but does it by removing the limitation in 163C of the Parliamentary Privileges Act that prohibits the drawing of inferences from, and I quote from the bill, anything forming part of proceedings in parliament, end quote. Now that is potentially broader than is needed to deal with the concerns raised in the interim report which are really limited to, to reports, to responses, and to that kind of formal exchange and documentation. And there are a series of reports, not least the DLA Piper report, uh, as, as, as we were discussing earlier. There are a series of reports, Auditor General reports, Parliamentary Committee reports, that should be in front of this Royal Commission, not just to note, but to have a look at some of the structural failures. And not just structural failures in defence, but structural failures in this place. That has, that has seen these reports tabled but failed to take the action. And that's, that has been one of the core limitations you can read um, if you read in detail. But I think it's chapter six of the interim report. Um, so, so addressing that is important to veterans, but doing it in a way that respects and, and promotes parliamentary privilege is the real challenge. And, and if, there is area to explore, I think, in narrowing the scope of this bill and potentially a short, sharp inquiry to take the relevant submissions to get the balance between balance right. And, and on balance, I'll finish by reading on, if you like, the two, two sides of the argument. Um, um, and I, I'll read again from the interim report, um, uh, um, paragraph four, 41 onwards. We, we acknowledge the customary importance of parliamentary privilege to ensure that the parliament can debate and investigate matters of public importance effectively and without interference. But for a Royal Commission tasked with investigating systemic issues contributing to suicide, the origins of which may be the action or inaction of government and departments which have been subject to numerous prior reviews, privilege has hindered our work. Our terms of reference require us to consider the findings and recommendations of, relevant, of previous relevant reports and inquiries, including any assessment of the adequacy and extent of implementation of those recommendations. In this Royal Commission, parliamentary privilege extends to a number of reports prepared for or by parliamentary committees which consider the same matters or matters directly relevant to our terms of reference. We are concerned that parliamentary privilege is not limited to tendering documents or asking questions that might make or imply a conclusion about a decision of parliament. Privilege extends to inviting the drawing of any inferences or conclusions from part of a report of inquiry, even if that inference would not impinge on parliament or any of its members. That is what is frustrating the Royal Commission, and you can understand why. But again, we come back to this, the importance of parliamentary privilege. And I say this from the position of a party that does not have a majority. Um, and I acknowledge as well independence. Um, parliamentary privilege is essential for whistleblowers to know they have protection when they come to us. It's important for us um, to be able to hold powerful corporations and interests to account. It's important, essential for us to do the work. And, and Odgers indicates that. Odgers, um, in its Australian Senate practice says this in relation to privilege, and, and particularly focusing on the Senate. The law of parliamentary privilege is particularly important so far as the Senate is concerned, because it's the foundation of the Senate's ability to perform its legislative functions with the appropriate degree of independence of the House of Representatives and of the executive government, which usually controls that House. 
Parliamentary privilege exists for the purpose of enabling the Senate to effectively carry out its functions. The primary functions of the Senate are to inquire, to debate and to legislate, and any analysis of parliamentary privilege must be related to the way in which it assists and protects those functions. Although the relevant law is the same for both houses and is analysed accordingly in this chapter, it is particularly significant for the Senate and must constantly be borne in mind. So our party is very aware of the, how essential parliamentary privilege is and, and adopts in whole those the, that, that observation in Odgers. Um, we do, however, commend Senator Lambie for bringing this bill, and we do think that there is a powerful argument to explore it in detail in a brief committee inquiry um, in order um, to check if we can get that balance right. And we don't have forever to wait. This Royal Commission's time is running out. Veterans can't wait. If we are going to do this, we should act with some haste. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak uh, in relation to this private members bill, and I am speaking against, but I want to make some very clear preliminary comments. The first is uh, I have the utmost and greatest respect for Senator Lambie in relation to her fearless advocacy on behalf of veterans and their families in relation to this subject matter. And I've said that in this place before. I've said that outside of this place. And I'll say it to people when I cease to be sitting in this place. Uh, you really should be congratulated through you, Deputy President, uh, for her fearless advocacy in this area. The second point I want to make is reading the interim report from the commissioners, one can sense the palpable uh, frustration that they have in relation to how the exercise of parliament, parliamentary privilege is, in their view, uh, acting as an obstacle with respect to the discharge of their responsibilities. And indeed, in the letters patent which established the Royal Commission, there is an obligation upon the Royal Commissioners to act expeditiously to conduct the inquiry as quickly as they can. And the particular uh, document which they or one of the documents they were seeking to interrogate in particular was an Auditor General's report with respect to the culture in the Defence Force. And they're frustrated uh, that they feel as if they're being impeded by the operation of parliamentary privilege in that respect. However, parliamentary privilege is an absolute foundational building block of the, of the institution of the Australian Parliament. It is a fundamental building block. And whilst I heard Senator Shoebridge and his contribution talk about a quick inquiry to see if there's a, a workaround, etc., this is not something. This is not something that should be abandoned quickly or changed quickly. Um, in the uh, in the concern that we should try and assist the commissioner's report, this is a really important issue, and we need to tread extremely carefully in relation to this matter. And I'm going to expand on that. Uh, during the course of my remarks. So yesterday in this place, uh, I actually dove into the, uh, the development of parliamentary privilege uh, in our Westminster system, the uh, development of the Bill of Rights in 1689 and what actually led up to the Bill of Rights in 1689 which, in the United Kingdom, which forms the foundation for the principles of parliamentary privilege. And this was a time, the 17th century in, in England, where there was gross interference, gross interference with the operation of parliament. Literally, members of parliament were put in the Tower of London for expressing views with respect to the arbitrary treatment of citizens, with respect to uh, taxation measures which they considered to be illegal, and with respect to criticism with respect to the, uh, the crown, uh, the monarch, and how the monarch operated. Literally, they were arrested after giving speeches in Parliament and put in to the Tower of London. And that was the whole genesis, the whole genesis of the Bill of Rights, uh, which contains in this article, Article 9, which is the foundation stone of our parliamentary privilege here in Australia. And I quote, that the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings, or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament." End quote. So the purpose, the fundamental purpose of that Article 9 of the Bill of Rights is to make sure that all of us here in this place and in the House of Representatives 
in, in the course of our committee work, in the course of documents, submissions which are prepared for the purposes of parliament, it is all intended. That Article 9, going back to 1689, is intended to make sure that none of those proceedings, none of those processes are capable of being impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. And specifically in terms of our law under the Parliamentary Privileges Act, which I'll get to, that includes royal commissions. So that has been a long-standing foundation stone in relation to our system. Now, I just want to make a few comments in relation to the operation of the Royal Commission. And, uh, I had a look at Odgers, and Senator Shoebridge quoted from Odgers in relation to this matter, and there is very useful information in Odgers on Australian Senate practice, the 14th edition, with respect to the development of parliamentary privilege. And I just want to quote from page 68. In 1983, the Royal Commission on Australia's Security and Intelligence Agencies accepted in the course of its proceedings that it did not have the power to inquire into statements made in parliament. The Royal Commission inquiring into the Oil for Food program in 2006 went further in warning council to familiarise themselves with section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act before they tried to question Commonwealth ministers on their parliamentary statements. And then in the Latest supplement to Odgers that continues on page four. Numerous commissions of inquiries have traversed the same ground, and this is the important point. Numerous commissions of inquiry have traversed the same ground as parliamentary committees and have done so without infringing parliamentary privilege. For instance, in 2017, the Select Committee on Lending to Primary Production Customers recommended that the newly established Royal Commission into Misconduct in Banking superannuation and financial services industry considered the evidence published by the committee in the course of its inquiry. While the Royal Commission had access to the information published by the committee, so the Royal Commission in this case has access to that Auditor General's report in particular, parliamentary privilege limits its use so that while people could not be directly questioned on their parliamentary evidence, that is the evidence in the course of producing the Auditor General's report, the Commission could use the material, could use the material to develop its own lines of inquiry. End quote. And that is the uh, that is the difference in terms of um, that's the boundary in terms of the limits on the use of what has been prepared for Parliament. And with respect to the Auditor General's report in particular, I quote from um, an article by. Uh, Australia's probably leading constitutional law professor, Ann Toomey, can parliamentary privilege be used to shut down parliamentary accountability? And I quote, the Auditor General is an officer of parliament whose performance audit reports are prepared for the purpose of tabling and debate in parliament and therefore attract parliamentary privilege. The information analysis in these reports provide crucial support to the parliament's role of scrutinising the executive in relation to its spending of public monies. End quote. So that report that was referred to by the Senator Scar will be in continuance. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Social Security Administration Amendment, repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022. Second reading debate. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, and I rise today to speak on the repeal of the cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022. Well, today we're about to see another embarrassing backflip by the Albanese Labor government as it appears that they're about to move amendments that will extend the cashless debit card in Australia. So the Labor government have misled the Australian public with promises during the election campaign and now embarrassingly you are now having to admit that it was a thoughtless grab for votes. The amendments that we are about to see allow Cape York, the cashless debit card trial sites and those people in the Northern Territory who have voluntarily transitioned from the basics card onto the cashless debit card to remain on the cashless debit card. Uh, this is just an admission that they messed up this ill-conceived election commitment. The amendments put forward by the government confirm that even they have had to admit that abolishing the cashless debit card is a really stupid idea. They have now provisioned for $50 million to support drug and alcohol support services 
because they themselves understand the social harm that is likely to result by the removal of this card from the communities, the vulnerable communities and the vulnerable people that so heavily rely on it. So I say shame on the Labor government for doing what they have done had they have left great uncertainty for vulnerable Australians and then at the 11th hour have had to admit to the fact that they got it wrong in the first place. So this bill, as I said, seeks to repeal the cashless debit card. In effect, it no longer will because of the amendments. But this card was put into communities as an important financial management tool developed with advanced technology to help improve the lives of some of Australia's most vulnerable people. It's an innovative program designed to tackle social harm, and particularly harm associated with drug and alcohol addiction in communities where there are high rates of long-term welfare dependency. The coalition has very serious concerns and have always held very serious concerns about this, uh, any legislation that impacts on repealing of the cashless debit card because we understand the impact it's going to have on the communities that it's in and the people in those communities. There are particular concerns about the way this legislation effectively sends vulnerable people back uh, to a restrictive technology like the basics card, but clearly the government have actually worked that out at the 11th hour. But really devastatingly, the decision to make to, the decision to, for the election commitment to, to remove the cashless debit card, to abolish the cashless debit card, was done with no consultation. Now, the Labor opposite will come in here and say that the minister has been widely consulting. Consultation occurs before you make the decision, not after you've yeah, made the decision. Yeah, exactly right. So yeah, yeah. anybody who thinks that what the minister is doing at the moment is consultation uh, probably needs to get the dictionary out and have a look what consultation really is. So, Firstly, it's important to understand that the cashless debit card is one of two methods of delivery of income management in Australia. It's designed to limit spending on harmful things like alcohol and gambling and illicit drugs. Income management has been in place in Australia since 2007, and until the cashless debit card was developed, the only way people were able to undertake an FPOS transaction were using the basics card. The basics card is a standalone technology that can only be used in about 15,500 places. These outlets are designated and have to be approved by government. The limited number of outlets that accept the card make its use highly restrictive for the participants who rely on it. In recognition of this, the cashless debit card was developed as a new, approved, advanced technology for the delivery of income management operating using existing banking infrastructure. CDC card holders are able to use their card at around a million places across the country that have an FPOS facility, as well as online and internationally. The program uh, is supported with an overall suite of measures implemented to improve community safety, stabilise people's lives and help them become job ready. This includes a $30 million job fund uh, and job ready initiative and $50 million for drug and alcohol residential rehabilitation uh, facilities. Significantly, the development of the CDC program was a direct response from calls from community leaders. In fact, in South Australia, in my home state, the South Australian coroner handed round an absolutely devastating and heartbreaking report called Sleeping Rough into the deaths of six um, people in South Australia on the far west coast. The report found that unsuccessful efforts to curb alcohol abuse was having devastating impacts on individuals, their families and the community. Indigenous community leaders approached the government uh, for support and worked with the government to establish and design a program to assist communities to, to address the social harm implications from alcohol and substance uh, addiction and long-term welfare dependency. The continuation of the CDC program in 2020 was also as a direct response from calls from these community leaders who told us that the card was working in their community. Uh, the continuation of the cash stable card was passed um, to enable income management recipients in the Northern Territory to voluntarily transition onto the cashless debit card. M nearly 4,500 people in the Northern Territory have made their own decision to move to the cashless debit card. And that's why it is so concerning that this legislation seeks to repeal the cashless debit card from the communities uh, only to repeal on the communities who directly rely on its support. Uh, evidence given during the, the, the hearings uh, showed that uh, the bill confirmed that the government's intention to extend income management via the basics card and through existing instruments was 
fundamentally flawed. We are yet to see whether this government is intending to extend those instruments, um, which expire at midnight on Friday night, which in effect means that they will be extending income management in the Northern Territory while at the same time uh, trying to abolish income management in other places around Australia. They need to answer the question as to why people in the Northern Territory are being treated differently from people in the other trial sites around the country. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that we know that the cashless debit card is a really, really advanced piece of technology. As I said, it works in just about every outlet in Australia, online and internationally, as opposed to the basics card. Um, the basics card is also has a massive degree of stigmatisation because the individual person needs to be identified by the cashier. The cashless debit card does not identify the individual unless, of course, that individual seeks to buy a product that has been uh, uh, banned. So, despite this, um, the Albanese Labor government has sought to tick and flick an election commitment with no regard whatsoever for the impact on vulnerable people and vulnerable communities. But as I said, the most disappointing aspect of this bill is that it does not have the support of community elders where the, the CDC program operates. These communities support the program. They supported the extension of the program back in 2020, and they continue to support the program in their communities. The community inquiry into the bill highlighted that the government has clearly failed to consult with these communities, particularly the Indigenous communities um, in which it operates. Um, clearly, the evidence given by a very, very compelling Australian, Indigenous Australian, Noel Pearson, the founder of uh, and director of the strategy for the Cape York Partnership, when he emotively said at the inquiry, I think this legislation will wipe out 20 years of my work. In the absence of a solution that had the same functionality as the cashless debit card, our Families Responsibilities Commission and the welfare reform work we've done via that over the last 20 years will collapse, and that would be a very bad thing. We just have to give up and walk away. We would come to the point of just giving up on the idea that we can change anything for the future of these communities. You guys will repeal this thing and then you'll walk away. You will repeal the card and then you'll walk away and leave us to the violence, leave us to the hunger, leave us to the neglected children. It's very easy to forget about the remote communities. Right. Well, at least we have seen that this government has listened to Mr uh, Pearson because they have extended the cashless debit card for the Cape York community. So what we have seen today and what we will see when the amendments come into this place is that the government, in effect, is going to keep the cashless debit card. They probably will change its name because they want to con the Australian public into believing that somehow they have done what they said at the election. They haven't. They are lying to the Australian public. They have no intention of getting rid of the technology that is the cashless debit card because they have agreed already with Mr Pearson and the Families Responsibility Commission that they will continue to use the cashless debit card until some new technology that they are designing comes into effect, which I will bet will be the cashless debit card by another name. We have seen numerous um, comments from other people where the, the, the card works. As an example, per, uh, Mayor Perry Will from the District Council of Sejuna also noted, we have had no consultation about it at all. The first we heard of it was when the Prime Minister's election promised that he was going to do it. Prior to that, we had had no representation from any Labor politicians. Likewise, Mayor of Kalgoorlie Boulder, John Bowler, said that he was disappointed the decision to scrap the card was made before the Assistant Minister for Social Services, Justine Ellard, had visited the goldfields in August 2022. He told the hearing, it almost seems like they are putting the cart before the horse. I would have liked for them to come here, consult with us, consult with the committee and then make a decision. It has become clear that the Labor is intent on taking a backward step on income management in Australia just to play politics. However, when they were called out, when they were caught out for what they were doing, they have now had to make an embarrassing backflip. So I would say to those senators opposite, be honest with the Australian public. Be honest with this chamber about what you're intending to do, because the cashless debit card was designed with absolutely only the best intentions and the best outcomes at heart for those communities that sought for the cashless debit card to be part of the tools that were available in their community to help the vulnerable people, 
particularly those that were dealing with serious addictions to drug and alcohol, to make sure that they could stabilise their life so that they could put food on the table for their children, that their children went to school and that they were supported on their journey away from addiction. So the government's absolutely reckless decision to scrap the cash as debit card has created immense uncertainty in these communities. And right now, we only have a trust us, we will fix it later approach from this government. Apparently, they're going to change the income management legislation to enable an advanced technology to deliver income management. That suggests to me that they're going to use the cashless debit card under the income management legislation, uh, which in a sense just goes to show that this government is not genuine, they are not honest, they are happy to mislead for an election commitment. So it's clear in the evidence that the government supports the continuation of compulsory income management. We know that it is very likely that this week they will extend the instruments to, in, to make sure that compulsory income management is continued in the Northern Territory. We know that they are likely to move amendments in this place this afternoon or tomorrow to extend the use of the cashless debit card. So, um, we would hope that they wouldn't waste the massive investment that has already gone in to the cashless debit card platform, uh, a platform that allows the universal network of the Australian banking infrastructure to be able to deliver a seamless product for those people that we are trying to support to stabilise their lives. And we know that the CDC is an effective mechanism and the government must stop playing politics, stop pretending that you're doing something that you're not and actually be honest with the Australian public about the importance of supporting vulnerable Australians on their journey to recovery. So the, government can, uh, the opposition condemns the government for this bill. We condemn the government for the way they have gone about putting this bill into this place. We condemn the government because of their lack of consultation, in fact no consultation, before they made a decision to rip a very valuable support mechanism out of vulnerable communities. Um, we would hope that the government become, uh, is transparent and comes clean with their intentions going forward. I would hope that they provide more information um, as they make their contributions on this bill about what their intentions are for compulsory income management going forward, for voluntary income management going forward, and I would hope that they were honest about the technology platform that they intend to deliver, deliver income management going forward. Um, the, the opposition will be um, moving a second reading amendment. Are you moving at, that now? And uh, I will Senator move Austin, that now, uh, Mr Deputy President, which in effect seeks for the, the third reading of this bill not to proceed until such time as the government lays on the table clearly and distinctly what its intentions are for income management going forward um, and that that legislation has the opportunity to have the appropriate scrutiny of this place and the other place before we move to this reckless interim step that is going to damage the lives, create greater uncertainty uh, and will deliver absolutely nothing to support the lives of the most vulnerable in our community which is what the cashless debit card has sought to do for the last six years. Uh, the, gov the opposition will not be supporting this bill. Senator Rice. Deputy President, the Greens have opposed the punitive and discriminatory cashless debit card since its inception, and we welcome this legislation to end its compulsory use in the four cashless debit card trial sites. Today is a big day for the more than 17,000 people who were forced onto the cashless debit card over the last six years. Anyone living in Sedona in South Australia, in the Goldfields regions or East Kimberley region in WA, in the Bundaberg Harvey Bay region in Queensland, and who has been on the cashless debit card, will finally be able to control their own finances again, able to buy clothes for their kids at second-hand stalls, able to pay cash for fruit and veg at street markets, and to buy stuff on eBay rather than having most of their income quarantined on a debit card. I am celebrating with them and for them today. The evidence provided to our Senate committee inquiry into the bill was stark. Two stories collected by the National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children exemplify the appalling impacts of the cashless debit card on people. One person said, 
I survive on cash. Everything I own is from garage sales or op shops. Most of my food comes from the farmer's market or roadside stalls. I cannot afford to buy new things from shops, nor can I afford a lot of store-bought items. I'm not alone. It's the only way single mothers can afford to live and feed their children on what is the lowest paid yet most important job. Another person said, in the three years I've been subjected to this lunacy, the cashless debit card has one, attempted to prevent me from accessing a private speech therapist in my community, two, prevented me from using my tax return to buy my son a bedroom suite, and three, put a bunch of people with no mental health, disability or domestic violence skills in charge of my financial situation in an arbitrary manner. And when my ex-husband treated me this way, the family court called it financial control. Compulsory income management has consistently failed to benefit those who it was imposed upon and has instead had a demonstrably harmful impact. And abolishing this card is an important step towards social equity and racial justice. We thank all the groups who campaigned and fought against this punitive and horrific measure and who have called for it to end, and thank the many people who were vulnerable and brave enough to share their stories of what it meant to be on this card and the damaging impact that this card has had on them. They did it in evidence to the inquiry and in their advocacy both before the election and after it. For your courage, your commitment and your advocacy, and, to, and all the advocates and activists who are watching as the cashless debit card is abolished in the trial sites with this bill, thank you. But we must not forget the many people who will continue to be subject to compulsory income management, such as the basics card, once the cashless debit card ends. And you remember the people in the Northern Territory who are on the cashless debit card who are going to be forced back on to the basics card, albeit an enhanced version of the basics card. At the Senate inquiry into the cashless debit card, the committee heard of the disproportionate impact of the card on First Nations individuals and communities and its contribution to the ongoing injustices of colonisation and persistent economic inequality experienced by First Nations peoples. And this stark division as to how we treat First Nations peoples compared to non-Indigenous peoples in Australia will be even more acute if compulsory income management in the Northern Territory continues after the repeal of the cashless debit card. This is why the Greens are calling to an end to all forms of compulsory income management in this country. In the final four months, of the Howard government, Australia was one of only four countries that voted against the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And as the United Nations described it, the declaration establishes a universal framework of minimum standards and elaborates on existing human rights standards and fundamental freedoms. And Article 19 of the declaration specifies that States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. And although we are glad that the Australian government subsequently reversed its position and supported the declaration, there are multiple examples of legislation that has passed through this place that consistently fails to meet the standards outlined in this declaration. And of particular relevance for the bill before us today, Australia's history of colonisation and racism extends into how income management has been designed and deployed in ways that disempower First Nations peoples and run directly counter to the principles of free, prior and informed consent. We know this because First Nations peoples have told governments so over and over again. The Australian Peak Organisation's Northern Territory provided evidence to the committee inquiring into this bill on exactly this point. And they said that compulsory income management is a vehicle for disempowerment 
and perpetuate stigmatisation of Aboriginal people rather than building capacity and independence. For many, the program has acted to make people more dependent on welfare. Change the Record outlined how the colonisation and dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from country has taken many forms, including theft of land and resources, exploitation of labour and theft and quarantining of wages and welfare payments. These injustices have caused First Nations peoples to experience persistent economic inequality to this day, and their legacy continues to shape Australia's welfare and social security system. Compulsory income management is a stark example of the type of discriminatory, coercive and top-down decision-making that has caused very real harm to First Nations individuals and communities. The Central Australian Aboriginal Family Legal Unit told our inquiry that compulsory income management undermines self-determination for our people. It is a mechanism by which Aboriginal people and communities are further disempowered, particularly given the ongoing impacts of the Northern Territory intervention. And Dr John Patterson, CEO of the Aboriginal Medical Services Alliance's Northern Territory, he shared with our committee the harm associated with the punitive approaches inflicted as part of the intervention and the racist accusations used to justify them. In a really heartfelt contribution to the inquiry, he said, this is what happened as a result of the intervention in the Northern Territory all those years ago. It causes trauma and stress on us. When you're trying to lead organisations and you're leading your mob and you've got people out there just casting all these aspersions on you and labelling you, and you have politicians making all these crazy comments that they can't support with evidence, and you've got to try and live and work with that. I struggle with that. Fundamentally, this is something that we have to talk about with regards to compulsory income management. It is a racist policy that has been imposed by government primarily and predominantly on First Nations peoples, and it must end. And we know, of course, from the evidence that compulsory income management doesn't work. For all those who are arguing for the continuation of compulsory income management as a measure to address social problems, I implore you, listen to the evidence. It doesn't work. We've heard it from the Australian National Audit Office, who said in their second report on the CDC that the Department of Social Security has not demonstrated that the CDC program is meeting its intended objectives. And similarly, the Australian Council of Social Services told her inquiry there is no credible or conclusive evidence that these policies have delivered better outcomes for individuals or their communities. Instead, cashless debit and income management are paternalistic policies that restrict basic human rights. And the St Vincent de Paul Society told us that the card should be scrapped because it is discriminatory, punitive, costly and ineffective. It has not produced significant long-term reductions in the use of habitual alcohol, gambling or illicit drugs or improvements in participants' budgeting strategies or socially responsible behaviour. In fact, rather than simply failing to develop the benefits some of the paternalistic advocates claim, it can actually cause harm. Dr Elise Klein summarised in her evidence that research published by the ARC Centre of Excellence, the Life Course Centre, examined compulsory income management in the Northern Territory and showed a correlation with negative impacts on children, including a reduction in birth weight and school attendance. She said the research implications are significant and draw attention to several possible explanations for the reduction in birth weight including how income management increased stress on mothers, disrupted existing financial arrangements within the household and created confusion as to how to access funds. So the Greens will support the passage of this bill. However, we strongly oppose the provisions in the legislation that will enable the minister to move people from the cashless debit card onto other forms of compulsory income management like the Basics Card or the new Enhanced Basics Card. And I want to be very clear that we will be moving an amendment to reflect that and reflect our fundamental commitment that compulsory income management should not be imposed on anyone. Rather, 
a genuine abolition of compulsory income management. Rather than being that, the legislation as currently written will simply shift thousands of people, largely First Nations peoples, from one form of compulsory income management onto another, with the same failings and the same punitive impacts. The Greens support an opt-in voluntary option for income management for those that want it. And we welcome the announcement from the government that they will be moving towards ending all compulsory income management at some stage, but we think it can and should happen sooner. Compulsory income management is a failed punitive policy that can and should be removed as soon as possible. So beyond removing compulsory income management, we need to be funding the services and the supports for communities that are needed across Australia. It's simply not enough to remove the harsh punitive conditions that have been in place. We actively need to provide the support and the services that are needed in communities across the country. We've had a decade of Liberal government cutting key programs across Australia, and now a Labor government is arguing that because of the decisions a Liberal government made, that they can't fund the services that we need. People in communities across the country who are struggling deserve better. And that's why at the last election, us Greens, we took a platform of providing a billion dollars extra a year in funding for essential social services, so that services like drug and alcohol services, like family and domestic violence services, and the community services are so urgently needed can be funded. That's what needs to be put in place. As we get rid of compulsory income management as soon as possible, we need to be putting in place the funding for those support services that will genuinely allow people to be living their best lives. So I foreshadow that we will have an amendment to address this issue and we'll call for the cross-party support for the basic principle that regardless of your position on the cashless debit card, we must ensure that services are provided for people in the community, that, uh, foreshadowing a second reading amendment. So, as well as repealing and abolishing all forms of compulsory income management, there is much more that must be done. And Funding services, but critically, we need to be ensuring that anybody in Australia has got the income they need to survive. Anybody in Australia should be able to get a guaranteed livable income for everybody who needs it. And as part of that guaranteed livable income, there are two th key things. One is to end the punitive conditionality that permeates so much of our income support system, which the cashless debit card and compulsory income management absolutely exemplifies. The mutual obligations, the income management, and the other programs that make it hard for people to access income support. And the second thing we need to be doing is to be raising the rate of all of our income support payments to ensure that all payment rates are above the poverty line. So let's be clear. We are abol abolishing the cashless debit card in the four trial sites um, today, but more needs to be done because poverty is a political choice. And we cannot end poverty in Australia if we punish those who are suffering without enough to live on. It is cruel, it is often racist, and it must stop. Senator Rice, you foreshadowed a second reading amendment. Are you moving that or another member should move it later? No, I will be moving it, but we've got one before the chair. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, let me tell you, the cashless debit card was flawed from the very beginning, and our government was formed on the platform that no one is left behind and no one is held back. The evidence presented to us showed that many CDC participants forced to use the card felt marginalised, embarrassed and reported a loss of freedom and choice. Now, let me remind the Senate a bit of a history, and it's interesting to hear the other side give a complete forgetful version of history, in my view. In 2016, when I entered the Senate, I spoke about what happened in the Northern Territory in July 2007, when the Northern Territory Parliament, the Northern Territory people, 
were intervened on in such an incredibly dramatic way without any input, without any view. It was certainly then, when I was the member for Arnhem in 2007, standing in the parliament of the Northern Territory, the most disempowering moment, not just as the member for Arnhem, but for all of those constituents that I was there to represent, I could say nothing. I could do nothing. The humiliation of people, the shame that people felt, all of that carried through with the Northern Territory intervention, which saw the arrival of the Basics card. Now, I pick up on the reflection of history of the other side, a forgotten reflection of history, in my view, where, Senator, where the senator says, Senator Rustin, that we don't care about the people of the Northern Territory on the Basics card. Well, I ask you, in your time as the previous minister in this role, how many inquiries did you have into the Basics card and into the families of the Northern Territory to actually ask them how they were going? This has been a long road, Senators, a very long road for the people of the Northern Territory and, indeed, all of those now who are on the CDC card right across Australia. I have objected to this from the day I entered this Senate, and I am incredibly proud that our government has brought this as an urgent piece of legislation for this Senate to push through on. There are thousands of Australians out there who do not want to be on this card. And it is up to this Senate to make what I believe is the right decision in ensuring that this legislation gets through. We took to the election under firm belief from previous inquiries over four years, in addition to reports, academic reports, none of which could say, none of which could say that the CDC was working in such an effective way that it was reducing trauma, that it was reducing domestic violence, that it was reducing uh, people's ability to live a life free of all of that. None of those reports could say that. Let me remind you, senators, that the reason the CDC, one of the reasons the CDC was introduced, because it was meant to do those things. It was meant to see a better quality of life for Australians. That was the initial intention, but somewhere along the way that got lost, that got forgotten. And it took those reports that came to our Senate inquiries, and these were not Senate reports. These were academic reports that were done on each of these communities under the CDC. So when senators opposite get up and say there's been no consultation, let me tell you this has gone on for a very long time. And that is the very reason why the First Nations Caucus Committee of the Federal Labor Party pushed for this policy to be integral in taking it to the recent federal election. There is no doubt, Senators, from this side of the House that we are very clear in our objectives here. There has been no mistake. What we have done in this term of the parliament, in the very short term, is through the Senate inquiry that many senators here took part in, to look into this bill, we most certainly did listen. And I commend Minister Rishworth and Assistant Minister Elliott for the travels that they have embarked upon not long after being appointed in their ministerial positions to go to each of these CDC sites across the country. They did so straight away. 
Why? Because we knew it was important. We knew it was imperative. We knew that there were Australians out there who were suffering, who needed some security about what was their future with this card. That's why Minister Rishworth and Minister Elliott took off across the country listening, talking and bringing forward this piece of legislation. And yes, Senator Rustin, there are amendments to deal with, but hey, that's what Senate inquiries do. Senate inquiries into pieces of legislation do that. Hello, it's what we do with many pieces of legislation because we believe and trust in the democratic process of that inquiry. And that's why these amendments have come into this particular legislation at this particular time because we waited for the Senate inquiry to see what people were saying. Now, you may jest that we've made an amendment in relation to Cape York, but guess what? We listened to people like Noel Pearson, to the Fair Work Commission. We listened to them because we knew sorry, the Families Responsibilities Commission, we knew that that was critical and that that was different uh, in terms of the, the way the Families Responsibilities Commission handles uh, the program up in Cape York. We saw that previously in opposition through the many Senate inquiries. And in fact, I do recall sitting in Darwin at a Senate inquiry and listening to the Families Responsibility Commissioners and others, elders from that community, giving evidence. And I do recall thinking, you know what? This is a ground-up way of looking at these problems. The elders are involved. They are participating. They're the ones working with their family members, kinship groups, and saying, OK, this is the decision we'll make in a consultative way. And I had thought then that if that particular program had come in in 2014 as opposed to the style of CDC that came in, we might have been in a pretty different sort of place. So I do commend the people of Cape York with what they are trying to do. And we are unashamedly bringing in this amendment because of that. So you ask about the people of the Northern Territory with the basics card. Well, I come back to my start. I recall the intervention into the Northern Territory in 2007 and what it meant for my constituents. The, the heavy-handed approach that was used. And yes, the basics card continued, even under a Labor government. Again, to the disquiet and discontent of so many of my constituents. But I never forgot. I never forgot. And I have brought that here into the Senate because I want the Senate to never forget that deep feeling of disempowerment, disrespect and shame. And OK, we may not be dealing with the basics card right now, and you can call it for all you want on the other side, but we are about process on this side. We realise something. You championed the CDC members opposite, yet you had no plans beyond December 31st for all of those 17,000 people or more on that program. You had no plans beyond December 31. You just threw it all down, packed your bags and walked off and said it's, not, it's their problem now. They're the new government. They can handle it. Well, guess what? We are handling it and we are pointing out your inability to have made steps for those thousands of Australians who required greater dignity and who required greater knowledge of what this parliament was going to do about their future in assisting them in some of the most basic things. Financial support, quality of life, being able to pay their bills, be able to pay their rent. The stories of people homeless, not knowing what their future was, 
still not knowing. That's why we've got to get this bill through. We've got to get this bill through. And yes, we will come back to the basics card, and I can tell you now, Senators, that is one area I will not let this Senate let go of. We need to discuss that with the families of the Northern Territory. One of the questions I kept asking of the former minister, Senator Rustin, was how much money was spent doing all those ads across the Northern Territory to get people off the basics card onto the CDC? How much money did you spend? I could never get an answer to that question, but let me tell you, I'm certainly checking the books now on this side. You spent so much money to try and get at least 4,000 people onto the cashless debit card, but you still didn't worry about the 22,000 people on the basics card. You still had no inquiries, you had no investigations, you had no consultations, and you come in here having a go at us about the basics card? Oh, no, 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 senators. Oh, no, 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 you won't. I will keep reminding you of what you didn't do. And yes, we have a lot of work on this side now that we have that responsibility. And I am proud to bring this legislation before the Senate, and I have no objections whatsoever to what we are asking of senators here. But I do make this plea to those senators on the crossbenches. And I do remind those senators who came to the Northern Territory in particular, Senator Lambie, on your visit to Central Australia and to far north East Arnhem Land, remember the Yongle. Remember the families that spoke to you. They still hold those same messages today about what they want for their future. And you know what they said to you. And I took the former senator of South Australia, Rex Patrick, and even he saw the importance of this debate to First Nations people, that for once they can be heard instead of trampled over as we were in 2007, where there was no debate, no discussion. I reassure the Senate that I will make sure that there is comprehensive, dignified discussion with families about the basics card. I thank the Arnhem Land Progress Association and the work that it has done and continues to do with residents and employees across its many locations. You are the ones that started with your ALPA card, and that was prior to the intervention in 2007. The ALPA card came out months before that did. Now, just imagine if you had been consulted about this kind of income management, money counselling. Just imagine if you had been counselled and consulted where we could see that ALPA card today had there been that discussion. So I have a long memory, Senators, and I will always put on the table where we could have done better on this side. And I will always point out in the Senate where you should have done better on your side. Senator Cash. Thank you, Deputy President, and I too rise to make a contribution to the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. And without a doubt, Acting Deputy President, ending the cashless debit card will go down in history as the greatest piece of ideological madness this government will perpetrate on this parliament. And in fact, what we've just heard today is that at the last minute, the last minute, they will be rushing amendments through this place in relation to this bill. One needs to ask, why would the government do that? In particular, when this was one of their election commitments. It was one of their election commitments. And yet, they are about to rush some amendments through this place. 
perhaps, Acting Deputy President, the sheer weight of the evidence that they were confronted with was so overwhelming that they finally realised this was an act of nothing more and nothing less than ideological madness. And in fact, the previous speaker, Senator McCarthy, stated the government was very clear in our objectives here. In fact, so clear that at the last minute, we haven't even seen the amendments, you hear the minister saying, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. Not great that we got it wrong, seeing as we're out there telling everybody we got it right. We got it wrong and we are going to have to make some changes. Perhaps, though, Acting Deputy President, it's because they listened to the coalition. They listened to the weight of evidence that was presented to them. Perhaps now they better understand that this ideological madness that they are about to undertake would actually have made the lives of so many, so many Australians much worse than their lives are today. If the bill in its current form goes through, this is what the Albanese Labor government are going to be delivering to thousands and thousands of Australians. They will continue to see the scourge of alcoholism. They will continue to see the scourge of drug addiction, gambling and domestic violence in their communities where, and this is what the weight of evidence shows, the cashless debit card has successfully contained these problems. What kind of a government, Mr Acting Deputy President, Order. would want to inflict this sort of pain upon fellow Australians? And the answer is clear. It is a heartless one. It is a heartless one. And it is a government that cannot see past their ideological bent on this issue. Those opposite, given the weight of evidence, given that communities are crying out for this card, should hang their heads in shame on this issue. Let's look at what the purpose of the cashless debit card is. It's a very simple purpose. It's to prevent income support recipients from spending a significant portion of their payments on potentially harmful goods such as alcohol, illegal drugs and gambling. I am still at a loss to understand how the Albanese Labor government thinks, again based on the sheer weight of overwhelming evidence, that this is a bad thing. Again, the cashless debit card was introduced by the former government as a means to ensure that those receiving welfare payments were spending taxpayers' money on basic necessities such as food, household bills and clothes, and not on habits that enable a destructive lifestyle. What it has done when you look at the stories, when you listen to the stories, when you understand the impact that this card has had on families, what do you see? It has allowed countless of families across Australia on welfare to feed, clothe and provide for their children. Again, I don't know why that is a bad thing. Rather than seeing their money wasted away on drugs, alcohol and gambling. And in fact, again listening to that weight of evidence, in many instances it has reduced domestic violence, it has reduced alcohol consumption, and when you reduce Order. domestic violence and alcohol consumption, what you see is the number of people presenting to the emergency department at a hospital, that also decreases. Let's look at some figures, Acting Deputy President. Last year, or as at last year, around $2.5 million worth of transactions on restricted products had been declined in the goldfields. So what does that mean? Well, it means that $2.5 million was therefore better spent on food, paying bills, clothes, 
and other essentials, rather than the alternative which Labor and the Greens would like to allow at pubs, bottle shops and at the TAB. And when you look beyond the card's stated purpose and at examples of people in the communities who had the cashless debit card, what did they say? And I would remind the Senate, these are not people in Canberra. These are people who are on the cashless debit card living in communities, who have real life experience. They are real people who have realised the benefit of what the cashless debit card has offered them. So, for example, in Siduna, this is what a community paramedic said. Since the cashless debit card, we've definitely seen a decline in domestic violence, alcohol consumption and numbers of people presenting to ED at the hospital. Again, Acting Deputy President, I am at a loss to understand how this is a bad thing and why the Albanese Labor government wants to get rid of it. What about community leaders in Laverton, in my home state of Western Australia? They have actually pleaded, pleaded with the government not to get rid of this card. And what have they said? They have been forced to plead for an emergency contingent of police officers and paramedics because they are anticipating, as a result of the legislation that we currently have before us, they are anticipating a surge in violence when thousands of local residents are taken off the card. That is what this government is going to be responsible for. And in fact, Indigenous and non-Indigenous leaders in Laverton they told the West Australian newspaper this, that the card has ensured children have been fed and clothed. That's it. The card has ensured children, young children, who have no control over where this money is going unless they have the cashless debit card, have been fed and clothed. Something, quite frankly, that all of us in this place take for granted every single day. And they fear what is going to happen when this legislation goes through. The Shire president in Laverton, Patrick Hill, he said, the community has been brought to its knees by alcohol abuse in the years before locals opted to support a trial of the cashless debit card in March 2018. And this is what he said. We had the Royal Flying Doctor Service here constantly to pick up domestic violence victims. Kids were not being looked after and not going to school. And you know it's bad when the ambulance needs a police escort to go to these incidents. We wanted to explain all that to the government before they took the card away. Listen to this, Mr Acting Deputy President, because it's the only thing in 30 years that has made any difference. Well, guess what? Today we say goodbye to the only thing in 30 years that has made any difference because of the ideological hatred, the ideological hatred that those on the other side have for actually giving people a helping hand to actually survive. Janice Scott, Wangatha Elder, she established a residence group in Laverton in 2016 out of concern for the welfare of local children. Let's have a look at what she said. The biggest difference was for the kids. Suddenly they had food. They had clothing. People used to throw rocks on my roof in the middle of the night saying, I'm hungry, and that stopped. They had food at home. Shame on those opposite for demeaning Janice with this legislation. Indigenous man Marty Sealander, chief executive of Laverton's Pakanu Aboriginal Corporation. This is what he said. His organisation wanted the card and it had, and I quote, put things on an even keel in town. What you don't see anymore is the gambling, where people are sitting around playing cards with cash. That's finished. Families don't use the food program at the schools as much. They're buying groceries. And people with serious drinking problems are getting really drunk once a fortnight. Not three or four times a fortnight like they used to. And then, of course, you have the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder, who also backed the retention of the card. And again, they highlighted the benefits that they have seen because of this card. 
What they said is this. The program has demonstrated significant value in the community, not only by linking participants to employment, but by also providing opportunities for them to engage in training and skills development. The city's submission to the relevant inquiry said there'd been a 57 per cent decrease in crime. Wow. 57 per cent decrease in crime from 2018 to 2022 following the rollout of the card. And the most significant crime decrease is observed in non-dwelling burglary, property damage, drug offences, dwelling burglary and the stealing of motor vehicles. And this is what they said. With the abolishment of the cashless debit card, there is no doubt that the region will need to rely more heavily on the state government to provide additional law and order services to ensure that the level of crime does not reach the unprecedented levels experienced three years prior to the introduction of the card. Again, I am at an absolute loss to know why the Albanese Labor government thinks that abolishing the cashless debit card, even with its amendments, is a good thing, given the sheer, the overwhelming weight of evidence that clearly supports the benefits, the benefits that this card has had to some of the most vulnerable in our society. And then, of course, there is my colleague, Senator Nampajimpa Price. She is an empowered, well, peri-Celtic Australian woman, as we know, from the Northern Territory. And in her maiden speech to the parliament, this is what she said in relation to the cashless debit card. It's allowed countless families on welfare to feed their children, rather than seeing their money claimed by kinship demands from alcoholics, substance abusers and gamblers in their family group. Getting rid of the card is an appalling example of legislation pushed by left-wing elites that is guaranteed to worsen the lives of Indigenous people. So what we are here today debating is a piece of legislation that an Indigenous woman from the Northern Territory, who has lived and breathed these experiences, is very open that when it goes through, it will actually worsen the lives of Indigenous people in this country. What does she then say? Yet at the same time, we spend days and weeks each year recognising Aboriginal Australia in many ways, in symbolic gestures that fail to push the needle one micromillimetre towards improving the lives of the most marginalised in any genuine way. Well, guess what, Acting Deputy President? I know whose view I back in relation to this. Yeah. Senator Nampajimpa Price, someone who will stand up for the rights of Indigenous people in this country, somebody who will only ever ask what Order. practical difference? What Order. practical difference is this policy going to make to the lives of Indigenous in this country? And she speaks from experience. She doesn't come in here as a left-wing elitist. She speaks from experience. She has seen the benefits firsthand, firsthand, up close in her own community. That's who the government should be listening to people like Senator Nampajimpa Price. So, Acting Deputy President, the government should hang their heads in shame over this issue. It is ideological madness, nothing more and nothing less. Their intention, despite Senator McCarthy saying it was clear, clearly is not. Quite frankly, the best thing you could do today, pull your legislation, go back out, listen to the community and then end this ideological madness. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to follow um, Senator Cash um, and your comments with this. I'm glad we're having this conversation about the future of the government welfare. It takes many forms and there are many Australian people who receive it. There's no doubt many Austra Australians truly need it. There's also no doubt that many Australians who receive it do not truly need it. There are many more Australians who pay for it. It's costing taxpayers almost $200 billion, billion, not million, billion dollars a year. And there are almost as many opinions about whether it's too much or too little and whether it really does any good. However, 
There is one opinion which strongly prevails among the Australians who fund this welfare. Those who receive it should be accountable for it. This is reflected in some of the conditions and obligations placed on recipients, such as education, training and job seeking. Australians who fund welfare with their taxes understandably have an expectation that money is not squandered by those receiving it. They don't like it when recipients spend all their time on their couch instead of actively, actively looking for work or at least being in training for work. They don't like it when they see recipients spending welfare money on things like alcohol, drugs and pokies. Most recipients don't do this, but it begs the question why we have over 900,000 people on unemployment benefits, yet jobs are plenty are waiting to be filled. So are these people incompetent, illiterate or just plain lazy, believing everyone else owes them a living, not just a helping hand, in a time of need? When there are others depending on them, like children, there can be big problems. This is especially the case in communities with higher levels of long-term welfare dependency. And I won't beat around the bush, many of these um, communities are predominantly Aboriginal. It was these problems, children going hungry and without education, alcohol and drug related violence, family and domestic violence, poor health outcomes, widespread crime and social unrest. The cashless debit card was aimed at addressing. It did this by limiting the spending of up to 80 per cent of a person's welfare income on essential items like food, clothes and rent. The basic idea was to ensure that people on welfare experiencing difficulties with prioritising the essentials themselves no longer had to. The trials were limited to a few areas, some of them with high levels of long-term dependency and a history of related social problems, particularly alcohol-fuelled violence and neglect. The Bundaberg and Harvey Bay region in Queensland, Doomagee in remote northwest Queensland, Cape York in Queensland, parts of the Northern Territory, the Goldfields region around Kalgoorlie and Esperance in Western Australia, the East Kimberley region in Western Australia, and the Sejunia area in South Australia. The introduction of the cashless debit card was not without controversy or teething problems, some of which persist. It has not been entirely successful in completely quarantining welfare income for spending only on essentials. People have found ways around the restrictions, for example, buying someone else's groceries with a card in exchange for cash, which is then spent on things that cannot be bought with the card. There has also been frustration at its limited utility, especially in online transactions and also because some shops in the trial communities didn't or couldn't accept the card. However, these problems have been outweighed by some very good outcomes. Violence related to alcohol and drug use has declined significantly in some of these trial regions. More kids are going to school and more of them are being better fed. Quite a few people on the card have reported it helps them manage their household expenses much better than before. I went to the Goldfields region in Western Australia and saw all this for myself. I spoke to Indigenous elders, local government leaders, local public servants and others in these communities. I spoke to many who were literally pleading for the cashless debit card to be rolled out much more widely. I heard how, before that card, older family members would force younger ones to hand over all their welfare money. It's a cultural thing for Aborigines to hand over money to other family members. Some who refuse face the risk of being bashed. One employer told me a young Aboriginal man who worked for him quit his full-time job because his family forced him to hand over his pay. Working provided no future for him. The card prevented a lot of this sort of thing from happening. One Nation supports the cashless debit card and income management being imposed on people in communities which clearly need it. I'm convinced it does little harm and much good and I want to see the concept extended. 
To those who say it unfairly targets Indigenous communities, I say you're wrong and you need to get out into those communities like I have. You need to be honest with yourselves and the Australian people and admit problems like domestic violence, sexual abuse, drug and alcohol dependency and unemployment are highly prevalent in Indigenous communities. I wait. There's more, isn't there? Oh, the voice will end all that, won't it? We're going to have the voice and it's going to fix all these problems. You need to witness and experience the unrest, the violence and the poverty for yourself and understand how income management makes a positive difference. And those supporting this legislation must explain to these communities and the Australian people what you're going to do about the fallout. What are you going to do about the return of the alcohol-related violence, the increasing social unrest and the children who will again go hungry when the card is gone? How are you going to ensure Indigenous children have the same education as non-Indigenous children? You can't and won't until you enforce the same laws that require every child to attend school regardless of race. Aboriginal parents can be reluctant to send their children to school for fear of them being better educated than themselves. In many cases, it is the parents holding back future generations, yet the activists and self-interest groups blame white Australia for poor education outcomes and lack of opportunities for Indigenous Australia. Education is the key for Indigenous Australians to pull themselves out of the quagmire of welfare dependency and a better lifestyle. People in these communities are furious about the government's plan to make income management strictly voluntary for all but a few. They fear the vacuum from the loss of the card will be filled with more problems, more unrest, more violence and more crime. They fear the return of the chaos and dysfunction the card was helping to stop. I note the government is, is tacking more money to this legislation. Oh, they plucked another $65 million uh, to throw out alcohol and drug services to fix the problems neither major party has been able to solve for decades. Oh, what, you know, these people in these communities, they're paying over $100, $150 for what's called a pillow. That's a cask of wine, five litres of wine. And in some areas, they're paying up to two to $300 for a bottle of rum. Oh, so we're going to put in more um, uh, health issues like dialysis machines, so that's going to solve the problem. Where if you restrict the money that they have, that they're not spending it on this alcohol and drug abuse that is happening and with the young ones, that might be a good start for it. And it's been proven that it has worked, it has helped. I'm reasonably confident this won't substitute for the good outcome produced by the cashless debit card. I know it won't. So another 65 million thrown at it. I'm sure the Australian people are going to be happy about that one. This government must prioritise investment in a skilled homegrown Australian workforce to fill Australian jobs instead of outsourcing them to overseas workers. And higher immigration is not the solution. It's about getting Australians into jobs. What we need to do here, and I, I fully support this cashless debit card. I've been to the meetings and I've actually spoken to the people on the ground. I've been to Dumaji. I've seen the, the, um, the problems that these uh, communities have. Senator Hanson, we've now reached a hard marker. It's 1.30, so we're going to proceed to two-minute statements. All right, and I'll continue my remarks. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed Senator Canavan was running in, so I thought I'd stand and he can go next. Um, Queenstown sits on the rugged west coast of Tasmania, a community of around 1,800 people. It's a community that, that's reinventing itself from the closure of the Mount Lyle copper mine um, over five years ago now. The Mountain Heights High School has some amazing teachers, and one of these is Alex Burgess Norris, who has recently been recognised with a statewide award for her teaching and leadership excellence. Alex came to Mountain School, uh, Heights School from right here in Canberra in 2019. 
through uh, a two-year placement through the Teach for Australia's Leadership Development Program. And she's now in her fourth year at the school, teaching humanities, social science and English. She said that she was thrilled to be given the Tasmanian branch of the Australian Council of Educational Leaders Award, commenting that teaching is so fulfilling for such a diverse range of reasons. She said it's the relationships with the students, the creativity in preparing lessons, connecting the school with the wider community, opportunities to learn, a fast-paced environment. And she said you're always on your toes, the professional collaboration with other students and, of course, the students who are so resilient and have taught her so much. Her previous career was in environmental science and she decided to make the switch for teaching via Teaching for Australia. For that I say thank you. What a great switch. I've had many visits to Mountain Heights School over the years and it never ceases to amaze me the drive and commitment from the teachers towards ensuring that the students get the best out of their schooling to ensure that they get the best out of their lives. Um, congratulations to Alex and I hope that she decides to stay at Mountain Heights School for many, many years to come. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, the Queensland Government has announced that it plans to waste 780 million taxpayers' dollars on building a useless wind farm when we already have too much unreliable energy in Australia. This winter, we only kept the lights on because we made factories shut down. We put people out of jobs just to keep lights on. We did not have enough power because we have shut over four gigawatts of reliable power, mainly coal, and replaced them with weather-dependent energy. The Queensland Government trumpets today that its new $780 million wind farm will power 280,000 homes, but it will only do that when the wind blows, which is only about one third of the time. The other two thirds of the time we will be left in the dark. For $780 million, this project will create just 15 permanent jobs. 15 <laughs> permanent jobs. That comes in at $52 million per job. Per job. Great deal. But wait, there's a lot more. The Queensland government does not have $780 million, so they're going to have to borrow $780 million. So the plan is we are going to borrow millions more from the Chinese government to buy Chinese-built wind turbines so that we can destroy our local manufacturing industry and give China more of our jobs. What a great deal for the people of Queensland. That will be the outcome here, because Europe has already tried this failed strategy, and it's failed catastrophically there. Europe has lost almost a quarter of its aluminium capacity thanks to an over-reliance on renewable energy. You cannot run the Boyne Island aluminium smelter near Gladstone on a weather-dependent power system. There are thousands of Queensland jobs now at risk because of the Queensland government's ill-thought-through energy policy. If the Queensland government were serious about jobs and reducing carbon emissions, they would be building clean coal, gas and nuclear power plants. We have all of that energy, all of that energy under our feet, all of those resources here, but we refuse to use it, which is a national crime. We are not using our own God-given energy resources. Instead, we rely on imported solar and wind turbines that will cost us much of our manufacturing industry and cost all Australians more for their basic power needs. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in solidarity with the women of Iran. Since the brutal death of Masha Amini, a 22-year-old woman who we know was uh, who died in custody after being detained by the country's morality police, protests have erupted across the country. The people of Iran, led by the incredibly brave women who have taken to the streets in defiance of their government and its laws that require them to wear uh, coverings on their head, are wearing loose clothing and wearing loose clothing for women, are fighting back. They are fighting for their basic human rights, the right to choose. They are fighting to as, as they're fighting, they're taking off their hijabs, they're burning them, they're even cutting off their hair in solidarity. The chants that the rallies declare will support our sisters and women, life and liberty. These protests are unprecedented, but it is also, sadly, being met with military force and casualties, many of which are not reported. The violence must stop and the oppression must stop. I stand with the brave women and girls in Iran. Women and girls' rights are human rights, and they must be universal. All women and girls deserve to be respected and live free from violence and oppression, whatever country they come from. I stand in solidarity with the women and girls in Iran and across the globe who are fighting for their fundamental rights. Thank you to those brave women and girls. 
for fighting for the rights of all of our daughters and girls everywhere. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I rise to talk about a great charity that I am participating in called September. Every 20 hours in Australia, an Australian is diagnosed with cerebral palsy. It is the most common physical disability in childhood in Australia. When I was younger, my Sunday school teacher had severe cerebral palsy, and I learned from her that people deserve to get as much out of life as possible. And this is why I've joined September. I know many people with cerebral palsy, and my fundraising will go to multiple initiatives to support the cerebral palsy community, such as essential research, search, telepractice, practice, youth programs, babies at risk, and also rural and regional support, which is vital. The aim of September is that you sponsor me for me to get 10,000 steps every day. Now, during a parliamentary sitting period, it is so simple. I'm getting well and truly above my 10,000 steps. Non-sitting periods, it's a little bit more challenging, and on Saturdays, it's damn near impossible. <laughs> on Saturdays, I'm a jammy day Saturday. That should be the next charity that I work for. Um, but I really want to promote this uh, initiative and I want to ensure that even if my steps fall short, that my fundraising target is met. I will be posting this speech on my Facebook page with a link to the donations because this is a great charity and it helps many, many people's lives. In fact, one of the first things I did when I was a senator was assist a young girl in my town with cerebral palsy, get the education support so she could sit her HSC. She's now just about to graduate from university. It's these sorts of things that we want to promote. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to talk about um, uh, an issue close to both of our hearts, regional manufacturing in regional Queensland. The Albanese Labor government sees a future in Australian manufacturing. Our government sees a future for manufacturing in regional Australia. And that is as clear as day when you look at our commitment of $150 million for the Cairns Marine Precinct. This investment, in addition to the Queensland government's own $150 million commitment, will go towards much needed once in a generation facility in Cairns. The Cairns Marine Precinct project will create good, secure local jobs. It will create more opportunities for local businesses, and it will help Cairns remain a world leader in marine manufacturing, maintenance and repair. The Cairns Marine Precinct project will help Cairns con continue to be a key strategic player in the defence of our country. And it is investment like this that just makes sense for our government, investments that give back to communities, that ensure workers have secure jobs that they can build their futures on. And it was investment like this that those opposite turned their nose up at. The member for Leichhardt is a staunch opposition, oppos in opposition to this commitment. Despite widespread community support, when we announced this funding, his response, whether he would match it, was, no, in a word, absolutely not. It's not a surprise, not from the LNP. They dared Holden to leave, and they did. They slashed R&D support to manufacturing. They shut the doors on thousands of apprentices and trainees. They sent trains overseas, and it was Labor that brought them home. And they have never met a manufacturing job that they wouldn't casualise. You can't count on the LNP to back manufacturing, but you can count on a Labor government because we know just how important it is to make things right here in, at home. Senator Roberts. Well done, everyone. What an amazing job you've done. I'm delighted to announce that the Commonwealth of Australia has reached its net zero target under the United Nations Paris Climate Agreement 30 years early. Well done, everyone. Senator Babette, well done. I thank Senator Assistant Minister McAllister for the definition she used in this Senate chamber during the climate change bill. From Article 4 of the UN Paris Climate Agreement, quote, net zero is a balance between human production of emissions and removal of those emissions by environmental sinks, end of quote. Our country has so many forests that Australia already sequesters sinks 
three times more carbon dioxide than we produce. Worldwide, forests and oceans sink three quarters of human production. Under the government's own definition, Australia is already at net zero and the rest of the world is not far behind. But the Paris Agreement definition of net zero ends with these words, quote, in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. The UN Paris Agreement allows development, and that's great news for our project Iron Boomerang. Yet notice the last part, eradicating poverty. If the Albanese government takes measures under its Climate Change Act that increases poverty in Australia, it will be in breach of the UN Paris Climate Agreement that the Liberal Nationals signed. Yet high energy prices from insane energy policies are increasing inflation, destroying wealth, destroying jobs and opportunity and forcing people into poverty. Our human carbon dioxide production is not breaching the UN's Paris Agreement. Instead, the destruction of baseload power in this country and worldwide is breaching that agreement. And it does not require that action. The Albanese government cannot pick and choose which elements of the UN Paris Agreement it uses. One nation will hold this government to the letter of the UN agreement Australia signed. And that is simple. Climate zealotry and deceit must not push one person into poverty. Not one person. Not one. None. Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise in relation to an article which appeared in the Australian Financial Review this morning entitled Labor Added Again in Surprise Move on Dividends. And it's by John Kehoe, the outstanding economics editor of the Australian Financial Review. And I quote from the first paragraph The Albanese government has shocked investors by proposing to retrospectively stop companies paying shareholders fully frank dividends that are funded by capital raisings. What is it about the Australian Labor Party and franking credits? They just won't leave them alone. There are three fundamental issues, three reasons why this proposal. This thought bubble from those opposite is wrong. First, it is absurd, absolutely absurd, to apply retrospectivity all the way back, and this is what the exposure draft of the legislation says, all the way back to payments, distributions which have been made at or after 12 noon by legal time in the ACT on 19 December 2016. 2016. More than five years ago. That's what they want the law to apply. Distributions already made to shareholders more than five years ago. It's outstanding. How can you comply with a law when you do something five years before the law is introduced? You don't have to be a constitutional lawyer to work out there's something wrong with that. The second point is, when you actually read the details of the legislation, it's extraordinarily complicated with respect to effect and purpose of capital raisings. Can I give you my considered legal advice on the basis of 28 years as a commercial corporate lawyer? It's a swamp. The only people who are going to make money out of it are the tax lawyers and the tax accountants. And third, it's totally disingenuous. It says it relates on a government announcement made in 2016 when Scott Morrison was treasurer. We're going all the way back to that. You don't have to be Michelle Grattan to work out. If a proposal didn't come in legislation after 2016 into this place by now, it was a political dead duck. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it has never been more important to make more of the essential vaccines and medicines that we need right here in Australia, like life-saving mRNA vaccines. But despite the need for urgency, despite the need to put the nation's best interests first, despite the need for cooperation, we had the former Morrison government reported as saying they would support any bid to bring mRNA manufacturing to Australia only if it was anywhere but Victoria. Well, just this month I was proud to be at the announcement of the location of Moderna's first Southern Hemisphere mRNA manufacturing facility at Monash University in Melbourne in Victoria. Because the truth is, a project of this scale, this importance and this size couldn't be anywhere else because Victoria is Australia's home of medical research and manufacturing, home to 18 world-leading medical research institutes, inclu including the Doherty and Burnett Institutes, now well known to all through the pandemic, home to one of the largest medical science workforces in the country, home to the world's leading international pharmaceutical manufacturers, home to top universities, including Monash University, where the first Australian mRNA vaccine candidate was invented. 
and home to excellent public hospitals, over 40 directly involved in clinical research and trials. Victoria is Australia's science and innovation capital. Because of the sustained vision and investment of the Andrews Labor government and of our medical research and manufacturing communities for more than 20 years. And that vision has well and truly paid off for the people of Victoria and Australia, with growing international investment, thousands of good, secure jobs, and of course, better health and better lives too. Senator Tyrrell. Tasmania produces the best wine in the world. You mainlanders make an OK drop, but Tassie wine is special. Mainlanders know it. They come in droves to Tassie to sample our wine and eat our cheese. They spend up big. A lot of jobs in our state rely on the tourists who come for our wines. For the last few years, a grant program run by the government helped our wine producers open cellar doors to sell directly to tourists. More cellar doors equals more tourists and more jobs. Now this grant is in danger. It's normally announced in July, but this year, silence. This is a retrospe retrospective grant, so wine producers have built it into their business plan. They're anxiously waiting to hear if the program is continuing and wondering if they'll take a financial hit if it isn't. I visited local wine producers. The people who run these vineyards aren't millionaires. Their mum and dad operators having a red-hot go at running their own business. They've told me that without this grant, they might have to put, out, put off staff. Without these grants, plans for expansion might not happen, expansion which other businesses in the area are relying on. This is just the latest blow for them. In the past few years, they've lost exports to China, lost tourist revenue through COVID, and suffered catastrophic bushfires in 2016 and 19. They're also facing a third year of crop-threatening La Nina rains. The government is reviewing all grants programs at the moment, and I know that money is tight, but these businesses are worth investing in. They put our tourist spots on the map, they win international awards for their wine, they bring in tourists and employ local people. We can't leave these businesses in limbo any longer. The government needs to announce that the Australian Wine, Tourism and Cellar Door Grants program will run again this year. I urge them to do it as soon as possible. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a senator, sometimes an issue comes to your attention that is so egregious that you have no choice but to act. For me, this was in 2016 when I learnt that, unknowingly, tens of thousands of Australians have for years been paying overseas child traffickers, traffickers to traffic at-risk children from their families to be exploited in so-called orphanages. That's right, colleagues. Good-hearted Australians and their children paying to have an orphanage tourism experience, one that they are led to believe uh, will assist these so-called orphans. The reality, however, is far different. Over 90 per cent of children in these institutions are not orphans. They are often terribly abused, and they are trained to smile and to put on a show for the constant parade of paying visitors from all over the world. Good-hearted Australians with the best of intentions find the prospect of assisting orphans so compelling that they don't do any due diligence on the facility or on the children themselves. It is quite simply the perfect 20th first century scam. No one wants to believe that instead of doing good, they have effectively paid for the trafficking and the exploitation of children. It is a multi-billion dollar criminal enterprise globally. So, colleagues, consider this. In Australia, we know the damage that long-term institutionalised care does to our own children, which is why we closed orphanages. And we would never, ever, ever have paying people come and visit our children in care. So why on earth do we think it is okay to do this to other people's children simply because they were born in developing countries? We have created this trade and now we have a responsibility to end it. And I look forward to continuing to work with my parliamentary colleagues to stamp out this hideous practice. Thank you. Senator Polly. It was announced in May this year that an Albanese Labor government would provide $4 million in funding to the Clifford Craig Research Hub based at the Launceston General Hospital. 
This funding would allow for a boost in research performed by the Clifford Craig Foundation, which will lead to improved health outcomes for northern Tasmanians. The Clifford Craig Foundation has been at the forefront of medical research in Tasmania, based in northern Tasmania, and this funding will ensure a world-class fit-for-purpose facility can continue to develop the Foundation's stellar reputation. The facility will operate as an all-encompassing hub to harness medical research but also attract the best doctors and clinical staff to northern Tasmania so that we can improve the general health outcomes for all Tasmanians. This funding will also benefit Tasmanians' health system, particularly in the areas of clinical research, education and training, as well as having the full support of the Clifford Craig Foundation. The proposed hub has the support of St Luke's Health, the Royal Flying Doctors Service and the Launceston Health Hub. This $4 million commitment from our government will ensure that the capital works of the project are completed. The Liberals have dragged their feet and refused to invest in the health of Tasmanians for too many years. It's evident that this Liberal government that they didn't care when they were in office, and what they did, in fact, was cut health services to regions uh, in Tasmania. Tasmania, in the middle of the Omicron wave of the pandemic, they cut the psychologi psychological support that Tasmanians badly needed. Labor built Medicare and will ensure it is protected. Going forward, we have a strong record of investing in medical research as well as direct services to benefit all Tasmanians, and we will build on that record because Labor cares about our health. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Victorians have had enough. Victorians have had enough of the lies, the cover-ups and the corruption. Victorians are sick of living their lives under a man whose incompetence is only matched by his ability to deny responsibility for the mess that he and he alone has created. Victorians are sick of the economic mismanagement. The state has a projected debt of $170 plus billion, greater than the combined debt levels of New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania. Victorians have had enough of the government interfering in their lives, their businesses, their homes, with absurd overreach like the permanent pandemic powers which has, which has enabled one man to act like a quasi-dictator. Victorians have had enough of the erosion of their parental rights and seeing their children exposed to inappropriate sexualised content in the classroom. Victorians have had enough of one man, his government, and his incompetence as a leader. The red shirt scandal, slug gate, hotel quarantine, no ambulances, school closures, toxic soil in the West, the Belton Roads fiasco, which resulted in the Morrison government having to step in and block the deal. A health system on the verge of collapse after years of neglect. Elective surgery waitlists that are among the longest in the Western world. Suicides, family breakdown, misuse of public funds, cover-ups, bankrupt small businesses, divorces, closed playgrounds, closed beaches, five kilometres from your home the most locked down city the world has ever seen. The list just goes on and on. Victorians want to move on. Victorians want to heal. They want room to breathe and to live their lives without fear. Victorians, remember this November and never forget what you went through. Victorians, make your voice heard. Chairman Dan, he's got to go. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, nearly two years to this day, a global tragedy unfolded off the west coast of Tasmania. At remote Strawn Beach near Macquarie Harbour, over 470 whales were stranded on the beach. Uh, regardless of the valiant efforts of conservation volunteers, local communities, aquaculture workers, scientists, uh, a big majority of those whales perished. Um, in an almost eerie coincidence, exactly two years to the date, of that global tragedy, Australia's biggest whale stranding ever, we've had another whale stranding off the coast of Tasmania, uh, over 250 pilot whales stranded. This following just a few days earlier, a very rare stranding of 14 whales uh, on King Island, uh, 14 sperm whales, very rare in uh, the waters off Tasmania, very rarely beached. Um, why? Nobody knows. 
There are a lot of theories out there, but nobody knows. Can we do more to stop this from happening? Yes, we can. Are there gaps in our knowledge and research? Yes, there are. Um, I would like to today uh, thank once again all the legends who have been down there in the freezing cold in heartbreaking conditions working to save these whales. And, um, we are to them as we do to the many frustrated uh, Tasmanians and Australians indeed global community that are horrified to see this happening again. We are to them to actually do more. Um, so, uh, the Greens will be proposing a, uh, a one day or two-day hearing through the Environment and Communications uh, Committee to actually look uh, at what we can do and what the federal government can do to assist the state government in its efforts uh, should this happen again. Senator Little. Thank you. An Australian dies almost every hour, yes, every single hour, from alcohol, drug and gambling harm. One in four Australians will struggle with alcohol and other drugs or gambling misuse in their lifetime. Note these describe individual impact without the compounding human, social and economic cost for all Australians and Australia. Evidence, data and lived professional experience should weigh heavily in decisions because it is those things, not emotion nor well-meaning intention, that must triumph and trigger the right action every single time. There are real people in those numbers. For Indigenous Australians as a group, we are much less likely to drink alcohol and uh, not drink alcohol, but those that do, do so at more harmful and dangerous levels. Our mean age at death from alcohol attributable causes, cirrhosis, organ failure, brain damage, haemorrhage, is about 35 years, every one of them preventable. In South Australia, alcohol-related hospitalisations are three to four times higher than that of the general population, the representation highest from remote and very remote regions. The recent Rethink Addiction Conference had a clear message of hearing from those with lived experience, rather than through representations constructed by other people. I heard from them that real change is possible with frank and fearless conversation, dispelling myths and ending the stigma, stopping people from getting help. Data is a big issue. No, actually, it's a significant issue. It's there. We need to use it. It is, however, not often easily interrogated or comparable across borders, making it easier to hide or even ignore the true impact, and that has to be addressed. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Last week marked 10 years since the murder of Jill Maher, attacked by a stranger while walking home from a night out with friends. Her murder sparked an impassioned national debate on women's safety, another impassioned national debate. Every year or two since, a senseless and awful act of violence makes the headlines and briefly captures the nation's attention. The murders of Eurydice Dixon, Aya Masawi, Courtney Heron, the murder of Hannah Clark and her three children. These vile acts galvanise the women's movement and its allies to take to the streets, to light candles, to write to their politicians pleading for action, reclaiming the night. But what changes? In the 10 years since Jill Maher's murder, at least 650 women have been killed violently. Many don't make the news, especially if they're women of colour, First Nations women or women with disabilities, and the majority are not killed by strangers but by people they know. The uh, long overdue national plan to end violence against women must be fully funded. It must drive cultural change, and no woman should be turned away when she reaches out Thank to a you, service Senator for help. Waters, your time so much has expired. We'll statement. now move to question time. Um, Senator Farrell. Yes. <coughs> Chair, um, uh, sorry, President, um, I have a statement by leave concerning ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Senator Wong will be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business overseas. In her absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. The Minister for Defence, uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister for Defence Personnel and Minister for Defence Industry, in addition to all of my other <coughs> um, responsibilities. Gallag Senator Gallagher will represent the Minister for Climate Change and Energy and the Minister for Environment and Water.
Thank you, Senator Farrell. Now move to questions, and I call Senator Little. <laughs> Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. When asked on 28 July 2022 if the government is intending to remove compulsory income management from the Northern Territory, you told the Senate no. The instruments that give effect to the operation of compulsory income management via the Basics Card are due to sunset this Friday. Can you confirm that the government will not let these instruments sunset this week and will extend the operation of compulsory income management? Thank you, Senator Little. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank uh, Senator Little for uh, that uh, question and for her uh, <coughs> deep and uh, sincere interest uh, in this uh, area of uh, policy. Um, when I answered that question uh, <coughs> on the last time it was uh, Raised, of course, um, the answer I gave was the uh, uh, the correct uh, the correct uh, answer, <coughs> and uh, um, the no, no, we haven't uh, been rolled. No, I don't get rolled. Uh, <coughs> no, I don't get rolled. Um, <coughs> so the I'm, I'm simply making the observation that the statement I provided to the Senate on the last occasion, I think it. Uh, um, th th that I was asked this question it was the uh, correct uh, the correct answer. Um, I think the the difficulty that um, <coughs> the opposition is is having uh, with this whole uh, cashless uh, debit card uh, issue is that there's a lack of understanding that <coughs> although you had this sort of policy that you were all committed to. Um, and you believed it was uh, working and successful in the communities that you'd applied it to, all of the evidence that is now come out— um um, Minister, could you sorry. resume your seat, please? Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, on a point of order, um, I believe the senator on this side of the chamber was asking a very specific question around the extension of instruments that relate to income management in the Northern Territory. The minister seems to be referring to the cashless debit card, which is not the subject of the actual question. Do you think you could perhaps ask the minister if he could address the issue about the proposed extension of income management via the basics card in the Northern Territory? Thank you, Senator Rustin. And, uh, the minister is being directly relevant. He has responded to the question as it was asked. Please continue, minister. Thank you. Thank Thank you, uh, President. And I don't think I could have been more directly relevant or more, more directly answering the question that I was asked. I was asked a question about statements I'd made on a previous occasion in the Senate when I was asked similar questions, and uh, I thought I answered that question as directly uh, as, uh, as it uh, <coughs> is possible uh, to do. And I can't think of anything else I could have said. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, President, there was one question here about whether these instruments would be extended. Uh, if Senator Farrell, who's now taken a minute and 56 seconds, is unable to provide that answer, uh, he should commit to come back to the chamber and do so promptly, given they expire and sunset this week. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Sen uh, the minister was also asked about a question he'd asked previously, and he ha is being directly relevant. Uh, please continue, Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, I, as, as I was saying, I thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Little, uh, first supplementary. Good work again. Can <laughs> can the minister confirm that the Albanese government? has now had a backflip on your intention to repeal the cashless debit card by introducing amendments to extend its use in Cape York, the Northern Territory and in a voluntary capacity in the four other CDC trial sites. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, President. And once again, I thank uh, Senator Little for her, uh, her question and her interest in this, uh, in this area. Um, all of the places that uh, you've just uh, outlined are places where um, we are making changes to uh, the operation of the, uh, the cashless uh, debit uh, card. Um, I think the, the first and fundamental point, and again, <coughs> I hate to lecture 
the opposition, but <clears throat> the Labor Party took this policy to the last yeah, election. Yeah. We, we went to the people of Australia. We went to the people of Australia, and we said uh, we don't believe that this system of income management that um, you had uh, you had established um, in an ideological uh, in, in an ideological fashion is working, and we intend we intend to change it, and that's what we're doing. And so today and tomorrow, that's exactly what we're going to be doing uh, in this thank chamber. Thank you, Minister. Their time has expired. Senator Little, uh, second supplementary. Thank you. So the Albanese government has announced $50 million for additional drug and alcohol treatment programs in the CDC trial sites. Does this announcement, along with the introduction of the new amendments, mean the government is finally acknowledging its policy to repeal the CDC will have serious social harm for the communities which rely on it for critical support? Great question. Minister. Um, the answer is no, and I'll, I'll tell you why, uh, Senator uh, uh, Little. Um, in, March, in March 2020, your then government committed $49.9 million in additional funding to alcohol and other drug-related treatments. So you've, you've committed the money, but, but what happened? How much of that $49.9 million was spent, was spent, was spent on, on dealing with alcohol uh, issues in Indigenous communities. Yes, you're right, Senator Brown. The answer is zero. Not one single dollar of that money was spent. Now, the new, the new minister, the new minister, and she's a terrific minister. I know, I know, I know her very well, Senator, uh, not Senator, <coughs> Minister Rishworth. She should be in the Senate. She's doing such a good job. Thank she should you, be in minister. the Senate. Minister, your time has um, expired. Our Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the state of the budget and some of the challenges facing the budget? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman uh, for her question and her interest in all matters relating uh, to the Australian federal budget. Um, when Parliament returns after this sitting week, it will be to hand down the October budget. The Treasurer and I announced last week that we will release the final budget outcome for the 21-22 financial year this Wednesday. And I think we've been very upfront about the serious challenges facing the economy and the substantial pressures hitting the budget. And one of the biggest pressures, of course, is the management of the trillion dollars of debt that was left to us by the former government. With higher interest rates, that debt will now cost the budget more to service with billions and billions of dollars that we will need to find in the coming years that has not been provisioned for. And that, of course, is on top of the funding that was promised uh, by the previous government for the last financial year that did not get out the door to benefit Australians, and much of which will pass over to the next financial year. Whether it's COVID support, delayed infrastructure projects, support for flood victims, in there, there's at least $6 billion that those opposite promised to spend in the last financial year but didn't, and we will now have to pay for these as they flow over through the October budget. But the Treasurer and I have been very clear that this, uh, the former government did not make provision for a lot of the costs that are going to have to be managed by this government, because this is a government of grown-ups. This is a government that actually does their work. This is the government that's methodical in our analysis, that weighs up the evidence for policy decisions, that makes those really often difficult decisions when we go through the budget process. That is our commitment to the Australian people. That's why they elected us. They wanted someone to manage the budget responsibly, to be fiscally responsible, but also to make room for all of those areas that Australians value in terms of, of their services and um, access to to support. Uh, Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, can the Minister explain how the Albanese government will help Australians deal with cost of living pressures in the upcoming October budget? Thank you, Senator. Minister. And I can. Um, thank you, Senator Payman. 
We know Australians are doing it really tough, which is why our first priority is dealing, delivering responsible cost of living relief. Responsible because it needs to take some of the pressure off people, but also grow the capacity of the economy and not make the Reserve Bank's job harder. A great example of this is our childcare policy, which every member on this side is so proud of, with the legislation being introduced into the House this week. This will be a game changer for family budgets, for our workforce and for the productive capacity of our economy. And we know what we stand for on this side, rock-solid support for game-changing, economy-building, cheaper childcare. It's a no-brainer. Sure, anyone who is serious about helping with cost of living would support cheaper childcare, and surely if you spend every day lecturing the government about cost of living, you would support that policy as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Um, what steps is the Albanese Labor government taking now that it is in charge of the budget to properly manage some of these major challenges while still delivering on its promise? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for the supplementary. We've been responsibly assessing and, um, line by line through the budget process about where Australian taxpayers' money is going. We want to ensure that the budget is managed properly, but we are, that we are able to meet our commitments and, of course, manage some of those incoming um, budget pressures. Apart from implementing our election commitments, which are obviously important in terms of our economic plan for Australia, things like cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines and fixing the aged care crisis, but we've also had to deal with issues left behind by the previous government. This includes around $5.5 billion in unavoidable spending. Around $3.5 billion of this was extending COVID relief payments in line with isolation requirements, vaccine eligibility, support for aged care facilities and replenishing medical stop files, all unfunded by the previous government, and around $2 billion in relation to disaster recovery, all necessary funding but Thank you, Minister. Are not the provided time has for. Expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Cyber Security, Senator Watt. On 22 September, Optus confirmed they were responding to a significant cyber attack. Can the minister outline what steps the government has taken to protect Australians who may have had private data stolen in this attack? Thank you, uh, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. I know cyber security is a matter you're uh, very genuinely interested in, and I think all Australians were concerned uh, to see uh, this apparent cyber attack that occurred over the last few days involving uh, Optus data, uh, and I think that's because Australians do expect that when they hand over their personal data, particularly to corporations, that every effort will be made to keep it safe from harm. Uh, and as a result of this data breach, unfortunately, it appears that millions of Australians have been impacted uh, uh, in, a, in an unfortunate way. Uh, as Senator Patterson recognises, the information that we have to date is that the breach involves people's names, date of birth phone numbers, email addresses, residential addresses and, for some customers, passport and driver's licence numbers being for sale on the dark web. Uh, so this is very concerning, I think, to many Australians. Uh, I do note, however, uh, that Optus has advised uh, that while a ra wide range of data has been breached, uh, according to Optus, payment details and account passwords have not been compromised. So that is at least some uh, saving grace, I guess, for, for Australians who have experienced this. Uh, since the government was advised of this matter last Wednesday, the 21st of September, uh, a range of government uh, bodies have been working to contain the incident, including the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Australian Federal Police. Uh, of course, uh, for obvious reasons, I won't go into the technical assistance and cyber security advice that is being provided to Optus or the wider efforts to help protect Australians. Uh, but I can assure Senator Patterson and all Australians that uh, hundreds of Australian government staff have been working long into the night and over the weekend to stem the damage uh, flowing from this, and I want to thank them for their efforts. Uh, the Minister for Home Affairs has, of course, been continually briefed since this issue commenced, uh, and I note also that the thank Leader you, of the Opposition Minister, was briefed today. Your time today. has expired. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I thank the Minister for his answer and for also anticipating my first supplementary question. So I'll move on to my second supplementary question. Why did it take almost three days for the Minister to publicly respond in the form of three tweets sent at three-quarter time of the grand final to the most significant cyber attack in Australian history? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, I don't think that is a fair characterisation of the minister's response to uh, this incident. And as I say, uh, a number of government bodies who are directly responsible for responding to these sorts of incidents were involved as soon as they were informed of it by Optus. And, and I'm, I'm assured that the minister herself uh, was continually briefed and worked with those agencies uh, to stem the damage flowing from that. So, as I say, I don't think that's a fair characterisation uh, of the minister's uh, performance or approach to this. Uh, she, I'm assured and I'm very confident that she has done everything that is appropriate for her to do as minister. Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam President. It's now six days since one of the largest cyber attacks in Australian history has, has occurred and the minister is yet to publicly front up to speak about what action the government has taken or when it has taken it and to detail the actions the government has taken. When will the minister publicly hold a press conference to answer the questions that Optus users and Australians have about this issue? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Well, uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Again, I completely reject uh, the premise of Senator Patterson's uh, question. Uh, and in fact, um, any cursory examination of media regarding this subject over the last few days will see that the minister has made a number of public comments about uh, this incident, about her concern about it, about the actions that authorities are taking and about the additional reviews that she intends to undertake in relation to cyber security. Uh, please resume your seat. Senator Patterson. Uh, on relevance, Madam President, the question was when will the minister hold a public press conference to answer questions about this matter? And I believe the minister is being relevant. He has outlined a number of media comments the minister has made, but I'll hand the question back to him. He's heard your comments. Minister. Um, thank you, President. And I mean, I think it's somewhat ironic that we have a member of the opposition questioning this government's approach to cyber security, because let's not forget uh, that when the opposition was in, in power, only one in four Commonwealth entities met the essential eight cyber security obligations in 2021, according to the op, uh, Audit Office. The, the then government, now opposition, released a ransomware bill one year after the opposition released a discussion paper calling for a ransomware strategy. So I think Thank any you, independent Minister, observer would recognise a good performance. Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Women. Minister, Australia now has one of the poorest paid parental leave schemes in the OECD. We're stuck at 18 weeks paid leave with two weeks for partners paid at just minimum wage without superannuation, a pay cut for many working families at a critical moment in a family's life. Meanwhile, the rest of the OECD has overtaken us with the average period of paid parental leave now around 52 weeks and close to full wage replacement in many places. Australians and organisations from across the country, parents, women, unions, employers, are united in their call for a, uh, more paid parental leave for Australia's parents, especially mothers. This is one of the most common and most united points of discussion at the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, and not a voice was raised against it. When will your government increase the length of paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator Pocock for the question and acknowledge her um, deep expertise in, in this area. Um, as, as the question or the preamble to the question um, implied, this was an area that was discussed at the Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, there is a lot of support for extending uh, the paid parental leave uh, system in Australia. Of course, it was a, a scheme that was put in place by a former Labor government because it's Labor governments that, that do these big things, that answer these big policy challenges. Uh, and whilst I'm not here to announce um, any um, an extension of the PPL scheme. I would say that as Minister for Women, uh, it's something that I am looking at uh, closely if, if and when we can make room um, in the budget uh, for this. Um, we're also dealing with significant deficits, significant deficits across the forward estimates. We have a trillion dollars of debt, which I said in my last question is getting more costly to manage, uh, and there are no shortage of very good ideas uh, that the government would like to fund if we had the capacity to do so. I would also say that uh, last week I announced the Women's um, Economic Equality Task Force um, on the, that's chaired by uh, Sam Mostyn. It has a great, fantastic group of 13 
women. Um, they will be providing advice to government, uh, and I have no doubt that PPL and improvements to the PPL scheme will be a part of the work that, that they do. Um, the former minister responsible for implementing the PPL scheme, Jenny Macklin, is also on that task force, and it came up at the first meeting. So I think there is agreement about the fact that we need to improve our PPL scheme, uh, but the budget is under real stress, and I have to manage those challenges as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, those supporting increased paid parental leave know that we can afford it, and we can afford it now. We can afford to increase the length of leave, the rate of payment and pay superannuation on it. Rather than give a $9,000 tax cut to the 227 politicians in this building and to the very well off, we can redirect stage three tax cuts to the parents who need it most. Will you set aside the stage three tax cuts and instead improve paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Our position on stage three tax cuts hasn't changed. Um, and I would also say that the amount of good ideas that are coming to the government would more than um, exceed the allocations related to that. I'm just making the point that you, in the Greens policies alone, the Greens policies alone, I think, would have the Green, sorry, the Forward Greens out. policies alone would spend that ten times over. Um, on the point of PPL, I genuinely, I genuinely and the government genuinely wants to look at how we can progress this when we have made when we have the room in the budget to do so thank you minister senator pocock second supplementary and you mentioned jenny macklin in her second reading speech in the introduction of the first the paid parental leave bill in 2010 she drew attention to the need uh, to pay superannuation on paid parental leave but here we are 11 years on and no progress on that front. We must make sure that mothers in particular don't find themselves living in poverty after a lifetime of work and care. Why should the price of care be poverty in old age? Will your government ensure that all periods of parental leave are covered by superannuation payments thank you, Senator so Pocock, that parents your time aren't has left expired, behind? Minister. Thank you, President, and uh, I look forward to working with Senator Pocock to advance women's economic equality in this country. It is absolutely a priority for this government, as you would have seen in the, some of the policies that we took to the election uh, and some of the uh, ways we raised the uh, level of interest in women's economic equality at the Jobs and Skills Summit. So I do look forward to working with anyone in this uh, chamber who wants to genuinely progress economic equality. Um, and obviously super on paid parental leave has always been part of, of the discussion. I have no doubt that the Women's Economic Equality Task Force will be looking at this and providing me with advice in uh, the near term. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Could, you, could the minister provide an update on the progress of the Albanese Labor governments to diversify Australia's export markets? Minister. Thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Polly for her deep and abiding interest in this, uh, in this issue and uh, a, particular, a particular interest to her home state of Tasmania. After a uh, decade of the Liberal government, Australia is more dependent than ever uh, on a single market for our exports. Placing all your trade eggs in one basket has proven to be bad economic strategy. The uh, COVID-19 uh, global uh, pandemic, supply chain volatility, which have uh, been exacerbated by uh, Russia's illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine and Chinese uh, trade blockages have exposed the growing risks for Australian exporters, jobs and prosperity. To address these challenges, the Albanese Labor government is implementing a trade diversification plan that will provide opportunities for Australian businesses to gain new market access into major markets and facilitate inward investment to help build the infrastructure for the green economy. The Liberal government dropped the ball by failing to conclude parliamentary processes to enable entry into force of the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australian-Indian Economic Cooperation uh, and Trade Agreement. Unlike uh, the previous government, the Albanese um, Labor government— Minister, please is resume your seat. Order, order, 
Order. Senator Billett. President, I'm having quite a lot of trouble hearing. And for, for, a side, for a side of parliament with no policies, uh, I think they Senator should Billick, listen. It's not an opportunity but to I make can't comments. Hear, I seriously cannot hear Thank him. you. I will ask order, senators. Order. Order. Senator Mackenzie. Um, Minister, please continue, and I ask senators to listen quietly. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, unlike the previous government, the Albanese Labor government is working hard to conclude all treaty and legislative processes to enable implementation of the UK and India trade agreements this year. Yes, this year. Given the importance, <clears throat> given the importance of implementing these trade deals as soon as possible, uh, we expect support from the opposition benches in both chambers for the expeditious passage of the relevant legislation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Madam President, could the minister provide an update on the progress of the trade negotiations with the European Union? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Once again, thank uh, Senator Polly for her question. Um, despite many years of negotiations, the Liberal government failed to land a trade deal with the European Union. In fact, negotiations stalled as a result of the Morrison's government's disrespectful treatment of a close ally. I'm happy to report that negotiations are now back on track. Last week, I met with the French Trade Minister, and it was a very positive discussion. In the meeting, we reiterated our support for concluding the Australia-European trade agreement negotiations, uh, preferably by early next year. Uh, we acknowledge that an ambitious and comprehensive trade deal would provide an opportunity to boost two-way trade and investment to further strengthen our bilateral relationships. On the same day, I also met with members of the European Parliament's uh, Committee on uh, International Trade. It's clear that the Albanese government's strong commitment Thank to you, address Minister. climate Your time change— has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. Madam President, the minister recently participated in trade negotiations to launch the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What is the framework and how will participation benefit Australia, Minister? Minister. Thank you, President, and once again thank Senator Polly. Earlier this mo month I did uh, join uh, ministers from 13 uh, other partners across the Indo-Pacific in Los Angeles to launch negotiations for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Together, IPEF members represent over 40 per cent of global GDP and, for Australia, eight of our top ten trading partners. At the meeting, it was agreed that negotiations would cover a range of new and emerging issues on trade—supply chains, clean energy, decarbonisation and infrastructure, as well as tax and anti-corruption. Launching IPEF negotiations is a significant step in the future of greater economic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. It brings together the United States, North and South Asian partners, including India, uh, and most importantly, uh, our Pacific neighbour, Fiji. IPEF is an important element of the Albanese Labor government's trade diversification agenda. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts. The question is to Senator Gallagher, representing the Minister for Health. Minister, I understand that the TGA is conducting a review of their ban on prescribing ivermectin for COVID. Can the minister confirm this review is underway, state the return date, and advise the Senate of the current advice to medical professionals on the use of ivermectin for COVID-19? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Roberts for, for the question. Um, I understand the TGA received an application from a, a doctor uh, to amend the poison standard in relation to ivermectin, and um, I think that kicks off an automatic process, uh, which the application is to remove those restrictions that were placed on ivermectin uh, when it began being um, prescribed to treat COVID-19. Um, and so the application is to enable uh, GPs to be able to prescribe it. I think that kicks off a process which is automatic in the TGA and the application is currently open for public consultation until the end of this month. Um, 
and then it will be discussed um, at the ACMS uh, by the ACMS at their next meeting on the 9th of November, and an in a decision, an interim decision, is expected by February uh, 2023, uh, and a final decision later in 2023. I understand, in terms of advice, whilst this process is underway um, separately. Um, there hasn't been any change in advice uh, around from the TGA, which led them to put those restrictions on ivermectin as a prescription for COVID-19. That that hasn't changed. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. On August 31st this year, the Brazilian University of São Paulo published a peer-reviewed paper that found regular use of ivermectin as a prophylaxis for COVID-19 led to a 92 per cent reduction in COVID-19 mortality rate amongst their sample of 88,000 subjects, a 92 per cent reduction in mortality. Minister, how much more proof does this government need to overturn the ban on ivermectin today and stop costing lives? Thank you. Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you. Well, I have full uh, trust and faith in the processes that the TGA uh, implement in terms of making advice and recommendations um, uh, and placing restrictions in this case on the use of ivermectin. I would say uh, that there are there's a range of um, academic research, not all that would be putting the case as you put it. I've seen other studies that have been done that um, ha show that there is no clinical benefit from using ivermectin. So I think, and that isn't unusual. That isn't unusual in in some of these um, trials. It isn't unusual to have a, a, a significant difference of opinion. Um, but from uh, my point of view, the TGA has served us very well through this um, <coughs> pandemic. Um, they have provided very good advice. Um, their processes are rigorous and thorough. Uh, and this process that's now underway, I'm sure we'll look at the issues that have been raised by this doctor, but as far as I Thank can you, see, there's Minister, no reason to change. Expired. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Whether separate from or part of a royal commission, Minister, will you conduct an inquiry into the failure of medical advice on ivermectin and specifically who made the decision to ban ivermectin, who is responsible for the harm that came from that decision? And when will you apologise to the politicians and medical professionals who were right all along? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you. Well, I think we have a fundamental um, disagreement happening here. I do not accept the position that you're putting, um, Senator Roberts. I understand you have a particular view on this, but I believe that the Therapeutic Goods Administration have operated very well during this pandemic. Uh, the Prime Minister has made it clear that at the right time, um, when we're through the pandemic, that you would definitely have a review of some sort into looking at the, our response to the pandemic, uh, but I do not accept the proposition that you're, place, you're putting about the use of ivermectin. Um, the evidence that's before the TGA is that um, there did need to be restrictions placed on it. It's not the only drug where there are restrictions placed on it. There are other medicines that cannot be prescribed by GPs or where they have to go through a process. Uh, but um, based on the information the TGA has provided, uh, they see good reason to put those restrictions on. Um, and that other process, which I spoke of in the first answer, will um, report back on those dates that I've outlined. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Since July, the opposition has been calling on the government to adopt the Coalition's online privacy bill which reflects the urgent need for greater online privacy protections on social media and other platforms such as those run by telecommunications companies. What steps has the government taken to prioritise these reforms? Thank you, Senator. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank uh, <coughs> thank uh, Senator Henderson for uh, her uh, question in this, uh, in, in this important topic. And of course, it's got that extra element of uh, importance uh, as a result of uh, the cyber security threats that we saw uh, <coughs> last uh, week, and, week and over the weekend uh, in respect of uh, Optus. I think um, the starting point for a discussion about this, and uh, I think this is what uh, we've discovered, uh, <coughs> is that uh, how little um, the previous government did in this space and that the problems that uh, we've now inherited are problems because um, 
Uh, we... uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Point of order on relevance. It's a very specific question that I asked. What steps has the government taken to prioritise the reforms Senator in Henderson. the online privacy bill Thank you, proposed by the coalition? I don't need the question um, repeated. I've taken uh, notes of the question. I believe the minister is being relevant, and I'll continue to listen to make sure the elements of your question are answered. Minister. Um, well, look, I, I was trying to explain that the reason that we need uh, uh, need uh, legislation in this uh, in this space is, of course, because the previous government did nothing about it. And I <coughs> noticed uh, Senator Hume's comments uh, over the uh, over the weekend, where she said, "We don't have policies; we are in opposition, not in government." And <coughs> I think what's now very clear is. Not only does, does the opposition not have policies in opposition, uh, they Minister, never had any policies Minister, in government. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Henderson. Uh, a, a point of order on relevance. I would ask um, the senator to be relevant to the online privacy bill and whether the government is taking any steps to prioritise these important reforms. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Minister, I'll just refer you back to the question that was asked by Senator Henderson. Thank you, uh, President. Um, look, the Albanese Labor government is committed to protecting Australia's personal information. Uh, the ri rise of the uh, digital platforms and the use of modern technology has created uh, a whole host of uh, new privacy challenges and risks that we saw over the weekend, <coughs> including the collection and the use of a vast amount of personal information by social media platforms. Australians should have better control over how <coughs> their personal data is collected and used and uh, confidence that when they engage with a business or a government agency, their data will be protected and not misused. Uh, and, uh, Thank Australia's you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. The Optus cyber attack must surely be a wake-up call about the urgent need for greater online privacy protections. Isn't it the case that the government has been asleep at the wheel on both the need for the online privacy bill and broader reforms of the Privacy Act to which the coalition committed when in government? Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Farrell. Senator Henderson, you can't be serious about asking. You cannot be serious about asking that question. You cannot be serious about asking that question because for 10 years, for 10 years, including time in time when you were in the lower house, for 10 years you did nothing about this issue. And of course we find that the uh, issues uh, that occurred last week with, uh, with Optus have occurred in a set of circumstances where there is no legislative protection. Um, based on all of the years, all of the years you had to uh, deal with it. Now we do intend to uh, protect Australians' privacy. Yeah, we do intend to protect it. Um, I might point out to you, Senator Henderson, we've only been we've only been in government for uh, for, for for a few uh, for a few months. You had ten years. You had ten long years to try. You had ten long years. You had ten long years to. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. I'm just going to wait for quiet, Senator Henderson, before I uh, invite you to ask your second supplementary. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam President. As part of the former government's consultation on the online privacy bill, Optus argued that telecommunications companies should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws. More broadly, Telstra and Optus also argued against consumers having the right to erase their personal data. Does the government agree that telecommunications companies Order. should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws? Uh, I'm not going to call the minister until there's quiet. Minister. For that protection. Um, um, look, I doubt whether Optus is... Uh, running that uh, argument uh, today, Senator uh, Henderson. But can I say this? The Attorney-General and the Attorney-General's Department uh, has ex engaged extensively with experts, community organisations, businesses and privacy advocates on his proposed uh, Privacy Act. And the Department uh, so far, <coughs> and I'm happy to provide these to you, has provided two consultation papers 
It's received 434 submissions and held a series of uh, round tables. So I don't think— <coughs> um, um, Senator Henderson, please wait until you're called before you—so please go ahead. A very specific question I ask. On relevance, does the government agree that telecommunications companies should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws? Thank you, Senator Henderson. I do believe the minister is being relevant. Minister, please continue. I started out my, my answer, uh, Senator Henderson, by, by saying that I doubt very much whether uh, Optus is uh, now pursuing that particular, uh, that particular argument. Well, I've explained to you all of the things that the Attorney-General is doing in order to consult with all of the all of the relevant organisations. Uh, so Thank you, to... Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, my question with minimal notice is to Senator Watt, representing the Attorney General. Uh, former Senator Rex Patrick is in the federal is in the federal court challenging the Information Commissioner for unreasonable delays in dealing with freedom of information reviews. These delays impact everyone trying to get answers from the government. While in opposition, now Attorney General Mark Dreyfus provided an aff affidavit supporting Patrick's case. Despite this, under the now new Attorney General, the Commonwealth continues to oppose the case. As at 1 August 2022, the total external Order. legal costs incurred by the Commonwealth in opposing Patrick's case were a whopping $301,667.12. Consistent with the sworn affidavit of now Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, and noting that some matters remain unresolved more than a thousand days after referral, will Labor now support the case of former Senator Patrick to prevent unreasonable delays in dealing with freedom of information reviews? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge, for the question. I appreciate the advance warning of the question as well. Um, the well, that's common courtesy. You might Order. want to learn a little bit of that. Order. Um, I always displayed common Order. courtesy to you through opposition. Maybe you could uh, Minister do the Watt, same. Interjections across the ta across the chamber are disorderly from both sides. Order. <laughs> Minister Watt, please continue. Goodness. Thank you, President. Um, the uh, Senator Shoebridge's question goes to uh, legal action undertaken by former Senator Rex Patrick, uh, who I think all of us would recognise made a bit of a name for himself here uh, in the accountability arena. Uh, I understand from Senator Farrell that now Mr Patrick, former Senator Patrick, is running for a Lord Mayoralty in South Australia. So I presume that he'll bring the same level of uh, accountability to that role should he be successful. Uh, in, in direct answer to the question, uh, this matter, as you have recognised, is currently before the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment. Uh, but there can be no doubt whatsoever as to this government's commitment to transparency, in contrast to the abhorrent and willful ignorance of transparency that we saw for 10 years under the former government. Uh, we, we, are, we are on the verge of introducing legislation to introduce and establish a new National Anti-Corruption Commission. I, I see Senator Mackenzie welcoming that, and I wonder why it didn't happen for any of the 10 years that she and her colleagues were in government. Uh, perhaps one day we can talk about that outside the chamber, and she can uh, illuminate me on that. But that is just one example of how this government intends to be far more transparent about its actions uh, than what we saw for 10 years under the coalition. Uh, and as I say, this, this matter before the AAT will be resolved, and that's the appropriate forum in which for us to discuss this matter. Senator Shoebriggs, first uh, supplementary. Well, we're talking about transparency and taking you at your word, Senator, that you're committed to transparency. Well, can you now provide an updated cost of how much this case has cost the Commonwealth to today? It was 301,667 fighting transparency as at the 1st of August 2022. How much has been spent to date? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Thanks, President, uh, and thanks, Senator Shoebridge. I can absolutely uh, assure you that I'm happy to provide that information. I will have to take the details on notice. I don't have that figure at hand, uh, but I will take that on notice and um, get back to the Senator ASAP. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Well, well it gets worse. Because in a recent letter to the Attorney General, the Information Commissioner said her office was underfunded and revealed that in 2020 21, there are now 667 
freedom of information reviews were more than a year old, an increase of some 50 per cent in that year. Would you agree, Minister, would you agree that any funding for the Info Information Commissioner might be better spent not in court arguing against someone suing against unreasonable delays, but instead staff in the office to respond thank on you, time? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I well remember Senator Shoebridge uh, the resourcing difficulties that the Information Commissioner had over the period of the former government, because on a regular occasions I asked the Information Commissioner about exactly that matter in Senate estimates when we were in opposition. Um, and it was disgraceful the way that the former government starved the Information Commissioner of resources in the way that it did. Now, already though, today, every question we've had from the Greens. Uh, as has been the case in other settings as well, calls for this government to spend more money. And we have to, take, we have to recognise uh, that we have inherited a complete financial mess from the former government. Earlier today, you were asking us to spend more money on paid parental leave, a worthy thing to do. Now you're asking us to spend more money on information commissioner, a worthy thing to do. I'm sure your next question will ask us to spend $11 billion on something else. We will weigh up all of those uh, things Minister Watt, uh, and, and Minister make the commitments Watt, that we can afford to do. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge. This question wasn't about additional funding. The minister has not been um, responsive to the question. This question was about instead of spending uh, it on lawyers, spend you. it on the information commissioner. Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. The minister is being relevant. You've got one second left. Have you finished? I refer to my earlier answer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Can the Minister please update the Senate on recent rain and subsequent flooding recorded in central and northern New South Wales and in the Gold Coast hinterland? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Sheldon, for the question. And can I thank Senator Sheldon publicly for the tremendous work that he is performing as the government's special envoy for disaster recovery, a new position that was created by this government in recognition that our disaster affected communities need all the support that they can get. Uh, and I personally thank Senator Sheldon for visiting around a dozen communities in the short time that he has uh, held this role and providing excellent advice to both me and the government more generally about what those communities need. Uh, I think all of us have noticed that over the last week we have been closely monitoring and responding to another difficult weather system, particularly over central west and northern New South Wales, as well as some severe thunderstorms in southeast Queensland. The worst of the flooding over the weekend was in the Namoi River in Gunnedah, with several streets, low-lying properties and businesses inundated. And I know that all of our thoughts go out to the communities that have been affected, particularly through New South Wales. There were also strong fears that Lismore would again see localised flooding, but fortunately forecasts there were downgraded. The Wilson River, which of course runs through Lismore, only peaked to minor flooding levels this time, well short of the level required to top the flood levy there. I want to commend the New South Wales SES services, uh, both paid and volunteer personnel, for the tremendous work that they did to pre-deploy resources to affected areas and to assist vulnerable people who were still recovering from the last floods earlier this year. The action that the SES took in getting ready for these events before they hit, I think, go, went a long way to ensuring that people were kept safe. As of late yesterday, the New South Wales SES had received 898 requests for assistance, including 64 flood rescue activations. Uh, and of course, South East Queensland was also affected, particularly the Gold Coast hinterland. Sadly, this flooding has taken the life of a young five-year-old boy in Tullamore in New South Wales after the car he was travelling in was swept away by floodwaters. Again, I know that all of our thoughts go out to that family, and it's another reminder of the life-threatening danger Watt, that your floods time has provide. Expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister remind the Senate of the weather outlook for this summer and advise how the government is preparing for these potential disasters? Minister Watt. To Sheldon for the question. As I've previously told the Chamber, the Bureau of Meteorology has officially declared a La Nina event for Australia, with above average rainfall predicted for most of the east coast of the country this summer. Given that this will be our third successive La Nina event as a country, something that I'm advised is incredibly rare, the risk of flash flooding and severe flooding is even higher than we have seen previously. That's why it's vital that our emergency management agencies are working to their best ability to make sure that we are prepared. Earlier this month, I formally launched the National Emergency Management Agency, or NEMA, bringing together the capabilities of Emergency Management Australia and the National Recovery and Resilience Agency into a single agency. 
NEMA brings together the capabilities of both agencies to provide support, prepare for future disasters, lead the response when disaster strikes and remain deeply connected with communities during recovery. Last week, I announced Mr Brendan Moon as the new Coordinator General of this new agency. Brendan is one of Thank Australia's Minister, foremost what, natural disaster professionals. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister outline what else the Australian government is preparing for communities for these potential natural disasters? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. As I've said before, good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst. That's what we've done in establishing a new agency, in appointing one of Australia's foremost disaster professionals to head it and taking additional action as well. It's why teams from NEMA have been out meeting with all states and territories to discuss their preparedness plans well ahead of this high-risk weather season. The briefings included a scenario-based discussion based on the bomb outlook to better understand the risks and enhance collective preparedness for the upcoming season. But how we respond to natural disasters must not just be about the immediate response. Last sitting, this government introduced amendments to the Disaster Ready Fund legislation, and these amendments will ensure that the full $200 million allocated in the fund per year is spent on disaster mitigation while maintaining our commitment to support communities as they recover from disasters. And we've also been rolling out important funding in New South Wales under the Emergency Response Fund for disaster mitigation projects. It's what Australians deserve, and it's a far cry Thank from you, the Minister, I don't hold up Your time has hose. expired. Senator McKenzie. Fine. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister guarantee that the Albanese Labor government will put an end to the uncertainty faced by farmers and transport operators and restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Minister. Order, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, Senator Steele. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, I'm not aware of. I, I think the question was are you going to restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Um, I'll have to take um, that on notice, President, and come back to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. National Road Freighters Association President Rod Hanafi says it all comes down to cost of living, and I quote, road transport is at breaking point. Drivers and operators can't keep footing the bill for rising fuel costs. Not all can easily pass these costs on, and it simply adds to the cost of living across Australia. It's unsustainable, and supply chains will soon grind to a halt if this new federal government doesn't step in. When will the minister give industry and the Australian community certainty, given the fuel excise is due to be reinstated from Thursday this week? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, and I will come back to the chamber if there is further information I can um, provide. Um, obviously, we are going through a range of uh, decisions at the moment uh, through the budget process. Um, and I would also point out that the budget is in a terrible state, right. as I've been trying to make clear all in all rules. of the public statements I've been making rules. about the budget, is, is, is that we, whilst there are a whole range of things and a whole range of stakeholders who would like us to invest more, to spend more, and to support them during um, some of the increases that that co in costs that they are experiencing, um, we have to we have to balance that with the fact that you guys busted the budget. Like you, you doubled the debt before the pandemic, you doubled the debt before the pandemic. You failed to fund ongoing programs that are ongoing, Thank and we you, will Minister. have to Your deal time with that. Your time has expired, Senator McKenzie. Our second supplementary. Thank you. The TWU, ARTIO. NRFA and Nat Road have all written to the Treasurer calling for certainty. Rising operating costs are already impacting the sustainability of road transporters, drivers and operators who already operate on razor-thin margins. Industry groups and unions are in lockstep on this issue. When will this Labor government stop sitting on their hands and restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Order. Order. Is that a policy? Minister. 
Uh, thank you, um, President. Well, I've already undertaken to come back to the Senate if there is further information that I can provide. But the government is currently weighing up a whole range of different requests uh, and challenges facing the budget. We are going through that process now. And whilst there are a whole range of areas Order. where people want us to invest more or respond to a particular challenge, we have to deal with these matters in a fiscally responsible way. That is the government that we are going to be, and if there is anything further that I can provide, um, President, I will come back to the chamber with it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, senators, um, the minister has the right to respond to the question uh, in silence, as does the person asking the question. I ask you to show some respect, Senator Urquhart. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline the latest details in the government's plan to deliver an Indigenous voice to parliament? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Urquhart for the question. Uh, as senators would know, the Albanese government has committed to implementing the Uluru Statement uh, in full, and we will hold a referendum to enshrine an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the constitution in this term of parliament. This will be a once-in-a-generation opportunity to recognise our First Nations people in our founding legal document and to make Australia a better place for everybody. Because no matter what side of politics you're on, I think we can all agree that something needs to be done, and as a country, we can do better. The Voice is about making a practical difference. It's about addressing poor outcomes from the long legacy of failed programs and broken policies by listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about what works. The government will this week convene the first formal meeting of the referendum working group. This group will provide advice to government on the big questions that need to be considered in the coming months. Firstly, the timing to conduct a successful referendum. Secondly, refining the proposed constitutional amendment and question. And thirdly, information on the voice necessary for a successful um, referendum. Uh, Senator Farrell. We're trying to we're, we're, we're trying to listen to uh, the issue of the uh, uh, order the order order Senator Farrell order I would ask all senators to listen to the response from Minister Gallagher in silence and not uh, Senator Nampajinka Price. In particular, you've been disorderly throughout her response. Um, please continue, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Um, thirdly, the information on the voice necessary for a successful referendum. Its work will be complemented by the establishment of a second group, the Referendum Engagement Group, that will be tasked to build community understanding and awareness for the referendum. The groups comprise a broad cross-section of representatives from First Nations communities across Australia, and they will ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander views are front and centre in the decision-making leading up to the referendum. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Urquhart, first supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Albanese Labor government's commitment to delivering a voice to parliament will make a difference for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I'm very happy to answer that question. A voice to parliament will be about hearing from the grassroots, from the community, about what can be done better. It's a direct line to parliament to make a practical difference in areas like um, housing, keeping children in schools, in education, in health, in infrastructure, in community safety. It's about local communities finding local solutions to local problems. And the idea of a voice came from those communities. It's about ensuring First Nations Australians are heard, that they're heard on policies, that they're heard on laws, that they're heard on what works. And I would encourage everybody in this chamber to get involved in the discussion, even if you disagree or have a difference of appointment, and work together to bring about this nation-building change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate why a voice to parliament is important for all Australians? Minister. Thank you, um, Madam President. 
And I thank Senator Urquhart for the question. Well, it's about respect, really, isn't it? It's about respect. Um, it's about listening to Order. First Order. Nations people. It's about Senator ensuring Rushton. that our constitution recognises the longest continuous living culture in the world is reflected in our country's constitution. Our, our founding document is reflected. Senator Nancy That's what it's about. Everyone wants to work together to make Australia a better place. And that's why all of us have a role to play in this debate. It is about talking to friends. It's about listening to what's being proposed, even if you have a different view. But being part of the discussion, it's not a radical proposal. It's a fair and practical change, and I urge everybody to Thank get you, involved Minister. in the discussion. Thank you, Minister. expired. Senator Farrell. Oh, President, could I ask that further questions be put on, Thank uh, on notice? Yep. Thank you. And I also uh, have a further response to Senator Little's uh, question of uh, Thank you. myself. Um, I'd like to add some additional information to the answer I provided to Senator Little on the topic of income management. While income management legislation in the Social Security Administration Act of 1999 <coughs> does not sunset, it operates through a number of legislative instruments that sunset every 10 years. These instruments enable uh, income management to operate in specific locations uh, and or um, income management measures. Six of these legislative instruments were due to sunset on the 1st of October uh, 2022, and I think that's what you were <coughs> referring to. In order for the government to consult effectively with communities on the future of income management, the Attorney-General has agreed to deferral of the six instruments for a period of 12 months. Our consultation with communities will then uh, direct the future of income management. Product level, blocking <coughs> product level blocking technology will be maintained under our government's plan to support participant and merchants under the Enhanced Income Management Program. It will reduce the stigma associated with the business card under the current Income Management Program. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Pursuant to Standing Order 74.5, which requires that questions on notice be answered within 30 days, I, at the request of Senators Cash and Bragg, seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister as to why answers to questions on notice numbers 98, 126, 127, 128, 129, 139, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 254, 255, 256, 257, 289 and 326 have not been provided within the requisite 30 days. That's a very good question. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, well, Minister Birmingham would know something about unanswered questions on notice. After all, he was the minister representing the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, as recently as just a few months ago. And can I tell you the number <coughs> about the uh, uh, former uh, Prime Minister's track record on questions on notice. When the election was called, the former Prime Minister had a total of 128 unanswered parliamentary questions on notice. 128. And it wasn't, it wasn't just parliamentary questions on notice that were left unanswered. The Prime Minister's own department had a total of 390 one unanswered questions on notice from uh, Senate estimates, 391. I'm advised that the Prime Minister will answer these questions in due course, but we're not going to be lectured by the opposition after the government routinely failed to answer questions on notice in a timely fashion. Senator Birmingham. Deputy President, I move to take note of the answer provided by Senator Farrell. Well, Depu Deputy President. We were told it was all going to be so much better. 
We were told they were going to hold themselves to a higher standard. We were told endlessly, of course, how terrible the previous government were, and we heard Senator Farrell attempt to do that just again. But it turns out, Deputy President, that it was all just talk. It was all talk from those opposite that indeed there are 22 overdue questions on notice from the Prime Minister alone already. 22. Senator Farrell likes to remind this chamber that the previous government was in office for nine to ten years. Now he comes in and says, and there were 128 questions that were overdue from that time frame. Well, you've only been there, as you like to remind us, Senator Farrell, for some few months, and yet you've already racked up 22 to the Prime Minister alone that are overdue. It was all talk. You have broken your promises to this chamber. Indeed, let's look at what some of those promises were. Senator Watt, Senator Watt said just last year in June, we deserve answers and transparency. It is not negotiable and it should not be negotiable for the Prime Minister to comply with the standing orders and properly answer these questions. Well, why then is it that Mr Albanese through Senator Farrell, is now trying to negotiate around whether or not he complies with the standing orders in terms of answering these questions. Remarkably, Senator Watt was still going on with some of these claims, even in question time today. He said, there can be no doubt whatsoever as to this government's commitment to transparency, in contrast to the abhorrent and willful ignorance of transparency over the years under the former government. Well, apparently there is doubt as to this government's commitment to transparency, despite what Senator Watt was saying in question time today, despite the fact he claimed that adhering to these standing orders was not negotiable, the government is walking away from them. Of course, it's not just Senator Watt. Senator Ayres, Senator Ayres indeed, reflecting directly upon me in the role Senator Farrell just referenced, Senator Ayres said back in November 2020, it is high time Senator Birmingham signalled a change in approach in terms of accountability and ministerial accountability in this place from what we have seen in a stoic refusal to provide timely responses to questions on notice. So Senator Ayres was there with Senator Watt arguing for timely responses. And now here they are lining up the excuses. Senator Mario Smith, in quite an honest and reasonable contribution very early on in her time here, said, I am relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. That presumably is why the standing orders are there, within 30 days. Labor senator after Labor senator used to say it should be within 30 days. Now, of course, they are failing in that regard, even those no longer with them. It's always nice to reflect on former Senator Keneally. <laughs> Even those no longer with them, Senator Keneally, who could put things very directly, standing orders require the government to answer questions on notice and to answer them in a certain time frame. It is not a technicality to avoid accountability. It is your responsibility as a government to be answerable to this chamber. It is the responsibility of the government to be accountable to the questions posed by senators, and it is your responsibility to conform to the standing orders. The standing orders require the government to answer questions posed by senators, including on notice. Various Labor senators, present and past, arguing very clearly that they believed questions should be answered within the time frame of the standing orders and that they would hold to a higher standard in that regard. This is a government that knows how to grandstand. We can see that from everything. They know how to grandstand, but they are already showing themselves to be incapable in the delivery. Grandstanding, yes. Delivery, no. Because guess what, Deputy President? It's not just the 22 questions to the Prime Minister that are overdue. There are, in fact, 117 questions to the new government that are already overdue. 117 questions that have been racked up that the government has got sitting in various places that already they are determining is not possible for them to answer. So despite 
all these grand claims that we have seen about answering questions on time, this government has shown itself to be hypocritical in that regard. And they're not just hypocritical in terms of this area of accountability. There are numerous areas of accountability in which this government is showing that it is not living up to the rhetoric that it took to the election, to the rhetoric that it deployed in this chamber previously, or indeed to the claims they still try to make about themselves. Take the ministerial standards. The ministerial standards, unveiled with great fanfare uh, by the new Prime Minister and a new ministerial code of conduct, and yet then it became apparent that his ministers hadn't either read the code of conduct or ensured compliance with the code of conduct. Because subsequent to the unveiling of the code of conduct, which came some time after the ministers had been sworn in, the ministers were sworn in, then the code of conduct was unveiled. You would assume ministers had been informed of it before it was publicly released. You'd certainly hope that's the case, Deputy President. Then subsequent to that, three ministers at least have been forced to change their interests after it was publicly revealed they were in breach of the new code of conduct. The NDIS minister, Mr Shorten, the local government minister, Ms McBain, the assistant trade minister in this place, Senator Ayres, all had to go through and make changes after the public disclosure of their breaches to the code of conduct. So a government big on rhetoric about accountability big on rhetoric about transparency, won't answer its questions on time in this chamber. Its ministers have been found to not be reading or not complying with the code of conduct. Or indeed we had the issue raised by the Australian Greens in this chamber today, the issue about national cabinet release of documents. Back in opposition, the, op the Labor Party constantly complained about the secrecy surrounding deliberations of National Cabinet. Mr Albanese and others endlessly attacking and suggesting that former Prime Minister was, and I quote, obsessed with secrecy over these issues. And yet, and yet, now Mr Albanese has confirmed after his first National Cabinet meeting that the Commonwealth has not proposed changing practices in relation to the release of documents from National Cabinet. And as you heard from the questions of the Australian Greens today, not only are they not proposing changes, uh, but they're continuing to defend the decisions of the former government. Now, I'm not, Deputy President, necessarily criticising their decision in that regard. It's the hypocrisy that I'm shining a spotlight on, the hypocrisy uh, of a mob of Labor politicians who endlessly criticised the former government and railed against the former government in relation to the way it handled such matters of release of information, and yet then, when it comes to office, simply goes and continues past practice, ignoring all that they had to say before. They are the living embodiment of hypocrisy in the way in which they are conducting themselves in this regard. We see it in chamber management too. Chamber management here in terms of, again, a government that used to rail against the application of guillotines, mm -hmm. complain about curtailing of debate, but now has been more than happy to do so whenever it suits them, and not just in this chamber, but even more remarkably, what they've done in the other place, Deputy President, in the other place where they have the numbers to be able to simply change the standing orders, they've done that. And they've done that basically embedding a permanent gag and yes. guillotine in the standing orders Shame. of the House of Representatives. So much for debate in the House of Representatives, so much for empowerment of the greater diversity of members of parliament in the House of Representatives. It now basically just takes a minister to declare that legislation is urgent. Done. They don't have to give any reason. They don't have to say why it's urgent. They don't have to meet any other criteria in relation to its urgency. The minister just says it's urgent, and then all of a sudden a range of automatic guillotines take effect. That once declared urgent, a bill in the other place is subject to automatic guillotine. The changes collapse the consideration of the uh, consideration in detail phase of the debate in the House of Representatives, meaning that any amendments, government or otherwise, are simply moved together, voted on immediately. 
Deputy President, that's not a government committed to transparency. That's not a government committed to accountability. That's not a government committed to the proper functioning uh, of a parliament. That's the behaviour of a government that simply wants to drive through its own way without any consideration for transparency, accountability or the proper functioning of government. What we see with those opposite is that despite all the grand and lofty promises they made during their years in opposition, despite all the great criticisms that they tried to deliver, they ultimately are failing to live up to those standards. Now, Mr Albanese, even when he was releasing his code of conduct for ministers, claimed that they were committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, and that ministers in his government will observe standards of probity, government and probity and governance. Well, Deputy President, where is the integrity and accountability when ministers breach the code of conduct None. and have to have it called out by the media, be shamed publicly into changing the way their affairs are ordered, and then try to deny that there was actually anything wrong? Where are the standards when you have a government that claims endlessly that it's frustrated in the delivery of answers when they're in opposition? moans endlessly that the then government was failing to adhere to the standing orders, promises endlessly that they would do better, but then, when it comes to their own behaviour, within just a few months has racked up 117 overdue questions. 117 overdue questions across a range of different areas of public policy. The 22 that I highlighted today to the Prime Minister were questions asked by my colleagues Senator Cash and Senator Bragg across different issues in relation to superannuation industry policy, different issues in relation to workplace relations or in relation to the administration of government. They're not particularly tricky questions, Deputy President. These, at the early stages of a government, you would think are relatively straightforward questions for a government to get on and answer. So how, why is it the case that this government has been unable to do so in the time that they have had. 30 days they've had these questions, and yet the clock has seen them run over and fail to do so. 117 across all of the other portfolios. So, Deputy President, let it stand that this government is a government proven to be one who was just all talk when it came to these sorts of standards pre-election. And now they're breaking their promises to the Chamber, to the Australian people, to themselves even. No doubt they'd convinced themselves going into the election, and now they're breaking their promises to themselves as well. They're a government who will no doubt continue to grandstand and claim that they're doing better, that they're doing differently, when in fact the proof is in the data, the proof is in the behaviour that they are letting themselves down, they're letting this chamber down, and ultimately they're letting the Australian people down. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, transparency, integrity and accountability. This is the Prime Minister of Australia, the man who went to the last election stating that if he was elected by the Australian people, an Albanese-led government would be the hallmark of transparency, integrity and accountability. And yet today what we see is Mr Albanese has fallen over at the very first hurdle. And in providing an explanation on behalf of the Prime Minister of Australia, what did we get from the minister representing the Prime Minister? Well, actually nothing. Nothing but excuses and blame. You see, what the minister and the Prime Minister clearly fail to remember, you are now in government. You set the standards by which you wanted the Australian people and this parliament to judge you. Transparency, integrity and accountability. And yet on each one of those standards, with 117 questions overdue, and it's not like you had a short time in which to provide the answers, this is overdue now for over 30 days, you have failed in every regard. 
And as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate stated, when those in government were on the other side of the chamber, they were very demanding when it came to questions being answered on time. And yet now, now that they are in government, they don't hold themselves to that same standard of accountability. In June last year, just over 12 months ago, what did now Minister Watt say in relation to the failure to provide answers to questions on notice in a timely fashion? He said this, we deserve answers and transparency. He went even further actually and said it is not negotiable and, and it should not be negotiable. At that time, for the then Prime Minister to comply with the standing orders and properly answer those questions. Well, of course, that Prime Minister is now his Prime Minister. That Prime Minister is Prime Minister Albanese. And according to what now Minister Watt said at the time, Mr Albanese has failed. Mr Albanese has decided that transparency is negotiable, even though when they were in opposition and we were in government, it was not negotiable. And then, of course, Senator Mario Smith, on the 15th of October 2019, what did she say? I'm relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. Well, I agree. It is not an unreasonable request, in particular when you are the now Prime Minister of this country and you have gone to an election on the basis of integrity, on the basis of transparency and on the basis of accountability. The Prime Minister should stand true to his words and ensure that at all times he complies with the standards that he himself set. The Prime Minister made a huge fanfare a huge fanfare when he announced what he said was his new code of conduct for ministers. What did he say in the foreword to the code of conduct? Signed personally by Anthony Albanese, the now Prime Minister. He says Australians deserve good government. The Albanese government is committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, will observe standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. And yet, when it comes to ensuring that they comply with the standing orders in this place, the Australian Senate, all of that goes out the window. And the now Prime Minister thinks, well, I won't personally observe the standards of probity, governance and behaviour that are worthy of the Australian people. And in making all the fanfare that he did in relation to his code of conduct, at clause five, accountability, he says this. Ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of parliament or a parliamentary committee. Now, Deputy President, this is the code of conduct which Mr Albanese made great fanfare when he announced it. This was going to be the code of conduct to end all codes of conduct. And yet what we have is the Prime Minister himself and they've only been in government for what is it now over 120 days, and he is already failing the code of conduct that he himself signed off on. But what is worse, as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate has stated, the Prime Minister has been more than happy in the past to have several press conferences about the ministerial arrangements of the previous government, and yet when it comes to taking responsibility for his own government and answering questions, very serious questions, he is nowhere to be seen. The questions on notice, and there's 117 that are outstanding, which have been asked of this government, in particular in this case, asked of the Prime Minister of Australia, are very important. 
And in, ca in the case of the questions on notice that are outstanding for me, they seek to inquire into what discussions Labor ministers and the Prime Minister's office had with a number of union stakeholders. Ah. Exactly. But Senator Scar, as you would know, many of these stakeholders have donated millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Australian Labor Party. Money comes in by way of donations, policy goes out. Exactly. There's one accord in town, and that's the accord between the Albanese Labor government and the union movement of Australia. And then when we deign to ask very simple questions, just some what, when, where, why and how, we are treated with complete contempt. And in treating the opposition with contempt, the Albanese government is treating the Australian people with contempt. Because the Australian people deserve to know the answers to these questions. But again, of course, we know the contempt with which the now Prime Minister treats his code of conduct. He says in a big press conference there's a new code of conduct. All his ministers will abide by it. And yet what do we see? Within the first few months of the parliament, we see minister after minister in potential breach of the code. As I said, what the code actually says is ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of parliament or a parliamentary committee. And what do we have? Minister after minister after minister ignoring this code. And what does the Prime Minister of Australia say? The Prime Minister of Australia, who went to the election on the basis of transparency, integrity, accountability and honesty, well, let's be honest, he really doesn't seem too interested in whether his ministers are actually abiding by it or not. In relation to one of the first ministers to have a conflict, Minister Christy McBain decided the best way to divest herself of a number of her shares was to actually give them to her husband, oh. which was unfortunate. Which was unfortunate because if you actually read the ministerial code of conduct, it actually says that is a breach of the ministerial code of conduct. It will exactly, Senator Scar. In this case, she clearly didn't read it. She clearly didn't read it, albeit I understand all ministers were actually issued with a copy of the Code of Conduct. Perhaps Mr Albanese didn't give them the instruction that they should also read the Code of Conduct, because had Ms McBain read the Code of Conduct, she would have understood that you can't just transfer the shares to her husband. What did she say and what did Mr Albanese say? Nothing to see here. No breach of the Code. There has been nothing that has been done wrong. Then you had the second minister, Minister Jed Kearney. She had an interest in a fund which had a number of holdings in a fund with significant exposure to health care, despite having a portfolio in that area. But again, according to the Prime Minister, who is big on transparency, integrity and accountability in the lead up to the election, when his ministers are called out, there is nothing to see here. But of course we have the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus. Mr Dreyfus, who loves to lecture, and we saw it in question time today actually with Senator Shoebridge's question, who loves to lecture others on integrity. Who refers people to the police. He does frivolously, frivolously referred nine of his political opponents to the Australian Federal Police just to get a headline because none of these referrals were in any way successful. But Attorney General Dreyfus, for the Hansard record, was heavily invested in a fund which owned shares in Omni Bridgeway, a company which put out a press release, and you can go online, you can Google this, go online and see this, praising a decision by the Attorney General in regards to litigation funding policy, a policy which strongly benefits that company. On any analysis, whether you're a minister in the Albanese government or not, how the Attorney-General of Australia would think this is a good idea 
is quite frankly unbelievable. But when and he is the attorney, he should know. Well, he should have read. He should have at least read the code of conduct. When he was questioned about this in the parliament, though, he actually said to the parliament, as he was reading his answer, it's fascinating to actually watch. If you actually go online and watch the video, as Mr. Dreyfus is reading out the code of conduct, you can actually see his face, and he realises. He actually needs to report back to the parliament on the matter. But this is very, very typical, colleagues, of the Albanese government. What's good for the government when they're in opposition is not the standard that they are going to live by when they themselves get into government. When you look at the fact that this is the Prime Minister of Australia who has failed to answer very simple questions. In terms of the statistics, over 16 per cent of questions in the Senate are currently overdue. 16 per cent of the questions asked are overdue. One would think three months, and one would think that when you are elected on a platform of transparency, integrity and accountability, no questions would be overdue. But it gets worse, because when you break down the 16 per cent, over 40 per cent of that 16 per cent are actually overdue, and they were directed to the Prime Minister ah, of Australia. He has only been asked 48 questions on notice, and yet he thinks this parliament, this Senate, is beneath him to respond. And as I said, if you treat the opposition in this place with contempt, you are treating the Australian people with contempt. The Australian people who believed in transparency, integrity and accountability are being failed miserably by the Prime Minister of Australia. Transparency, integrity and accountability. Those are words in the lead up to an election which the Prime Minister is happy to throw around. But when he gets into government, when it gets into government, it all goes out the window. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read out the, the relevant clause from the, uh, this new, new ministerial code of conduct that's been in for several months, when I say new. And it says at 5.1, ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of the parliament or parliamentary committee. Now, it is somewhat shameful. It's somewhat shameful that we have a prime minister in this country who goes around lecturing us all about good on integrity and about transparency, but also about good manners. This prime minister is big, big about oh, we've got to have good manners in public life, and we've got to good manners when it comes to trying to, to change things. But when it comes to answering questions, the prime minister doesn't have any good manners. Uh, the good manners have got in a, a big, large, large white car, gone to the airport, and flown off overseas with him. And this is the problem. We've We've got a Prime Minister who's not engaged in the day-to-day -day running of this country. We've got a Prime Minister who doesn't want to answer questions. So 40 per cent of the questions that have not been answered in this chamber come from the Prime Minister. That is 40 per cent. So this is a Prime Minister who spent the last three years going around the country uh, like some sort of demented robot talking about transparency and accountability and how he's pure than pure. Oh, and he grew up in public housing. Isn't life terrible? But I'm going to be honest and transparent. But he gets into power. He gets in that big white limo. He gets in that leather spin around chair and he goes, well, Bugger this. Uh, thank you, Senator Hughes, for that um, uh, eloquent um, uh, Senator quite McGrath, disorderly. Senator McGrath, let's just keep the standard of yeah, well, I, I at a high Senator level. Hughes. She's leading the Australia, as, as she is want, want to do, so, and, and as the Prime Minister is leading the country, Australia. But 40 per cent. Now, that is, that is a big number. But when it comes down to it, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy President, there's 22 questions. Now, the, so the Prime Minister doesn't want to answer these questions. 
But I'm going to read out these questions, and I think it is important these questions are more on the public record so those poor people up there in the public gallery can leave this chamber and they go to the Queen's Terrace Cafe and have a, a double shot cappuccino just to make sure that they understand that the Prime Minister of this country is snubbing his nose at this chamber, snubbing his nose at accountability. Now, the first question put, um, from my, my good colleague Senator Cash here, question on notice number 130, 139, um, says, on what date did the the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet provide an incoming government brief to the Prime Minister or his office following the May 2022 federal election? That's a pretty simple question. Like it's, it's a classic machinery government. So it's very, very easy. So, so what was the date? So we weren't asking him to do sort of algebra. We weren't asking him to solve a uh, of world peace. It was what date did you get the incoming brief? Now, not too tricky at all. And, and this, this you know what answer he gave? None. No answer. None whatsoever. None. No. 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 answer. Um, and also, we did ask, can a copy? Or Senator Cash asked, can a copy of the incoming government brief prepared by the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet be provided? Well, no answer. None. Zip. You know, yet nothing happened there. So a very, very, very simple question. Now. The next question, in my view, is also very simple, uh, and, and the answer will shock people too because there isn't an answer. And so, my, my, my good friend here, Senator McCarthy Cash, uh, asked the Prime Minister, with reference to the additional information provided by Minister Watt on 28 July 2022 at 3:05 p.m. So very precise, ladies and gentlemen, very, very precise. In, refer in relation to questions taken on notice from myself, being Senator Cash, in relation to a meeting held with the Construction, Forestry, Maritime Mining and Energy Union Construction Division on 17 June 2022, the meeting. So, very, very specific question. It wasn't like a random question, like when was the last time you had a scone or something like that. This was a specific question in relation to a me in relation to a meeting, in relation to a question that was uh, was asked by by, by, uh, by my, my good friend here that, uh, that, that that Minister Watt sort of didn't really answer. Um, but it was 3:05 p.m. So this is like an Agatha Christie. We we know where it happened. We know the time. So question one was. Can all briefing notes, file notes, emails and messages, including text messages and messages sent on any instant messaging service or application between the Prime Minister and or his office in relation to the meeting with the CFMU on 17 June 2022, the meeting, and or in relation to the Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022 announced by Minister Burke on 24 July 2022 be provided? This request covers both internal and external documents in the Prime Minister's office and department. Now, a pretty specific request. It wasn't what you'd call like a fishing exercise. No, Senator Cash said, you know, hadn't done a, done a general question. You know, you know, what's, your, what's your view on the weather? No, it was a specific question in relation to a meeting, in relation to information that, that referred to that particular meeting. So guess what? Zip. Absolutely nothing. Very, very disappointing. Then, they, they, then, then, Senator Cash, and you are living this at the moment because you are standing up for, yeah, and you are standing up for the taxpayers of Australia, those, those poor, poor people who that mob over there are about to take away their stage three tax cuts. By the way, so breaking news there. That's not going to happen. We can all see that coming down, coming down, down the hallway. But can copies of any correspondence between the department and the prime minister's office about this meeting, including but not limited to email, instant messages, for example, test messages, what? Etc., or by letter be provided. So, so we have asked for this on behalf of the people of Australia, on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia, but also weirdly, and, and I, I don't want to be sort of existential, um, um, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, we've actually asked on behalf of the Prime Minister. Because the Prime Minister has talked to all of us about the importance of transparency and accountability. We just lectures us like he's one of those who could bore for Australia about this, but he just does because he's one of those people, he's a, he's a bit of a chatterbox, but he doesn't deliver. And he certainly hasn't deli delivered on this. And what we want to do, we want the Prime Minister, because we were team players, we're team players. We want the Prime Minister to do a good job. We want the Prime Minister to deliver deliver on his promises. We want the Prime Minister to be that man he promised to be for the last three years. 
Now, we all know, I'm going to let you in a secret, we know he's not going to do that. We know that he is a creature of the socialist left of the Labor Party, and there's going to be taxes going up, new taxes. There's going to be there's a giant vacuum cleaner over regional Australia at the moment, sucking all the money out of that so it can go to building trams in Redfern or something like that. As important as trams for Redfern might be, that we have a Prime Minister who is not doing what he said he would do. He is not standing up for accountability and transparency. Now, I am going to read another question now. So, um, so for those who are watching in the office, um, you know, watching at home or watching the office on the internet, you know, don't make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Just yep. sit down, and you are—you just hold on. It's like a roller coaster. <laughs> Here it comes. So, so, Senator Cash. Um, Ask the Prime Minister again. You know, the Prime Minister, you know, Saint Anthony of of of, B, of accountability, transparency, and you know, telling the truth. Um, so, Senator Cash, question on notice number 197, said, refer with reference to the additional information provided by Minister Watt on 28 July 2022, 3:05 p.m., uh, in relation to questions taken on notice from myself, that's been Senator Cash, in relation to a meeting held with state and territory ministers with responsibility for workplace relations on 5 July 2022. The meeting. So, very specific time, very specific meeting, and look, it wasn't like a meeting just with one person. It, this was with other ministers. So other ministers representing other jurisdictions, all paid for by the taxpayers of Australia. Uh, you think there would be some accountability here, but uh, no. So question number one: Was the prime minister or his office aware of this meeting? If yes, when and how did they become aware? So you'd think the prime minister. Look, look, I'm not the most technological person in the world, but I can go to my Microsoft Outlook and I can sort of, you know, do a search and whatever, and look backwards and find out when I had meetings and things like that. So it, it, you don't need to be a Rhodes Scholar to operate Microsoft Outlook Diary uh, and find out when you may have had a meeting or not had a meeting. So, and I, there are a lot of people who work in the Prime Minister's office. We see them. They all walk around this building rather grandly and push me out of the line at Aussies and things like that because they're very important people. Um, but I think one of them could actually work out how to use Microsoft Outlook and find out that did the Prime Minister or his office become aware of this meeting on the 5th of July 2022? So I sort of don't know what they're doing in that office. Like 40 per cent of the questions have not been answered. Uh, they're paid for by the taxpayers of Australia, and we've got some very simple questions. Yeah, just, 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 I don't know what they're doing. So we haven't got anything in relation to that. So question number two. Did the Prime Minister or anyone from the Prime Minister's office attend this meeting? If so, who and what position do they hold? Well, they could so, just ask at morning tea. No, well, what they could do, they could ask at a morning tea. They like what we know. They brought back in the morning tea. They're big on morning teas. Uh, they bring on, you know, big on like having lots of biscuits and things like that because that's how you rebuild the economy. But what you think is they could have done an all, all of office email. Yeah, we see that. And just say, by the way, did anyone here know about this meeting? Uh, you know, whoopsie, someone forgot to go. Like my bad. So you think someone would have done that? But no, because they are welcome. Welcome to the new paradigm of of the arrogance of of this this this. I mean, it is a new government. Four months, but it's actually they are the government. Breaks my heart to say that. I workshop my pain, but they are the government. They're in charge, but guess what? They're not really doing anything because they're not answering questions. Now, question number three that my, my good friend Senator Cash asked is, um, if the Prime Minister or his office did not attend the meeting, was the Prime Minister or his office briefed on this meeting or the outcomes of this meeting? If yes, A, when and by whom, and B, what was the Prime Minister or his office told? Look, these aren't difficult questions. You know, we're not saying, you know, Work out world peace. We're not saying um, work out pi and sine and things like that without using a calculator. We're saying, did you attend the meeting? Was there some information in relation to me? Was there a briefing? No. Because we know, guess what, Prime Minister's office? We know there was. We know there was. So by not answering these questions, you're not just lying to us, you're lying to yourselves. And we want you to be better. We want you to be, be proud to spend the taxpayers' money and do a good job. We know, we know you won't, we know you're terrible, but at least try and answer these questions. So question number four. Can copies of any correspondence between any minister's office and the Prime Minister's office about this meeting, including but not limited to email, instant messages, for example, text messages, WhatsApp, etc., or by letter be provided. 
Well, apparently not, because apparently there is only one photocopy in the Prime Minister's office, and that's on the blink because they're waiting for Terry from someone to come and, from Canon to come and fix it up. Because this is the issue. You know, the, the, the printers aren't working. You know, they need to put a password, or something like that. They can't print these things off. Photocopy is not working, and they're not going to. They don't trust Richard Miles and you know, borrow his photocopy or anything like that. They certainly won't trust the senator. So they're in trouble. Uh, not going to ask uh, uh, Minister Plebisek either. either. So, so, what is going on at the Prime Minister's office? What are they doing in there? Like, more, having an afternoon tea, probably right about now. And you know, question, question five is: Can a copy of any correspondence or briefing notes from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet or any other department about this meeting, including but not limited email, instant messages, for example, text messages, WhatsApp, etc., or by letter, be provided? No. Apparently not. It's, you know, it's, it's a no. It's like it's, there's no answer whatsoever. It's sort of like that awkward silence. You know, they're, they're frightened that people are going to talk to them. Uh, they've got a personality disorder, and they're just going to go and stand in the corner and stare at the wall. That is the political. What we're facing now in politics in Australia is a prime minister's office who do not want to engage uh, with taxpayers. They do not want to engage with this chamber. They do not want to engage. With, with being honest and transparent and accountable. And that is the lesson here, uh, fellow senators, that we've got a Prime Minister's office who, quite frankly, don't care about this chamber. They do not care about accountability. We've got a, a government here who do not care about us. So estimates is going to be interesting. So yeah, get, get lots of coffee for that. Yeah. yeah it's coming down, it's coming down. Oh, Minister, not my job, uh, Senator Watts. Yeah, yeah so Minister, uh, Minister Watt is very scared of Shane Stone. Bring back Shane Stone. Yeah, yeah. That, that'll scare, that'll scare him, that'll scare him. But, uh, Deputy President, um, it is very important, as 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 people who believe in a liberal democracy, that governments are held to account. And on a daily basis, when we were in government, we were held, held to account by the opposition, and that is important. And as someone who's worked around the world in various different um, emerging democracies, it is so important for that government of whatever persuasion to be held to account. But what we are seeing here is a government who are refusing to be held to account because they're refusing to answer simple questions about how, we are, uh, spe how they are spending money and how they are making decisions on behalf of the Australian people, but re refusing to release pretty basic information. And that that is shameful. So shame on the Prime Minister. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And, and you know, kudos Senator McGrath for going through some of those questions. But I don't even think you really touched on my personal favourite of the questions that has been asked. Uh, because I'm actually reasonably sure, whilst this question was asked of the Prime Minister, I'm even going to give him credit. This is probably not something he was personally responsible for. But I am reasonably confident that these details are able to be provided pretty easily, pretty quickly by his EA, by anyone in his office, because I know when I have hosted a function, all of these details are immediately available. So, uh, following on from Senator McGrath, the question asked by my good friend Senator Michaelia Cash to the minister representing the Prime Minister on the 25th of August 2022. Uh, there, actually, this question was asked twice. Question on notice number 289 and question on notice number 326. With reference to any functions, official or unofficial receptions or other events hosted by ministers, assistant ministers or their departments in their portfolio since 1 June 2022, can the following information be provided for each function? A. The name of the function. B. List of attendees, including departmental officials and members of the ministerial staff. C. Function venue. D. Itemised list of cost. E. Details of any food served. Uh, F. And this is my personal favourite. Details of any alcohol served, including brand and vintage. And G. Details of any entertainment provided. Because we know that those opposite have never seen a trough deep enough to get their snout in as quickly as possible. And I'm sure that those briefs, which would actually be sitting in someone's drawer already sorted, because that's the sort of information you get every time you host any sort of function, particularly in Parliament House, all of this information is provided to you. Certainly the name of guests. You do not turn up to a function as a backbench in the opposition without knowing who's going to be at events. 
And there is no way the Prime Minister is turning up at any function, nor any of his ministers or assistant ministers are turning up at any events without a list of all attendees. That would just be part of the event brief. But any event that they've ordered and they've organised would have all of that information. And I have no doubt that one of the reasons they don't want to provide this, because none of this information has been provided, because the vintage Moet that they probably served may not align with the alleged blue-collar working values that they purport to support. The fact that that snout has dolved into the trough well and truly within the first, if, you know, I'd like to say 120 days, I would have given it 120 minutes and they'd have been in. Within 120 minutes, the taxpayer-funded French champagne would have been provided. I mean, aside from the fact they don't even support Australian winemakers, except Senator Farrell, we've got to give him credit for the godfather. That's why they dined at Otis. The Otis group was only there because the only restaurant in Canberra to serve Senator Farrell's own wine. So we know Senator Farrell has an interest in the domestic wine market, particularly when it's supporting his own winery. But I think in any other instance, we know those opposite and those particularly at the far left of the chamber love a good drop of a vintage French. But of course, these are the people who are all do as I say, not as I do, who we've been listening to bleat on about. They were going to be the bastions of integrity, the bastions of transparency and honest government and lifting the standards. There were going to be no more mean girls. Everyone was going to be giving each other big hugs or oh, kumbaya. There wasn't going to be the tearing down. It was all going to be about support. It was all going to be love-ins. Oh, you know, I've got a two-minute statement tomorrow, and we've actually just lost a member of uh, a long-standing member of the Liberal Party, so I'm, I may give credit to him tomorrow. But because what I was planning to come and do was actually just read out some of the misogynistic tweets I've received in the last seven days, because I actually thought it'd be interesting to see how the tone of politics has improved since the Albanese government has come in and called for this kinder, kinder parliament. Because I can tell you, it has got worse. And not only has it got worse for conservative women, not only has it got worse, I mean, I've got to tell you, there is a meme that's come out today and it's hilarious. I mean, I think it's great. It's, it's me, Bronwyn Bishop and Prue McSween, and it's asking where's the factory that produces these. And as I said to reply to it, well, that must have been in response to who were your dream dinner party guests. Uh, but you know, then I got another one that was has Bronwyn Bishop and John Howard had another lo had a love child with a very flattering photo of me, which I sent to former Prime Minister Tony Abbott because we know he always claimed to be their love child, and he responded to me going, "Well, congratulations, the family's clearly expanding." But I digress. We're now talking about the tone, the parliamentary tone. But I'll tell you where we are going to see a tone towards women absolutely descend. And we know where women are going to be starting to be treated even worse than conservative women in this place and in the sewer of Twitter, etc., will be on work sites around this country. Because we know those opposite are all talk, but all delivery when it comes to union policy. As soon as John Setka gave you the call, as soon as those election results were in and John Setka was on the phone, you lot, quick as a flash, quick, let's get rid of that ABCC. We've got to get rid of any security for women on building sites. We've got to get rid of any security for workers on building sites that don't subscribe to the CFMEMU. Oh, we know how many, we know how many hearings there's been, how many cases there's been, how the CFMEMU just sees these fines as the cost of doing business the most appalling treatment of women on building sites. But we also know that we hear them bleed on about cost of living. There's a housing shortage. We need to boost the building sector. But how's this going to help? We're going to see building companies struggle even further to attract workers, to maintain workers, to keep their workplaces going and work sites operating, as the unions are given even more overreach and power. And this is only going to get worse. And if you don't think housing costs are going to increase. If you don't think building costs for businesses and, and uh, commercial properties are going to increase, you guys live in la la land. You guys, everything you do, you're making a bad situation worse. You add to inflationary pressures through every decision you make because you don't understand consequences. You just think, oh well, we'll do what Mr. Setka tells us, then everything will be okay. No, it won't. Building, yeah, 
Building costs are going to go sky high. We're going to see inflation follow through. We're going to see further pressure go on families trying to find housing. It's the same as what you're doing with the CDC. And you know that because you've now put $50 million more into drug and alcohol services. You know that there are going to be consequences for Indigenous families, particularly women and children, but you won't ever acknowledge it. You're just going to crawl back under some rock and pretend you don't know what's happening. Because over there, you don't understand consequences. All talk, no action, unless your union bosses tell you it's OK to do so. Absolutely appalling. But we do know that you're very big on action if it comes to photo shoots. We do know you're very big on action if it comes to overseas trips. Because interestingly, we're all back this week and we've got people here in the gallery. And what they don't understand, potentially you may not know, there was absolutely a number of weeks that we could have come back to make up for the week that we had with the Queen's passing. But no, 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 the new Albanese government who claimed they were going to be family friendly, all about work, family, work-life balance decided. Uh, with very short notice, they were going to put the first sitting week on the first week of school holidays. They also put the public holiday on last Thursday. Now, why was it last Thursday? Lots and lots of people wondered. Well, what a lot of people don't know is that Friday in Victoria, there already was a public holiday for the AFL. And today, there's a public holiday in WA. So Thursday kind of worked because uh, Mr Albanese was back from overseas and other, you know, and so didn't upset the Victorians because they didn't lose a public holiday, didn't upset the West Australians because they didn't lose a public holiday, but upset an awful lot of businesses, but also upset a lot of families because all of a sudden, my case, I had a daughter, I had to come home day early from boarding school. You had parents had to find something to do with their kids on the Thursday to send them back on the Friday for the last day of school. But what you don't know is Mr Albanese, who's so big about transparency and getting through all this legislation, he's not even here for the next two days. So why he's picked this week to come back when we actually have another four weeks that we could have used to come back? Because there are so little sitting days that you have allocated, that the Labor Party has allocated so few sitting days and pulled all the dates back because you cannot face the scrutiny. You will not answer the questions when they're put on notice and you do not like the transparency. You will keep us out of parliament as often as you can because you do not want to answer the questions. I mean, that is so obvious in this place with four ministers only in the Senate and clearly your ministers in the other chamber not providing substantial briefs because all we ever hear from ministers not my job or I'm not the minister for, that never washed when, it was on, when we were sitting on that side of the house. I can tell you I remember watching a number of my colleagues sitting here coming in with their folders. Hilariously, you could barely see them. I mean, thank goodness we had COVID because they had the seat next to them was empty for about the 19 folders that they had, which, you know, in the case of Michaela, I think required about Senator Cash, about six staff to carry them because they probably weighed about four times as much as she did. But that was because we had staff that had effectively briefed her, that had provided information so that when those opposite were sitting on this side of the House and questions were asked, we could answer them. Our ministers were briefed, even if it wasn't their direct portfolio responsibility. They had done the work. They had been briefed and they understood under this system of government they have responsibilities for ministers that sit in the other place so they could answer the question. As Senator Birmingham could answer the questions when he was asked representing the Prime Minister because he had been briefed. What we hear in this place when we ask questions to the Prime Minister, well, I, I don't even know what we hear. I mean, if anyone can tell me what some of those words were today, I'm not 100 per cent sure. There's no answers. There's a killing of time and in, you know, an inaudible amount of waffle, and then you kind of get a bit of a mumble. I mean, absolutely nothing that makes sense to anyone that would be listening at home were they sentences that would have passed the most basic of English exam. But yet this passes somehow for an answer from a minister in the Senate from this government. You know, this government comes in here and is talking to us about how they are this fantastic government, 120 days, they've done so much, achieved so much, talked about their job summit. What job summit? Like, they've talked about a job summit. They came into government with the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. And it wasn't a job summit that you needed to find work for people. You need to find the labour people. And when you make people unsafe on workplaces, 
When you put the unions back in charge, who represent 10 per cent of the workforce but give them 33 per cent of the seats, when you've got you know, over 50 per cent of Australians employed by small business, yet you give small business one seat, one seat at the table, how do you think you're going to actually attract the Labor? You're not. All you are doing is working to detract Labor. You are working to do everything you can to deter people from wanting to go and work in these industries because they will be bullied. They will be harassed. They will be intimidated. And the CFMMU will look at that and go, that's all right. It's all par for the course. That's all right. We'll pay for it. It's all good. We still get what we want, and our blokes are in there now who we give millions of dollars to, and they'll just continue to deliver what we want. So, you lot, you're all do as I say, not as I do, and very, very soon the Australian people are going to start to see through it. Senator Reynolds, um, are, you are you seeking the call on the motion moved by Senator Birmingham or taking note of answers? Uh, um, without notice. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I'm actually seeking to take note of answers at question time. Just bear with me for a moment. I'll put the motion that uh, Senator Birmingham has moved. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Reynolds, please uh, thank move your Thank you motion. very much, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note uh, of questions answered from uh, Senators Little, Patterson and Henderson during question time today. In response to a question from Senator Little, Senator Farrell said some of the most disgraceful things I've ever heard in this chamber, and he said so with a little smirk uh, on his face, as if it was somehow funny what he was saying. Senator Farrell said that uh, the repeal of the cashless debit card was an election commitment. So therefore, they had carte blanche to implement it. What he didn't say, what he did not say, either publicly in the policy document or subsequently in this chamber, is the following. He didn't say that there was no policy associated with this. There was no detailed consideration of the impact on Australia's most vulnerable. It was simply an ideological uh, left-wing policy statement one that has unbelievably serious consequences for Australians, for some of our most vulnerable Australians, particularly women and children and the elderly. Anyone who has taken time to visit these regions will see uh, what the consequences of this will be on at-risk communities. As I've said, they are women, elderly and the children. They are not necessarily about at all the person who has the card. It is about their behaviours um, that will impact again on women, children um, and, and the elderly, and those who are also subject to humbugging. It is the view of those of us on this side of the chamber that this card should be extended and not repealed. So what the minister, while she said that they had consulted, it was very clear that she had not consulted, and ever since she and her department have been scrambling to try and do some um, very inadequate uh, um, consultations and get input from those on the ground. This parliament, as I've said previously in this place, the Senate very shamefully cut, put through a consultation, a parliamentary consultation that didn't go to many communities, didn't give time for consultations, and did not visit Western Australia, our home state of Western Australia. So let's hear what some West Australians in the communities who requested this card, who requested this card, have said. So Ian Trust, the director of the Wunan Foundation in Kununurra, he said this. The card reduced the alcohol violence and the harassment of the elderly and vulnerable for cash when they go to use the ATM. The cashless card is not a silver bullet, but it is something that and we can build on it. But there is no plan by those opposites about what happens after the CDC is abolished. We are left in a vacuum. The government says if we want to go down that path of keeping income management that it has to be a community decision, but there is no information for the communities about how they want us to arrive at that decision or what the replacement will be. Shame on them. The second location in my own home state of Western Australia, the mayor of uh, the city of Kalgoorlie, Boulder, has said this. 
It seems that the cart has been put before the horse by Labor. The decision to abolish the CDC has been made without any consultation with the regional community, and the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder remains unconsulted on the transition, which will impact on CDC participants, social service providers, government agencies and the community. And I will also say to public health providers who have to pick up the mess of women and children who are assaulted, who are raped and who are murdered by men in their own communities. So, after we pointed all of this out, the, co the committee from this parliament did a very, very short um, inquiry. And the government, what did they do? So the minister put out for three days consultations by the uh, impacted uh, local communities. So as late as the 30th of August, the 30th of August, the so-called hastily put together CDC engagement team sent the Goldfields a raft of draft engagement documents, in fact four documents, and they had three working days, three working days for a local council to deal with one of the biggest and most serious issues in their communities. They sent a draft engagement plan, an engagement summary, a participant checklist and a CDC fact sheet. Well, what a triumph of bureaucracy over genuine consultation with impacted communities. And the shires were given until 12 noon on the 2nd of September, three working days later, to provide their feedback. This is a disgrace. And those opposite, they know what the consequences will be in local communities. You Thank cannot you, say you were Senator not warned Reynolds. that Your people time will die. Has expired. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And look, I rise to make my contribution to this debate too. And like your good self, uh, Senator and Chair, that uh, there are a lot of people in this uh, building that talk up a lot about closing the gap and working in Indigenous communities. But I know from the heart there are a number of us that actually walk the walk and talk the talk. And uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, you're one of them, and I'm one of them. And Mr. Acting Deputy President, for those out there who don't know, you and I are both co-patrons of the men's shed in Fitzroy Crossing, yeah. and I know the work that you have done working with communities around this issue. It's a very complex issue, but it's also a very um, it can tear families apart. It can tear friends apart. It hurts my heart to have this debate because it's a well-known fact in this building that I supported Ian Trust and Lawford Benning and, and Teddy Calton in Katanara when they worked to do the trial in Katanara and Wyndham. And, uh, and I remember with um, previous Minister Jenny Macklin committing to the trial. And there was an air of hope around that this would go a long way to, as you and I both know, trying our best to, to and let's say it as it is, stop the rivers of grog that were flowing through the Kimberley. And I'll make this very clear, I only speak about the East Kimberley. I'm not here to represent Kalgoorlie Boulder's view because I've not worked out there. I've done an Senate inquiry there early in the piece before it came. But the work that you and I have done through the East Kimberley and through the Central Kimberley and the West Kimberley where the card is not there. Mm. Unfortunately, at the time, there was great support for the card. There really was. And it breaks my heart because of the work that I still do in the Kimberley and nobody, nobody not even Senator Thorpe, who likes to have a cheap crack, who's not here today, a cheap crack at us white privileged men. What would we know and what do we do? Well, you and I, we've got the runs on the board. And to this day, I still do my community work through the Kimberley. I still run the donated furniture and the bedding for the victims of domestic violence and, and anyone else and the homeless. And I'm doing a run next week again with donated gear. And it breaks my heart when I see kids same age as my grandkids, and there is no way known they're getting fed three meals a day. It breaks my heart when I'm driving through Fitzroy Crossing and I see the kids. I've seen the footage of the kids trying to break into the Coles Express to get the Bowser off so they can get petrol to sniff. And I know the argument that I had to have with great support from Coles Express, they were tremendous. Viva Energy weren't very good at all, but fortunately now the fuel both there and at Nali Roadhouse the 97 per cent has gone, so we have lost the sniffable fuel, thank goodness for that. But it tears me apart to see 
How the heck can we make these kids' lives better? When I see kids going through Fitzroy Crossing, walking from Bayulu, Mr Acting Deputy President, you know where that is. You've been there like me. 14 kilometres walking in the middle of the night because they want to escape the, 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 the violence and the, the nonsense that's going on in some of these drug-fueled communities. Not all of them, but the ones where the, where the parents aren't doing the right thing. But I am a member of the Australian Labor Party. I don't apologise for that. I wish that we could have some system that would go to, to taking away the pain that I feel and, and you would feel every time you go and others that see up there. There's a lot of work to be done. But the truth of the matter is the Labor Party took it to the election. And I will be voting with the Labor Party, with my party, on the abolition of the uh, cashless welfare card, cashless debit card. Um, I do have to say that um, Ian Trust, and I know Senator Reynolds mentioned in Ian Trust's name, Ian is a personal friend of mine. And I still work very closely with Ian. I was on the phone to him last week and through Woonan, and I admire the work that he's done. And I had a conversation with Ian just prior to Minister Rishworth going up there. And I heard Senator Reynolds say not a lot of consultation. Well, I know Senator Rishworth. Oh, no, sorry, Minister Rishworth was in Kununurra because I know she met up with Ian. She met up with the crew. She met up with everyone. Um, and Ian is one of the most wonderful people in the world. And I know that, first and foremost, are his people and his kids. And I know that he has some plans, so hopefully we can get together and we can try and mirror what's being done up in uh, Cape York. But the truth of the matter is um, it was taken to the election and the other side can bang on as much as they like. It wasn't a secret. I've done my best within the Labor Party to put my views forward and my view is in the, in, in the minority. So, uh, Ian, I'll still continue to work with you, mate, and Lawford, and I hope to heck that we can do all we can to possibly achieve closing these gaps. We've been talking about it damn well long enough and we're nowhere near it. So on that, I will be supporting the bill that the government puts here into the Senate and voting for the abolition of the cashless welfare card. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Of course, Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, one of the things that is constantly on the, uh, on the minds of <coughs> South Australians and Australians that I speak to uh, as, I, uh, as I get around and speak to people is this issue of uh, data integrity and data security. It is consistently uh, a theme, a theme which is bothering people, a theme which is constantly on people's mind, and it's never been more important, I think, in, uh, uh, in our lives than it is today in 2022. Everybody uh, has data out there on the cloud with their service providers, government departments. Uh, it is a massive, massive issue for Australians, and it's not an issue, Mr Acting Deputy President, to be taken lightly, which I fear is uh, something we're seeing from the government in the last week. Um, it is extraordinary news, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we have seen uh, something in the order of, we, we think it may be now as many as 10 million Australians, the data of 10 million Australians, uh, compromised uh, out of uh, uh, Optus users. Um, Incredibly concerning stuff, but even more incredibly concerning that is the listless, listless approach from the government and the minister uh, responsible, who we heard uh, this afternoon took uh, something in the order of three days, I think it was, to even respond to, to the incident itself. Uh, and to be even more uh, frank about it, having, having taken three days to respond, the response formed three tweets. And three tweets. It's 3-3-3, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, at three-quarter time of the AFL Grand Final we heard today. Uh, extraordinary stuff. It was a relatively dull game. I get that. And if ever you were going to take the opportunity to get a press release out, it would be once you'd put down the Bollinger at the, uh, the half-time show at the AFL Grand Final. Uh, bang out a couple of tweets and make sure the Australian people have full confidence uh, in that which you are doing in your portfolio. But, of course, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't satisfy the likes uh, of me, it won't satisfy the likes of Australians who are hoping and pleading that their government is across this issue. Um, we heard from uh, the leader of the opposition on Friday, um, well before the grand final, I might say, that this may in fact be the largest ever data breach in Australian commercial history. Now, um, that was known well in advance of Saturday. I, I asked what the question, uh, what, what, what the delay was in responding, and why it took so long. I, uh, the opposition is now seeking briefings in relation to the matter, but the Albanese government seemingly has just been missing in action on this issue. And Australians deserve the opportunity to hear what steps the government is taking 
to secure their personal data and protect them from future cyber attacks, because, of course, this one incident might, might well be the tip of the iceberg. We, we don't know uh, what else is out there. We know that Australians live their lives now um, in the cyber world, and that is only going to increase. This issue is only going to get more important. And of course, with the prospect of digital ID and the digital ID legislation approaching, Australians have got every, every right to be concerned about uh, their data being in the hands of others, governments, private businesses, because we can see what can happen. Millions and millions of terabytes of data can go, well, maybe not that much, but terabytes of data can go. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm quite tech savvy, as you know. Uh, uh, can, go, can go off into the ether without even blinking, uh, as it has in this instant. And really, the, um, uh, the, the businesses and the corporations need to be transparent, but that's what governments are for. Governments are meant to be there for the regulatory purposes of taking it up to businesses when they, when they have these sorts of problems. Uh, the government, including the Cyber Security Minister, now needs to make good that delay, that listless response, and tell the Australian people uh, and make it clear what steps they've taken to protect Australians from future such attacks, because there will be more. We have um, bad actors in the corporate world. We've got state-based actors looking for opportunities to penetrate the uh, uh, cybersecurity veil. And um, we know that the coalition government, uh, as it was, had an extraordinary track record when it came to cybersecurity. In fact, some of the most uh, impressive and um, far-reaching deliveries in terms of key reforms. Uh, World-leading laws to protect critical infrastructure like water, power, telecommunications from sophisticated cyber attacks. Uh, we had introduced a suite of ransomware-related legislation, uh, which included tougher penalties for criminal provisions uh, to deter cyber criminals. Um, regulatory amendments to empower the telco sector to identify and block SMS scams, which are now becoming even more prevalent. Uh, we had. Uh, the expansion of a 24-hour cybersecurity centre hotline to ensure Australians, including business owners, had, had access to cybersecurity data. That's the point being here that time is of the essence with these, these matters. Uh, not three-quarter time, not full time, but time, Mr Acting Deputy President. Yes. Uh, Senator Coney. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and, uh, look, I, I have a lot of respect for Senator Antig on, on this particular matter, but uh, it, it is quite disappointing to see when the opposition comes here into the chamber, um, trying to play political football uh, uh, with the issues of such importance, such as what has occurred over the last week. And I appreciate that uh, Senator Antic appreciate the pun that was used there, but it is quite serious matter. It is a very serious matter. We've had 10 million people uh, records that have been breached, uh, but it is a breach, and it is a breach that Optus seriously needs to pay particular attention to and address with utmost urgency. And that is why the minister today and, and what we have heard from the opposition, apparently the minister has not made any public statements or, or tweets, because that's how they used to govern. Remember how they used to govern yeah. back when they were in government? Yeah. Press releases, tweets. It was all spin but no substance. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. And as the minister also articulated very clearly today in question time, the adults are in charge. We don't need to be putting useless tweets or media releases out to the public. What we are doing, what we are doing is taking the advice of our experts, experts that actually understand all the technical ins and outs of what has actually occurred. Now, there is obviously national security implications here, things that we cannot disclose. But the minister will, at the appropriate time, make all the necessary commentary when she has f all the facts in front of her. That is something that we and our agencies are trying to do right this moment, working with Optus, trying to understand how deep have the hacks uh, ha have occurred. But the minister today in question time has made it very clear, has made it very clear that responsibility for such breaches rests with Optus. And, and I quote, I want to note that the breach is of a nature that we should not expect to see in a large telecommunications provider in this country. So for, for uh, Senator Antic and others on the other side to come in here pretending that uh, somehow, oh, this is just a, an event that requires just a media release or a tweet, just solves all the issues of the world, well, it doesn't. Actually, our public servants, those particularly in ASD, our signals directorate, the cyber security team here in Canberra, and the Federal Police have been working around the clock over the last four days. Whilst Senator Antic makes fun of people, um, and, and particularly those that may have actually been at the footy, 
But I can tell you there are a lot of public servants in this uh, great capital here that were working very hard, working very closely with Optus to make sure that those people who have actually hacked into the data, um, the database of Optus are going to be held accountable. They are going to be held accountable and according to Australian law. And interestingly, the um, other aspect too that the minister has also highlighted in, in the parliament today is that one in four of our Commonwealth entities actually met the essential eight cybersecurity obligations back in 2021. Um, further, it is also now public record that when the Labor Party were in opposition, it took the then Liberal government last year 365 days to release a discussion paper calling for a ransomware strategy. They then introduced this bill, but it was too late. It was far too late to actually have the bill passed by, this, by the previous parliament because we had the upcoming federal election. And there would have been other remedies in that bill that would have prevented such hacks from occurring, but the government of the day, the then coalition government, the Liberals and the Nationals, took their time in implementing reforms that were needed. Uh, but the minister today, Claire O'Neill, has also indicated that this hack has actually resulted in, in a need for substantial reform, substantial reform that this government will be working very closely with the industry and others to ensure that this occurrence does not happen again. Uh, but Optus has said that it would directly communicate with those customers over the coming days. So I do encourage anyone who is a current customer of Optus or has been in the last seven years, please make sure you do contact Optus. Please make sure that you do ensure that they are actually taking this breach very seriously. Because the last thing that this government wants is people details being uh, shopped around out there. Because we all know, we've all been probably all know of people in our families who have been unfortunately caught up in some scams in the past. But it is something that this government is taking very seriously, despite the rhetoric that we hear from those opposite. But it's interesting because they've spent the last hour and a half, the hour and a half, wasting precious Senate time so they could filibuster and prevent you, precious Senator. legislation from being Tony. passed. Call Senator Little. Thank you. Um, I came into this place on the 1st of July, so um, speaking in this is new to me. But certainly the cashless debit card, the basics card, and working in and with Aboriginal communities in remote and regional areas is definitely not. It's a career spanning some 25, almost 30 years, let alone being born in a place where the card actually exists and having immediate family still living in those places. It's disappointing that the government has misled the Australian public with promises during the election campaign and now embarrassingly having to admit that it was a grab for votes. This is a promise they should break. The amendments we have now seen allow Cape York, the CDC trials and those people in the NT who have voluntarily transitioned from the basics card onto the CDC to remain on the cashless debit card. This is just an admission that they have messed up this ill-conceived election commitment. The amendments put forward by the government confirms that even they admit that abolishing the cashless debit card will have serious consequences for vulnerable communities. We see that in the provision of $50 million for additional drug and alcohol support services because they themselves recognise the serious harm that is likely to result from the removal of this critical program. The Albanese government's decision to abolish the cashless debit card will give the green light to more alcohol, drug abuse and violence in some of our most vulnerable communities for the most vulnerable people within those communities. Addicts will now have more cash to access grog, gunja, crack and gambling. And families will have less chance to protect themselves because they will no longer have the card to be able to do that. Let me give you an example of how this works. These women who have these grandmothers who are looking after their children's children because they can't or won't see family walking down the street. When they see family walking down the street that with the cashless debit card and the basics card, they don't have to cross the street. What they can say to their family is, I'm sorry, 
I can't give you cash to go and buy grog, gunja and gamble because the card doesn't allow me to give you any more cash than the cash I have in my pocket. <laughs> That's about protecting their interests. That's about protecting the interests of their children. That's about protecting the interests of their grandchildren. That's about protecting the interests of other people who are not Indigenous that also live in the towns and communities. This is not a race issue. This is actually about people who are problem drinkers, who often find themselves incarcerated, incarcerated at risk of deaths in custody because they've been drunk, drugged, or they're just finding themselves on the street because their families will not let them live in their house because of the dysfunction that addiction brings. This is the reality. The CDC is an advanced technology that enables recipients to access their welfare payments using the universal banking platform. The Basis card is a limited delivery mechanism. I've heard people way back before 2016 and even when the card come in, came in, and I heard them say to me, I don't like being on the card, but you know what? It gives me protection from my family members. I've got money to feed the kids, I've got money to clothe them, and it makes life a whole less hectic. Only a few weeks ago when I went to Sejuna, I'll tell you what my consultation looks like. I actually had to go at the last minute. And sure, we, vis we visited those organisations that usually provide the services. But then Julian Lesser and I went for a walk down the street. We went into the gaming room. We went into the bar. We met people that we met on the street in places on the edge of the town because they were too frightened to speak to us directly. And what they said to us repeatedly was, I don't like the card. I shouldn't be on the card, but I know the card is really important for my family and I get power and I get control when I can tell people that I can't give them money because the money is quarantined on a card. That takes it out of the personal. That gives them the power and that gives them the power to feed their children and to clothe them. This is a terrible decision. Senator Little. Uh, the question is that the motion to take note of answers moved by Senator Reynolds be agreed to. All those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Call the Greens. Deputy President, I rise uh, to take note of the answer given by Minister Gallagher to a question I asked today relating to paid parental <coughs> leave. 21 years ago, in 2001, I sat at the back of this chamber as a staffer near the senator who introduced Australia's first private member's paid parental leave bill. Senator Natasha Stott Despoja. At that time, Australian women were, alongside the US, the only women in the OECD not to get a paid rest when they had a baby, a hundred years after the International Labor Organization said they should. Anyone who has carried, pushed out, fed a new baby and been sleep deprived for months knows how essential that rest is. If Australian men had babies, we would probably lead the world on paid parental leave, just as we led the world on the eight-hour day in 1856 and set a decent minimum wage at Federation. We were international leaders in creating a working man's paradise, a white working man's paradise, important to note, but that paradise did not extend to mothers. Sadly, it was not until 10 years after that first private member's bill that this parliament finally enacted paid parental leave in 2010 with leave of 18 weeks at a minimum wage. An additional two weeks was added later for partners on a use it or lose it basis. 11 years on, we've been overtaken by the rest of the OECD yet again, with the average period of paid parental leave now around 52 weeks in the OECD and close to full replacement wages in many places. Australia now has one of the poorest paid parental leave schemes in the OECD. We are now stuck at an inadequate 18 weeks paid leave with two weeks for partners at minimum wage without superannuation, a pay cut for so many people at a critical moment in a family's life. Today the Greens are pushing for a catch-up. We have given notice of a bill to be introduced in November to increase the length of paid parental leave to 26 weeks, to offer six weeks of paid parental leave to be available to second carers on a use-it or lose-it basis 
that leave to be paid at, the, at a minimum wage level as the lowest level of payment, with income replacement for those who earn more up to a wage cap of 100000 and superannuation to be paid on the full period of leave. Overseas evidence tells us that increasing the rate of pay for paid parental leave and making a portion of it available six weeks in our bill to second carers, mostly fathers in many Australian households, on a use-it-or-lose-it -it basis has a powerful positive effect for the longer-term sharing of parenting. It's great for fathers, it's really important for kids, it's important for families and it will shift gender equity. It's also vital to include super. At present, new parents pay a big price in lost income, including superannuation, when they have a baby. We must ensure that mothers in particular do not find themselves living in poverty in old age after a lifetime of work and care. There's powerful evidence that improving paid parental leave like this will do many good things. It will increase women's participation in paid work. It will address skill shortages. It will increase GDP. It will improve children's development and improve relationships between couples and between kids and their parents. It has a very positive effect on men's health and it will help address gender inequality. Those supporting increased paid parental leave, and they are many, know we can afford it. We can afford to increase the length of leave, the rate of payment, and we can pay superannuation on it. Rather than give a $9,000 tax cut to the very wealthy and each of the 227 politicians in this building, we can redirect stage three tax cuts to the parents and the kids who need it most. We should set aside these stage three tax cuts and instead improve paid parental leave and take other measures that will help Australian families deal with the cost of living crisis, including providing free, quality, accessible early childhood education and care. At the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, Australians and organisations from across the country, parents, women, unions, employers, were united in their call for a paid parental leave increase and improvement for Australia's parents, especially mothers. Indeed, the ACTU called for a pathway to 52 weeks leave, so we move ourselves more centrally to the OECD average. Alongside improved early childhood education and care, increasing paid parental leave was one of the most common and most united points of discussion at the summit. No one opposed it. It's time to act. We can afford it, and for the sake of our kids, parents, women and our workplaces and economy, it's time we did it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay, I now put the question uh, that the Senate take note of answers. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Now, are there any uh, notices of motion to be given for another day? No one? Very good. Okay. Um, I'll go. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clark. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Sorry about that. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Wong for 23rd and 26th September 2022 on account of ministerial business. Senator Ayres from 26 to 28 September 2022 on account of ministerial business. Senators Chisholm and Watt for 23rd of September 2022 for personal reasons. Senator Dodson from 23rd to 27th of September on account of parliamentary business. And Senator Grogan from 26 to 28th of September 2022 on account of parliamentary business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, oh, sorry. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons. Senators Antic, Brockman, Molan and Patterson for the 23rd of September. 2022, and Senators Brockman, Dunningham and Molan from the 26th of September to the 28th of September 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Thorpe from the 26th to the 28th of September this year for personal reasons. Clark. 
So I'll put the question to the Senator that they agree to. All those that opinion say aye. Against no. Carried. Senator Lambie. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Oh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Lambie. I move that leave of absence be granted for the following senators for personal reasons, Senator Lambie and Senator Tyrrell for the 23rd of September 2022. I'll put the question. All those of opinion, aye. Against, no. Carried. Clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, business of the Senate, notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock from today until 25 October. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 11 on today's order of business. Thank you. And I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? This is getting easier. Oh, Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Bragg, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number three, proposing a reference to the Economics References Committee relating to the influence of international digital platforms be taken as formal. I move the motion. Okay. The question is the motion be moved. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against no. There are no no's. The ayes have it. I'm sorry, I'm just seeking guidance from the clerk because there's a few speakers that aren't here that could have been here, I suppose, but Senator Lambie, did you? No? That's all right. All right, in that case, we'll go to uh, the urgency motion. Thank you very much. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, <coughs> 32 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, yes, Senator McKim. On a point of order, can I draw your attention to the state of the chamber? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum's present. Okay, so I shall go back and just repeat Senator McKim. Okay. Uh, so I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 32 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is that proposal supported? Wow. Yes, okay. It's supported. Thank you. 
Okay. I understand the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator McKim. Thank well, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. There is nothing short of a full-blown rental crisis happening right now in Australia. And in my home state of Tasmania, since 2016, the median rental rate in Hobart, where I live, has grown by 50 per cent. That is 50 per cent in six years. It is absolutely critical that we address this crisis in rental affordability and in housing more broadly, where if you're lucky enough to be able to rent a place, so many people can't afford to pay their rent and so many people can't even find a place to rent because vacancy rates are too low. The explosion in rental costs and the ensuing rental crisis represents a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich and, in general terms, from the young to the older. And it's not by accident and it's not just bad luck by the tenants. This has been done and driven deliberately by successive Liberal and Labor governments because the class war by property owners and the banks has been going on for a long time, and make no mistake, the tenants are losing the war. The Labor Party and the Liberal Party have backed in landlords and they've backed in the banks and they've backed them in to continue to make massive profits. And they've done that by ensuring that the return for the banks and the return for the landlords is guaranteed by the taxpayer. The great Australian dream is no longer that you can one day own a home of your own. The great Australian dream today is owning a property portfolio with tenants who pay your income and who pay ultimately for your assets. So if you own a house and it's rented out, even though you might be renting it out for a loss, that loss is subsidised through tax breaks for you, paid for by the taxpayers. And what that means, tragically, is that not only do tenants pay off their landlord's mortgage, they pay the tax that the landlords don't. And on what planet is that fair or reasonable? It is an absolute scam. And the scammers are the parties, the political parties in this place, that deliver on those tax breaks. In real terms, what that means for people on the ground is they're skipping meals, they're not paying their power bills, they're not paying for much-needed medicine just to keep a roof over their heads. In a country where a landlord can own 283 rental properties and still complain about the prospect of a freeze in rents, this is an absolute obscenity. Enough is enough. It's time to cap rents, and we should do it for two years, then we should peg them to the CPI thereafter. And that is just the start. We've, we should scrap the capital gains tax discount, we should end negative gearing, and we should actually start building enough homes so that everyone can have a home to live in. And most importantly, we need to shatter the class gap between those who own housing and those who don't. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the motion moved by Senator McKim. Uh, the Albanese government recognises the challenges that Australians are facing uh, because we talk to them every day. So we know families are struggling with a decade of low wages growth, cost of living pressures and rental affordability. The private rental market has been put under significant pressure as a result of strong numbers of people moving within states between towns and cities and people moving across state lines, putting pressure on particular rental markets. Uh, and also putting pr pressure on rental markets has been shrinking household sizes, 
um, which uh, in turn puts pressure on the supply of private rentals. Um, major cities and regional towns are experiencing low vacancy rates and really fast-growing rental prices. Uh, and this is forcing Australians into insecure housing arrangements like caravan parks and other temporary solutions. Uh, in, a, in a wealthy country like Australia, this is just not acceptable. We do understand how tough it is for Australian households. We know that long waiting lists for social housing are forcing vulnerable Australians into the private rental market. And we know that more Australians are being forced to rent because they've been unable to buy their own home as well, uh, which is why our ambitious housing reform agenda is working to address the underlying causes of housing unaffordability using the levers that we do have as a federal government available to us to get more Australians into affordable homes. Uh, but these challenges that we face today, of course, have not come on uh, overnight. There have been very real challenges for the past 10 years, challenges that the former government took absolutely no interest in addressing. Um, those opposite oversaw shamefully low numbers of new social housing builds uh, when they were in government. By 2020, seven years into their term, they had only built 7,500 new dwellings. Um, compare that to the more than 30,000 new dwellings from the previous Labor government over a similar period of time. Um, but in their dying days, the coalition finally had uh, a light bulb moment on housing policy, uh, and they finally came up with one uh, that they said would address housing affordability and help people own their own home. Uh, and what was that solution? Um, of course, we will all remember that it was to force Australians to raid their own superannuation to be able to afford a house deposit, a policy that would have driven up property prices even further and left Australians with higher debt and depleted, and depleted workers' retirement savings. Why does the coalition hate superannuation? Why do they hate it so much? Leaving even more Australians without financial security. <coughs> now, on the other hand, the Albanese government, we have a comprehensive plan to address the housing crisis. Uh, and we are wasting no time getting on with it. We're establishing the Housing Australia Future Fund, uh, investing $10 billion to build 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties. 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties. Um, that, of course, is going to get more people who need them into those homes, and it's also going to put downward pressure on rental prices. Uh, and help really vulnerable families um, access housing when they're fleeing family and domestic violence as well. Uh, in addition to that um, massive investment, unprecedented uh, $10 billion of federal investment in social and affordable housing, we're also unlocking up to half a billion dollars through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in even more social and affordable housing. Uh, and that is a move uh, that will encourage investors, um, such as super funds, to invest in projects that drive down housing prices, um, rather than gutting workers' retirement savings and driving house prices up. That's where we think the super funds can come into the housing uh, equation, uh, in partnering with government to invest in projects that create more homes and drive down prices. Again, we think that's a better option than forcing people to raid their own super in a desperate attempt to be able to afford their own home while, of course, gutting their retirement savings and putting themselves in an even more vulnerable position uh, in the future. Our government is also helping Australians to enter the housing market and own their own home. We've brought forward the start of the Regional First Home Buyer Guarantee to October 1, uh, and that will help up to 10,000 Australians purchase their first home. This joins the up to 50,000 Australians being assisted to buy their first home under the Home Guarantee Scheme. Uh, our government is also introducing the Help to Buy program, 
Uh, that is going to help uh, cut the cost of buying a home by up to 40 per cent, uh, making it easier uh, and cheaper for Australians to own their own home. Uh, and when it comes to rental affordability, uh, our government is stepping up uh, and we are bringing the states and the territories together because uh, that's what we do. We work with the state governments and the territory governments. Uh, we bring them together with us to solve the big challenges that Australians face. So we're working with the state and territory housing ministers to explore uh, innovative solutions to address these housing challenges. We're addressing a new national uh, housing and homelessness plan, developing a new plan uh, that will form a key part of our agenda. Uh, and we're introducing a national housing supply and affordability council to ensure the Commonwealth uh, is playing its role in increasing supply uh, and improving affordability. Our government is stepping up to bring new national leadership on housing, uh, national leadership that was sorely missing under the previous government. Because while we recognise that some of the levers to fix these problems sit with state uh, and territory governments, we also recognise that the previous government simply was missing in action on this question. Now we know the security that housing can bring to Australian workers, and we also know that one of the key barriers to accessing housing um, is insecure work. And the crisis of insecure work is a legacy of those opposite, one that they have absolutely refused to admit in their 10 years in government, one that they refuse to admit even exists. Um, coalition senators have said, uh, and I quote, that insecure work is a labour lie. Uh, it's a labour lie. Um, one of their ministers earlier this year called job insecurity made-up issues. So labour lies uh, and made-up issues, um, despite the evidence right in front of them, including evidence about the links between insecure work and housing insecurity as well. Uh, and despite what they themselves were hearing from workers, um, workers that came and told their stories to the job security inquiry uh, led by my colleague Tony Sheldon, for example. Stories of low pay, stories of low irregular hours, stories of having no ability to provide stable income on a rental application. People who are working and having to live in caravan parks because they can't get enough secure hours to actually fill out a successful rental application. So fixing the crisis of insecure work, the very real crisis of insecure work, is part of our government's plan to give people security at work and also in housing. The legacy that those opposite left behind is a crisis of insecure work, a decade of low wages growth and nothing nothing at all to help Australians afford a home. We know the importance of good, secure jobs. We know they're a gateway to good, secure lives. We know that they're a gateway to good, secure housing as well. And we know what insecure work is doing to households and families. Uh, that's why we have a secure jobs plan, which is about giving workers permanency and security that they need to, to plan for their future. Um, we'll make secure work an objective of the Fair Work Act, making sure that the Fair Work Commission puts job security at the heart of its decision making. Uh, and we're introducing a secure jobs code to ensure that taxpayer money spent through government contracts is being used to support secure employment too, because we know people need secure jobs and secure houses. Our government takes these housing challenges very seriously. We're getting on with delivering answers to them. Uh, we know that having a good job is critical to good housing. We know we can't require the state and territory governments to freeze rents like the Greens want us to, or uh, we know we can't force Australians to raid their retirement savings like Time those opposite want us to as well. I thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In speaking on this urgency motion, I'd first like to address some of the comments made by Senator Walsh, uh, whose thoughts and views I, uh, I deeply respect. Uh, but there are three uh, points I'd like to make with respect to Senator Walsh's con contribution. First, in relation to the coalition's policy that it went into the last election with, the policy was to give superannuation fund holders, especially the young, the choice. The choice. It wasn't a question of forcing. It was giving them the choice 
if they decided to take a certain amount out of their super, superannuation funds in order to get them into the housing market and buy their first home, their most important asset for the rest of their life. That's the first point. Second point, I believe in relation to the supply of housing we need to be more creative in terms of working with community organisations, being innovative. Social housing doesn't necessarily have to be owned by state governments or federal governments or whichever government, but be innovative and work with community organisations at the front line to try and get solutions for local communities. Some of the most passionate people in this space, as I'm sure everyone would agree, are those frontline community organisations that are dealing with this issue every single day. And the third point I'd like to make in relation to Senator Walsh's comments is the question supply. Supply, supply, supply. We need more supply for people who are seeking to rent accommodation. That's the question. We need supply. And green tape and red tape is frustrating supply. And I see it where my office is located in Springfield, southwest growth corridor of Queensland, the fastest growing region in Queensland, where the people who want to construct housing uh, for new home buyers, for others, for renters, etc., are being frustrated by the green tape and the red tape. We need supply. Now, dealing with Senator McKim's urgency motion, whenever the Greens, whenever the Greens put forward a motion dealing with economics. I always go to my library and I bring out my book on basic economics by Dr Thomas Sowell. And I see what my book on basic economics says by Dr Thomas Sowell, because that always provides the answers. And I only needed to go to page 45, page 45 of my book, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, to learn that the history of uh, economics teaches us rent controls do not work. Rent controls do not work. They might, be, they might be proposed with the best of intentions. They might be proposed with the best of intentions, but what frequently happens when a policy is proposed with the best intentions, it actually hurts. It actually hurts those who it is intended to help. And that Order. is the case with respect to rent control. Now, Order. let me quote from page 43 of Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics. And that says, quote, nine years after the end of World War II, Order. not a single Sen new Sen building Sen had Scar. been built Senator in Scar. Melbourne, Australia. Sen Senator Scar. Sorry, Senator Scar. Senator McKim, now I'm pretty relaxed on inter, you know, interjections, but I did ask you a number of times if you could just. Okay? Let's, let's see, Lee. Senator Scar, and you two can sort it out in the hallway after. Thank Senator you. Scar. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, for your usual firm hand in this place. I do appreciate it. Uh, let, me quote, let me quote from this book. Quote, Nine years after the end of World War II, not a single new building had been built in Melbourne. For nine years, not a single building, new building had, apartment building had been built in Melbourne because of rent control laws there which made buildings unprofitable. So that's what happened. They introduced rent control in Victoria at the time of World War II. Not a single new apartment building was built because it wasn't profitable to do so. That's what impacts supply. That's the impact on supply. And it wasn't just Victoria. How about Egypt? In Egypt, rent control was imposed in 1960. This isn't new. This isn't new. An Egyptian woman who lived through that era and wrote about it in 2006 reported, and I quote, the end result was that people stopped investing in apartment buildings and a huge shortage in rentals and housing forced many Egyptians to live in horrible conditions with several families sharing one small apartment." End quote. And it's not just Egypt. Let's go to England. And I quote again from the book, this is page 45. In terms of incentives, it is likewise easy to understand what happened in England when rent control was extended in 1975 to cover furnished rental units. According to the Times of London, quote, advertisements for furnished rental accommodation in the London Evening Standard plummeted dramatically in the first week after the Act came into force and are now running at about 75 per cent below last year's levels. End quote. That's what happened in London in 1975. Let's go to Toronto. Let's go to another continent. We've been to Australia. We've been to Africa. We've been to Europe. Let's go to North America. This is what happened in Toronto. Within three years after rent control was imposed in Toronto in 1976, 
23 per cent of all rental units in owner-occupied dwellings were withdrawn from the housing market. End quote. So that's what happened in North America. You don't have to have a PhD in, in economics like Dr Thomas Sow to work out that rent control does not work. It has never worked. And in fact, it actually hurts the people it's intended to help. And then what happens to these places? What happens in these places when they actually remove rent control? Mm. So let's take the corollary. What happens when you remove rent control and you let the market, you let the market act and people make their individual decisions? Again, I quote from page 47. In Massachusetts, a statewide ban on local rent control in 1994 led to the construction of new apartment buildings in some formerly rent-controlled Massachusetts cities for the first time in 25 years." End quote. You ended rent control and you actually got new apartment buildings for the most vulnerable in society for the first time in 25 years when you removed rent control. That's basic, basic economics. Basic economics. We need more of that, more of basic economics. This isn't new, this stuff. You don't have to be John Maynard Keynes or Milton Friedman to get it. It's not new. It's not new. It's all there. And I'm happy to lend my copy to anyone in the Greens at any time. Just come around the office. I'll even buy you one. I'll buy you one. I refer. I quote it so often to you, Senator McKim. I'll even buy you one. I'll buy you one. I'll buy you one. I'll get, a, I'll get 12 of them. And at the same time, I must say it's a bit. Uh, it's a bit difficult to sit here and, and, and be lectured to by those opposite sitting in the Labor Party, coming from the home, my home state of Queensland, and I see what the Queensland government is doing. They're drinking the same Kool-Aid as the Greens in terms of this urgency resolution. And they have this ridiculous proposal at the moment with respect to land tax, where they want the land tax threshold for Queensland investors to take into account properties which are held in other states. That's absolutely crazy stuff. And what's the consequence? What happens when you change the tax system in this way? What happens when you introduce rent controls? Well, the investors leave. The landlords say it's too hard. If it's not going to be profitable for me, I'll go and invest my money somewhere else. That's what happens. It's basic economics. And that's what we're actually seeing in Queensland. And I want to take the opportunity, because I think it is relevant to this debate in relation to housing supply and what we need to do, to quote from an article by Neil Sweeney, reporter in the AFR, an article of September 25, 2022. And I quote, Queensland new land tax rule will not take effect until the middle of next year, but property investors Peter and Joanna Meek are not waiting around. They're not waiting around, they're selling up. And what do they say? We have three rental properties in Queensland, we've already sold one, and we're in the process of selling another, Mr Meek said. We're planning to move into the last property as we're unable to find a decent rental. So that's three rentals off the market already, end quote. That's what they're doing. That's what those landlords are doing in response to Queensland Labor Palaszczuk government, their proposed land tax reforms. People are simply leaving the market. The landlords are leaving the market. I quote further from the article. SQM Research Managing Director Louis Christopher said the rental supply crunch would worsen as a result of the Queensland government's tenancy and tax reforms. I fear it will get worse for tenants as the scarce supply, scarce supply, supply and demand, that's what it's about, pushes rents higher, Mr Christopher said. But the proposed rental freeze and the new land tax rule will not solve the problem. It will only encourage landlords to walk away, end quote. And that's the problem. That's what basic economics tells you. That's what the experience from all over the world tells you. When you introduce things like rental freezes, when you introduce massive changes to land tax, when you introduce laws which make it more difficult for landlords to be flexible with respect to their investments, they walk away. And then the supply of rental properties decreases, the rents go up, and who's hurt the most vulnerable in our society? Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Speaking with people in our communities at the moment, or even picking up a newspaper, you would have to have your head buried deeply in the sand if you fail to recognize that housing affordability is absolutely top of mind for so many. And there is no surprise why. Rents have gone through the roof. 
Um, you know, the, the dream of owning your first home has become a real nightmare. Across the country, many areas have seen the steepest annual rent increases on record this year. In Sydney, where I live, the annual increase has been a whopping 19.6%. And a very grim tale is told in regional New South Wales as well, especially by those who have been so deeply affected by the climate-induced floods. The unfolding rental affordability crisis is destroying communities. A recent ABC article tells this story. Single mother Tilly Eastwood says the worst part of being priced out of the rental market isn't living in a garage with her three children. It isn't the absence of windows for light or fresh air. It's not even the 150 plus failed rental applications. It's the gnawing feeling that she's letting down her kids. How is it that the Labour government is willing to give $244 billion for stage three tax cuts back into the pockets of the wealthiest and the billionaires, yet refuse to act for those who are struggling to keep a roof over their head. A very basic human right. We need a national rent freeze and we need it now. It's beyond clear that with more and more people renting long term, people in our community of all ages, backgrounds, walks of life, desperately need relief from skyrocketing rents and poor tenancy protections. The federal government cannot just wash their hands off the responsibility of ensuring a home for everyone. It regularly plays a role in issues like industrial relations, energy and others, which would usually be left up to individual states and territories, so surely they can do the same for housing. A two-year rent freeze would be followed by ongoing rent caps and an end to no grounds evictions. Minimum standards for rental properties and giving tenants rights to make minor improvements to their homes, as well as having a right to have companion animals. The Greens have been fighting hard for rental affordability, renters' rights, and homes for all. Just a couple of examples are Jenny Leong, the Greens member for Newtown, who has been leading this work in the New South Wales Parliament. Earlier this year, Jenny introduced a private member's bill to introduce evictions bans and rent caps in flood-impacted areas in New South Wales as well as ending no grounds evictions and limiting rent increases for renters across New South Wales. Further north, the Greens MP for South Brisbane, Amy McMahon, has introduced a bill that would freeze rents for two years. In her second reading speech, Amy said that across Queensland, families are struggling to make ends meet with rising costs of rent, fuel and groceries, and it is hitting renters and first home buyers the hardest. Families are living in tents, because they cannot afford a secure, affordable home. This is an outrageous situation, and it requires decisive action, and it requires decisive action now to finally tackle this. The housing affordability crisis is harming too many people. We need a rent freeze right now. We need strong national renters' rights standards. We need to build a million publicly owned affordable homes and we need to end the tax loopholes for the richest in the country. Nobody, nobody should be without a home. Whether you own a home or rent, our housing system should work for people, not for profit. The government must make the choice of fixing this crisis. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Albanese government understands just how serious the current housing challenge is. We are committed to acting to address it, whereas the previous government made it very clear it would not take up the call for action. Unlike some in this place, we know there is no silver bullet to address this very serious problem, but Labor has an ambitious plan to tackle the housing challenge we inherited. We went into the May election with a comprehensive housing reform agenda and we're working hard to address the causes of Australia's rental affordability challenges. We recognise this is a very serious challenge occurring across the country, which is putting stress on a great many families and individuals. In Tasmania, rental, renters are experiencing these inc increases just like the rest of the country. More and more people have been coming to my electorate office talking to me about the struggle of trying to find an affordable home. Cities and towns across our country are experiencing extremely low rental vacancy rates. Australians are being forced into insecure housing like caravans and tents. 
This is not an acceptable situation in a wealthy country such as ours, and the Albanese government is taking significant steps to address it. These rental and cost of living challenges are very real, and they need real, lasting solutions. We are not, however, actively considering proposals to freeze rents. It is important to note that regulation of residential tenancies is a matter for state and territory governments. The Commonwealth cannot require those governments to freeze rents. But there are things we can do, and our government's housing reform agenda is working to address the causes of Australia's rental affordability challenges. We're moving to swiftly implement a comprehensive plan to address the rental crisis and to help those in the private rental market, a plan which was endorsed by the Australian people when they voted us into government this year. Social housing lists have grown to an unacceptable size over recent years. In my home state of Tasmania, government's own data shows that more than 4,450 families are now stuck on the government's historically unprecedented wait list as the state government fails to deliver on its big housing promises over many, many years. And these long waiting lists for social housing across the country have forced vulnerable Australians into the private rental market. To help address this, we've acted quickly by unlocking up to $575 million through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in more social and affordable housing. This will support our commitment to build 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties through the $10 billion Housing Australian Future Fund. This will put downward pressure on rental prices. We have uh, many Australians who are trapped in the rental market because they have been unable to buy their own home. In response to this, the Albanese government has brought forward the start of the regional first home buyer guarantee to October 1 this year three months earlier than we promised. That initiative alone will help up to 10,000 regional Australians every year get into their first home with a, de with a deposit of as little as 5 per cent. The government will guarantee up to 15 per cent of the purchase price for eligible first home buyers, meaning regional Australians looking to buy can avoid paying costly mortgage insurance. This is concrete action taken by our government to help Australians into a home. And it's targeted action, available only to locals who have been living in the region they want to buy in or a neighbouring regional area. To be eligible for a regional first home buyer guarantee, applicants must be Australian citizens, purchase outside a capital city and demonstrate they've been living in the region in which they are purchasing the property or, as I said, the adjacent regional area for at least 12 months. <clears throat> this is in addition to the Home Guarantee Scheme, which helps up to 50,000 eligible Australians into home ownership every year. It supports first home buyers and single parents with dependents into home ownership with a smaller deposit. Under the First Home Guarantee, up to 15 per cent of an eligible first home buyer's home loan from a participating lender will be guaranteed. This enables the home buyer to purchase a home with as little as 5 per cent deposit without paying lender's mortgage insurance. The Family Home Guarantee supports single parents with dependents to own their own home with a minimum deposit of as little as 2 per cent. We will also introduce Help to Buy, a brand new program that will help cut the cost of buying a home by up to 40 per cent and make it cheaper and easier for eligible Australians to own their own home. It's important to recognise that many of the levers to fix rental affordability are in the hands of state and territory governments. And so, in a spirit of true collaboration and national leadership, our government has begun a process working with state and territory housing ministers to explore innovative approaches to address rental affordability. This reform agenda is so important to ensure that Australians are not denied that basic right of a roof over their heads will be in clear evidence in the upcoming budget with real commitments to put more downward pressure on rents. Unlike the previous government, we recognise that the Commonwealth has an important leadership role in increasing housing supply and improving affordability. We will establish a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council 
to ensure the Commonwealth plays that leadership role in increasing housing supply and improving affordability. The Council will be advised by experts from the sector. It will set targets for land supply in consultation with states and territories. It will also collect and make public data on housing supply, demand and affordability. Fixing land supply and planning will improve housing affordability and boost economic growth, but the only way to achieve this is by the three levels of government all working together. The Minister for Housing and Homelessness, the Hon. Julie Collins MP, has started the development of a new national housing and homelessness plan that will become a key plank in our reform agenda. This plan will be developed with the support and assistance of key stakeholders, including states and territories, local government, not-for-profits, urban development experts and industry bodies. It will set out the key reforms needed to make it easier for Australians to buy a home, easier to rent <coughs> and put a roof over the heads of more homeless Australians. Organisations from all sides of the political spectrum have been calling for years for a plan like this, and the previous government ignored them. The Albanese government takes rental affordability challenges seriously. That's why we are delivering the regional first home buyer guarantee ahead of schedule, because we recognise the serious housing challenges in regional Australia. We inherited a housing affordability crisis and we are tackling it with a practical but ambitious plan. This challenge is one we will strive to address every day we are in government in this country. We know we have a lot of work ahead of us, and this coming weekend, the start of the regional first home buyer guarantee is that first step. Thanks, Senator Lickett. <clears throat> Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this motion today. Because let me tell you, one of the reasons why I'm in the Liberal Party is that the Liberal Party actually believes in home ownership. So, while I'm speaking to the issue of freezing uh, rents, uh, I think the best way um, to get around this issue is to actually own your own house, uh, and that is why I'm in the Liberal Party. Uh, and um, I just want to quote from the speech, and it's often considered uh, the original uh, speech or the manifesto, if I can use that word for the Liberal Party. A bit of a oxymoron there, that statement. But anyway, um, it's interesting to note that Robert Menzies, in his Forgotten People speech, mentions the word home 23 times. He also says that the rich and powerful can look after themselves, and he also says that we should, no go, should not go back to the old and selfish notions of laissez faire uh, capitalism, which I think a lot of people, if they'd actually read the Forgotten People speech, would be surprised by. And I'm happy to give anyone on the other side of the chamber that speech, because you would see that it actually appeals to those people who just want to remain quiet in the suburbs, who don't need uh, you know, other people telling them what to do. They just want to be left alone in their house with their family and everyone else can get out of their lives. And I know I speak for many people who feel like that, and that is why I am in the Liberal Party. But I just want to quote uh, what homes mean to the Liberal Party uh, and a part of Robert Menzies' speech. Uh, first, it is, is he describes homes as having a stake in the country. It has responsibility for homes, homes material, homes human and homes spiritual. I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found in either great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs. So he actually is not a big fan of the blowhards. I know a lot of people think the Liberal Party is the blowhard party, and I admit we do have blowhard, blowhards and sometimes we tend to take their line, but we shouldn't do that. We are the party of battlers and we've got to remember that. This country is all about wealth for toil and it's founded by the battlers, not the blowhards, and we need to remember that. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and, ad and unadvertised and who, whatever their individual religion, a religious conviction or dogma, see in their children their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. Exactly. Who doesn't love their children? The home is, to be, is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. Well, I can vouch for that. I have to admit, in my youth, I drank a lot of beer and when I bought a home. Uh, you know, it took a couple of years, but I slowly weaned myself off the bottle. Um, it is the indispensable condition of continuity. It health determines the health of a society it, as a whole. I have mentioned homes, uh, material, homes human and homes spirit, spiritual. Let me take them in order. What do I mean by homes material? The material home represents the concrete expression of the habits of frugality and saving for a home of your own. Your advanced socialist may rave against private property even while he acquires it. Yep, good point there, pointing out the hypocrisy of some, some people that you know, think we should all own nothing, uh, but you know, meanwhile flying jets and everything like that. 
uh, but one of the best instincts in us is that which induces us to have one little piece of earth with a house and a garden which is ours, to which we can withdraw, in which we can be among, among our friends, into which no stranger may come against our will. If you consider it, you will see that, as in the old saying, the Englishman's home is his castle. It is this very fact that leads on to the conclusion that he who seeks to violate that law by violating the soil of England must be repelled and defeated. Don't uh, get too much on that stuff. National patriotism, in other words, inevitably springs from the instinct to defend and preserve our own homes. Well, so can I say, Senator McGim, I, I, I totally uh, think that we need to get people in houses. Um, I think home ownership. There's a lot to be said for home ownership, and I think one of the problems we've got with the rental market at the moment is that not enough people own their own homes. And I've often uh, ranted against the fact that when Keating uh, made a lot of amendments in the 80s, and as you well know, there was a lot of neoliberal stuff that was brought in in the 80s, one of the biggest mistakes that was made was that we didn't have capital gains tax on wealthy housing. I'm not against you know, the common man having a house, but you take, say, the 5 per cent, or you, know, you could start at 2.5 million or something, but there's a, a level above which you shouldn't have capital ta ta uh, gains tax-free housing because you've got multi-millionaires living in Bondi in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. They buy a house for three million, they sell it for ten million, they clean up seven million dollars in profit and they don't pay a cent of tax. Meanwhile, you've got the battlers out there who get out of bed every morning, they put their nose to the grindstone and they will start paying tax above eighteen thousand two hundred dollars at nineteen cents uh, in the dollar plus two per cent Medicare. They'll also lose fifty cents in the dollar if they're on the, on um, New Start or Job Seeker, whatever it's called nowadays. Um, and then they lose another ten and a half percent super. So they actually end up losing between twenty and thirty grand, you end up losing eighty cents out of every dollar you earn. Um, and that's completely absurd. So I, I think we should have a capital gains tax on housing and actually then above two million or three million, somewhere between that range, and then basically use that to give a tax offset to the low income earners uh, who struggle. Because basically if you earn less than the cost of living, which let's say it's forty thousand dollars a year. Uh, um, acting Deputy Speaker, you're actually losing money. So why do we tax people below the cost of living? It is, it is complete nonsense. Um, so anyway, um, so I'm very passionate about home ownership. Now, wh while I know that your intention is good, we do have a bit of a problem at the moment because we've also got a, a very um, incompetent RBA that blew up the housing bubble uh, uh, throughout COVID, even though we already had a housing bubble before that. I should note that in 1985, we had $8 billion in foreign debt, uh, and when uh, we opened up, Keating opened up the economy to foreign banks, by 2008, we had $800 billion in foreign debt. That mean, and all of that money went into mainly the property market in Sydney and Melbourne, which meant that housing prices went from four times average earnings to 13 times average earnings. Right? So, you know, we've got to actually start to learn how to control the volume of capital in this country and not let so much volume of capital, so much money go into housing, while at the same time we don't put any money into manufacturing and being productive. Right? Because if we're going to get ahead in this country, we have got to stop relying on other countries. And as I say to people, if you got washed up on a desert island, would you either A, go to the bank uh, and, and, or try and manipulate interest rates? Uh, or, or get a, a credit, you know, Fitch's credit rating or something like that, or B, would you look to provide essential services to the people like dams, water, um, housing and, and productivity? Right? Now, of course, you'd do the latter. And of course, we know that's exactly what happened in this country about uh, uh, 210 years ago uh, when Lachlan Macquarie came here. He was the first governor to see Australia as a country, not a colony. He realised in order to run a country properly, you've got to have your own currency. We don't really have our own currency today. We do in name. But what people don't realise is whenever we go to build a dam or anything like that, we use foreign currency, which of course means that when you build a dam for a billion dollars and you've borrowed a billion dollars in foreign currency, the first billion dollars in wealth you create you have to repay offshore. Now, what people don't understand is not all money printing is the same. If I'm a company and I want to become a bigger company, I can issue shares, equity, right? It's not called debt, it's called equity, right? Equity is title. As a sovereign country, we have title over this country. If I want to actually build a dam, I can issue shares in a dam, right? That is productive. I don't need to borrow for it. Right? And all you need to do is get the RBA to lend a billion dollars to whichever state government is going to build the dam, and all they have to do is repay that debt. But I digress a little bit, but the reason why I talk about the RBA and this whole volume of money in the system is that we need to actually lower the cost of living as well. Right? And if we're going to lower the cost of living, 
rather than do what the RBA is doing. So we've currently had a supply shock because of Russia and all these other things, right? So what we've done, supply has gone down. What the RBA is going to do is try and crush demand as well by pushing it down. So they're going to use an austerity policy. That is complete and utter madness, right? What we need is a productivity policy that is going to increase supply. So rather than reduce demand and, and make people suffer through you know, not being able to rent a house or, or um, buy their own house, we need to increase productivity. We need to build. And if we build, and you'll get all the neoliberals and all these people who think they're economists, let me tell you, economists are to finance what climate modelists are to scientists. They rely on assumptions and false, false ideas, right? The idea that you know, uh, building uh, dams is going to cause inflation is a bad thing, is completely ridiculous. Because if you build more dams, you build more power stations, you build more roads, you build better transport infrastructure, you increase the supply. If you increase supply, you push the cost of essential services down, okay, then you make it cheaper for business to actually operate. And then if you make it cheaper for business to operate, guess what? They employ more people. And if you employ more people, and you're making more money, you can pay them more, and then they can afford to buy a house, and it becomes a virtuous circle. So uh, let me say that, look, while I can't agree with you entirely on the premise of keeping um, rental levels entirely flat, we do need to look at the way we run this country, um, and we need to look at becoming much more productive, and we've got to stop all this paper shuffling uh, and pandering to uh, markets rather and start pandering to actually genuine productivity. That means less academics, more tradesmen. Uh, we need to get rid of payroll tax in this country by bringing back stamp duty on share trading. It is completely nuts that if I buy a house or I buy a farm or I buy a business or a truck, I've got to pay stamp duty, but yet I can flip shares all day on the stock market and, and the stock market's manipulated by foreign investors. They pay no stamp duty. right? So, for, you know, so um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Time's up, but yeah, that was a good talk. Thank you. Thank you. You've still got one second? No, OK. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Norman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Housing is an essential service and a human right. Everyone has a right to safe, accessible and affordable housing. Yet in the midst of Australia's cost of living crisis, millions of Australians are struggling to make ends meet, while also paying ever higher skyrocketing rents. We have seen the biggest annual rent increases in 14 years. The cost of rent is increasing seven times faster than wages. That's insane. It's crushing people. This is a housing crisis, and we know that the implementation of a nationwide rent freeze is essential. It will press pause on rent increases and allow wages time to catch up, and it will stop the profiteering by landlords becoming even worse. During this debate, we've heard about strategies for increasing the number of houses in this country helping people into home ownership. But that is not going to help the family who can't afford their rent this week. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people across our country in that situation. This is a national emergency. That we have parents and carers and families and children sleeping in cars sleeping in tents, at risk of being evicted from their housing because the rent's been put up and they can't afford it, should be something that every single person in this place wants to move heaven and earth to fix today. That's why we need to freeze rents and it's why we need to cap increases to 2 per cent each year thereafter. We are currently undergoing one of the most significant transfers of wealth from non-property owners to property owners. It is deepening economic inequality in this country. 
Our current willingness to accept skyrocketing rental costs is creating a growing generational wealth divide as young people are forced to rent for longer at higher prices and at lower wages. Tenants are being saddled with the cost of increasing interest rates through these rent increases. A rent freeze is one of the most important things we could do to alleviate the cost of living pressures of Australians. Let's get it done. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. We are in a housing crisis. Australia is seeing the biggest rent increases in 14 years, putting millions of Australians into severe rental stress. And none are more affected than the millions of Australians who are forced by this Labor government to survive under the poverty line on grossly inadequate income support payments. I've heard from so many people who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. One person who receives the disability support pension contacted my office to let me know they were evicted from their rental property of nine years because their landlord wanted to double the rent, and they couldn't do it while they were still in the property. This person is now homeless, staying in a caravan park with no heating. Someone else told me that their rent's just gone up by $60 a week, so it's now well over half their income. Once they pay the rent and their bills, they have $18 left over for food and all other items. They are forced to buy out-of-date food, they can't afford fresh fruit and vegetables, and their health is suffering because of it. Poverty is a political choice, and the gov this government is choosing to leave people without food or heating as they struggle to pay the rent. So just as the government coordinated a national response to the COVID-19 health crisis, the federal government should coordinate an emergency national response to the housing crisis, including an urgent rent freeze. The Greens are also fighting for all government income support payments to be lifted above the poverty line to ensure everyone has got enough to cover their basic needs. Our plan would raise all government income support payments above the poverty line. It would abolish mutual obligations and remove unfair restrictions on who can access payments to ensure that everyone has got enough to cover their basic needs. Don't let the government convince you otherwise. This is possible. I've said it once and I will say it again. Poverty is a political choice. So this government now has a choice. Labor could either work with the Greens, not go ahead with the stage three tax cuts and fund services to support everybody, or they could choose to side with Peter Dutton to funnel more money into the pockets of billionaires and the ultra-wealthy. It is a choice. Poverty is a political choice. We have the choice to end people living in poverty. We have a choice to institute a rent freeze that will help people survive. Poverty is a political choice, and we call upon this government to make the right choice. Thank you. Senator Rice. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you. Housing is a human right. Every single person in our community should be able to have a roof over their head, somewhere to call home, somewhere that is safe, somewhere that is affordable, somewhere where they can belong in a community, and making sure that every single community member is able to have a roof over their heads is one of the top priorities of the Australian Greens, and it should be a top priority of this government. Now, the reality of being a renter in Australia in 2022 is not something that we often hear in Parliament, because, shock horror, there aren't too many renters that are elected members of Parliament. But let me just fill you in on what it is actually like to be a renter right now in Australia. One of my friends in Perth, they rent a house, right, for $500 a week. Now, this house in the summer is 40 degrees inside. And when this person contacted their landlord and said, hey, you've just put my rent up, could you please fit an air conditioning system? The response of the landlord was, the amount of money you're paying is commensurate for a house without an air conditioning system. No. They 
Another friend of mine uh, in uh, the lower south metropolitan part of Perth uh, spent one year arguing with their landlord whether or not their internet was functioning. They couldn't get online, they couldn't access government services at home, they couldn't socialise with their friends during lockdown. And every time they sent their landlord an email saying that this was a problem, the landlord responded that the telecommunication company had not registered a fault. And round and round it went for a year. Now, whether it is telecommunications, air conditioning, the leaky pipe in the back of the system that causes black mould to grow, whether it's the holes in the roof, People struggle in such deep insecurity, such absolute uncertainty, suffering such a profound power imbalance with their landlords that it causes incredible mental health uh, impacts upon people. You literally don't know whether this week is the week the landlord is going to evict, whether this week is the week that they're going to renovate and kick you out, or simply put your rent up so high that you cannot afford your home. And so that is why this government must follow the Greens' lead and institute a rent freeze, so that at the very least People renting across this country can know what they're going to have to pay and know that it will be affordable for them so that they can keep that roof over their head. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to reject this motion in the strongest terms. Forcing a rent freeze will only make our housing crisis worse, not better. Don't get me wrong. I'm fully aware of the huge rent increases that have occurred since the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm fully aware that many Australian families are struggling with it. But freezing rents will only force more landlords out of the sector and further reduce the amount of accommodation available for rent. You need to address the underlying causes of this crisis. Lack of supply, in part driven by the fact we allow foreigners and multinationals to buy new residential property, actually stop all foreign ownership of any housing new or established. Massive and costly regulation imposed on landlords and high demand largely driven by the unsustainable flood of immigrants coming into this country as part of Labor's plan to outsource jobs that should go to Australians. State governments should release more land in a timely manner address costs and red tape, stamp duty revised. Most landlords are not wealthy property tycoons. In many cases, it supplements an otherwise meagre income. Many have spent all their lives making sacrifices to invest in a single property to make things a bit more comfortable in their retirement. Their costs are going up too, like council rates, insurance and interest rates. They have no control over these costs. If they cannot raise rents to accommodate these costs, they will leave the rental game and Australians will have even lower supply than before. Landlords are also tired of increasing regulation which takes away the rights as property owners. These days, when a tenant moves in, they effectively become the owners, and if they become a problem, they can be impossible to remove in exchange for responsible tenants. Bonds worth six or six, four or six weeks rent are wholly, wholly inadequate to cover the cost of repairing property damage, wear and tear. Landlords in some cases can't even refuse tenants who own pets they don't want in their properties. Now the Greens want to take away another right. Are they completely ignorant of the short-term holiday accommodation market? Are they not aware of how much easier it is for property owners in this market than the rental market? Insurance costs are taken care of. Most stays are only for a day or a week, limiting the amount of wear and tear a landlord might need to fix. Property owners can make a lot more money from this market. A home that might attract $25,000 a year in rent can earn double that figure in the short-term holiday accommodation market without much of the regulatory burdens forced on landlords. I know the Greens mean well. I really do. With this idea, and I look forward to them freezing rents on their own investment properties, but don't impose your economic illiteracy on Australia. Thank you, Senator Hanson. The time for the debate has expired, so I'll put the question. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Cadell, teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 33. The question is resolved in the negative. I might give uh, those senators not taking part in the next item of business the opportunity to leave the chamber if they so wish. And I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Uh, uh, the documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Cadell. Uh, I take note and seek leave to continue the remarks on items. Uh, page four, items eight, nine, ten and eleven. And on page five, item twelve. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Senator Faruqi. Just order, sorry, Senator. Sorry, I, I rise now to take. Is. Thank you. I rise to take note of document nine on page four relating to the Australian Research Council funding schemes. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senators will know that I have a strong interest in the work of the ARC. The importance of research and the ARC cannot be understated, and it was a travesty how university research and researchers were treated by the previous government, in particular how ministers made something of a sport of vetoing recommended grants based on a whim or a political ideology, and then trying to make a mockery of some of the proposals they shut down after they had been approved through the rigorous peer review process. Shamefully, in December last year, the then acting education minister delivered a letter of expectations to the then CEO of the ARC, 
telling the ARC to direct more funding towards national manufacturing priorities at the expense of other research and demanding greater prioritization of the national interest test in determining funding recommendations. The letter was widely condemned by academic institutions as unjustified interference. The CEO resigned less than a week later. The new Labour Education Minister has announced that there will be an independent review of the ARC as recommended by the Senate Committee inquiry into my bill to remove ministerial discretion from research grants administered by the ARC. This is welcome. The new minister has also said that there should be an end to delays and political interference in the research grant process. That too is welcome. However, the minister has also said that the national interest test should continue. There is no compelling reason for the continuation of the national interest test. It is onerous, it is unnecessary, and it is causing havoc for researchers. A practice known to the academics as nitpicking has delayed and interfered with the research funding process in recent months. This document, produced in response to my OPD earlier this month, shows the concerning extent of the ARC CEO's interference and just how broken and unnecessary the NIT is. The ARC CEO requested revisions to the NIT statement in 322 applications, 13% of all projects that had reached the CEO. Multiple revisions were requested in almost two-thirds of these cases. And disturbingly, applications to the Discovery Indigenous 2023 scheme attracted a request for NIT revisions, nearly three times the average rate of NIT picking for applications that had progressed to the CEO. Nitpicking has disproportionately interfered with the applications of Indigenous researchers. The CEO needs to explain why Indigenous research applications were subjected to more revisions than others. In December 2018, the Senate passed my motion, which called to scrap the National Interest Test, as it would allow the government of the day to influence an independent research approval process. It acknowledged that the ARC already has a rigorous peer review process for assessing grant applications, and applications are required to demonstrate the benefits and impact of their research, and called on the government to get rid of the national interest test. Labour supported the motion. Senator Carr referred to the test as Orwellian sounding, and nothing more than an instrument for the further political manipulation of an independent peer reviewed process. Nor is it needed. Senator Carr noted that scholars already have to prove the national benefit and impact of their research proposals. So I asked the Labour government, what has changed now? And I call on them to drop the hypocrisy and drop the Morrison era national interest test. It cannot be saved through redrafting. We should aspire to be a global research destination which has a reputation for fairness, rigour and the production of outstanding research. Amongst other things, this requires getting rid of the completely unnecessary and onerous national interest test and abolishing the political power which allows grants to be vetoed. Researchers and uni staff must have better pay and conditions and research must be properly supported by investment and proper public funding. If we are serious about treating our universities as a public good rather than as corporations, that has to involve care and respect for research, including proper public funding. I will be paying close attention to the ARC review and look forward to continuing my discussions with researchers and universities and the government on what needs to change for Australian research. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of um, the Auditor General's report for 22-23, uh, number four on page four. Um, do I need to seek leave? Sorry, Acting Deputy President. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, just so, rise. Okay. Um, so this is a uh, the auditor performance report. The Australian Government implementation of the National Waste Policy Action Plan for the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. Um, this is a very important uh, audit report, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, Effective management of waste is absolutely critical to us here in Australia, uh, something I, the Greens have been campaigning on for well over a decade because, of course, uh, sadly, we've seen a lot of waste, especially plastic waste, make its way into the ocean and into the environment, but also uh, creating a circular economy. 
uh, where everything that is produced is designed for its end of life and stays in the system. So we actually essentially eliminate waste. Creating a circular economy is absolutely critical uh, for climate action. It doesn't matter whether that waste is organic waste uh, or food waste or textile waste uh, or plastic waste. Uh, if we design things for their end of life, we can uh, create more jobs, we have a very exciting and vibrant uh, economy, and we can actually eliminate a significant environmental problem uh, while we do that. And of course, governments have a very important role to play uh, in eliminating waste and building a circular economy. And the National Waste Policy Action Plan, the NWPAP, was uh, designed by the government in 2019 and was intended to guide investment and national efforts uh, in Australia to reduce waste and support more sustainable resource use to 2020. Uh, to put it in other ways, to help actually move us along the path to creating a circular economy and getting to zero waste. So this Auditor General report looked at the implementation of this national plan over the last four years. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the results weren't necessarily good. Um, what the department, the Auditor General, found uh, was that the department's implementation of this national plan was only partly effective. Um, they also found that the effectiveness of the department's implementation and coordination of actions and monitoring and reporting of progress is reduced by a lack of agreed action scope or deliverables against which programs or progress can be assessed. Now, I'm very concerned about this uh, because the last government talked a very big talk uh, about reducing waste and taking action, for example, on things like banning single-use plastics. If you go to the plan, you'll see there's eight key components to it. Uh, the first one is to ban the exports of waste. And we've talked about that a lot in here. The second one is to reduce total waste generated in Australia by 10 per cent per person. Only 10 per cent. We should be looking to eliminate waste in this country. And we can't even uh, measure whether we've achieved that or are on a pathway to achieving that. Now, the third target is 80 per cent average resource recovery from all waste streams following uh, the waste hierarchy by 2030. In other words, getting 80 per cent towards building a circular economy by 2030. Um, target four, significantly increase the use of recycled content by governments and industry. In other words, having governments buy recycled content to help the recycling industry. Target five, and this one's critical to me personally, phase out problematic and unnecessary plastics from our waste stream. By the way, it's not just the Greens that want to phase out, especially single-use plastics that are killing marine life. The recycling industry wants to get rid of them because they actually foul up the system. They contaminate our waste streams and make recycling very difficult. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that are really critical around uh, eliminating organic waste, or at least halving the amount of organic waste to go to landfill by 2030. Uh, and here's target seven, which of course underpins all this, make comprehensive, economy-wide and timely data publicly available to support better consumer investment and policy decisions. And we're working with uh, the state environment ministers uh, and various departments to achieve this. But unfortunately, I haven't got time to go into it today, and I urge senators to read this. We'll certainly be asking questions at estimates. Um, it's found that there's basically no way we have any idea if we're on track to do any of this stuff. And of course, uh, under the very important legislation the last government brought here, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 2021, um, we've also got product stewardship schemes where we've got a packaging covenant like APCO, the Australian Packaging Covenant, that have voluntary targets to reduce packaging waste. Um, do we trust the department to be on track? to actually monitor someone like APCO to achieve their objectives. So these are some big questions we have to answer following this report. Uh, and you can be sure the Greens will be in here doing exactly that. Thank you, Senator Bush Wilson. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek to speak to document eight on page four. I thank Minister Gallagher and Minister Lee for taking this document discovery seriously and providing a considered and timely response. Parliament cannot review our handling of COVID-19 unless the data critical to that review is made available promptly and in clear detail. And we had many problems with that with both the Queensland Premier and the previous Prime Minister. Failure to provide this data earlier has led to harmful speculation that timely reporting would have prevented. 
I note in the minister's reply that the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, has now committed to a publishing schedule for health-related data that has the effect of returning data disclosure back to pre-COVID turnaround times. Finally, at last. The data that was provided in this discovery does indicate Australia's mortality rate is increasing substantially and that birth rate is falling substantially, yet less than some commentators have been assuming. Now, I believe, Madam Acting Deputy President, in making accurate statements based on solid data, and so further discussion on this matter should wait for the Causes of Death 2021 publication, which I note, Minister, is due on the 19th of October. I thank the Minister and the Government for their attention to this matter, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Roberts. If there are no other senators wishing to speak to the documents uh, in the order of business, we will move to the tabling of a committee report. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the report of the committee on its review of the listing and relisting of aid organisations as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a brief contribution on the tabling of this report, uh, and in particular to focus my oh. contribution. Sorry, I seek leave to make a short contribution of no more than two minutes. Thank you. Um, I particularly like to focus my contribution on uh, one of the listings in particular of those eight terrorist organisations, although I support uh, the minister's decision to list and relist all of those organisations, and that is a listing uh, in its entirety of Hamas as a terrorist organisation. Um, the history of this issue is that uh, Hamas's al qassam brigades were initially listed in November 2003 and have been repeatedly relisted by ministers for home affairs uh, or their equivalents. By, under governments of both persuasions uh, until uh, the 4th of August 2021. In the PJCIS's last review of that listing uh, under my chairmanship, we recommended that the evidence was now overwhelmingly clear that the al qassam brigades of Hamas were not a discrete and separate entity to the rest of Hamas, but that the entirety of Hamas was responsible, both morally, ethically, uh, legally and financially for the terrorist activities uh, that the Al-Qassam Brigades engages in, and that in particular the so-called civilian uh, leadership of Hamas were at the very least guilty of uh, many instances of incitement to violence, meeting the definition under the Act uh, required. And so we recommended uh, for the first time that the government consider broadening that listing to cover Hamas in its entirety. Uh, and I'm very pleased that the then Minister for Home Affairs, uh, Ms Andrews, uh, in October uh, 2021 um, received our report and then in February 2022 agreed to the committee's recommendation and proceeded to list uh, the organisation in its entirety. Um, under the leadership of the new committee, uh, my colleague in the other place, uh, Mr Khalil, uh, the PJCS has considered that listing and reaffirmed and supported the minister's decision to list uh, Hamas in its entirety. I want to thank the uh, Labor members of the committee for their support of this listing. This is a very important bipartisan initiative to recognise that all of Hamas is responsible for its violent crimes around the world and should be held so in, under our law. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Waters? Yes, just on your indulgence, Acting Deputy President, I did rise to take note of a document and seek leave to continue my remarks, but I missed my moment. Um, could I ask that uh, document number 20 on page 5 um, that I seek to take note of it and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Thank Senator you. Waters. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further contributions on the tabling of the committee report, we'll move to committee memberships. Uh, the president has uh, yes, received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that Senator Cox replace Senator McKim on the Economics Legislation Committee for the committee's inquiry into the provisions of the Atomic Energy Amendment, Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022, and Senator McKim be appointed as a participating member. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any ministerial statements? Thank you. I, uh, thank you. Um, I table the government response to the interim report of the Royal Commission into v Events and Veteran Suicide and a ministerial statement relating to the response.
Oh, Senator Lambie. In, um, Deputy Madam President. Um, I seek leave um, to make a statement on the, on the ministerial statement of defence and veteran suicide, if I may. Senator Lambie, you can move to take note of that statement. You That's don't need to seek leave. So, damn it. I had that written down the first time, uh, <laughs> Madam Deputy President. You should know that by now. Here's the thing about the Veteran Suicide Royal Commission. It didn't come about because the Liberal and Labor parties woke up one day and realised we actually needed one. It didn't happen because Defence and Department of Veterans Affairs finally admitted they have a problem. It happened because our veterans and their families made it happen. Our soldiers, our sailors and our airmen made it happen. It took bravery, strength and a hell of a lot of resilience. It took years. Many, 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 many people have had to bear their souls to strangers, share their deepest sorrows and vulnerabilities to people who didn't want to hear them. They have had to do this over and over again just to prove how much we needed this. It has taken more than a decade, but at least we all got here in the end. Ten years and finally the powers that we had to sit up and listen to the men and women who live this every day of their lives. I can't tell you how many of these people from around the country and some from overseas have come through our office in Tassie during that period. Do you know how many soldiers are being bullied to an inch of their life by the superiors in the army? Do people know how many kids have gone in there hoping to do their country and family proud, only to come back out the other side physically broken and emotionally shattered by the people who were supposed to be their heroes? Do people know how many women have been sexually abused, harassed, handed out of the military for no other reason except that they aren't one of the boys? I tell you, it's been thousands. Women are still dragging chairs up against their bedroom door of a night time, scared of the same people they're supposed to find ne fight next to in a war. I know senior people, majors, lieutenant, lieutenants, captains, who have spoken up about the bullying and abuse that is going on with their own diggers in their own units, and their careers have been killed off. And this is still going on today, even with a Royal Commission happening. 20, 30, 40 years of service down the drain because they did the honourable thing and they called out unacceptable behaviour of their peers. They had courage and they showed guts, and this is how we treat them. And we continue, Defence continues to treat them today. I know smart, clever young recruits who have tried to look out for their mates only to get chewed, out, chewed up and spat out by the power of the cover-up culture in defence. That's what happens if you speak up in the Australian Defence Force. You speak up, you're a troublemaker, you're a problem. It's as simple as that. Because what you do is you stay in the military institution. It is shame on you, apparently, because you must understand this, it always is the institution first. Well, I have to say this to the institution. I reckon those days are all but over, and I'll make sure of it. I don't intend to go anywhere in the next three years, and I certainly don't intend to go anywhere in the six years after that. That cover-up culture puts you on the backside out in civilian life, away from the world you thought would be your own until you're old and grey. You put your country first, and that's what happens to you. Good, strong men and women turn into shadows of themselves. They should be serving our country, but if they speak up, they're more, li more likely to end up on the dole. And the families of these people, their kids, who go, in, who go in so hopeful and come out so lost, we leave the mums, dads, wives and husbands to pick up the pieces. That's what we've been doing. Over the 10 years that we've been fighting for this, we honestly must have seen the same thing over and over again hundreds of times. Maybe even more. If you heard the things we've heard in my office, if you've heard the things I've heard out in the streets, if you think if you've heard the things I've heard because I've got military mates who have served and are still serving, I can tell you now what absolutely make your make your heart break. This Royal Commission has to change all of that. It really is our last shot. We can't ask everyone who fought for this to keep going and do more. They've given every last drop of energy and fight they have to do this. But even here at the highest level of inquiry you could possibly imagine, 
the Royal Commission is being blocked by the same people who have fought against it all these years. These are the people that didn't want a Royal Commission. It isn't getting the information it needs to do its job, and that is not fair on the Royal Commission. We're putting in millions of bucks trying to save lives, and the institution doesn't want to pass over documents. Really, it's not that difficult. And it can't ask the hard questions it needs to ask without that paperwork. It is simple. We've set up, we've set up the strongest, most powerful inquiry we can, and you can't get more powers than a Royal Commission. And even here, the highest form of inquiry you can get, we're coming up against roadblocks. Don't take it from me, take it from the Commission itself. This is what they've told us. And I quote, we can't ask the hard questions. They've told, unquote, they've told us they're constrained, unreasonably constrained. Now, I know the government thinks the Royal Commission's wrong in this. They reckon there's no problem here. To that I say, when a Royal Commission tell you, tells you that it needs information it can't get it, I suggest you start listening. It obviously can't get it for a reason, and we need to fix that. We need to give them a solution. Otherwise, we're wasting millions and millions of dollars once again on running some fantasy that's never going to come up with the answers that we need because we are blocking the information from them. We have to take the Royal Commission seriously in what it's telling us because they say well, they have a problem and it's up to us to fix it. That's what we're in here for. We debated my bill this morning to make this happen. It addresses one barrier to the Royal Commission's work, parliamentary privilege. You don't touch privilege lightly. I get that. I also get that I've never heard a Royal Commission, and state me if I'm wrong, ever say that they are being blocked from getting information. Show me. Parliamentary privilege is an important part of how a parliament works. It's a thing that lets me stand here today and say what I need to say without being worried about being sued. It gives people legal protection when they come to me and say they have a problem. We've even used it before to name and shame the bullies in the Australian Defence Force who are the reason we need a Royal Commission in the first place. But parliamentary privilege is getting in the way of the Royal Commission. That's because if a report or paper is covered by privilege, that comes with a whole set of rules about how it can be used in a courtroom. A judge can't use it to make a finding, for, a, for, a, for example. You can't ask a court to use someone else's evidence in a sending inquiry to decide if a crime has been committed. A lawyer can't use it to show you've broken law or defamed someone. Privilege stops the Veterans Suicide Royal Commission from using evidence from Parliament. It stops the Commission from being able to look at the Senate inquiries and order the general reports. It stops the commissioners from being able to use that information to make recommendations. They can't, they can't question government officials about what they've done without, without, with that information. Instead of protecting the people who come to me and ask for help, parliamentary, protect, parliamentary privilege, would you believe it, is protecting the people in power who threw the abuse out in the first place. Government, official, government officials, ministers, politicians, that's who parliamentary privilege is protecting. The Royal Commission can't ask public officials the question it wants to ask because of parliamentary privilege. It can't use the evidence to build a case on what the ADF and Defence have done to fix a problem that some parliament has pointed out for years. All those Senate inquiries, all those reports, the evidence people gave us here in parliament, it is useless to the commissioners. They can't touch it. Instead, they've got to go back and do all the work again. What a load of rubbish. They're just doubling up. Parliamentary privilege shouldn't be used that way. That's not what it's for. But that's what's, what, that's what's happening. Take this for an example. The legal officers who helped the Royal Commissions at public hearings, they wanted to ask Defence about the Auditor-General's report that looked into Defence's handling of some cultural change programs. The report was subject to parliamentary privilege, which meant the lawyers knew that they had to be careful. They knew that they couldn't ask the Royal Commissioners to use the report to make any recommendations or draw any conclusions. Like I said, you're not allowed to do that. But they really want to know that Defence has done in response to the report's findings. At first, they tried to ask the officials broad questions about what the report said, and they decided not to show any part of the report publicly, even though it's, it's on the website for public consumption. 
They didn't quote anything directly out of what the Auditor General said, but the lawyers for the federal government didn't think that was good enough. They thought the Commission would still fall foul of the laws on parliamentary privilege and be in contempt of parliament. That's where we're at. And sure enough, a few days later, the Royal Commissioner's lawyers had to back it down. That's where we're at today. Um, something needs to be done about that. Um, it makes no sense. This is why I've proposed a bill to perform to reform the Privileges Act. We have to get to the bottom of this, and I'm very disappointed that Labor isn't listening to what the Royal Commission has said. We have no choice. We have to run a short Senate inquiry on this, and we need to find a way around this now. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, the, if no other senators wish to take note on that ministerial statement, Senator Shoebridge? I'd seek to take note on the ministerial statement and, and seek leave to Continue your remarks. Continue my remarks. Thank you. Very Thank well you, done. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are no further, another ministerial statement, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I well, this is um, this, right. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning industrial relations matters and the special envoy for disaster recovery. So that was them. Senator Shoup. Oh. If no senators are. Uh, um, seeking to uh, take note of those, that statement, Senator Gallagher. So messages. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I can move to messages. Absolutely. Uh, the president has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence: the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill 2022, and the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures Number no. Two Bill 2022. I call the minister. Very much. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill 2022 and Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 2 Bill 2022. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill 2022 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you very much. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Climate Change Bill 2022 and the Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. The President has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to two laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. That concludes messages and I call on the clerk to call on business. Happy to do so, Chair. Uh, business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Tyrrell, proposing the disallowance of financial framework supplementary powers amendment, Prime Minister and Cabinet's portfolio measures number two, regulations 2022. Senator Lambie. Oh, sorry. Do I need to? Sorry, Madam Deputy yeah. President. Do I need to move that? You might, might wish to move to post. You, you can either move the motion or you can move to postpone the motion. I move the motion, Acting Deputy uh, Madam President. The question is that the uh, motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to, and just for uh, Senator Shoebridge. Yes. Um, well, I, this has come on in rather of a hurry, um, and, and I know that Senator Tyrrell may wish to come down and speak to it, and I think if she does, it's important she be given the opportunity to come down to speak to it. And I, 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 rise, I rise to associate the Greens with the motion um, that's on the disallowance motion that's been on, uh, put on by Senator Tyrrell to disallow the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment. Prime Minister and Cabinet's Portfolio Measures No. 2, Regulations 2022. Um, it's a, a regulation which has a very innocuous, almost a 
deliberately Orwellian title, um, but it's the regulation under which a kind of sweetheart deal to deliver millions of dollars to the pet charity of the Governor General that was cooked up between the Prime Minister and, um, and, and the Governor General on a series of sort of fireside chats. Um, now, we've seen, and, and, and I think we, sh we support, the Labor government has said they're going to pull the funding. Well, that's good, and, and we support the, um, the decision. In fact, we celebrated the decision. We were pushing for the pulling of the funding. And if this is a project that has merit, well, then it should go through the usual procedures in order to have, um, to have, have it assessed as a meritorious um, um, project. Um, and go through the usual transparency procedures for a grant. But as the, um, as the, as the, the statement that associated that, that, that came with the financial framework made very clear, the regulations made clear, this was a, this was a, 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 a grant that managed to avoid all of the usual scrutiny processes. It wasn't put up on the website. There was no competitive tendering. It was just some $18 million of public money being handed over to a charity um, which was being lobbied for by the Governor-General behind closed doors. So it was good to see the, um, the, the new government say they're not going to proceed with the funding, and we support them saying they're not going to proceed with the funding. Um, and indeed, it's something that um, the Greens and my office had been calling for um, for, um, for some considerable time. Um, and the Senate will recall that, on behalf of the Greens, I put forward a similar disallowance motion to that that's been used um, by uh, put forward here by Senator Tyrrell. Um, and we agreed for the tidiness of the um, Senate to withdraw our motion and associate ourselves with Senator Tyrrell's motion, which has now come on. Um, so we say to the Labor government, well, the decision has been made to pull the funding. Tick. Let's now scrub the offensive regs off the statute books, the, the, the regs that allowed for the delivery of this big chunk of public money without any scrutiny. Without going to, without even being put on the website, let alone without allowing com competitive tendering. If this this leadership charity, I suppose it's called a charity, but if this you know uh, leadership proposal has merit, go through the usual process, have competitive tendering, have a proper public assessment of it, and if it stacks up, and it's better to spend 18 million dollars here than 18 million dollars on other critical. Um, uh, projects, and I can tell you, I can think of about 500 that I'd put before spending money on this particular project. If it stacks up, then by all means fund it. But in the meantime, we're doing th this motion is doing the people of Australia um, a, a great service. It's scrubbing off some unnecessary laws. We make a lot of laws, and we could just scrub off this one, which is not only unnecessary, but if it's allowed to remain on the statute books would still allow for the government to reverse its decision and put the funding through without any kind of scrutiny, without that kind of necessary daylight that all grants should go through. Um, so for those reasons, we associate ourselves with the motion, commend Senator Tyrrell for bringing it to, uh, to the Senate, and we look forward to the government supporting it. Senator, Lan uh, Senator Gallagher. Sorry, I thought I'd just put the government's position very briefly. Uh, the government is not proceeding with the 2022-23 budget measure regarding the Australian Future Leaders Program. Uh, funding for this measure, along with a number of other measures by, uh, announced by the previous government, have been reviewed as part of the Albanese government's budget preparations. Um, we will uh, support the disallowance. It's actually practically no longer needed, given we will not be funding this program. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Bah, must be getting late. Um, I just uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, thank Labor uh, for uh, for doing this and cleaning up what they uh, do. I think once we all investigated and the media investigated, and um, I'm sorry I can't remember the journalists that brought this out in the open, but I thank her um, to start with. 
uh, this was, I think, when we also want to thank Labor. I think what we want to do is make sure it's completely cleaned up so it doesn't happen again. Um, yeah, just to make sure it's finished. Um, but I think, um, I think it's been really, really disappointing um, from the blue side here when they were in government that whatever little deal was done between the Governor General uh, and the Prime Minister of the day has been absolutely disgraceful. There is no information on it. We've got no idea where this money was being spent. It was like a little boys' club gone wrong. I mean, it was just disgraceful. Like 18 million bucks is 18 dollars worth of mixed lollies. Fair income. This has been absolutely disgraceful in the way it was done. We don't just hand out money because they're the Governor General without any details. And I still still for the life of me have not heard much out of the Governor General explaining what this what do they call it? Future Leaders blah 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 program was all about without any detail, and yet the Governor General is still sitting there in his position. Happy to take 18 million bucks not be transparent with public out there and tell them exactly this is, this is how great this program was going to be because for 18 million bucks he was going to get a great program. Um, there was no doubt about that, apparently. Uh, we haven't heard boo. And I have to say that's been quite shameful. That in itself is probably time the Governor General went and had a look at his position um, in front of the public eye. And I, once again, if you've got full detail, mate, of what this program looked like, then you come out and you tell us what it looked like, but I haven't seen peep out of you. You realise now you're not in the military, you're in the face of the Governor-General uh, and in the face of the public people of Australia. And if you do not, if you can't come out with good reasoning on that 18 million bucks and where it was going and the little deals that were done on the sidelines, then maybe you don't deserve to be in that position in the first place. You're not in the military, mate. There's no more cover up here. It's a whole different ball game being the Governor General. And quite frankly, you need to come out and you need to be honest with the Australian people and what was going on. And I tell you, I, and like millions of other, uh, others out there, will not be satisfied until this was done. I mean, I'd love to know who was going to be the future leaders. Who are the future leaders that you were going to pick in your own little spear there and put on another planet? Was it a miniature Australian Defence Force Academy or something, is it? What, what, what did it look like? What was the substance to it? Who signed off on the regs? Buddy? Yeah, who signed off on the regs? Thank the you very general. much. The Governor General. That's, a That's correct. That's so, um, you know, I think, I think for us just to uh, have this end up and having, having it cleaned up um, and finished off properly and making sure that there is a statement very loud and clear that I don't give a stuff if you're the Governor General. And I, I mean that with due respect, but um, you're under the same public eye as what the rest of us are up here. Welcome to the real world. The military will no longer be there to cover your bottom. Doesn't work like that. So, uh, firstly, I ask you to go and think about your position and whether that's tenable, because quite frankly, I don't think it is, and neither do millions of others out there, apparently, that are not that happy with you. Uh, so I do ask you before I, I finish up is if you go and have a good look at yourself uh, to the Governor General, because quite frankly it's absolutely unacceptable behaviour. Uh, there's nothing more you can say about that, um, and maybe it's time it's, it's time for you to leave. So um, other than that, geez, I, I would have thought that the Future Leaders Program, if it was such such going to be such an asset, and the leaders were going to be so great, you'd have been out there prancing around like like uh, a butterfly about it. But we haven't heard a peep. So, other than that, um, I won't say anything else. I think we all know, quite frankly, where we stand on that. Um, but uh, we'd like to finish it off and make sure um, it, it is done done correctly, and make sure that this has been an example, and that we are not going to tolerate that sort of waste let alone without any substance to where the $18 million or millions of dollars was going to go uh, into the future, that this is just not on. And I don't particularly want to be part of a Senate that just thinks $18 million bucks can be flagged around, like I said, of $18 worth of mixed lollies. It might seem a lot of money when we're dealing with billions up here, but it is an absolute waste that had no substance to it whatsoever. And I think that's more destroying than anything that someone asked for some money um, 
yet on the on the same note um, there's no instruction there's no what does it look like there's absolutely nothing and I think that is shameful um, so thank you very much thank you Senator Lambie if there are no further uh, Senator Tyrrell hi sorry about that um, look, thank you to Senator Shoebridge for getting things started in my absence. He did a great job, as always. I'm happy for him to step into my shoes any time. Oh, sorry, and I seek leave to you make a short Senator statement. Durrell. Is that all yes. right? Yes. Thank you for your graciousness. I do appreciate it. Um, I'm glad we have a chance now to disallow this regulation. I'm hoping we take full advantage of it because it's dumb. There are a number of reasons to disallow this regulation, and I'm happy for senators to take their pick of whichever one they like. We should disallow this regulation because it is not transparent. It was made through a one-off grant without a competitive tender. It's fair to ask why. It's not like there was any track record it could point to that would suggest this is a safe bet for taxpayer money. The foundation was not operational before the grant was announced. It had no staff, no office, no website and no profile. We'll never know the basis on which the decision to award this grant was made. We know it was hidden from public view. Grants normally get published on the government's online Grant Connect Hub, and this one was not. The Governor-General was meeting with the former Prime Minister to lobby him over the project. Or maybe he wasn't. It depends on who you ask. He says he, was, he wasn't lobbying for it. His office says he wasn't lobbying for it. But its director says he was meeting with the government over it. I don't know what to make of that. Let's just say it's not very transparent. Maybe you don't mind the transparency issue. We should disallow this because it was a waste of money. This is not just my opinion. The Treasurer confirmed the government had concluded the $18 million initial grant and $4 million a year of ongoing funding didn't pass muster and did not represent value for money. So it doesn't pass muster. It doesn't represent value for money. We do not need to spend $30 million over the next four years setting up a program for rich kids to get told how to rule the world. Trust me, I know a few rich kids. They don't need any help getting told how to rule the world. They feel very well equipped to do that without any help. So it's an unnecessary and wasteful spend. Maybe that doesn't bother you either. Finally, we should disallow this because it is weird. Even if you think this is a perfectly useful way to spend tens of millions of dollars of public money, this is a weird way to go about spending it. According to the ABC, the person pushing this sent emails saying the Prime Minister's office would own the project. Promotional material for the program boasts of support from organisations and individuals who apparently have nothing to do with it. The organisation was granted charity status without seemingly doing anything. It listed a Barangaroo address as its registered office, but the address was a law firm. It's not transparent, it's not necessary and it's not normal. Nothing about this stacks up. Everything about this should go. I urge my colleagues to get rid of it by supporting this motion. It's good to see Labor scrapping the money. Let's disallow this because it's weird and it's dumb. Let's scrap it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Tyrrell be agreed. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Uh, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Yeah. Government business order of the day number one: Social Security Administration amendment, repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022. Resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment, repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill. It's a privilege to be able to come into this place and again speak on a bill which is part of the Albanese government's plan to restore integrity to policy making and implementation. 
Supporting evidence-based policy is a hallmark of any good government, but unfortunately a principle which the former coalition government was unable to uphold. Labor made it very clear during the federal election campaign that we would abolish the cashless debit card because it marginalised people and it was not in any sense of the word sound public policy. There was no evidence to support that it changed behaviours or spending habits of any tangible way. And on principle, no government should tell its citizens how to spend their money. A further example that the Liberal and Liberal Party of Australia no longer means liberty or freedom. This bill enables participants to progressively transition off the program from September 2022 and re-establishes income management in the Cape York region of Queensland. Communities have indicated their strong preference for support services such as alcohol and drug rehabilitation, early intervention services for domestic violence and education and childhood programs to remain in place following the abolition of the CDC. And this is welcome news because we know that when communities embrace autonomy over their own futures, good outcomes rise. The government will be consulting further with the CDC communities about the future of the support services that they have that have been funded through the CDC program. The Albanese government is a government of consultation, cooperation and negotiation because it equates to better outcomes for people and communities. We must, as a society, move away from privatisation of welfare, which, occurs, which did occur under the previous government. Governments should never demonise individuals or communities or play individuals and communities off against one another. Our government will not do that. We have been elected by the people and we must govern in the national interest and not leave anyone behind. Now, there is something deeply unjust and simply wrong when private for-profit companies control people's welfare and income support payments. It's just basically wrong. I've, been I've seen study after study that shows that the CDC or payment schemes similar to it, especially in New Zealand, did not cooperate or work effectively. There is literally no evidence to support that it works and those opposite should accept the facts. Now, unfortunately, the former government spent $170 million on the CDC program money, quite frankly, which could have been better invested in the support services within those local communities. Now, our government, the Albanese Labor government, will continue to consult with Indigenous communities and the entire community, including stakeholders, to ensure people understand this process and are not worse off. Transition arrangements will include an extension communication strategy and in-person engagement in each CDC site. We want to bring our communities with us. We want to make sure that they understand these changes because we want these changes to really matter to them and improve their lives. Participants transition off the CDC will be able to opt out of the program from the 19th of September, engaging with social service officers to seek additional information and support, including choosing to opt in for voluntary IM to set up centre pay arrangements where there is a need or receive a referral to available local services. This is a good outcome for all involved. Every Australian deserves the same opportunities in life, and it's up to the government to harness those positive opportunities and outcomes. The existing policy was created to divide and demonise certain communities. It was the government of the day saying to you, you're different. You can't be trusted with Social Security, so we will determine how you should spend your money. The Albanese government looks forward to this bill coming into law so the CDCs would not be forced on our fellow Australians again. I urge senators in this place, and particularly those on the other side, to accept the fact that their policy was bad policy. That's when they had policy. It was wrong 
and it did not achieve the outcomes that they sought to believe was going to happen. So I urge people to support this bill. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I just want to start with a quote. And you may have heard this quote before in this debate, but um, that is just testament to how important it is to hear this quote and to really take it on board. You guys will repeal this thing and then you'll walk away. You will repeal the card and then you will walk away and leave us to the violence, leave us to the hunger, leave us to the neglected children. Now that quote, um, which really struck a chord with me, and that came from the founder and director Director of Strategy of the Cape York Partnership, Noel Pearson, who is widely regarded and respected as an elder who speaks with first-hand knowledge of these issues and who is very, very focused on closing the gap and initiatives that support his people and Indigenous people around Australia. We've also had concerns raised by other organisations who work at the coalface of some of these communities who are actively working to close the gap. Foundations like the Mindaroo Foundation, who have said, and I quote, we are concerned that the decision to abolish the cashless debit card is being rushed through the parliament without appropriate or meaningful community consultation. The removal of the cashless debit card has the potential to exacerbate vulnerability and this must be avoided at all costs. The cashless debit card was introduced by the former coalition government after multiple examples of alcohol abuse, domestic violence, gambling and addictions that resulted in many, many families going hungry and being victims of abuse and deprivation. The cashless debit card has been described as an innovative program designed to tackle social harm, particularly associated with drug and alcohol addiction, in communities with high rates of long-term social security dependency. When the Albanese government first announced their intention to remove this program without consultation and on unsubstantiated claims of human rights abuses and after running a massive scare campaign up and down the east coast of New South Wales. Those who had first-hand experience of the benefits of this innovation knew what the consequences would be. The government claims it has consulted uh, Senator Polly, though, um, actually highlighted what the truth is because she just explained that the government is starting the consultation. So they didn't consult before they made this announcement. Whatever consultation they think they might have conducted must have been scant and meaningless. And, uh, I suspect there was never any real intention to find evidence of the success of the program. Um, otherwise, why would they now be backtracking? I mean, Senator Polly said they want to bring the communities along with them. But I'm sorry, it's too late when the bulldozer is already rolling. And we can see the panic now in the government, with the hurried announcement last Friday um, that people on the cashless debit card, oops, they will leave the program from early October because the bulldozer is taking off, but um, we'll now find a new, um, and I quote, enhanced card 
will be available to people who choose to remain on income management. And this new improved voluntary card will also somehow be available at more than the one million merchants the existing card is available at, and as well as online shopping and uh, BPay. Well, if the work has been done to ensure the technology and the systems and the compatibilities are in place to deliver this, that is the fastest I have ever seen a government and a department and a social welfare system work. In our experience, rolling out the necessary FPOS arrangements to these additional merchants will take much longer than the few days since the announcement was made and when new arrangements will supposedly start in October. We're also told that a further bill is coming because they must be realising the devastation that might ensue from this cancellation of the CDC, but a further bill will be coming with the Social Services Minister saying there would be an 18-month consultation process with affected communities to decide what the future of income management will look like. Wouldn't you think this consultation should have happened before the cancellation of the existing program, an existing program that works? This is putting the cart before the horse in every sense. The government has also announced millions of dollars in additional social supports for communities transitioning off the card. Well, they wouldn't need those social supports if you left the card in place. Order. Uh, I, I will take the interjection, Senator Rice. The, the millions of dollars we can support our communities, but the card supports the communities and stops the violence. It stops the addictions and it stops people. It stops Order. people standing over their spouses with their hand out and a club in their hand to claim their welfare cash because it's not there. Now, these last-minute changes that we are now seeing from the government can surely only be an admission that Labor got it wrong, very wrong in the first place, and that their election propaganda was based on little evidence and no consultation with those who have first-hand experience, those who attended the committee hearings that um, Senator Hughes attended those that Senator Pocock heard from in his committee hearings as well. Had the government consulted properly, they would have heard that abolishing the cashless debit card would give the green light to the more alcohol, drug abuse and violence, as per the quotes I read at the start of my contribution. And while the affected families and communities are the voices that absolutely should be front and centre of this debate, they are not alone in recognising the benefits of the CDC. The government claims there is no evidence that a CDC works, yet there have been more than a dozen evaluations of income management which have provided consistent evidence about welfare quarantining. The evaluations show decreases in drug and al alcohol issues, decreases in crime, violence and antisocial behaviour, improvements in child health and wellbeing, improvements in financial management and ongoing and even strengthened community support. One such evaluation by the University Order. of Adelaide Order. released in 2021 reported Senator that Hughes. the cashless debit card had helped recipients improve their lives and the lives of their families and other community members. The findings of that report, which obviously Senator Rice does not include as evidence, but 25 per cent of people reported they are drinking less since being put on the CDC. Senator Rice. 21 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported gambling less, and evidence found that cash previously used for gambling had been redirected to essentials such as food and 45 per cent of CDC participants reported the cashless debit card had improved things for themselves 
and their families. Do not believe the government's rhetoric and do not believe the claims of the Greens members who are sitting in this chamber heckling away, who didn't attend the committee hearings, who were not there, who are ignoring the voices of the very people who Order, they claim Order. to represent and who they claim to want to help. Of the 17,000 people currently on the CDC, 4,398 of them in the Northern Ter Territory are on it voluntar voluntarily. And I'm also advised that most participants in Cape York are also on it voluntarily. Now, if it didn't work, if they didn't see value in the card, why would they be volunteering to be on the program? I urge the government to monitor more closely the impacts on those families who withdraw from the card. I urge the government to listen to the members and senators in this place who have first-hand experience of what families faced before the card was introduced and how those families' lives have changed since. I mean, I know Labor really aren't interested in re representing the vulnerable communities in South Australia or in the goldfields in Western Australia or the families in Bundaberg, Harvey Bay and Cape York who have benefited from the CDC. I know they're pandering to the progressives in the city who are far removed from the problems that they are blind to, who think they're doing the right thing by our vulnerable communities, but who really aren't. I say drop the scales from your eyes and look at the hard truth of the issue. Listen to the Noel Pearsons of the world. Listen to the families and the women who are asking for the cashless debit card to remain in place. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to start by acknowledging the strongly divided and deeply held views in this chamber on this bill. Uh, I've engaged with all sides in consideration of this legislation. I thank Senators Rustin and Rice and other senators for their time during committee hearings, hearing tragic stories from people whose lives are being affected. I would also like to thank Minister Rishworth for genuinely listening and taking on board ideas to deliver better outcomes for the communities affected by this legislation. I'd also like to thank Senator Reynolds for the encouragement to travel to committee hearing to hear from myself. I thoroughly enjoyed this experience, my first uh, committee hearing as a senator for the ACT. I attended the committee hearing in Darwin and read the submissions to the Senate inquiry and have since then met with a range of other stakeholders. I've tried to look at the available evidence and listen to the stories and evidence from affected communities. I've heard the arguments for and against. And what is clear to me from all of this is that compulsory income management has to end. What's also apparent is that there are individuals who want a voluntary form of income management that utilises the technology of the CDC card. There are communities who want to be able to decide for themselves who they put on income management through their own self-determined processes. Throughout the course of the last few months, I've worked with the government on this bill and commend them for making amendments based on some of these conversations and I'm sure many others. The main concerns I raised were protecting the Family Responsibilities Commission and the framework in place in Cape York, ensuring the CDC is still available to them. Clearly, this is something that they want. They rate it as, as much more functional than the basics card and we have to ensure that they can continue with the work that they're doing up there. We need to ensure that people on the CDC and the NT do not have to go back onto the basics card 
which is clearly an inferior technology. We need to ensure that people who would like to keep income management on a voluntary basis have the ability to, ability to do so. To be clear, we need to end all income, compulsory income management, and this bill does not do that. It simply allows the government to take people off the CDC. We need to continue to push the government to ensure that they prioritise ending all forms of compulsory income management. While I'd like to have a timeline from the government regarding their ending of, of all income management, with these changes and the funding for support services outlined over the weekend, this is clearly a first step. The research and majority of the evidence given during the Senate committee hearings overwhelmingly shows the CDC is not addressing the problems it was designed to address. I would like to reiterate that with the changes negotiated with the government, anyone who still wants to utilise income management can still access it on a voluntary basis. This is something we heard consistently during the committee hearing process. I welcome the government's commitment to, su to support services and to co-designing them with communities. A more holistic approach is clearly needed, a focus on co-design and ensuring that communities are empowered to make decisions for themselves to solve their own problems, to partner with communities, work alongside them, rather than dictate from Canberra what they need. It seems to me that on, on this issue, a voice to parliament would be something that would provide consultation and advice on an issue that affects overwhelmingly, disproportionately affects First Nations people. And the referendum to enshrine a voice in our constitution is something I look forward to working with my colleagues in this place and Australians to take this step forward for, for our great country and to begin to write a new chapter together. This bill is far from perfect, uh, but is clearly a first step and is needed, and any significant delay in its passage will subject people to further distress, so I'll be supporting this bill. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This bill implements the government's election commitment to end a program that has never lived up to its promises. The cashless debit card implemented over six trial sites across Australia was designed to deliver a lot. The former government claimed it would help to address adverse behaviours relating to drug and alcohol misuse in communities by quarantining a proportion of a person's welfare payment. But the evidence from numerous evaluations, inquiries and audits simply isn't there to demonstrate that this program delivered on its objectives. And now the legislation that underpins the program is due to sunset on December 31st. The bill before us allows for the transition away from the CDC to be considered and staged. It is in response to the sunsetting of that legislation. Acting Deputy President, the issues confronted in the legislation before us are tough and they are complex. I actually chaired the Community Affairs Legislation Committee inquiry into this, where we heard from representatives from across all of the trial sites in Australia. We heard firsthand the lived experiences of many of those on the card. We heard how it had stripped away people's rights and left them feeling ashamed and humiliated and stigmatised, that it left people unable to buy basic necessities like second-hand school uniforms because there simply wasn't enough cash at hand, of kids being kept home from school to avoid the humiliation, of not being able to give that $2 donation needed for an ice cream day on Friday because the cash was gone. And we heard of the workarounds being used to get cash that compounded disadvantage and which demonstrated 
that a card, a piece of technology in and of itself, can never and will never be a simple and single cure-all to drug and alcohol dependency. The reality being that without the right social help and services to support people, these dependencies continue and they continue to cause harm. And what we heard on this inquiry was not greatly different from what I've heard on the ground in Sejuna in South Australia, where I've travelled with then Shadow Minister for Social Services, Linda Burney, and our now Minister for Social Services, Amanda Rishworth, in my work advocating for the Yardu Health Clinic. And on these visits, I sat by Minister Burney and Minister Rishworth's sides as they heard similar stories, that the CDC was stigmatising individuals, restricting their access to the second-hand economy, and limiting the ability of communities to make collective financial decisions. In several instances, I was told where people felt there may have been a positive impact from the program, it wasn't the card per se, but the wraparound support services that were implemented, not always to the extent they were promised, mind you, but implemented alongside it. And again, they heard of the workarounds happening that were leaving some of the most vulnerable in that community worse off. For too many people, we know this card, this program, hasn't worked as it was designed to. Indeed, it has made things worse for far too many Australians. But I won't pretend that all experiences on the card or views of the card are universal. They're not. And I don't pretend to speak on behalf of everyone in the community of Sejuna or elsewhere. As I said, this is a complex issue, and it's a complex issue in South Australia. There are supporters of the card as a mechanism for income management, including in Sejuna. Those concerned to see the transition done right. In Cape York, concerns were raised with the committee, as I said in the inquiry that I chaired, about the impact of the legislation on the continued operation of their unique model and the work of the Family Responsibilities Commission. Our inquiry heard these issues, we took them seriously, and as a result, we made a number of recommendations and commentary in our report. And now I'm really struggling to follow the commentary earlier from opposition senators that the government shouldn't have responded to the committee's recommendations, that by responding to these issues, there was somehow a failure here. That is absolute nonsense. I've heard so much nonsense, actually, on the, on the consultation argument from members of the former government who never properly consulted before forcing people on this card, forcing them on it punitively in places like Bundaberg, where young people were put on this card without any consultation, without any choice. To the idea that the minister was somehow meant to consult before she was a minister, when they know full well this former shadow minister has been out there for years listening to people on this issue. And I know Minister Rishworth is personally and deeply committed to getting this right, to leaving individuals better off. And I thank her for the work on the amendments that the government is bringing forward and the recent announcements that will make, be brought forward to address the concerns that have been raised. That is an appropriate response. That's what happens when you genuinely listen, like the minister has. And I want to take a moment to talk through some of these things. Firstly, with the concerns raised about technology, an updated income management technology solution with an enhanced card will be available as a voluntary income management tool for those who want to use it, providing access to more merchants and facilitating BPAY and online shopping. This is in direct response to submitters to our inquiry. But critically, this enhanced technology will be delivered by Services Australia, removing the interface with a private company for customer support and will enhance support. It is not a punitive measure. Secondly, in terms of the transition, this of course needs to be staged with individual support for those who need it in coming off the card. The legislation allows for this and the minister has made clear that Services Australia will provide front of house staff in trial sites throughout the transition. And the transition, of course, needs to be backed up with services that are well-funded, co-designed and geographically, culturally and linguistically accessible. This is something our committee inquiry discussed. The minister has announced that the government will continue current community support services where funding was set to expire under the former government and will invest $17 million in additional community-led and designed initiatives to support economic and employment opportunities. In Sejuna, in my home state, this will see some essential support services, such as the community bus for children who don't have access to other forms of transport, 
that were set to have their funding expire next year continue. In addition, $49.9 million will be provided for additional alcohol and other drug treatment services and support in four of the cashless debit card trial sites. Now, there was some interesting commentary in the chamber earlier today, but I would remind the chamber that this was support actually promised by the former government, just never delivered. So if that announcement in itself is a, an admission of failure or admission of error on anyone's policies, it is the government's own. And I'm really proud that our committee's work has encouraged these commitments. That's what happens when a committee does its job. And the idea that by us making these recommendations and these, these comments, which has led to better policy, is somehow a failure, I just find that absurd. In terms of Cape York, the government always intended for this unique model to continue. Let's have some facts on the table when it comes to this debate. And where issues were raised that there may be some unattended, unintended consequences in the legislation which would impede on this work, we made recommendations. Our inquiry made recommendations for these to be worked through. The government's bringing forward amendments to this end, which allows the work in Cape York to continue, and I note that those amendments have been welcomed by the Family Responsibilities Commission. And I will also say for communities around the country who want their own model of community-based voluntary income management, including in Sejuna, if that's what the community decides it does want there, the minister left the door open on that too. These facts are important in this debate. I understand that emotions run high in it. As I said, these are tough issues and they are complex issues, but facts matter. And of course, there remains a lot of work ahead in the Northern Territory on the future of voluntary income management. Not all of this work can or should happen overnight. And to this end, I acknowledge the contribution made earlier of my colleague, Senator McCarthy, to this debate. If you missed her contribution, go back and listen to it, because she could certainly teach a few in this chamber a thing or two about respect, about dialogue and about consultation. Acting Deputy President, this bill represents the start of the government's work to end what has clearly been a failed program, to end the blanket imposition of compulsory broad-based income management that the evidence simply does not support. But of course, of course, there is more work ahead. Senator Nampajimpa Price. Thank you, President. I've not been in these chambers very long, but it's not hard to see the trickery, deceit, and <coughs> lengths this Albanese Labor government will go to to maintain lies and shallow election promises that were only ever about attempting to secure woke votes. The saying, if you repeat something enough times, it becomes the truth, should be Labor's motto as this is exactly how this government has demonised the cashless debit card in order to justify their election promise to abolish it. We've heard from out-of-touch Green Senator Rice, who I realise had her fingers stuck in her ears when vulnerable Aboriginal Australians told her during the inquiry they desperately need this cashless debit card. We've heard from Senator McCarthy from the Territory talk about the intervention and how it supposedly shamed adults. But she failed to admit it was the Northern Territory Labor government of the time that she was a minister of that sat on and did nothing about the Little Children Are Sacred report. It was this report highlighting the astronomical rates of child sexual abuse and STIs found in Aboriginal children which was the trigger for federal action. Labor and the Greens continue to this day to ignore the suffering of vulnerable children instead of favouring the rights of abusers, perpetrators and adults controlled by addiction. It hasn't mattered a single iota that this was a grassroots initiative in its very first instance, that the origins of the card came about because of the calls from vulnerable communities for a tool to curb spending on alcohol, drugs, gambling by vulnerable community members, nor the fact that alcohol in these regions, desperate for the card, had some of our nation's highest rates of child sexual abuse. We know because the evidence, not a repeated lie, but the evidence tells us that alcohol has played a colossal role in child sexual abuse in Aboriginal communities. The stark evidence 
tells us loud and clear that alcohol plays an astronomical role in the rates of violence and abuse in Aboriginal communities. The very reasons these communities call for the development of the cashless debit card in the first place. I hear very little about the concern for children from across the chamber. Very little. How ironic that a grassroots initiative is now being scrapped to satisfy the uninformed demands of the elites. I know these communities are far from the comfy lives that many of the members of this government live. We're told regularly that this government respects Aboriginal culture. We're told every single day, you all acknowledge elders past, present and emerging, whatever that actually means. Yet this government doesn't actually know Indigenous culture because none of you have lived it, really lived it or really lived in it. You think you may have been witness to it, but it's more than just parading around in animal fur. It's more than just putting some paint on one's face or playing a didgeridoo, an instrument that belongs only to the younger people of Arnhem Land. It's more than just walking through a bit of smoke. In fact, smoking ceremonies were, were never traditionally used at every single occasion and get-together. They were precisely only used after the death of a relative for medicinal purposes or to strengthen a newborn baby. But this government romanticises what it doesn't even know and pays lip service when it's convenience, not just this government, the Greens, all the time. Some cultural truths I know will be hard to comprehend for many here. Being what it's like to constantly have your income demanded from you by addicted relatives on a regular basis. That everything you own, including the clothes on your back, can be demanded from you because cultural protocol dictates that you have to say yes and hand over your income, even if it means your kids go hungry. It's hard to comprehend that if saying no to these demands is a breach of cultural protocol, the consequences of such culturally unacceptable refusal can lead to violent punishment. This is fact, people, fact. I live this culture. But this is the lived cultural experience of many. This is the protocol that has been embedded into one's psyche and passed down through generations. Members of this government could not fathom the oppressive actuality of not being encouraged or empowered to stand up for oneself and be able to say no. Communal living means consent does not belong to you as an individual. Many here will never understand because our Western-based democratic Australian culture upholds our individual rights. Our Western-based democratic Australian culture gives you freedom of choice. Our Western-based Australian democratic culture gives you the freedom to turn a blind eye in the name of political correctness to the oppressive elements of culture that belongs to our most vulnerable citizens. In fact, this government encourages and promotes separatism the us and them mentality, which sustains the breeding ground for cultural dysfunction. The favourable choice is niceties in reinvented cultural acknowledgements to countries, st strategically placing the Aboriginal flag in this chamber or behind oneself at every speaking opportunity to display one's virtues while ignoring the glaring and the disturbing intrinsic reality that plagues the lives of vulnerable Australian citizens. Australian citizens that I've been burying all my life in communities that are far removed and out of sight, out of mind from the privileged circumstances we're all a part of here. The only way a member of this government might feel pressured into giving the shirt off your back or all the money in your account to an addict to the detriment of yourself or your children is if you're under duress, in a toxic relationship, the victim of domestic violence or if you are an enabler yourself, but certainly not because it's your cultural obligation to do so. Imagine receiving an urgent and dreadful call from your mother that she has been informed that your aunt, a woman you've loved all your life, a jovial and warm character but an excessive drinker in her late thirties, has dropped dead on the town campground after spending consecutive nights drinking. Imagine arriving in the town camp to find she still lays in the same place on the dirt where she collapsed and died. 
Your other aunt is letting off heart-wrenching screams over her body. Other family, aunts, uncles, cousins, children, your young nieces and nephews, some as young as four, some in their teens, watch on. Some are in distress at the scene and some unemotional, probably numb from the hysteria and the sight of yet another death of a loved one. Imagine now your own children witnessing something like this. You think to yourself that it's not right that the little ones should be witnessing this. The police arrive and you are told politely that it might be best, given the circumstances, for family members to lift her body into the body bag and onto the stretcher. You want for your aunt to have dignity in those last moments and you want to get off the ground, but you also know she is now being taken away forever. This is one of many of my lived experiences of destruction by alcohol. The way in which it has taken away the lives of my family. I have many more stories to share, but I won't today. Instead, I will fight to support the measures that are pertinent to curbing the destruction of alcohol where it collides with a culture that we're continually told is the world's oldest living culture. A culture I've lived and come to understand that during the thousands of years of its, of its existence has not yet developed the tools and mechanisms to successfully overcome addiction. Addiction is a human affliction. The triggers for it within Aboriginal Australians have come from modern environmental influences, hence why there are no cultural preventions for it. However, it becomes even more dangerous when cultural obligations are exploited by addicts and abusers. These are the very reasons why it is our responsibility as lawmakers in this nation to, one, seek a deeper, more honest understanding of the authentic cultural practices that influence and at times dictate the lives of the vulnerable, two, make sound and sometimes tough decisions that work to uphold the human rights of those vulnerable as a priority before those who would destroy their lives and the lives of others. One life lost is one too many, and it is not good enough to sacrifice any lives in the name of political correctness or for the shallow exercise of winning votes. It has been an educational experience so far, learning of the procedures we undertake to determine outcomes for our nation and the approaches we are confined to by way of committee. The cashless debit card repeal inquiry was strategically and deliberately rushed through this government by this government, leaving little to no contribution from vulnerable community members unable to access the support needed to provide a submission. People whose first language is not English and whose level of education impedes their ability to communicate efficiently and swiftly, but who need the cashless debit card the most, were effectively excluded from participating. This came as no surprise, given that Labor primarily give access to and heed only the voices of educated conformists who reflect their values and support their endeavours. I've come to understand that by calling a swift inquiry, with a short time frame and minimal opportunity for travel to affected remote communities allows for the stacking of submissions in favour of a particular position. There were many calls for the redirection of funds reserved for, for operation of the cashless debit card to be transferred to social service providers instead. When I questioned a service provider on the specifics of how their service might better be a better alternative to the cashless debit card, a detailed and precise answer could not be given. Noel Pearson made some poignant remarks during the delivery of his evidence and pleas to maintain the cashless debit card. He said, services are important, but what people most need, what families most need is more opportunity. Give them opportunity directly. We only think of services because it's the only way we think about how to support poor people. The bureaucrats see a problem. They design a program. They allocate a bureaucrat or a service deliverer with a four-wheel drive, a fax machine and everything else, but it doesn't do anything. You've got to remember, we're urging you, service delivery is parasitic too. It's parasitic on the disadvantaged. It sees the disadvantaged people as a cause for a program and a job, and it doesn't do much to change their situation. 
So when you use the words service delivery, some of that is crucial mental health services, a whole lot of child protection services, they're really important. But a lot of it is rubbish too. It actually is festering on disadvantage. I learned that despite the many invitations and pleas made by one of the shy mayors of a trial site to meet Minister Rishworth and Minister Burney to discuss the critical need for the cashless debit card, in the end, they were simply ignored. I also learned that Minister Rishworth met Aboriginal women from remote communities during her rushed consultations who told her they were grateful for income management, that it was a lifesaver for them. Possibly, despite the representations of pious inner-city academics far removed from the lives of the marginalised and their culture, despite the demands from service providers in favour of income management abolition and redirecting funds, the few voices of the deeply concerned and vulnerable might cut through. Perhaps this government can no longer maintain the con that demonises the catalyst debit card. After all, if the card was not working, then why is the government making it voluntary? Why abolish the cashless debit card in favour of maintaining the inferior and restrictive technology of the basics card? Over the weekend, I read that Labor planned to re replace the CDC with another card. This card will have updated technology and, no doubt, a whole new bright, shiny name. So the government want us to believe it is scrapping the cashless debit card, as was the election commitment, when in fact it is keeping it and pretending to create a new one. The time and resources invested by the former coalition government to make immense improvements to the basics card by way of introducing the cashless debit card have been completely overlooked by, for ideological reasons by the government and its supporters. On the same basis, they disregarded the 2021 University of Adelaide evaluation that found a quarter of the people on the cashless debit card reported they drank less frequently and that 45 per cent of the recipients said it had improved their lives. The cashless debit card works, and it always has, but the government must continue its con. Once you start a lie, you have to stick with it, but it evolves and takes on a life of its own as we have come to see. Again, it's been a waste of all our time and resources watching on while Labor rearranged the deck chairs on the sinking ship of Aboriginal community life, knowing full well that pulling the rug from clean under these vulnerable people in the name of political correctness is going to destroy lives. It's all smoke and mirrors, President. Albanese is the ringmaster of this circus. Rishworth is the illusionist. And with their colleagues, they put the heads of the vulnerable into the mouths of the lions, while the taxpayers watch on either cheering with approval or, like those with any real comprehension of the danger, gasping in dismay. Only when your intentions are driven by your concern for this nation and its people, instead of your disdain for the opposition and hunger for votes, Will you actually find some real solutions for Indigenous people? Thank you, Senator Napajimpa Price. Your time has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make uh, contributions to this bill. It is absolutely no secret that the Greens oppose income management. We believe that a socially just, democratic and sustainable society rests on the provisions of an un uh, unconditional livable income for everybody complemented by the provision of universal social services. We are pleased that this discriminatory, oppressive scheme is finally being repealed, but deeply disappointed that it's absolutely taken too long. This is well overdue and just one of the many steps this country must take to stop the ongoing colonialism and oppression of First Nations people in this country. In 2015, my predecessor, former Senator Rachel Sewer, wrote in a dissenting report to the Community Affairs Inquiry into this bill that established the trials that, despite claims by the government that the proposed debit card is an extension of income management, compulsory income management is a failed measure which impacts negatively on the community and imposes significant costs to, on a government. Evidence provided through submissions and oral evidence to this inquiry show the fundamental problems to this approach. We the Greens have been ringing the alarm bells that this would be a disaster even before it was enacted. Compulsory income management has consistently failed to benefit the people and communities on which it is imposed, and more often than not, they are in fact First Nations people. There is no clear evidence that compulsory income management works or even leads to the improvement of the lives 
uh, lives of those who are subjected to these measures. So you can concoct any type of evaluation that you want. Um, one of the reasons for income management being reduced is due to the alcohol and drug-related problems partially in the Northern Territory. But there's actually no evidence that these problems have been improved. And the imposition of compulsory income management. The Australian Human Rights Commission have also stated that the application of the cashless debit card has not been shown to have been reasonable, necessary or proportionate. The CDC places unnecessary limits on economic, social and cultural human rights and undermines the right to self-determination. Now, I don't know uh, what people from the other side think, but clearly that's what we've been fighting for for 230 plus years, is our right to self-govern and our right for self-determination. The CDC does not respect individual agency or their rights. And the stakeholders have referred to this program as collective punishment and the continuation of that. The impacts that this scheme have absolutely been devastating for people in communities. The cashless debit card prevents people from even taking cash out. For many, they survive on cash because they can't afford to buy things from the shop. Now imagine that, not being able to buy things from the shop people not being able to do that for themselves. That's about access. They purchase their clothes and their household items from op shops and garage sales, and they purchase their foods from farmers' markets and roadside stalls. They don't get the privilege, like everybody else in this place, to go to the shop, to go and buy the things they need because they're on CDC. One single mother stated that in three years I've been subjected to the the ludicrous that CDC has, one, attempted to prevent me from accessing a private speech therapist in community, restricted her from doing that, prevented me from using my tax return to buy my sons a bedroom suite. Just think, put a bunch of people with no mental health, disability or domestic violence skills in charge of my financial situation in an arbitrary way. And I bet that wouldn't happen to anyone in this place. When my ex-husband treated me this way, the family court called it financial control. And the fact that this government, or the former government, was ever allowed to subject people to this level of control, that if this same behaviour was by a partner or a carer, they would actually call this financial abuse. It's absolutely barbaric. As I stated earlier, the CDC has, no, um, has disproportional impact on First Nations people. It is not about a postcode lot or lottery. In fact, it is done and it's, it's crafted and measured in a way where it actually will disproportionately impact on First Nations people. So make no mistake, the CDC is a continuation of colonialism in this country. It seeks to normalise policies that control First Nations people. It perpetuates the stigmatisation that we've just heard from across the chamber and in former speeches of First Nations people, as opposed to recognising their sovereignty, addressing the impacts of the collective and generational trauma that is the result of the attempted genocide of over 200 years of oppression in this country. I don't know how many times we have to say it. We said it last week during our other speeches. Change the Record also set this out in their evidence in the Community Affairs Inquiry into the repeal of the cashless debit card and said, Quote, colonisation and the dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from country has taken many forms. They include theft of land and resources, commonly known as stolen wealth, re exploitation of labour and theft and quarantining of wages and welfare payments. Stolen wages in this country. These injustices have caused forces First Nations people to experience persistent economic inequality, inequality to this day, and their legacy continues to shape Australia's welfare and social security system. Compulsory income management is a stark example of the type of discriminatory, coercive and top-down decision-making that has caused very real harm to First Nations individuals and communities, and we welcome the decision to abolish it. The CDC makes people more dependent on welfare rather than building capacity and independence. Now, I don't have to say this because I've lived that experience, 
but it's also a provision of the social safety nets that are provided globally, acknowledged by the WTO, the IPO and ESCAP in their definitions of how important that is. And it's particularly important to our women and our children, uh, as uh, the former speaker mentioned. The previous government have constantly shared their support for stage three tax cuts, in fact, and saying that public, to the public, this is your money. We're just giving it back to you. Clearly, this is a sentiment that only applies to white people in this country. It doesn't apply to black followers. If this government acknowledges the racist nature of this program and the harm that it's doing, then why shift some people to compulsory management through the basics card, which is simply controlling us in the same way, and, but under a different name? So same, same, no different. Um, we need to abolish all forms of compulsory income management. I want to echo the comments of my colleague, Senator Russ, who spoke very eloquently about the provisions of this bill that allow the minister to move people from the cashless debit card once it's abolished to other forms of compulsory income management. This, again, is simply unacceptable. We need to abolish it in all forms of compulsory income management, not just the cashless debit card. We have a lot of unfinished business in this country. We are the only Commonwealth country that doesn't have a treaty with its first people. We are yet to enact the legislation to enshrine the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Our children continue to be stolen at unacceptable rates. In my, in my state alone, I am 17 times more likely to lose my children than another white woman in my state. Just think about that for a moment, because I come from five generations of the stolen generation and the amount of anxiety that that causes for my family. Think about First Nations people who are the most incarcerated people in the world, with the fastest prison population in the world being First Nations women in this country. We have a serious problem with colonialism, which is the legacy of colonisation in this country. And the repealing of this bill is just one of the many steps that we need to take to heal this country, to provide justice for First Nations people and peace so that we can move forward. The Greens are proud to support this bill after calling for this cashless debit card to never ever have been established in the first place, and we will continue to fight so that all forms of compulsory income management are abolished. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you. This is the first legislative step towards abolishing this paternalistic control of people's lives put forward by the former government. It delivers on the Albanese government's election promise to right this wrong, to right this wrong through meaningful consultation and engagement with Australian communities affected by the cashless debit card. The card, of course, commenced in 2016, which was followed by more than six years of confused mismanagement, mismanagement synonymous with the cashless debit card and mismanagement that led to day-to-day -day interference, chaos and difficulty in people's lives affected by this card. Enough is enough. The purported purpose of the card was to minimise the social harms caused by excessive alcohol consumption, illegal drug use and, and gambling. But, of course, this was a one-size-fits-all solution targeting every social security uh, recipient, recipient uh, in uh, receiving job seeker payments with a cashless debit card. I personally heard stories from the Kimberley about people having their rent payments uh, not go through because of this system uh, and numerous other hardships that took a long time to resolve in a very difficult bureaucracy. The former government totally ignored all of these issues within the community. 
the former government was prepared to put forward what was obviously a racially targeted policy. It purports to say that it wasn't racially targeted because it targeted everyone in these communities. But if you look at the Aboriginality uh, demographics of these communities, it's very clear what the last government's motivation was. This is but one example of the many examples of the Labor Party having to undo and fix an ill-thought-out system that this government has slapped on to the Australian public. There was no empirical evidence used in this program and has instead led to people becoming more dependent rather than less dependent on social services. We can see that very clearly. This program has burdened people's lives and has produced no evidence that it has delivered on its objective. You only need to go to the Auditor General's report to see that. It certainly hasn't been a cost saver, not that it should be, but the former government spent $170 million on a privatised cashless debit card program. $170 million which could have been invested in locally run support services or money in the pockets of the needy, the families experiencing hardship. The former government had promised services to go along with the CDC, services that most often in the eyes of the community did not eventuate. I was privileged last month with other members of the Community Affairs Committee of the Senate to visit towns and communities affected by the CDC. We sought information on how the CDC affected people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But also we sought to ask what was actually wanted and needed in these areas. What was needed to recover from the fact that these communities had been very much knocked around by the CDC. A card that has limited buying power to such an extent that it disadvantaged users within their local economy and stigmatised them. It's been very keenly felt in my own home state of WA, where in the East Kimberley, frankly, it's difficult to get people to talk to you about the CDC. It's difficult because they're scared of government. They're scared also of what will be done without their consent if they, if they speak out. But once you peel beneath that surface, they feel stigmatised and they've experienced chaos and confusion and difficulty in managing their day-to-day -day finances, in paying their rent, in being able to take children on school excursions, in a range of day-to-day, -day, everyday tasks that we would expect households right around the country to be able to take for granted. Wyndham has been a test site since 2016 and the local evidence shows that people have felt it. They talk about the shame of not being able to make their own financial decisions, the frustration of not being able to freely use their money in the most effective way possible. A broad brush approach across a whole town and a whole community, irrespective of whether any of those families have a problem that needed uh, support. It made support services less effective because our social security system proffered no guidance or support to help reach out to those people and families that actually might have needed help for drug and alcohol or gambling problems. The report we put forward recommends that this bill be passed. It, it is a message this government has heard widely and universally. It's time to listen to the people impacted by this card who, are, who we are trying to help and to stop ignoring their rights. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator O'Sullivan.
Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, it is with actually real sadness that I rise today to speak on the cashless debit card, the repeal of the cashless debit card. Uh, I was part of its uh, design back in 2016-17 and uh, engaged directly. I was part of the team that actually went out and engaged with the communities on the ground, heard from communities on the ground about the need for such a card and such for such a program. And so it's actually real sadness that I'm here now speaking on it. But because uh, what we're seeing as I rise to speak on this uh, Albanese Labor government's blatant and disappointing disregard for the welfare of those living in our remote indigenous communities with a bill, this bill to repeal the cashless debit card. What we're seeing is that the Albanese Labor government has been obsessed, obsessed with repealing the cashless debit card. They've shown, frankly, that they've got no understanding whatsoever, whatsoever the devastating impact that this bill will have on some of our nation's most vulnerable communities. They have no compassion for those that are suffering from the most horrific abuse and trauma, which will be exasperated by the flood of alcohol and drugs that will pour into these communities across the country. As my colleague in the other place, the member for Deakin, said, this will inflict misery back into the vulnerable communities, vulnerable communities in places like the East Kimberley and the Goldfields in my home state of Western Australia, uh, in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay in Queensland, and indeed in Sejuna in South Australia. Now, I've been to each of these communities. I've, I've been to most of them before, years before the cash debit card was ever implemented, and I've been there while it's been in operation. And I can tell you firsthand that there is a stark difference. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to the people that are on the ground that are living in these communities. Now, Labor claim that they've actually been listening. They claim that they've been listening to the feedback from these vulnerable communities. They claim that they value and respect the process of consulting with these communities. But why is it that these communities have said repeatedly that there's been no community consultation prior to the tabling of this legislation? Are they not telling the truth? Are these people in these communities not telling the truth? Well, we know the truth. The truth is they only started engaging with the communities after the legislation was introduced into that other place. And they talk about consultation. Now, the committee inquiry that I was part of, I sat in on it, didn't even go to the CDC sites of Sejuna, Goldfields or the East Kimberley. Moreover, the government only gave stakeholders less than a week to put in a submission. What sort of consultation is that? How open are you actually to receiving feedback when you give them a week? The only people that have time are those that have got people on their payroll ready to put submissions like this in. And so what do we have? We had all these academics. We had all these you know, organisations based in the cities, Sydney and Melbourne. But you want to hear from people on the ground. You need to give them a bit more than a week because they're busy running their lives. They're busy getting their kids to school making sure their, their grandkids are going to school. But you've completely disregarded them. It's shameful. It's shameful. The lack of respect for communities that fought hard to see this card put in place in their communities is absolutely shameful. And this is coming from a government, a prime minister no less, that is out there pushing for a voice, an indigenous voice to parliament. And on their very first test, to listen to these communities, to have their voices heard, they didn't give them a voice at all. They didn't listen to the communities on the ground. The Albanese Labor government presumed to know what these vulnerable communities need without asking them. It is the height of hypocrisy. The Albanese Labor government presumed to speak for these vulnerable communities without speaking for them to them first. The Albanese Labor government presumed to represent these vulnerable communities, but they don't. They don't. They don't have a mandate from these vulnerable communities because they're not listening to the people who live in these communities, who have been protected by the cashless debit card, protected from the lawless and antisocial behaviour st stemming from drug and alcohol abuse, protected from domestic violence stemming from drug and alcohol abuse, you know, protected from sexual assault stemming from drug and alcohol abuse, which will only get worse without the cashless debit card. Now, granted, the CDC was part of the Labor Party election campaign, and we've heard 
Labor members get up time and again in this debate talking about how they took it to the people and the Australian people voted. Now, that's true. That's true. It was clear that they were going to abolish it. It was clear. We all knew it. Then explain to me how the member for Hinkler won his seat, the member for Durack won her seat, the member for Gray won her seat, the member for O'Connor his seat, the uh, member for O'Connor won his seat. These, these members of parliament are very vocal. Their support of the cashless debit card is known very strongly and widely across their community, and they all won their seats. They all won their seats. There wasn't some big turnaround in those communities. So is there anyone on the other side here that's got the guts to stand up to their colleagues to protect Australians living in these communities? We need to help Australians living in these communities, not abandon them. This is just another example of the Labor Party abandoning those living in our vulnerable and remote communities. And we know that the use of drugs and excessive alcohol drives up rates of domestic violence and abuse, particularly against women and children living in these communities. So who on the other side is going to stand up? Who's going to stand up for these women and children? We must listen to those who are living in these communities, who want to have the card, who have told us repeatedly that there are benefits to the cashless debit card. There are better outcomes as a result of the card. Now, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Noel Pearson. Mr Noel Pearson, the founder and director of the Cape York Institute. Now, before the committee, he shared powerful words with the Senate inquiry that this legislation, you know, powerful stories about how he has worked for more than 20 years to help his community through income management with the cashless debit card the, being the only technical solution that exists right at this moment. Mr Pearson said, and I quote him, we met with the minister, I spoke in no uncertain terms, he said, like I'm speaking to the committee now, that our work in Cape York will be severely kiboshed if we don't have a card facility attached to the Family Responsibilities Committee. It's crucial. You can't consider going back to the basics card. It's a very inconvenient card. It doesn't have the functionality of the CDC. Now, the Labor Party they have deliberately demonised the cashless debit card for the sake of their own political point scoring. Running their lies about the coalition putting pensioners onto the cashless debit card in the lead up to the federal election in May is the genesis of this, this problem that we've got. Why did they do this? Why are they now abolishing the cashless debit card when actually all the evidence, what they're hearing is that it's actually working? Well, they, 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 they painted themselves into a corner, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Because in order to maximise the political advantage out of their atrocious scare campaign that they ran ahead of the election, they were put into a corner where they had to say, well, what are you going to do about the cash to debit card? And in a flurry, they just said, oh, we'll get rid of it. And they've painted themselves into a corner. But you know what? We're seeing here, there's amendments here that have been distributed through the chamber. We can see here that... Uh, that their amendments and the funding for services that will be required to overcome the result of the abolition is proof that this government has actually lost its seat. In a flurry, they made this decision to abolish the cashless debit card, and now they're very quickly, right here before us, turning it around. And there's some amendments here that's going to keep up what they're calling an enhanced card, and I'll come to that in a moment. So even now, months after the federal election, they continue to spout lies and untruths about how the cashless debit card does not work, while choosing cons to consign welfare recipients in the Northern Territory back onto the clunky and outdated basics card. Now, all that the Labor Party have managed to do is demonise a method of income management that gives people choice and the freedom to choose to spend their money wherever and however they want, while still protecting their communities from lawless and antisocial behaviour stemming from drug and alcohol abuse. Now, what we are seeing with the government amendments that have been circulated is that uh, this lot over here have realised that they have painted themselves into a corner and that they're going to be putting people onto an enhanced card. And it says in here that they're going to put people onto a basics card bank account. 
Now listen to this carefully, and, and those are you know, in the back offices somewhere. I'm going to be asking them some questions about this tomorrow when we get to committee stage. And you make sure you come with information about what that actually means. Because last time I checked, the Australian government or Services Australia is not a deposit-taking institution. Now that's a technical term. And it's listed in legislation. It's, it, these, the only organisations that can hold money on behalf of other Australians, on behalf of citizens, is a deposit-taking institution, i.e. a bank. The Australian government can't do that. It's not a deposit-taking institution. Now, unless you're going to be nationalising a bank or you're going to spend millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars on becoming a deposit-taking institution, because you've got to build all of the infrastructure and the services that goes with it, then you are going to have to, if you're not going to do that, and I can't imagine you would, because I mean, it would just be ridiculous, you're going to have to outsource it. And who are you going to outsource it to? The same provider, I bet, that's already providing the cashless debit card. You're just rebadging it. You're just renaming it. So why don't you come in here and be upfront with the Australian people about what you're actually going to be doing? Because you've misled the Australian people. Right through your election campaign, so you're going to abolish the cashless debit card. But guess what? Right here in this amendment, it says that you're going to put them on an enhanced, a contemporary card. A contemporary card. Well, you've just bailed the cat because we know exactly what you're going to do. You're just renaming the cashless debit card. I wonder if people are going to have to change their account. Will they be able to stay on their current account? I bet you they will, because it's exactly what's happening. They probably won't have to change their account, anyone that wants to voluntarily stay on it, anyone that's in the Northern Territory, anyone that's in the, uh, up in the, in, in the Cape York. So, you know, be up front. Come in here, have the guts, stand up here and explain to the Australian people what you're actually doing. You've belled the cat. Be under no illusion. This so-called enhanced card is just the cashless debit card rebadged. So come on, fess up with, to the Australian people. You've bitten off more than you can chew, and now that you know how it works, you've come around. But rather than fess up, you think you can just rename and get away with it. Well, shame on you. The CDC functions like the millions of debit cards in circulation in Australia. And at this very moment, which can be used to purchase, uh, make purchases anywhere where Visa or FPOS are accepted, by running on the Visa platform. The card has moved with payment developments and is widely accepted by merchants. It can be used on phones through Apple Pay, Google Pay and for online purchases. The CDC it is the enhanced card that the government's amendments describe. All they're doing is renaming it. Now, in the two minutes that I've got left, I just want to give you some feedback from those that are on the ground that have got first-hand experience with the cashless debit card. Firstly, from my very good friend. And I think one of the most trusted Australians, Mr. Ian Truss from, the, from Kununurra, who spoke about lifting people from an entrenched disadvantage with the help of the cashless debit card. And he said, I'd say the biggest contribution from the cashless debit card was probably a reduction in the harassment of vulnerable people, many elders by their relatives, grandkids and children and so on for their money. Here's someone on the ground that gets it. Not some academic from Sydney or Melbourne. They're not just some bureaucrat. They're not just a bunch of politicians that don't really live it, don't really walk it. This is someone in his community. He was one of the ones that called for it in the first place. Some of the witnesses that we had before the committee advocated for more services and, and, and uh, seeing support put around people. We heard from those in, in uh, the East Kimble uh, sorry, in, uh, in the gold fields. That told us that just this year alone, 70 people have moved off welfare and into a job. 70 people this year alone, due to the investment that we've put in, that when we're in government, we've put into this community. 70 people have moved off welfare and into a job. Now I've been involved for a long, 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 long time. I've forgotten more than most people would actually know about this sort of stuff, and particularly when it comes to training and employment. And I can tell you. To get that sort of result, that is outstanding. That is outstanding. And I want to finish with this quote in the 30 seconds I've got left. WA Police Commissioner Mr. Cole Blanche said the card has been beneficial in remote communities. It gives opportunity for the more senior people in families and the elders of some of the Aboriginal communities to use the money on food, 
for the kids and other things. He said it just seems to settle the community down and gives them a better opportunity to spend their money on priority needs. You've got to stick with this card. Come on. Be honest with the Australian people. Don't give up on these communities. Thanks, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I, I think that contribution right there really built the cat. Um, in fact, what it said to me was this is an opposition uh, that has no policies and it's opposition for opposition's sake. This is a bill that delivers on the Albanese government's election commitment to abolish the cash, cashless debit card. This is a position that we took to the election. And what happened at, on the 21st of May is that we had a change of government. People voted for a change. That's what happened. And a couple of other things happened. And a couple of other things that a, a, a familiar theme that is being flowing through the contributions um, by the opposition is firstly we never listen. And then when we make amendments, because we listened to the Senate inquiry into this bill, that somehow that's wrong too. You never can get it right with this lot. You can never get it right with this lot. Because this is a commitment that, we ma that was made following, regardless of what they want to tell you, regardless of what they say in th that, their contributions, this is a commitment that was made following extensive consultations with individuals, with organisations, with service providers and, and cashless debit card holders. There have been numerous evaluations, inquiries and orders none of which have been able to establish that the card is working. And the latest of these was the ANO report released in June, which highlighted the lack of evidence to demonstrate any success associated with the rollout of the card. With any success associated with the rollout of the card. Instead, what we've heard are the experiences of cardholders feeling stigmatised and believing that they have been punished for being welfare recipients. That is why Labor committed to abolish the card. That is why the Australian people voted for the Labor Party as part of our commitment to abolish the cashless debit card. The passage of this bill will mean that no new Social Security recipients can be put on the card and also enable the more than 17,000 current card holders to transition away from having to use the card as part of this process. Everyone who is currently using the card will be able to remain on voluntary income management. Submissions to the Senate Committee Affairs Committee inquiry into this bill revealed how poorly targeted the rollout of the cashless debit card was. According to Uniting Care Australia, most of the people on the cashless debit card do not have substance abuse or problems with gambling, despite the previous government's claim that the rollout of the card would target welfare recipients experiencing those very issues. Uniting Care went on to say that the numerous evaluations and studies conducted since the car was first introduced in 2016 had provided no evidence that the groups of people singled out and put on the card were in fact the people facing the highest risks engaging in the behaviours that it was meant to target. Now, this is not new. This is not news to anyone. The government back then, the coalition of the coalition government had the same information to hand, but they continued. Last month there, was more, there were over 17,000 of our fellow Australians on the cashless debit card. People aged 35 and under who received job seeker payment, youth allowance, parenting allowance and in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay uh, are required to use the card. All recipients of working age payments in Sedona, the Goldfields and East Kimberley are required to use the card. 
some income support recipients in Cape York and some income management participants in the Northern Territory are also required to use the card. The current program relies on visa debit cards that have been issued by payment companies in due or the traditional credit union in the Northern Territory. One of the many problems is that these cards, cards can only be used in stores that accept the card. The lack of widespread acceptance of the card and the work around develops, developed by some community members and businesses had led to increased hardship. In some cases, rent payments have been blocked, making housing stabi uh, stability an additional challenge to, for those people. Now, we've heard in a number of contributions here about the issues that related to the use of the, the card and the extra hardship um, that it caused on people that were required to use these cards. And anyone in this chamber, really, should have a good, long, hard look at themselves as to suggest um, to, that people should be able to be, um, not be able to shop where they, should, should they want to shop. So when you're putting these uh, systems into place, you really need to have a good, long, hard look at yourself, really. I mean, Seriously. The previous government also claimed that this form of compulsory income management would help women in violent and abusive relationships, but again, no evidence to support this claim. No evidence at all. And none, none in all the contributions that we've had here today have put forward any evidence to support this claim. And you should be. If this is your position, if your position is to oppose this piece of legislation, you should be putting forward the evidence, not just blanket statements, but actual real evidence. Now, in the submission to the committee inquiry, the top end women's legal services outlined some of the complexity faced by women survivors and victims of violence and abuse, including the shame of providing details to Centrelink, and problems accessing housing and crisis support when, when on the basics cards and cashless debit card. So complete the opposite of what you're saying. The St Vincent de Paul Society shares the view of many that there is no evidence that compulsory income management has any widespread or sustained benefits. They also, they're also concerned that the use of the cashless debit card did not lead to any discernible, discernible improvements in employment outcomes. Instead, it often resulted in stigma, stigmatisation, exclusion, financial hardship and discrimination. This bill allows for a stage transition for people who currently use the card. This gradual process will allow Services Australia to conduct individual interviews with everyone subject, subjected to the cashless debit card to ensure that each, each participant is well informed of their options and the, and the support services that are available to them. So a sensible approach taken by this government, a government that cares about people. And it's really incumbent upon the opposition to come out here in their contributions and put cold hard facts out in their in their their contributions because quite frankly we haven't seen that we haven't seen any facts to 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 support the statements that they they are presenting this chamber with and uh, and really, they need, as I said, need to take a good hard look at themselves. This approach that the government has taken is supported by the evidence from service providers that the most effective way to achieve long-term sustainable change is to provide individualised, culturally sensitive services and supports for as long as they are required. 
When this bill is passed, anyone who wishes to cease using the card will, will be able to do so without having to prove anything to any of the government agency. They will no longer have to share some very detailed private information in order to be moved off the card. The gradual transition proposed by the government will also allow for further, further meaningful consultations with First Nations people and their representative organisations on the specific challenges faced by their communities. These, cons these consultations will explore the types of supports that will benefit these communities. Welfare payments and associated supports are key components to delivering on this government's priority that no one is left behind. A priority for the government will be to ensure that every measure we put in place to assist some of our most vulnerable citizens does just that, assist them. We will always have supporting the most vulnerable members of our community as our top priority. The delivery of housing, health, education, childcare and income support will make Australia a better place. These important areas of public policy are key to delivering on this government's top two priorities, no one left behind and no one held back. Today we are taking a step forward on that journey. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Scar. Fine, fine words, Senator Brown. Fine words. The question is going to be what actually happens on the ground, what actually happens on the ground when the cashless uh, debit card is removed. That's the question. What is actually going to happen on the ground? And I fear, notwithstanding all of Senator Brown's fine words and those given by an array of speakers opposite and from the Greens and from others, notwithstanding all those fine words, I genuinely fear in practice the removal of this cashless debit card will be an absolute unmitigated disaster for some of our most vulnerable people in Australia. That is my fear, my heartfelt fear. Those opposite have said that they have a mandate. They have a mandate to remove the cashless debit, cashless debit card. Well, let's drill down to that. Let's drill down to that because I'm someone who believes that all politics is local. And in each of the federal seats, in each of the federal seats where the cashless debit card has been in place, a coalition member of parliament was returned. In all four of the seats, in the seat of Hinkler, where Harvey Bay is a place where the cashless debit card is in place, the coalition member was returned. In the seat of Gray, where Sejuna is a place where the cashless debit card is in place, a coalition member was returned. In Kalgoorlie, Kalgoorlie within the federal seat of Durack, the federal member, coalition member was returned, and also in the seat of O'Connor, including the Goldfields, the federal coalition member was returned. Four out of four. Four out of four. Where's your mandate? Where's your mandate from the actual communities where the cashless debit card is in place? No mandate from those communities, but from others, from others who are far removed from what is happening on the ground in the communities most impacted. No mandate from the communities where the cashless debit card is in place. And in terms of one of those seats held by my good friend Keith Pitt MP in the federal seat of Hinkler, I just wanted to quote some of his words from his speech. Now, we might disagree in this place about philosophy, ideology, approach to issues. But I would hope that no one in this place, no one in this place, could uh, in any way impugn the sincerity of Mr. Keith Pitt MP, the member for Hinkler, who cares deeply, deeply about his community, which has the cashless debit card at the moment. He was returned. He has a mandate. He has a mandate to, to fight for the retention of the cashless debit card. And this is what he said in the other place on Tuesday 2 August 2022, and I quote, there were some 6,552 individuals on the card at this site as of 1 July 2022, and it's making a difference. That's evidence. That's evidence. That's the local member who is closest to his own community. That is evidence. 
That is evidence. He's talking to people on the ground every day. It is making a big difference. My site is significantly different to the other three. We do not have a majority of Indigenous or Aboriginal descent in my patch. It is only on four payments, New Start, Youth Allowance Other, Parenting Payment Single and Parenting Payment Partnered. That is all. It has worked and that has been demonstrated by the evidence. And he goes on and he talks about why he's so passionate about the car in Harvey Bay. When it was introduced, or prior to its introduction, again I quote from his remarks, it was projected that without any intervention, 57 per cent of those under 30 on welfare would still be on income support in 10 years' time. End quote. There's someone who's concerned about young people in his own electorate who are facing that future of continued dependence on welfare. That was his concern. And what did he say in terms of those opposite? Quote again. But here is what we have seen from those opposite. They said they would consult. We did over 100 meetings for consultation in my electorate, but they went and talked to some activists who don't even live in the area. In fact, they're not in the electorate of Hinkler, who are opposed because, well, they're activists, and that's no real surprise." End quote. So that's Keith Pitt MP, my good friend, the member for Hinkler, genuinely concerned, genuinely concerned about his community and generally concerned about the impact of removal of the cashless debit card upon his community. I pay tribute to the coalition senators who are involved in writing the dissenting report in relation to the removal of the cashless debit card, and there are a few points I'd like to make from their dissenting report. The first is it should be noted that the CDC program commenced in Sejuna, South Australia on 15 March 2016 and has been in East Kimberley, Western Australia since 26 April 2016. It was progressively rolled out in the goldfields, Western Australia since 26 March 2018 and introduced in the Bundaberg and Harvey Bay regions, represented by my good friend Keith Pitt MP, since 29 January 2019. And I should say, in terms of the introduction of the card in Harvey, Pay, in Harvey Bay, I gave a speech in this place probably about 24 months ago where I talked about how the youth unemployment rate in Harvey Bay actually fell at such an extraordinary rate after the introduction of the cashless debit card. It fell by an extraordinary rate compared to the rest of Queensland. It was also introduced uh, in the Cape York region, Queensland and the Northern Territory since early 2020. As at 5 August 2022, 17,754 participants were using the cashless debit card around Australia. So why was it introduced? Why was it introduced? What was the intention behind the introduction? And a lot of things have been said about the intention, all of which has been from those opposite, all of which I think has misrepresented the intention. The intention has always been to help people. The intention has always been to help people. You might disagree with the the philosophy of the policy, you might disagree with its practical outcomes, but no one can legitimately disagree with the intention, which has been to help some of our most vulnerable people make a transition from welfare to leading uh, lives where they can have jobs and provide for their families. The CDC, and I quote from the dissenting report, the CDC program was sparked by the heartbreaking report of the Sleeping Rough Inquest into the deaths of six people in South Australia's far west coast, handed down by the state's coroner in 2011. It found that efforts to curb alcohol abuse in the region had not been successful and that it was having devastating impacts on individuals, their families and their communities. The cashless debit card program was designed to be a tool that could assist communities in addressing social harm issues such as domestic violence, child neglect and other antisocial behaviours that arose from alcohol and substance addiction and long-term welfare dependency. Indigenous community leaders approached the government for support and worked with government to establish the CDC program. The further rollout of the program was established on the same basis, that being community support." End quote. That's the reality. That's what, that's what led to the introduction of this scheme in the first place. What is going to happen in those areas when this card is removed? What is going to happen in those areas? And what do the people closest to the community say? They're the people we should be listening to. 
It's their voice we should be listening to in terms of, in terms of this debate. Noel Pearson, founder and director of strategy of the Cape York Partnership, an outstanding Queenslander. This is what he said. Quote, I think this legislation will wipe out 20 years of my work. End quote. Is he wrong? Is Noel Pearson wrong? Is that evidence? It's pretty persuasive evidence to me, testimony from someone who has a close connection with his community, who's an expert with respect to these matters. Is that evidence? It's pretty persuasive evidence to me, Madam Acting Deputy President. And this is what he says. In the absence of a solution that had the same functionality as the cashless debit card, our Families Responsibilities Commission and the welfare reform work that we've done by that over the last 20 years will collapse, and that would be a very bad thing. We'd just have to give up. We would come to the point of just giving up on the idea that we can change anything for the future of these communities." End quote. That's Noel Pearson. No one cares more about those Cape York communities than Noel Pearson. And this is his, this is his testimony. This is his testimony, Noel Pearson. That's evidence, and persuasive evidence at that. And what did the city of Kalgoorlie, Boulder, state in their submissions? Quote, the decision to abolish the CDC has been made without any consultation with the regional community, and the city of Kalgoorlie, Boulder, remains unconsulted on how the transition will impact CDC participants, social services providers, government agencies and the community. That's what they say in Kalgoorlie. Again, one of the actual communities most impacted. And what does the mayor of the district councillor Sejuna say, Mayor Perry Will? Quote, we've had no consultation about it at all. The first we heard of it was in the PM's election promises that he was going to do it. Prior to that, we had no representation from any Labor politicians. End quote. And the former mayor was the same. Mr Alan Souter, OAM, stated, quote, I might also add that Minister Rishworth was encouraged twice by a local member of parliament to contact me because of my knowledge of the card when she visited Sejuna, but despite heavily, heavy prompting from our local member, no effort was made to contact me. I made sure I was available if the phone rang and it didn't end quite. That's what people on the ground are saying. That's what they're saying on the ground. And we'll see the evidence. We'll see the evidence of what happens when these trials come to an end. We'll see the evidence then, and those who support the abolition of the CDC will be responsible for those outcomes. It will be your responsibility, and every fine paragraph of oratory in this place will not make a damn difference to the people on the ground in those communities. It won't make a damn difference to any of them, to none of them. It will just be fine words spoken in this place, but it will mean nothing to their on-the-ground experiences. Again, let's talk about evidence. You want to talk about evidence? How's this for evidence? This is again from the coalition senators, their dissenting report. Quote, findings from an independent impact evaluation by the University of Adelaide, released in 2021, reported that the cashless debit card had helped recipients improve their lives and the lives of their families and other community members. Findings included a, 25 per cent of people reported they are drinking less since the cashless debit card's introduction. 25 per cent. How's that for evidence? 21 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported gambling less. And evidence found that cash, previously used for gambling, had been redirected to essentials such as food, exactly as intended, Madam Acting Deputy President. C. 45 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported the cashless debit card had improved things for themselves and their family. How's that for evidence? The study also showed that slightly more than half of interview respondents, and especially stakeholders, reported that they were in favour of the CDC continuing, albeit with certain improvements in various aspects. Sure, let's try and improve it, but don't abolish it. Don't abolish it. What is going to happen in these communities? These communities, the people most impacted by this legislation, did not give a mandate to the government to change it. Four electorates, four federal electorates with trial sites, every one of those electorates, every one of those electorates returned a coalition member of parliament. Four out of four, a hundred percent. Those opposite may have, in their own view, a mandate on a national basis for this policy. They do not have a mandate from the communities most impacted by the abolition 
of this cashless debit card. They do not have that mandate. Four out of four of those seats returned coalition members of parliament who fought the last election on retention of the cashless debit card. The communities most impacted, most impacted by the cashless debit card voted for its retention. Voted for its retention. And those opposite should soberly consider that fact, and it is a fact, just as we all will be forced to soberly consider the consequences, and I fear they'll be disastrous for some of these local communities. All of us will need to soberly consider the consequences of the abolition of the cashless debit card. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much. Uh, I rise to speak on the bill, which has a long title, the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. But essentially it's a simple bill. It's a bill that seeks to deliver on a commitment to abolish the cashless debit card. When I first came to this place, I had the good fortune to be asked to serve on the Finance and Public Administration Committee, and it meant that I was deeply involved in a number of inquiries into matters which affected First Nations people. Our committee, from the time I was on it, inquired into the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. We inquired into the Community Development Program. Uh, we inquired into the legal services that were available to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were uh, requiring support because they were facing legal proceedings of some kind. And a common theme flowed through the government's approach to all of these questions. The last government's approach to policy making in relation to First Nations people was almost entirely devoid of input from First Nations people. It was an approach that proceeded with a set of ideas about what would be good for community. It was not an approach that sought to engage community in the design or delivery of the programs that were inflicted upon them. And the results were very clear in each of the programs that we examined in these communities. It is a deeply flawed way of dealing with communities that continue to suffer very significant impacts arising from a legacy of colonisation. And however well-intentioned those were who sought to design and implement these programs, their inability to understand that unless we involved community in the process of building programs of support, these pro programs would not be successful. Flawed, and that inability to understand that flawed almost every measure that was implemented by our predecessors, who now sit on the other side of the chamber. And the bill before us seeks to remedy yet another one of these failed interventions. The cashless debit card was introduced as a trial. The government at the time said that this was something they wanted to try with communities and they'd build an evidence base uh, to evaluate whether or not it was a program that was in fact working. But like so many of these interventions, firstly, the people that were subjected to this trial were not really adequately consulted at all. But secondly, the trial was not constructed in a way that would yield an evidence base that would support a decision to continue or discontinue the program. The evaluation that was conducted by ARIMA into the effectiveness of the trials in Sejina and the East Kimberley was utterly inconclusive at best, a point that was made by the ANAO when they reviewed it. There was insufficient credible evidence at that point to support the establishment of further trials. But despite that, the government relied on that evaluation uh, to roll out more and more trials of the card. At the time, Janet Hunt, who was the Deputy Director for the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at ANU, said that the evaluation showed the cashless debit card had not actually improved safety and reduced violence, despite that being one of the trial's key objectives. The ANAO report into the implementation and performance of the cashless debit card trial 
in 2018 uncovered some very serious issues, uh, including false reporting of the data which was collected through the trials. Uh, the evaluation had noted, for example, a decrease in ambulance callouts when in fact there had been an increase, and the evaluation said there was an increase in school attendance, but the ANAO found Indigenous school attendance had decreased after the introduction of the card. The Auditor General's report of the trials also raised very real and serious questions about the costs of the program, including the very high cost of the trials, budget overruns and flawed procurement processes. Um, now, I raise this seems a long time ago now, 2018. But despite all of this information, the government persisted with an approach that, at the very best, you could say didn't have any evidence to support it, and the very worst, you could see that there was evidence there to suggest that it was not, in fact, working at all. This is basically the problem. Communities were not involved. The evidence didn't suggest it was working, but those opposite pushed ahead. The program unfairly targeted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people from low socioeconomic areas. And the evidence that keeps getting brought back to the parliament over and over again refers to the same kind of language. It talks about stigma. It talks about humiliation. It talks about having agency taken away from people. These kind of reports should give policy makers pause. It's unlikely that programs that make people feel this way are going to have an effective or positive social benefit. And it's surprising to me, even now, that our predecessors in the LNP were not inclined to listen to those voices when they repeatedly came before government and said over and over again, these kinds of measures are harmful to us and harmful to our people. They are harmful to our sense of self. They are discriminatory and they are stigmatising. It's an important reminder to us here in this place about why a voice to parliament is so critical and so overdue. If we do want to close the gap, if we would genuinely want to engage with First Nations communities, then solutions and policy need to be genuinely community driven. Not top down, not imposed. And it's on this basis that I support the bill. Right, thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Little. Thank you. Uh, I rise to make a contribution to the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. Well, what a backflip by this Labor government. What a proverbial dog's breakfast. We've heard from a Labor senator today, clearly with more than a glance into the issues confronting those who live with addiction, that he didn't want an end to the CDC because he's seen and heard there has been change. He will vote with his own party. What a brave, honourable senator. It was refreshing to hear that earlier today. It is not perfect income management, but it is part of a strategy to provide some stability to the lives of the most vulnerable in the most vulnerable communities. When in government for two terms, your own former Labor minister, Jenny Macklin, Minister for Indigenous Affairs back then, whose advice we learnt today you still value, was a fierce advocate for income management. Let me refresh memory. I quote from an ABC interview in 2010. There's less harassment for money, less money spent on alcohol and gambling, more money for food and for their children. Even Graham Richardson, a stalwart Labor person, has only this month said in the news media, I think it's had a positive effect and I think we'd be crazy to dump it. I quote directly from the Adelaide University report, an, academic, an independent academic evaluation released in 2021. It reported that the cashless debit card had helped recipients improve their lives and the lives of their family and other community members. The findings included 25 per cent of people reported they are drinking less since the cashless debit card's introduction, 21 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported gambling less, and evidence found that the cash previously used for gambling had been redirected to essentials such as food. 
45 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported the cashless debit card had improved things for themselves and their family. This has been botched and there's nothing here to celebrate. First responders, the police, the paramedics and the women's and men's shelters, those people who attend the carnage every single day from addiction know what is coming. There is no stigmatising because the evidence is right there. I dare you to stay around long enough when there's a battle going on between a couple, one wanting the money from the other. What they don't know is the war for them has not even really begun. The ANAO report in, of 2022 is another professional report. It mostly looked at administration. In it, there is no recommendation to end the CDC. In fact, there is nothing in that entire 83-page report that smells of scandal, of incompetence in service delivery or anything that suggests it is such a failure it needs to be dismantled. It does not say it does not work. In fact, an earlier Auditor-General report in 2018 and 2019 said it was difficult to conclude if the CDC trial was effective in achieving its objective of reducing social harm. It's about the data. It's about the baseline. As politicians, our job is to make Australia a better place, fix things. This legislation will make a bad situation much, much worse. I want to now talk about consultation, or rather lack of it, it seems, in this decision. It's not consultation. As a senator for South Australia, I visited the community of Sojourner very recently. I've been there a number of times over the years. I walked the streets with Julian Lisa, Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs, and we went into a gaming room and into one of the local bars. People knew we were there and they were pleased to stop and talk to us. I don't know who you were talking to, but these were not scripted, specially selected people. These were complete randoms. What they told us we already knew. These CDC sites were trials. They were not perfect and they felt comfortable telling us they were on the card. They didn't like it, but they needed it to restrict the good times and to ensure their families were okay. I'll translate that. Yes, they didn't like it, but it was an important safeguard for them and their families. These conversations happened in the street, in the bar and in the gaming room. We've had no consultation really about it all. The first we heard of it was in the PM's election promises that he was going to do it. Prior to that, we had no representation from any Labor politicians. That was the words of Mayor Perry Will from the District Council of Sejuna. Clearly, no recent consultation with him. I might also add that Minister Richworth was encouraged twice by a local member of parliament to contact me because of my knowledge of the card when she visited Sejuna, but despite heavy prompting from our local member, no effort was made to contact me. I made sure I was available if the phone rang, but it did not ring. Former Mayor Alan Souter, OAM. There is not an education campaign less than a few weeks out from the changes you propose. Time is important to allow those on the card to have conversations with their families on decisions on remaining on the card. It is unbelievable that you would think that was unacceptable or unreasonable to allow time for those discussions. That is also what free prior informed consent is about. It's about giving people the information they need so that they understand it in a timely manner and so that they can have those important conversations to reduce the backlash that might come their way. Some of these people have English as a second and third language. These are smart people. They should have been properly consulted. Even worse, I don't think I've seen in all the material that I've read anything that even looks remotely like a social impact statement, a social risk assessment. Sure, the Senate committee looked at it, but we've also heard that was rushed and prevented many people from being included. 
I would have thought, at the very minimum, if you were going to take apart a, a program that had been in place for so long, that you would have actually done a proper, rigorous, independent risk assessment. Your decision should have been informed by the most recent data. We now, however, have a baseline, and from that you should be monitoring hospitalisations, incarcerations and child protection notifications from the date of the end of the card. Are you even planning to do that, or has that just been conveniently forgotten? We won't forget those people that have been affected by the card. We've heard time and time again it is about delivering on an election promise. Are you serious? There are 151 electorates in this country, and yet only seven of them are in areas where the CDD, CDC card currently exists. That's hardly a mandate, if that is what you're suggesting. If those on the card want an alcoholic drink, want to have a flutter or to play the pokies, I will celebrate and join in with them. In fact, they probably have enough cash that they can shout me too. We can have a good time. They have cash available to them. There's a component that's quarantined and there's also a cash component. Discretionary. They can spend that at the local fete or they can choose to spend it on a drink, on the pokies or on anything else they want to. This is about living with addiction or binge drinking, drug abuse or gambling and providing some protection from the consequences of those things for those who need it most to protect themselves and others. I've heard directly from the people at the Sobering Up shelter in Sojuna that a blood alcohol level of, wait for it, 0.02 is pretty matter of fact. I read the coronial report that led to Sojuna being established as a CDC location, and it refers at one point to regular level, level regular levels being 0.02. But wait for this. It even refers to a 0.4. Yes, a 0.4. I've heard medical people saying, that's ridiculous. You should be legally dead. These people walk around every day, every day with these blood alcohol levels, and their bodies are ravaged by it. Their families are ravaged by it. They are completely ravaged by it. Their communities are ravaged by it, and the non-Aboriginal people in those communities are ravaged by it. Nobody wants to live like that. No, you should see, you should see in the coronials cirrhosis, liver, liver bleeding, bleeding of the liver. It goes Order. on and on and on. The, no death rate, the death rate is much lower than what you and I will expect to live. That's the reality. Flip-flopping and confusion by this government at the 11th hour only adds to confusion for those who are currently on the card and are already disadvantaged, mostly in education and employment and even in communication. You are not getting rid of income management in the Northern Territory. You are simply referring people to an inferior card with inferior technology while you work out the other bits, the technology. Well, when you live in a regional and a remote area, communication is always a challenge. And so going into the Christmas period coming up, wondering if the technology is going to work, not even knowing what card you're going to be on and how that transition might happen, that's terrifying for these people. The CDC is an advanced technology that enables recipients to access their welfare payments using the universal banking system. The basics card is limited delivery mechanism. In fact, when I learned of the benefits of the CDC a few years ago, as opposed to the basics card, I encouraged people to change over. I was absolutely gutted with what people were telling me. They'd heard from mischievous people, hell-bent on progressing their philosophical agenda of all sorts of evils. It was ridiculous, the stories I heard, cruel even. You know there is a terrible time ahead, not just for individuals with addiction, their families and the communities, 
yes, even the non-Aboriginal residents, because you have provided $50 million for additional drug and alcohol support services. Is that one? Is that for one year? Before you say it's good, is that for one year or is that every year for the next few years? How many years is that for? It's light on detail yet again. <laughs> what about the other services, such as domestic and family violence, financial counselling? We're just not very far out from the end of this card, and you still haven't explained it to the people that rely on those services. Drug and alcohol and gambling addiction is about losing control, about doing things to harmful level because you simply can't stop on your own. You might also take several attempts to actually get help, even if you know it's available to you. It takes at least three times minimum for a person with addiction to be successful in conquering it. That's a lot of time for people who rely on not having a drunk coming home, an abusive person coming home, having the food taken from them, to wait while the card's fixed or while that person gets help. Changing the CDC to a voluntary card will make the most vulnerable in our communities more vulnerable. I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it. Yeah. Whether you are living with or love those with an addiction, a frontline worker, a member of the public or the family, or generation left to deal with the chaos and grief, there is no escaping the consequences of addiction and substance misuse or the coercion and control that often follows. Addressing it benefits us all. In removing the CDC, you have failed to respond to that. Your abandonment of the most vulnerable is a disgrace, and the way you are going about this transition is irresponsible and reckless. Delay it, like you're going to delay the other card, to reduce further damage and disruption at the worst possible time in the calendar year for those people who it's going to affect the most. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022. And this legislation will go towards delivering on the federal Labor government's commitment to the Australian people to abolish the cashless debit card. And in my contribution today, I was going to focus my remarks on my experiences in Queensland, and that is particularly the case to Hinkler uh, and also the time I've spent in the Cape as well. And the commitment that federal Labor made before the election around this is something that I personally made on many times in the, in the electorate of Hinkler as well. Uh, and it's something that uh, I know was an important factor for us to be upfront with the Australian people, and it's something that we took to the election and that there is no doubt what the federal Labor position was before that election. And throughout the previous term of parliament, I spent uh, a vast amount of time in the Hinkler electorate of Harvey Bay, Bundaberg and surrounding communities because I'm the duty senator for that area. So it is something that uh, I have first-hand experience of meeting with constituents who have been impacted by the card, and it's something that has stayed with me as the senator, as the Queensland senator, as I experience those constituent issues firsthand. And part of the reason why I experience those issues is because their local member, the member for Hinkler, actually refused to meet with constituents who were impacted by it. Um, so that fell on me as the duty senator to pick up some of that slack that we, you would normally expect of a dutiful uh, federal member of parliament as a, a basic uh, function of their office and their uh, being elected, that they would look after those constituents or at least listen to those constituents and help them out. Uh, but we didn't see that in Bundaberg. They were ignored by their local members. And if you did go to those communities and listen, you were impacted by the stories that you heard from people who were put on that card. And it was those personal stories that had a real impact on me. It was the mum who couldn't take her kids to the school fate because the card wasn't able to be used there. She didn't have the cash to be able to do it. The young mum who was buying groceries in the local supermarket, who a couple of blokes saw that she was paying with the cashless debit card and commented on, oh, she's one of those druggies because she's using that card. It was the 
lack of wraparound services that these people were impacted by, that were promised but took too long to deliver. And it's clear to me, having spent time in that community, how divisive this card was, the stigma that was associated with it and the impact it had on those people. And my office dealt with numerous constituent issues uh, over the course of the last few years whilst this card had been implemented that we did our best to help, but the draconian nature of this card didn't always make it possible. But there's also the practical things, the fact that a place like Bundaberg produces so much great fresh produce and they have burgeoning farmers markets, yet people on the cashless debit card can't go and use it there. They're restricted in terms of where they can use their card. So just practical things like that that would actually enable people to live a better life and use fresh fruit and produce they weren't able to do. So uh, let alone the issues that came across our office of people um, defaulting on their rent because of uh, bureaucratic errors in the way that the card was administered as well. So there are so many issues with this card, and this is just in my experience in Hinkler, that had a negative impact on the community. But there was one constant theme, and that was that there was no consultation before this card was implemented. And in my contribution, I want to dispel this myth once and for all that there has been no consultation on this legislation. Because we're not going to get lectured to by those opposite about consultation, given what they did to the electorate of Hinkler. Given they came in from on high and implemented this legislation, they didn't consult with anyone in Hinkler before they came in and did it. They just put everyone on it and said, this is the way it's going to be. And then you add to that a local federal member in Keith Pitt, the member for Hinkler, who wouldn't meet with constituents who raised issues about this card, who had problems with this card. So there was no consultation before they did it. And then you had a local member who was so arrogant that he wouldn't actually meet with constituents who had valid concerns about this bill. But the other thing about consultation, and then I've heard numerous times from those opposite uh, in their contributions on this bill, that they've tried to say that Labor haven't consulted. Well, I know they're new to opposition, but that's actually what a good opposition does. They go out and consult, and that's what we did. Uh, I went with the then Shadow Minister, Linda Burney, through Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. We met with local constituents. We did roundtables. We did forums. We heard from people. That's how you form a view in opposition about what you want to do in government. There's something that they could learn, but they show no willingness to do it. But even since we formed government, the now minister, Amanda Richworth, has been out and consulted, along with the assistant minister, Justine Elliott, with every community that is impacted by this card. So for those to claim that there's been no consultation, it is absolutely nonsense. And we are certainly not going to be lectured to about consultation when they did none of it in Hinkler before the election. So let's dispel that myth once and for all. Uh, we are not going to be lectured to by these guys about consultation. Uh, and we have done the consultation because that's what a good opposition did, which is what we did when we were in opposition. And then when you come to power, when you come to government, you go about implementing your promises, which is what we've done. But we also had the minister and assistant minister visit these communities, and we also had the Senate committee process, uh, led by Senator Smith, do a really good job in terms of going around and listening as well. And when I said I'm going to make my contribution focused on Queensland, because that's my experience, but I have seen the contribution from my colleagues from South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory, um, who have done their job as senators, as Labor senators, and gone about consulting their communities over the last couple of years as well. So this lack of consultation myth can be completely dispelled. It is nonsense um, and it is disappointing that the, government the opposition continue to try and raise it. So when the government first announced the card, they promised there would also be an investment in wraparound services as well. And I know from my own experience in Hinkler, this took more than two years to be implemented. Two years this took to be implemented. So the card was being rolled out, yet the additional wraparound services that were promised and in a much needed area for the community, they took two years. And they only got delivered when there was a bit of public pressure, when there was a bit of media pressure, when the local community was saying, where are, where are these additional services? Yet we see they've wasted $170 million on this, but they didn't provide the services that were there. 
We also know that the Senate inquiry heard from many people impacted by the card, and many spoke about that lack of consultation that I experienced firsthand through my work as a senator as well. Catherine Wilkes said, uh, and I know Catherine very well from the time I spent in both Bundaberg and Hinkler, someone who's been a good advocate for her community, uh, people for whom it turned up in the letterbox, they didn't have any idea what was going on, no consultation, no. Would you like it? Bang, you're on it. And that was very common as a theme from, I heard, from what I heard from people in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay as well. And throughout the time of the card, we saw multiple attempts to change the goalposts uh, that would justify the trial as a success. First, about, first, it was about how it would increase employment in the area. At the time, there were no significant differences between Bundaberg, Harvey Bay to the neighbouring Gympie and Maribara, which weren't on the card. So when you actually compared the criteria they were trying to set, there were no differences across the geographic boundaries in the area. They then shifted the goalposts to talk about crime and social impacts. The previous government struggled to again to find any evidence to say that this was in fact. And after a $2 million study by the University of Adelaide into the cards, it found, as reported in The Guardian in February of 2021, that the cashless debit card review fails to find proof that the coalition welfare scheme reduces social harm. So even their own report into this that they commissioned failed to provide the evidence that it was working. And then the ANAO audit into the performance of the cashless debit card again found that there was a lack of evidence to demonstrate the success of the card. There were no key performance indicators, evidence or evaluation conducted to support the former government scheme. So despite the evidence the card wasn't working, the government continued to pursue it, forcing more people under the card and began to looking at to expanding it further. And this is why this government is acting, because we're out there, we're listening to constituents, we're listening to local communities, and we heard stories from those people who want the card scrapped. We have heard from organisations who have, long the, who have long maintained that the card is punitive and doesn't work. We have also seen the evidence that this card doesn't work. We said we would repeal it as a priority, and that is exactly what we are happening in government. The Australian people deserve a government that doesn't take them for granted, one that delivers on its investment into regional areas to create jobs and opportunities. And this bill will ensure that we make the transition away from the cashless debit card, uh, that it be as smooth as can be, and that the communities have access to support that they need. This bill will remove the ability for any new entrants to be put on the card. It will enable more than 17,000 existing cashless debit card participants to be, to be progressively transitioned off the card as soon as the bill receives royal assent, which we aim to have occur in the next sitting period. In September, allowing for participants to regain uh, the financial freedom and they've been asking for. Enable the Family Responsibilities Commission to continue to support the community members by placing them into income management where the need exists. And that is not something that is new for those Cape communities. Uh, income management has been a factor there now for a long time. Yeah. Allows for me to determine uh, the following further consultation on how the Northern Territory participants on the CDC will transition and the income management arrangements that will exist. And finally, it will allow, allow for the repeal of the cashless debit card on a day to be fixed by proclamation or a maximum of six months after royal assent. We know we need to continue to support communities and we will continue to support these communities, communities as they transition off the cashless debit card. The government's vision is no one left behind and no one held back. We will make sure all those in our society are supported and have the opportunity to succeed. Repealing the cashless debit card helps to do that and I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Labor Party has clearly shown us that they're not ready for government, and we all knew that. They've shown in their short time in government that all they can do is make grandiose statements that sound nice on social media but do not actually make one bit of difference in people's lives. We saw this recently you know, during the entirety of their 46th parliament. They harped on about integrity, and within the first couple of months of government, they've had multiple ministers breach their ministerial code of conduct. Mays, there's not one in here tonight. And how did the PM deal with this breach of ministerial standards? Nothing. He didn't do anything to do with it. He simply 
swept it under the, the carpet. And here we're seeing this pattern of making statements but acting in another way again with the repeal of the cashless debit card. Despite all their talk about caring for our First Nations people, we see that this is a hollow, that this is all hollow with the legislation now before us. The Albanese government's decision to abolish the cashless debit card has given the green light to more grog, drug abuse and violence in some of our most vulnerable communities. Without ever studying any social impact of what might be come out of this, without any evidence, you talk about the ANAO report, which clearly says that they can't tell whether it worked or not because of the wraparound services that you were just alleging weren't provided. Now you're going to have to spend even more on those because you can't even help people manage their own lives. It's all about grandiose statements. This was an innovative program designed to tackle social harm, something the Labor Party should give a damn about. And it was particularly associated with the harms around drug and alcohol addiction in communities with high rates of long-term social security dependence. Not random communities here and there, not from my day or two in Hinkler, not from my little junket here and there, but based on evidence. As Senator, my friend and colleague sitting next to me, Senator Little has pointed out so rightly on numerous occasions in this chamber, the cashless debit card is an important tool in the mix of these solutions. Would you like to debate on that? Okay, jump on your feet. There is no silver bullet when dealing with such complex social problems, as the Greens would like us to think. The cashless debit card has played an important role in reducing rates of alcoholism and gambling in remote Indigenous communities. Finding, findings from an independent impact evaluation by the university— Yes, I just Order. referred to that, and if you would stop interjecting, I might be able to tell you a little bit more evidence, Senator Rice. Findings from an independent impact evaluation by the University of Adelaide, re released in 2021, reported that the cashless debit card had helped recipients improve the lives of themselves, their family and their community. So you might just want to note that, Senator Rice, through you, Chair. Findings include, Senator through, Rice, I'll let you know, which I just did, Madam Deputy Chair. So the, the findings include 25 per cent of people reported they are drinking less since the cashless debit card's introduction, 21 per cent of cashless debit, cashless debit card participants reported gambling less, and 21 per cent, Senator Little, 21 per cent, and evidence found that cash previously used for gambling had been redirected to essentials such as food. Such as food, Senator Rice, through you, Madam Chair. 45 per cent, and th this report, when you're asking for evidence, this report said 45 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported that the card had improved things for themselves and Order. their family. Senator Rice, you don't have the call. And as I said, Senator Rice, the ANO couldn't make that call because of all the wraparound services. That's their report. This top-down consultation Senator poll— Senator don't direct your comments to Senator Rice. Direct I did them that through, through their you, Chair. Chair. And Senator Rice, please don't interject. If you go back to the transcript, I did it through you, Chair, mm -hmm. and I will continue on doing so. This top-down consultation poll, paternalistic approach by that Labor government is becoming a defining feature of their approach to policy. If they listened to the communities and those currently using the card, they would see how bad an idea it is to repeal this. Tammy Williams from the Family Responsibilities Commission has said that, and I quote, the majority of people now using the CDC on Cape York are doing it on a voluntary basis. I'll repeat that again, on a voluntary basis. Noel Pearson, the founder and director of strategy of the Cape York Partnership and one of our Australia's leading lights, has said that this legislation will wipe out 20 years of his work. 
Senator Chisholm, you might want to listen and pay attention. Order, 20 Senator years Van, direct your comments through the president. Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator Chisholm might like to, to stop and listen to what I'm saying because it's con contradicting everything he just said. Mayor Perry Well, yes, of course, from the District Council of Seduna has said that, and I quote, we have had no consultation about it at all. The first we heard of it was in the PM's election promises that he was going to do it. Prior to that, we had no representation from any Labor politicians. Must have been one of those, must have been in Hinkler, Senator Chisholm, through you, Madam Chair. If the government had any respect for the communities, they constantly say they are the tribunes, one would think that they would have actually spent some time talking to them to see how this legislation would affect their lives. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would appreciate the silence too. And this truly worries me, because it is these communities that will be affected by their carelessness. It also worries me, because it looks like they're taking the same approach to their voice to parliament. They're asking Australians to make a change to our constitution without providing us any detail of what those changes will be and without having any proper engagement or consultation. With such an important change that would have far-reaching changes to the rest of society, if they approach the voice to parliament in a similar manner to which they have with the cashless debit card, I fear that this government will implement changes that will hurt Australians even further. The government now clearly recognise they have made a terrible error with this bill, with their own amendments to allow Cape York, the CDC trial sites and those people in the NT who have voluntarily transitioned from the basics card onto the CDC to remain on that card. As my friend and colleague, Senator Najimpa Price, said in a moving first speech, the removal of the cashless debit card allowed countless families on welfare to feed their children rather than seeing the money claimed by kinship demand from, demands from alcoholics, substance abusers and gamblers in their own family group. It is time, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, that those opposite have a good hard look at themselves. The role of government is to improve the lives of people, not actively make it worse. And what the government is doing by pushing this bill through by any means necessary will make those most vulnerable worse off. Thank you. Senator Askey. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The amendments proposed by the government to the Social Security Administration Amendment, re repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022, will quite simply extend the cashless debit card. This goes against everything that said during the election campaign and shows this ill-conceived promise was made on the fly without pr proper consideration. It's yet another embarrassing backflip by the Albanese Labor government that ultimately means the people in Cape York, the Northern Territory and within the CDC trial sites who voluntarily transitioned from the basics card to the cashless debit card can now stay on the card. These amendments are an admission by Labor they got it wrong and that abolishing the cashless debit card will have dire consequences for those vulnerable communities. I'm pleased Labor has recognised their mistake in time and provisioned $50 million for additional drug and alcohol support services to reduce the serious social harm that is likely to result from the removal of this critical welfare program. Despite the amendments allowing people to voluntarily remain on the CDC program and the additional funding for drug and alcohol support services, the intention of this bill is still to repeal the cashless debit card. As the chair of the Community Affairs Committee during the 46th Parliament, I led the inquiry relating to the transition of income management participants in the Northern Territory and Cape York onto the cashless debit card from the basics card during 2020. The understanding I have of this program means I know the difference the cashless debit card made in the trial communities. I heard women speaking about how they felt safer better able to feed their families and more capable of helping their children participate in school since being part of this program. Labor's decision to abolish the cashless debit card would open up these vulnerable communities to more alcohol abuse, more drug abuse and more violence. I cannot simply endorse 
a, a bill that will impact the 17,000 participants in this way. I also cannot support a bill that is being rushed. So little time has been spent considering what comes after the cashless debit card is repealed, should this bill be successful, and that is distressing. During the federal election campaign, Labor said it would abolish the card and leave no one behind. However, forcing people who are used, who are used to using the system off the program with hardly any notice, it is not only poor planning, but goes against the very reasoning it was set up in the first place. The act of abolishing the cashless debit card leaves behind thousands of people around the country. The government's amendments were introduced today because at the 11th hour, Labor realised there was nothing suitable to replace the program. Income management has been used in Australia since 2007, and the technology that enabled an income management program to operate with FPOS transactions was introduced as the BASIC card in 2008. While the BASICS card technology made important inroads at the time of its introductions, its use is restricted. The BASICS card can only be used in around 15,500 designated outlets, which must all be individually approved by government. But there is a better system, the cashless debit card. The CDC program was introduced in Sejuna, South Australia in March 2016 and then progressively rolled out to the other trial sites between April 2016 and January 2019. There were 17,754 participants using the cashless debit card around Australia as of 5 August this year. The CDC program was developed following the Sleeping Rough inquest from 2011, where the state coroner inquired into the deaths of six people in South Australia's far west coast. The coronial report found efforts to curb alcohol abuse in the region had been unsuccessful and that had produced devastating impacts across those communities. The cashless debit card was designed to help these communities by addressing social harm issues like domestic violence, child neglect and antisocial behaviours that arose from alcohol and drug abuse and long-term welfare dependency. It must be said that Indigenous community leaders approached the government for support and worked with government to establish the CDC program. And the further rollout of the program was established on this same basis of community support. The Social Security Administration Amendment, continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020, enabled income management recipients in the Northern Territory to voluntarily transition from the Basics card to the Cashless Debit card. As of 5 August this year, 4,398 participants in the Northern Territory had voluntarily transitioned from the Basics card to the CDC. The cashless debit card can deliver income management technology and operates using existing banking infrastructure. Those who have a cashless debit card can use their card at around 1 million outlets that have FPOS facilities within Australia, but making it far more accessible than the Basics card. It can also be used online and internationally. Additionally, the cashless debit card program is part of a series of measures introduced by the coalition to help people improve their circumstances, as well as to keep their community safe. Besides the card itself, these measures include the $30 million Jobs Fund and Job Ready initiative to strengthen local support services and help participants to upskill. There was also $50 million for residential drug and alcohol rehabilitation facilities, as well as mental health services, extra family support services, targeted youth activities and financial counselling. Not only will such measures and support systems be under threat once the cashless debit card is repealed, but it will leave more than 17,000 program participants in a worse position than when they started. The cashless debit card operates as a visa debit card, just like the debit cards you and I use at shops, accepting visa and FPOS. The only difference is that this card cannot be used to purchase alcohol or gambling products, and only a portion of payments can be withdrawn as cash. In most cases, 80 per cent of the recipient's income support payment was quarantined on the cashless debit card, with the remaining 20 per cent transferred to their personal bank account. The quarantined amount was just 50 per cent in the Northern Territory for most participants, and for those in Cape York, the quarantine percentage remained as it was on their previous income management arrangements. This strategy to reduce cash withdrawals also lessened the person's ability to spend their income support payments on illegal drugs. Orima Research published a report evaluating the CDC trial in 2017, showing a reduction in alcohol consumption 
illegal drug use and gambling. Other evaluations, including the University of Adelaide's 2021 report, have consistently shown this policy decreased drug and alcohol issues within the trial communities and decreased crime, violence and antisocial behaviour, improved child health and wellbeing, improved financial management and strengthened the communities. Only weeks ago, the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee heard from Noel Pearson, who founded the Cape York Institute. As we've heard previously, Mr Pearson spoke passionately about how the cashless debit card had positively influenced people in his community. It provided educational opportunities for families like purchasing books, sporting equipment and school excursions. But he says this bill will wipe out 20 years of his work in the Cape York community. There has been discussion around quarantining income support payments and whether the government of the day should be able to stipulate how recipients spend such payments. Mr Pearson explained that quarantining money for essential purchases like rent and groceries gave those receiving income support payments the ability to save face when money was demanded of them. Instead of being forced to hand money over, recipients said, it's locked away, I can't give you the money. Instead, the money fed, clothed and homed their families. The Cape York Institute worked with banks over many years to create a workable alternative where money could be paid into a lockable or a pre-commitment account. But he told us no other option had been found, and I quote, in the absence of a solution that had the same functionality as the cashless debit card, our Family Responsibilities Commission and the welfare reform work that we've done via that over the last 20 years will collapse, and that would be a very bad thing, end quote. In her submission to the committee's hearing in Bundaberg, Commissioner Tammy Williams from Family Responsibilities Commission Queensland asked for the card to stay. She requested the Australian government retains the cashless debit card for FRC jurisdiction, or if replaced, that the alternative have at least the same functionality as the FRC does not support the return of the basics card because it does not meet the standard. Witnesses in Alice Springs spoke out about how the cashless debit card made a real difference in their communities. A financial counsellor with the Central Australian Women's Legal Service told the committee that most of the women she worked with actually liked being on income management because they feel their children are being looked after because they're able to provide food and clothing and they're not being harassed as much for money. If this bill is passed, Will the Albanese Labor government take responsibility for the inevitable increase of violent crimes, alcohol and drug abuse, humbugging and child neglect that will follow? No, they will say they're leaving no one behind while walking away from the communities in Sejuna, East Kimberley, the Goldfields, Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. But it's not just me saying this. Noel Pearson knows the impact that tearing supports away from a community like Cape York will have. He said, and I quote, you will repeal the card and then you will walk away and leave us to the violence, leave us to the hunger, leave us to the neglected children. This bill was pulled together in a rush without actually speaking with those who will be impacted. During the hearings, the city of Kalgoor Kalgoorlie Boulder said the council remains unconsulted on how the trans transition will impact CDC participants, social service providers, government agencies and the community in its submission while well, Sejuna Mayor Perry Will said we've had no consultation about it at all. The first we heard of it was in the PM's election promises. But at the end of August, Labor's hastily arranged CDC engagement team sent a raft of draft engagement documents to the goldfields, with stakeholders given less than four days to provide feedback. They should have been consulted as soon as this election commitment was voiced, or ideally as part of the policy development prior to announcing it. I wouldn't call this engagement. I'd call it ticking a box so Labor can say consultation occurred. Even the head of the Department of Social Services, the department which oversees this income management program, admitted the decision to abolish the cashless debit card was an election commitment of the government, so the department would not have been involved in any consultation prior to the election. In the other place, my coalition colleagues have already argued against the lack of planning that has gone into this bill and the repercussions that are sure to follow. Member for Grey, Rowan Ramsey, whose electorate covers Sejuna, mentioned the positive differences the cashless debit card made in his community. He said people he'd spoken with were all horrified that the current government was going to stop the card. 
He shared the story of an elderly woman who was initially against the card's introduction but soon realised its value as it was a buffer against the violence in her family and gave her the ability to stand up. Michael McCormick MP, the member for Riverina, pointed out that the biggest difference a cashless debit card had made was to children. If we, as the Parliament of Australia, are to look after one thing, one sector of society, it should be our children. They are our future, he said. He is right. We must look after our children, our most vulnerable children, and this program did just that. Previous Minister for Social Services and Member for Bradfield, Paul Fletcher, said the program has made a significant difference in the lives of thousands of people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, in many communities around Australia. He told members about how he was struck by senior Aboriginal women supporting the cashless debit card because it meant that women could use social services payments for food, clothing, rent for themselves and their children, rather than being pressured by family members, typically male, to hand over cash to spend on non-essentials like alcohol. Police told Mr Fletcher the number of call-outs relating to domestic violence had dramatically reduced, while medical clinical staff had told him significantly less people were presenting as a result of domestic violence, and the chemist said parents were buying medicines for their children because they could now afford to. A social worker in that community told him people were able to save money for the first time, and residents said they felt safer. Despite all this evidence, this government is insisting on forcing the bill through and the work done to improve the situations in these regional and remote communities will be undone. Repealing the cashless debit card does not fix the problem this program sought to address. It merely adds to the issues that need fixing. I do not support this bill and I ask senators to listen to the words of those living in these communities before putting your support behind it. Think about what will happen once the program is repealed. Think about the antisocial behaviour that will return once money can be freely accessed, and then think about all those children whose futures will change as a result of that support system being removed from their families. It's not a nice thought, is it? Thank you. Senator McGraw. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Time and time again, we, we hear fake cries from, from Labor and the Greens about the importance of consulting Australians on issues that affect them. That is, of course, until they're in government. Then, of course, things change. Seemingly overnight, Albanese and Labor have become all-knowing and infinite in their knowledge of what is best for Australians, but don't dare question the so-called wisdom of Labor or the Greens. The swift and stealthy abolition of the cashless debit card by Labor and the Greens serves as another fine example of, of inner-city elites claiming to know what is, what is best for you. Never mind the fact that most of these privileged Labor and Green politicians have never and will never set their feet in the remote Indigenous communities and speak with those who have directly benefited from the cashless debit card. Of course, there is no need, as these Canberra-based politicians know best. And how could one forget, especially the Green MPs from the inner city suburbs, who share this deep and profound understanding of so-called um, issues affecting these communities, yet too they, Acting Deputy President, have not found the time to consult between their very, very busy virtue signalling. Don't let the increased rates of, of domestic violence, rape, assault, sexual assault, alcoholism or drug use get in the way of Labor and the Greens' plans to scrap the cashless debit card. Remember. These politicians they know better than the communities facing these challenges. The Albanese government's decision to, to abolish the cashless debit card has given the green light to more alcohol and drug abuse and more violence in some of our most vulnerable communities. Labor has recklessly walked away from these communities. Labor and the Greens do not care about the real-life consequences for the people of these communities. They would rather feel good about themselves as they scrap the cashless debit card in the name of their so-called fairness agenda. As long as these Labor and Green politicians cannot see the rampant alcoholism, the sexual assaults, the rape, the domestic violence and the drug, and, drug abuse in these communities, then in their minds it does not exist. This sensible and life-changing measure is being abolished 
so that these Labor and Green politicians can just feel good about themselves. Because Prime Minister Albanese, Labor and the Greens know better than the Director of Strategy of the Cape York Partnership, Noel Pearson, who fears abolishing the cashless debit card will wipe out 20 years' worth of his work in vulnerable Indigenous communities. Mr Pearson has said that once the card is gone, the government will walk away, leaving his people to struggle with the return of violence, hunger and neglected children. With virtually no consultation, Labor has made it easier for those at risk to spend their taxpayer-funded payments on activities and substances that cause harm to themselves, cause harm to their families and cause harm to their communities. Well, if you don't believe me, take it from the Mindaroo Foundation, who are concerned the decision to abolish the cashless debit card is being rushed through Parliament without appropriate or meaningful community consultation and said that the removal of the cashless debit card has the potential to exacerbate vulnerability and this must be avoided at all costs. These are the voices that Prime Minister Albanese, Labor and the Greens conveniently silence. Why? Because it does not fit their narrative. So, so please spare us your, your sanctimonious lectures on community consultation. You're ramming this through after being in power for only four months. So this decision will inevitably bring more alcoholism, more domestic violence, more hunger and malnourishment of children, more rape and drug abuse. So I can't wait for Labor and the Greens to step forward and accept responsibility. Because when they don't, and they won't, we will, we will be holding you accountable for this, this appalling decision that you are proposing to make. I cannot wait for the MPs who support the cashless debit cards ab abolishment to head to these communities to help fight the scourge of alcohol and drug fuelled domestic violence alongside, in many cases, the understaffed and under-resourced local police. And Acting Deputy President, I know that won't happen. Because if the government is successful in abolishing the cashless debit card, the Prime Minister and his inner city dominated government will be responsible for every additional violent crime and neglected child that will inevitably occur as a result. This government has not just botched the process, it is going to botch the future for so many important Australians. Findings from an independent impact evaluation by the University of Adelaide, released in 2021, reported that the cashless debit card has helped recipients improve their lives and the lives of their families and other, commu and other community members. Findings include 25 per cent of people reported they are drinking less since the cashless debit card's introduction. 21 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported gambling less, and evidence found that cash previously used for gambling has been redirected to essentials such as food. 45 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported the cashless debit card had improved things for themselves and their families. There have been more than a dozen evaluations of the cashless debit card that have provided consistent evidence about welfare quarantine policies showing decreases in drug and alcohol issues, decreases in crime violence and antisocial behaviour, improvements in child health and wellbeing and improved financial management. Of course, Labor won't let these black and white facts get in the way of this reckless policy decision. When they scrap the cashless debit card, they will be directly responsible for the harm that is impacted and inflicted on individuals, families and entire communities. Because if Labor had bothered to properly consult with communities and speak to the people on the front line, they would know there is overwhelming community support for the cashless debit card. It has saved families and transformed communities. The Western Australia Police Commissioner Cole Blanche has said the card had been beneficial in remote communities. He highlighted how it gives an opportunity for the more senior people and families and the elders of Aboriginal communities to use the money on food for children and necessities. He said it just seems to settle the community down and gives them better opportunity to spend the money on priority needs. Another facility Labor and the Greens would have you believe is that every single cent on the card is quarantined. This is not true. Generally, only 80 per cent of the recipient's welfare payment is quarantined onto the card. The remaining 20 per cent of the recipient's social security payments are transferred into the recipient's bank account and can be withdrawn and used without restriction. 
Those in Labor and the Greens might find this hard to believe, but the card is effective in blocking the purchase of alcohol and gambling products and only permits a portion of payments to be withdrawn as cash. Reducing the amount of cash that can be withdrawn also reduces the card user's ability to spend welfare payments on illegal drugs. This is fair. This is simple. And no, as has been pointed out earlier this evening, it is not a silver bullet, but it has been effective in bringing about positive change in regional communities, and you cannot argue with those facts. Those of us in the coalition have always believed in ensuring we care for and protect the most vulnerable in our society. Those, co those opposite constantly espouse to, the, to share this belief. However, the removal of the cashless debit card will bring violence and chaos back into the lives of our most vulnerable and reap havoc in regional communities. Because, after all, Labor are only pursuing this policy because it makes them feel good about themselves. It makes those who live comfortable lives in comfortable homes of our capital cities feel warm and fuzzy inside. It is sickening to think that Labor's politicking has stooped so low they have no regard for the safety and the welfare of the vulnerable in these communities, so as long as they can abolish this card and give themselves a pat on the back. Meanwhile, Indigenous women and children are pleading for this card to stay. Regional police are begging for the card to stay. Indigenous elders are pleading for this card to stay. Regional mayors are pleading for this card to stay. Labor likes to bang on about an Indigenous voice in this place, but the sad truth is that Labor politicians and inner city elites are the only voices worth listening to, according to them, not those whose lives will be directly affected if the cashless welfare card is scrapped. Quite simply, if you cannot see or are not directly affected by the alcohol and drug fueled domestic violence, rape, child neglect or sexual assault, then it does not exist. Of course, context is absent from the Labor Greens narrative that this card is somehow inherently racist. They wouldn't have you know that the cashless debit card is part of a suite of measures to help people improve their circumstances. The coalition government made a total investment for supportive services of more than $110 million across cashless debit card sites, including a $30 million jobs fund and job ready initiative to strengthen local support services and help participants in cashless debit card communities to upskill become job ready and get on pathways to employment, and $50 million for drug and alcohol residential rehabilitation facilities. If the Labor government had bothered to properly consult, it would hear firsthand how the cashless debit card is making a real positive difference across many communities. Community leaders like Kalgoorlie Boulder Mayor John Bowler, who expressed his frustration, he said, it almost seems Labor is putting the cart before the horse, he said. I would, like, I would have liked for them to come here, consult with us, consult with the committee and then make a decision. The coalition condemns the government for seeking to extend the basics card in the Northern Territory without consultation or transparency, while at the same time seeking to abolish the cashless debit card. Stakeholders consistently gave evidence that the cashless debit card was a significant, significantly superior mechanism for the delivery of income management. Recent data from the Department of Social Services reveals that more than 4,500 people are currently voluntarily using the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory. Under the proposed legislation, these individuals will be forced to move back to the basics card. It is unclear how many of these almost 4,500 people the government consulted and what their reactions were when they were told they would no longer have access to the cashless debit card, because there was no evidence that any of these people were consulted. Labor like to think they are crusaders for fairness and social justice by scrapping this card. In actual fact, they are condemning families and entire communities to more chaos and violence. Shame on them. These people will not forget, and we will not forget, because we will hold this Labor Green government to account for what havoc and what nastiness they have unleashed within these communities. Thank you. Senator McKenzie.